Section One of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume Seven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume Seven, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section One. When it was the six hundred and thirty seventh night, Shahrazad continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Sa'adan, having broken into the palace of King Jamak and pounded to pieces those therein, the survivors cried out, Quarter, quarter! And Sa'adan said to them, Pinion your king. So they bound Jamak and took him up, and Sa'adan drove them before him like sheep, and brought them to Garib's presence, after the most part of the citizens had perished by the enemy's swords. When the king of Babel came to himself, he found himself bound, and heard Sa'adan say, I will sup to-night off this king Jamak. Whereupon he turned to Garib and cried to him, I throw myself on thy mercy. Replied Garib, Become a Moslem, and thou shalt be safe from the gull and from the vengeance of the living one who ceaseth not. So Jamak professed al-Islam with heart and tongue, and Garib bade loose his bonds. Then he expounded the faith to his people, and they all became true believers after which Jamak returned to the city and dispatched thence provant land henchmen to Garib and wine to the camp before Babel where they passed the night. On the morrow Garib gave the signal for the march and they fared on till they came to Mayafarikin, which they found empty, for its people had heard what had befallen Babel and had fled to Kufa city and told Ajib, when he heard the news, his doom day appeared to him, and he assembled his braves, and informing them of the enemy's approach, ordered them make ready to do battle with his brother's host, after which he numbered them, and found them thirty thousand horse and ten thousand foot. So, needing more, he levied other fifty thousand men, cavalry and infantry, and taking horse amid a mighty host, rode forwards till he came upon his brother's army encamped before Mosul and pitched his tents in face of their lines. Then Garib wrote a writ and said to his officers, Which of you will carry this letter to Ajib? Whereupon Sahim sprang to his feet and cried, O king of the age, I will bear thy missive and bring thee back an answer. So Garib gave him the epistle, and he repaired to the pavilion of Ajib, who, when informed of his coming, said, Admit him, and when he stood in the presence, asked him, Whence comest thou? Answered Sahim, From the king of the Arabs and the Persians, son-in-law of Khosroi, king of the world, who sendeth thee a writ, so do thou return him a reply. Quoth Ajib, Give me the letter. Accordingly Sahim gave it to him, and he tore it open and found therein, In the name of Allah the Compassionating, the Compassionate, peace on Abraham the friend await. But afterwards, as soon as this letter shall come to thy hand, do thou confess the unity of the bountiful king, causer of causes, and mover of the clouds, and leave worshipping idols, and thou do this thing, thou art my brother and ruler over us, and I will pardon thee the deaths of my father and mother, nor will I reproach thee with what thou hast done. But an thou obey not my bidding, behold, I will hasten to thee, and cut off thy head, and lay waste thy dominions. Verily, I give thee good counsel, and the peace be on those who pace the path of salvation, and obey the Most High King. 
When Ajib read these words and knew the threat they contained, his eyes sank into the crown of his head, and he gnashed his teeth and flew into a furious rage. Then he tore the letter in pieces and threw it away, which vexed Sahim, and he cried out upon Ajib, saying, Allah wither thy hand for the deed thou hast done. With this Ajib cried out to his men, saying, Seize yonder hound and hew him in pieces with your hangers. So they ran at Sahim, but he bared blade and fell upon them and slew of them more than fifty braves, after which he cut his way out, though bathed in blood, and won back to Garib, who said, What is this case, O Sahim? And he told him what had passed, whereat he grew livid for rage, and crying, Allahu Akbar, God is most great, bade the battle drums beat. So the fighting men donned their hauberks and coats of straight woven mail and baldricked themselves with their swords. The footmen drew out in battle array, whilst the horsemen mounted their prancing horses and dancing camels and leveled their long lances, and the champions rushed into the field. Ajib and his men also took horse, and host charged down upon host, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and thirty-eighth night, she pursued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Garib and his merry men took horse, Ajib and his troops also mounted, and host charged down upon host, then ruled the Kazi of battle, in whose ordinance is no wrong, for a seal is on his lips, and he speaketh not, and the blood railed in rills, and purfled earth with curious embroidery. Heads grew grey, and hotter waxed battle, and fiercer. Feet slipped, and stood firm the valiant, and pushed forwards, whilst turned the faint heart and fled. Nor did they leave fighting till the day darkened and the night starkened. Then clashed the symbols of retreat, and the two hosts drew apart from each other, and returned to their tents where they righted. Next morning, as soon as it was day, the cymbals beat to battle and deringdu, and the warriors donned their harness of fight, and baldricked their blades, the brightest bright, and with the brown lance bedight, mounted a doughty steed every night, and cried out, saying, This day no flight. And the two hosts drew out in battle array, like the surging sea. The first to open the chapter of war was Sahim, who craved his destrier between the two lines, and played with swords and spears, and turned over all the capitula of combat, till men of choicest wits were confounded. Then he cried out, saying, Who is for fighting? Who is for jousting? Let no sluggard come out, nor weakling. Whereupon there rushed at him a horseman of the kafirs, as he were a flame of fire. But Sahim let him not stand long before him, ere he overthrew him with a thrust. Then a second came forth, and he slew him also, and a third, and he tear him in twain, and a fourth, and he did him to death. Nor did they cease sallying out to him, and he left not slaying them, till it was noon, by which time he had laid low two hundred braves. Then Ajib cried to his men, Charge once more, and sturdy host on sturdy host down bore, and great was the clash of arms and battle roar. The shining swords out rang, the blood in streams ran, and footmen rushed upon footmen. Death showed in van, and horse-hoof was shodden with skull of man, nor did they cease from sore smiting till waned the day, and the night came on in black array, when they drew apart, and returning to their tents, passed the night there. As soon as morning morrowed, the two hosts mounted, and sought the field of fight, and the Moslems looked for Garib to back steed and ride 
under the standards as was his wont, but he came not. So Sahim sent to his brother's pavilion a slave who, finding him not, asked the tent pitchers, but they answered, We know not of him. Whereat he was greatly concerned, and went forth and told the troops, who refrained from battle, saying, An Garib be absent, his foe will destroy us. Now there was for Garib's absence a cause, strange but true, which we will set out in order due. And it was thus. When Ajib returned to his camp on the preceding night, he called one of his guardsmen by name, Sayar, and said to him, O oh, Sayar, I have not treasured thee save for a day like this, and now I bid thee enter among Garib's host, and pushing into the marquee of their lord, bring him hither to me, and prove how wily thy cunning be. And Sayar said, I hear and I obey. So he repaired to the enemy's camp, and stealing into Garib's pavilion, under the darkness of the night, when all the men had gone to their places of rest, stood up as though he were a slave to serve Garib, who, present, being athirst, called to him for water. So he brought him a pitcher of water, drugged with bang, and Garib could not fulfill his need ere he fell down with head distancing heels, whereupon Sayar wrapped him in his cloak and carrying him to Ajib's tent, threw him down at his feet. Quoth Ajib, O Sayar, what is this? Quoth he, This be thy brother, Garib. Whereat Ajib rejoiced, and said, The blessings of the idols light upon thee. Loose him, and wake him. So they made him sniff up vinegar, and he came to himself, and opened his eyes. Then finding himself bound, and in a tent other than his own, exclaimed, There is no majesty, and there is no might save in Allah, the glorious, the great. Thereupon Ajib cried out at him, saying, Dost thou draw on me, O dog, and seek to slay me, and take on me thy blood reek of thy father and thy mother? I will send thee this very day to them, and rid the world of thee. Replied Garib, Kafir hound, soon shalt thou see against whom the wheels of fate shall revolve, and who shall be overthrown by the wrath of the Almighty King, who wotteth what is in hearts, and who shall leave thee in Gehenna, tormented and confounded. Have ruth on thyself, and say with me, There is no God but the God, and Abraham is the friend of God. When Ajib heard Garib's words, he sparked and snorted, and railed at his god the stone, and called for the sworder and the leather rug of blood. But his wazir, who was at heart a Moslem, though outwardly a miscreant, rose, and kissing ground before him said, Patience, O king, deal not hastily, but wait till we know the conquered from the conqueror. If we prove the victors, we shall have power to him, and, if we be beaten, his being alive in our hands will be a strength to us. And the emir said, The minister speaketh sooth. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and thirty-ninth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Ajib purposed to slay Garib, the wazir rose and said, Deal not hastily, for we have always power to kill him. So Ajib bade, Lay his brother Garib in irons, and chain him up in his own tent, and set a thousand stout warriors to guard him. Meanwhile, Garib's host, when they awoke that morning, and found not their king, were as sheep sans a shepherd. But Sa'adan the gull cried out at them, saying, O folk, don your war gear, and trust your lord to defend you. So Arabs and Ajams mounted horse, after clothing themselves in hauberks of iron, and skirting themselves in straight-knit mail, 
and sallied forth to the field, the chiefs and the colors moving in van. Then dashed out the gull of the mountain with a club on his shoulder, two hundred pounds in weight, and wheeled and careered, saying, Ho, worshippers of idols, come ye out and renown it this day, for tis a day of onslaught. Whoso knoweth me hath enough of my mischief, and whoso knoweth me not, I will make myself known to him. I am Sa'adan, servant of King Garib. Who is for jousting? Who is for fighting? Let no faint heart come forth to me to-day, nor weakling. And there rushed upon him a champion of the infidels, as he were a flame of fire, and drove at him. But Sa'adan charged home at him, and dealt him with his club a blow which broke his ribs, and cast him lifeless to the earth. Then he called out to his sons and slaves, saying, Light the bonfire, and whoso falleth of the kafirs, do ye dress him and roast him well in the flame. Then bring him to me, that I may break my fast on him. So they kindled the fire midmost the plain, and laid thereon the slain, till he was cooked, when they brought him to Sa'adan, who gnawed his flesh and crunched his bones. When the miscreants saw the mountain gull do this deed, they were frighted with sore right. But Ajib cried out to his men, saying, Out on you, fall upon the ogre, and hew him in hunks with your scimitars. So twenty thousand men ran at Sa'adan, whilst the footmen circled round him and rained upon him darts and shafts, so that he was wounded in four-and-twenty places, and his blood ran down upon the earth, and he was alone. Then the host of the Moslems crave at the heathenry, calling for help upon the Lord of the three worlds, and they ceased not from fight and fray till the day came to an end, when they drew apart. But the infidels had captured Sa'adan, as he were a drunken man for loss of blood, and they bound him fast, and set him by Garib, who, seeing the gull a prisoner, said, There is no majesty, and there is no might, save in Allah, the glorious, the great. O Sa'adan, what case is this? O my lord, replied Sa'adan, it is Allah, extolled and exalted be he, who ordaineth joy, and annoy, and there is no help but this and that betide. And Garib rejoined, Thou speakest sooth, O Sa'adan. But Ajib passed the night in joy, and he said to his men, Mount ye on the morrow, and fall upon the Moslems, so shall not one of them be left alive. And they replied, Hearkening and obedience. This is how it fared with them, but as regards the Moslems, they passed the night, dejected and weeping for their king and Sa'adan. But Sahim said to them, O folk, be not concerned, for the aidance of Almighty Allah is nigh. Then he waited till midnight, when he assumed the garb of a tent pitcher, and repairing to Ajib's camp, made his way between the tents and pavilions, till he came to the king's marquee where he saw him seated on his throne, surrounded by his princes. So he entered, and going up to the candles which burnt in the tent, snuffed them, and sprinkled levigated henbane on the wicks, after which he withdrew, and waited without the marquee, till the smoke of the burning henbane reached Ajib and his princes, and they fell to the ground like dead men. Then he left them, and went to the prison tent, where he found Garib and Sa'adan, guarded by a thousand braves who were overcome with sleep. So he cried out at the guards, saying, Woe to you! Sleep not, but watch your prisoners, and light the cressets. Presently he filled the cresses with firewood, on which he strewed henbane, and lighting it, went round about the tent with it, till the smoke entered the nostrils of the guards, and they all fell asleep, drowned by the drug. When he entered the tent, and finding Garib and Sa'adan 
also insensible, he aroused them by making them smell and sniff at a sponge full of vinegar he had with him. Thereupon he loosed their bonds and collars, and when they saw him, they blessed him and rejoiced in him. After this, they went forth and took all the arms of the guards, and Sahim said to them, Go to your own camp. While he re-entered Ajib's pavilion, and wrapping him in his cloak, lifted him up and made for the Moslem encampment. And the Lord, compassionate, protected him, so that he reached Garib's tent in safety and unrolled the cloak before him. Garib looked at its contents, and seeing his brother Ajib bound, cried out, Allahu Akbar, God is most great, Edans, victory! And he blessed Sahim and bade him arouse Ajib. So he made him smell the vinegar mixed with incense, and he opened his eyes, and finding himself bound and shackled, hung down his head earthwards. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section one. Section 2 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 2. When it was the six hundred and fortieth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that after Sahim hath aroused Ajib, whom he had made insensible with henbane, and had brought to his brother, Garib, the captive opened his eyes, and feeling himself bound and shackled, hung down his head earthwards. Thereupon cried Sahim, O accursed, lift thy head. So he raised his eyes, and found himself amongst Arabs and Ajamis, and saw his brother seated on the throne of his estate, and the place of his power, wherefore he was silent, and spake not. Then Garib cried out, and said, Strip me, this hound! So they stripped him, and came down upon him with whips, till they weakened his body, and subdued his pride, after which Garib set over him a guard of an hundred knights. And when this fraternal correction had been administered, they heard shouts of, There is no God but the God, and God is most great, from the camp of the Kafirs. Now the cause of this was that, Ten days after his nephew, King al-Damig, Garib's uncle, had set out from al-Jazira with twenty thousand horse, and on nearing the field of battle, had dispatched one of his scouts to get news. The man was absent a whole day, at the end of which time he returned, and told al-Damig all that had happened to Garib with his brother. So he waited till the night, when he fell upon the infidels, crying out, Allahu Akbar, and put them to the edge of the biting scimitar. When Garib heard the takbir, he said to Sahim, Go, find out the cause of these shouts and war cries. So Sahim repaired to the field of battle, and questioned the slaves and camp followers who told him that King al-Damig had come up with twenty thousand men, and had fallen upon the idolaters by night, saying, By the virtue of Abraham the friend, I will not forsake my brother's son, but will play a brave man's part, and beat back the host of miscreants, and please the omnipotent king. So Sahim returned, and told his uncle's daring do to Garib, who cried out to his men, saying, Don your arms and mount your steeds, 
and let us succor my father's brother. So they took horse and fell upon the infidels, and put them to the edge of the sharp sword. By the morning they had killed nigh fifty thousand of the kafirs, and made other thirty thousand prisoners, and the rest of Ajib's army dispersed over the length and breadth of earth. Then the Moslems returned in victory and triumph, and Garib rode out to meet his uncle, whom he saluted and thanked for his help. Quoth al-Damig, I wonder if that dog Ajib fell in this day's affair. Quoth Garib, O uncle, be of good cheer, and keep thine eyes cool and clear. Know that he is with me in chains. When al-Damig heard this, he rejoiced with exceeding joy, and the two kings dismounted and entered the pavilion, but found no Ajib there, whereupon Garib exclaimed, O glory of Abraham, the friend, with whom be peace, adding, Alas, what an ill end is this to a glorious day! And he cried out to the tent pitchers, saying, Woe to you! Where is my enemy who oweth me so much? Quoth they, When thou mountedst, and we went with thee, thou didst not bid us guard him. And Garib exclaimed, there is no majesty, and there is no might, save in Allah, the glorious, the great. But al-Damig said to him, Hasten not, nor be concerned, for where can he go, and we in pursuit of him? Now the manner of Ajib's escape was in this wise. His page, Sayar, had been ambushed in the camp, and when he saw Garib mount and ride forth, leaving none to guard his enemy ajib he could hardly credit his eyes so he waited a while and presently crept to the tent and taking ajib who was senseless for the pain of the bastinado on his back made off with him into the open country and fared on at the top of his speed from early night to the next day till he came to a spring of water under an apple tree there he set down Ajib from his back, and washed his face, whereupon he opened his eyes, and seeing Sayar, said to him, O oh, Sayar, carry me to Kufa, that I may recover there, and levy horsemen and soldiers wherewith to overthrow my foe, and know, O oh, Sayar, that I am unhungered. So Sayar sprang up, and going out to the desert, caught an ostrich poult, and brought it to his lord. Then he gathered fuel, and deftly, using the fire-sticks, kindled a fire, by which he roasted the bird which he had halaled, and fed Ajib with its flesh, and gave him to drink of the water of the spring, till his strength returned to hits, after which he went to one of the Badawi tribal encampments, and stealing thence a steed, mounted Ajib upon it, and journeyed on with him for many days, till they drew near the city of Kufa. The viceroy of the capital came out to meet and salute the king, whom he found weak with the beating his brother had inflicted upon him, and Ajib entered the city and called his physicians. When they answered his summons, he bade them heal him in less than ten days' time. They said, we hear, and we obey. And they tended him till he became whole of the sickness that was upon him, and of the punishment. Then he commanded his wazirs to write letters to all his nabobs and vassals, and he indicted one and twenty writs, and dispatched them to the governors, who assembled their troops, and set out for Kufa by forced marches. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and forty-first night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Ajib sent orders to assemble the troops, who marched forthright to Kufa. Meanwhile, Garib, being troubled for Ajib's escape, dispatched in quest of him a thousand braves, 
who dispersed on all sides, and sought him a day and a night, but found no trace of him. So they returned, and told Garib, who called for his brother Sahim, but found him not, whereat he was sore concerned, fearing for him from the shifts of fortune. And lo, Sahim entered, and kissed ground before Garib, who rose when he saw him, and asked, where hast thou been, O Sahim? He answered, O king, I have been to Kufa, and there I find that the dog Ajib hath made his way to his capital, and is healed of his hurts. Ek, he hath written letters to his vassals, and sent them to his nabobs, who have brought him troops. When Garib heard this, he gave the command to march, so they struck tents and fared for Kufa. When they came in sight of the city, they found it compassed about with a host like the surging main, having neither beginning nor end. So Garib with his troops encamped in face of the Kafirs and set up his standards, and darkness fell down upon the two hosts, whereupon they lighted campfires and kept watch till daybreak. Then King Garib rose and making the wuzu ablution, prayed a two-bow prayer according to the right of our father, Abraham the friend, on whom be the peace, after which he commanded the battle-drums to sound the point of war. Accordingly the kettle-drums beat to combat, and the standards fluttered, whilst the fighting men armor donned, and their horses mounted, and themselves displayed, and to plain fared, now the first to open the gate of war was King al-Damig, who urged his charger between the two opposing armies, and displayed himself, and played with the swords and the spears, till both hosts were confounded, and at him marvelled, after which he cried out, saying, Who is for jousting? Let no sluggard come out to me, nor weakling, for I am al-Damig, the king, brother of Kundamir the king. Then there rushed forth a horseman of the Kafirs, as he were a flame of fire, and crave at al-Damig, without word said. But the king received him with a lance thrust in the breast, so dour that the point issued from between his shoulders, and Allah hurried his soul to the fire, the abiding place dire. Then came forth a second he slew, and a third he slew likewise, and they ceased not to come out to him, and he to slay them, till he had made an end of six and seventy fighting men. Hereupon the miscreants and men of might hung back, and would not encounter him. But Ajib cried out to his men, and said, Fie on you, O folk! If ye all go forth to him one by one, he will not leave any of you sitting or standing. Charge on him all at once, and cleanse of them our earthly wone, and strew their heads for your horses' hoofs like a plain of stone. So they waved the yew-striking flag, and host was heaped upon host. Blood rained in streams upon earth, and railed, and the judge of battle ruled, in whose ordinance is no upright. The fearless stood firm on feet in the stead of fight, whilst the faint heart gave back and took to flight, thinking the day would never come to an end, nor the curtains of gloom would be drawn by the hand of night. And they ceased not to battle with swords and to smite, till light darkened and murk starkened. Then the kettle-drums of the infidels beat the retreat, but Garib, refusing to stay his arms, crave at the Painimri, and the believers in unity, the Moslems, followed him. How many heads and hands they shore! How many necks and sinews they tore! How many knees and spines they mashed! And how many grown men and youths they to death bashed! With the first gleam of morning gray, the infidels broke and fled away in disorder and disarray, and the Moslems followed them till middle day, and took over twenty thousand of them, 
whom they brought to their tents in bonds to stay. Then Gharib sat down before the gate of Kufa, and commanded a herald to proclaim pardon and protection for every white who should leave the worship to idols dight, and profess the unity of his all might, the creator of mankind, and of light and night. So was made proclamation, as he bade in the streets of Kufa, and all that were therein embraced the true faith, great and small. Then they issued forth in a body, and renewed their Islam before King Garib, who rejoiced in them with exceeding joy, and his breast broadened, and he threw off all annoy. Presently he inquired of Mardas and his daughter, Madia, and being told that he had taken up his abode behind the red mountain, he called Sahim, and said to him, Find out for me what has become of thy father. Sahim mounted steed without stay or delay, and set his berry brown spear in rest, and fared on in quest till he reached the red mountain, where he sought for his father, yet found no trace of him nor of his tribe. However, he saw in their stead an elder of the Arabs, a very old man, broken with excess of years, and asked him of the folk, and whither they were gone. Replied he, O oh, my son, when Mardas heard of Garib's descent upon Kufa, he feared with great fear, and taking his daughter and his folk, set out with his handmaids and negroes into the wild and word, and I wot not whither he went. So Sahim, hearing the shaykh's words, returned to Garib and told him thereof, whereat he was greatly concerned. Then he sat down on his father's throne, and opening his treasuries, distributed largesse to each and every of his braves, and he took up his abode in Kufa, and sent out spies to get news of Ajib. He also summoned the grandees of the realm, who came and did him homage, as also did the citizens, and he bestowed on them sumptuous robes of honor, and commanded the riots to their care. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted stay. When it was the six hundred and forty-second night, she pursued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Garib, after giving robes of honor to the citizens of Kufa, and commending the riots to their care, went out on a day of the days to hunt with an hundred horse, and fared on till he came to a wadi, abounding in trees and fruits, and rich in rills and birds. It was a pasturing place for roes and gazelles, to the spirit a delight whose sense reposed from the languor of fight. They encamped in the valley, for the day was dear and bright, and there passed the night. On the morrow Garib made the wuzu ablution, and prayed the two-bow dawn prayer, offering up praise and thanks to Almighty Allah, when, lo and behold, there arose a clamor and confusion in the meadows, and he bade Sahim go see what was to do. So Sahim mounted forthright, and rode till he espied goods being plundered, and horses haltered, and women carried off, and children crying out. Whereupon he questioned one of the shepherds, saying, What be all this? And they replied, This is the harem of Mardas, chief of the Banu Katan, and his good, and that of his clan. For yesterday Jamrkan slew Mardas, and made prize of his women and children, and household stuff, and all the belonging of his tribe. It is his wont to go a-raiding, and to cut off highways, and waylay wayfarers, and he is a furious tyrant. Neither Arabs nor kings can prevail against him, and he is the scourge and curse of the country. Now when Sahim heard these news of his sire's slaughter, 
and the looting of his harem and property, he returned to Garib and told him the case, wherefore fire was added to his fire, and his spirit chafed to wipe out his shame and his blood wit to claim. So he rode with his men after the robbers till he overtook them and fell upon them, crying out and saying, Almighty Allah upon the rebel, the traitor, the infidel, and he slew in a single charge one and twenty fighting men. Then he halted in mid-field with no coward's heart, and cried out, Where is Jamr Khan? Let him come out to me, that I may make him quaff the cup of disgrace, and rid of him earth's face. Hardly had he made an end of speaking, when forth rushed Jamr Khan, as he were a calamity of calamities, or a piece of a mountain cased in steel. He was a mighty, huge Amalekite, and he crave at Garib without speech or salute, like the fierce tyrant he was, and he was armed with a mace of china steel, so heavy, so potent, that had he smitten a hill he had smashed it. Now when he charged, Garib met him like a hungry lion, and the brigand aimed a blow at his head with his mace. But he evaded it, and it smote the earth, and sank therein half a cubit deep. Then Garib took his battle-flail, and, smiting Jamr Khan on the wrist, crushed his fingers, and the mace dropped from his grasp. Whereupon Garib bent down from his seat in cell, and snatching it up, swiftlier than the blinding leaven, smote him therewith full on the flat of the ribs, and he fell to the earth like a long-stemmed palm-tree. So Sahim took him, and pinioning him, hailed him off with a rope, and Garib's horsemen fell on those of Jamr Khan, and slew fifty of them. The rest fled, nor did they cease flying till they reached their tribal camp, and raised their voices in clamour, whereupon all who were in the castle came out to meet them and asked the news. They told the tribe what had passed, and when they heard that their chief was a prisoner, they set out for the valley, vying one with other in their haste to deliver him. Now when King Garib had captured Jamr Khan, and had seen his braves take flight, he dismounted and called for Jamr Khan, who humbled himself before him, saying, I am under thy protection, O champion of the age. Replied Garib, O dog of the Arabs, dost thou cut the road for the servants of Almighty Allah, and fearest thou not the Lord of the worlds? O my master, asked Jamr Khan, and who is the Lord of the worlds? O dog, answered Garib, and what calamity dost thou worship? He said, O my lord, I worship a god made of dates, kneaded with butter and honey, and at times I eat him and make me another. When Garib heard this, he laughed till he fell backwards and said, O miserable, there is none worship worth save Almighty Allah, who created thee and created all things, and provideth all creatures with daily bread, from whom nothing is hid, and he over all things is omnipotent. Quoth Jamr Khan, And where is this great God that I may worship him? Quoth Garib, O fellow, know that this God's name is Allah, the God, and it is he who fashioned the heavens and the earth and guard the trees to grow, and the waters to flow. He created wild beasts and birds, and paradise and hell-fire, and veileth himself from all eyes seeing, and of none being seen. He, and he only, is the dweller on high. Extolled be his perfection. There is no god but he. When Jamr Khan heard these words, the ears of his heart were opened, his skin shuddered with horripilation, and he said, O my lord, 
what shall I say that I may become of you, and that this mighty Lord may accept of me? Replied Garib, Say, There is no God but the God, and Abraham the friend is the apostle of God. So he pronounced the profession of the faith, and was written of the people of Felicity. Then quoth Garib, Say me, Hast thou tasted the sweetness of Al-Islam? And quoth the other, Yes. Whereupon Garib cried, Loose his bonds. So they unbound him, and he kissed ground before Garib and his feet. Now, whilst this was going on, behold, they espied a great cloud of dust that towered till it walled the word. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section two. Section three of the book of a thousand nights and a night, volume seven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Yuka Gonzalez. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. When it was the six hundred and forty third night, she pursued, It hath reached me, auspicious king, that Jamarkan is Lamais and kissed the ground between the hands of Garib, and as you were thus, behold, a great cloud of just showered till it walled the world. And Garib said to Sahim, Go and see first what it be. So he went forth, like a bird in full flight, and presently returned, saying, O king of the age, this just is the Banu Amir, the comrades of Jamarkan. Whereupon quoth Garib to the new Moslem, Ride out to thy people, and offer to them al Islam. And they profess, they shall be saved, but, and they refuse, we will put them to the sword. Sir Jamarkan mounted, and driving steed towards his tribesmen, cried out to them, and they knew him, and dismounting, came out to him on foot, and said, Rejoice in thy safety, O Lord, said he. O folk, whoso obeyeth me shall be saved, but whoso gainsayeth me, I will cut him in twain with this scimitar. And they made answer, saying, Command us what thou wilt, for we will not oppose thy commandment, quoth he. Then say with me, There is no God, but the God of Abraham is the friend of God. They ask, O our Lord, whence hadst thou these words? And he told them what had befallen him with Garib, adding, O folk, know ye not that I am your chief in battle plain? and were men of cut and thrust of iron. And yet a man single-handed me to prisoner hath ta'en, and made me the cup of shame, and disgrace the drain. When they heard the speech, they spoke the word of unity, and Jamarkan led them to Garib, at whose hands they renewed their profession of all Islam, and wished him glory and victory, after they had kissed the earth before him. Garib rejoiced in them, and said to them, O folk, return to your people, and expand our Islam to them. But all replied, O our Lord, we will never leave thee, whilst we will live, but we will go and fetch our families and return to thee. And Garib said, Go and join me at the city of Kufa. So Jamarkan and his comrades returned to the tribal camp, and offered our Islam to the women and children, who all to a soul embraced the true faith. After which he dismantled their boats, and struck the tents, and set out for Kufa, driving before them their steeds, camels, and sheep. During this time, Garib returned to Kufa, where the horsemen met him in state. He entered his palace, and sat down near Sire's frame, with his champions ranged on either hand. Then the spies came forward, and informed him that his brother Ajib had made his escape, and had taken refuge with Jalan bin Karkar. Lord of the city of Oman, and land of Al-Yaman. Whereupon Garib cried aloud to his host, O men, make you ready to march in three days. 
Then he expounded all his alarm to the thirty thousand men he had captured in the first affair, and exhorted them to profess and take service with him. Twenty thousand embraced the fate, but the rest refused, and he slew them. Then came forward Jamar Khan and his tribe and kissed the ground before Gharib, who bestowed on him a splendid robe of honour and made him captain of his vanguard, saying, O Jamar Khan, man for the chiefs of thy kith and kin and twenty thousand horse, and fare on before us to the land of Jalan bin Karkar. Hearkening and obedience, answered Jamar Khan, and, leaving the women and children of the tribe in Kufa, he set forward. Then Gari passed in review the harem of Mardas, and his eye lit upon Madia, who was among the women, wherewith he fell down fainting. They sprinkled rose water on his face, till he came to himself, when he embraced Madia and carried her into a sitting chamber, where he sat with her, and the twain lay together that night without fornication. The next morning he went out, and sitting down on the throne of his kingship, robed his uncle al Damik with a robe of honour, and appointed him his viceroy over all al Iraq, commending Madia to his care, till he should return from his expedition against Ajib, and, when the order was accepted, he set out for the land of al Yaman and the city of Amman, with twenty thousand horse and ten thousand foot. Now, when Ajib and his defeated army drew in sight of Amman, King Jalan saw the dust of the approach and sent to find out its meaning. Scouts, who returned and said, Verily, this is the dust of one hides Ajib, lord of al Iraq. And Jalan wondered at his coming to his country, and when he assured of his tidings, he said to his officers, Fare ye forth and meet him. So they went out and met him, and pitched tents for him at the city gate, and Ajib entered in to Jalan weeping eyed and heavy hearted now jalan's wife was the daughter of ajib's paternal uncle and he had children by her so when he saw his kinsman in this plight he asked for the truth of what ailed him and ajib told him all that had befallen him first and last from his brother and said o king gary bitter to folk worship the lord of the heavens and forbidder them from the service of simulacris and other of the gods when Jalan heard of these words, he raged and revolted and said, By the virtue of the sun, lord of life and light, I will not leave one of thy brother's folk in existence. But where did thou quit them, and how many men are they? answered Ajib. I left them in Kufa, and they be fifty thousand horse. Whereupon Jalan called his wazir Jabamar, saying, Take these seventy thousand horse, and fare to Kufa, and bring me the Muslims alive, that I may torture them with all manners of tortures. So Jehovah departed with his host, and fared through the first day and the second, till the seventh day, when he came to a wadi abounding in trees and rills and fruits. Here he called a halt, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and forty-fourth night, she pursued, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Jalan set Jemamad with his army to Kufa, they came upon a wadi abounding in trees and rills, where a halt was called, and they rested till the middle of the night, when the wazir gave the signal for departure and mounting, rode dawn before them, till hard upon dawn. At which time he descended into a well wooded valley, whose flowers were fragrant, and whose birds warbled and boughs, as they swayed gracefully to and fro, and Satan blew into his sides, and puffed him up with pride, and he improvised with his couplets, and cried, I plunge with my braves into seething sea, seized a foe in my strength and my valiancy, in the doughtiest nights walk me well to be, Friend to friend and fierce foe to mine enemy, I will load Gamb with the captive's chains, Write soon and return in all joy and glee, For I have joined my mail and my weapons wheel, And on all sides charge the chivalry. Hardly had Jermalt made an end of his verses, When there came out upon him, From among the trees a horseman at treble mien, Covered and clad in steely sheen, Who cried out to him, saying, Stand, 
O riff of the Arabs, doth thy dress and grant thine arms gear and dismount thy destria, and be off with thy life. When Jermatt heard this, the light in his eyes became the darkest night, and he drew his sabre, and drove at Jamar Khan, for he was, saying, O thief of the Arabs, wilt thou cut the road for me, who am captain of the host of Jalan bin Karkar, and am come to bring Garib, and his men in bond? When Jamar Khan heard his words, he said, How cooling is this to my heart and liver? And he made the Jermatt versifying of these cutlets. And a noted knight in a field of fight, whose sabre and spare every foe of fright, Jamar Khan am I, to my foes affair, with a lance lunch known unto every knight, Garib is my lord, and I'm a pontiff, my prince, with the two hosts dash very lion of might, and imam of the fate, pious, striking all, on a plain where his face like the fawn take flight, whose voice bids folk to the fate of the friend, false, doubling idols, and God's despite. Now Jamar Khan had fared on, with this tribesmen ten days' journey from Kufa city, and called a halt on the eleventh day till midnight, when he ordered the march and rode on devancing them, till he descended into the valley aforesaid, and heard Jamar reciting his verses. So he craved at him, as the driving of a ravening lion, and smiting him with his sword, clave him in twain, and waited till his captains came up. When he told them what had passed, and said to them, Take each of you five thousand men and disperse round about the wadi, whilst I and the Banu Amir fall upon the enemy's van, shouting, Allah Akbar, God is most great. When ye hear my slogan, do ye charge them, crying like me upon the Lord, and smite them with the sword. We hear and we obey, answered they, and turning back to the braves, did his bidding and spread themselves about the side of the valley in the twilight forerun into dawn. Presently, lo and behold, up came the army of Al Yaman, like a flock of sheep, falling plain and steep, and Jamal Khan and Banu Amir fell upon them, shouting, Allah Akbar, till all heard it, Muslims and miscreants, whereupon the true believers ambushed in the valley answered from every side in the hills and mountains, responsive cried, and all things replied, green and dried, saying, God is most great. Aidance and victory to us from on high. Shame to the miscreants, who his name deny. And the kafirs were confounded, and smote one another with sabres keen, whilst the true believers and pious fell upon them, like flames of fiery sheen, and naught was seen, but heads flying, and blood jetting, and faint hearts hying. By the time they could see one another's faces, two thirds of the infidels had perished, and Allah hastened their souls to the fire, an abiding place dire. The rest of them fled, and to the desert, sped whilst the Muslims pursued them, to slay and take captives, till middle day. When they returned in triumph, with seven thousand prisoners, and that six and twenty thousand of the infidels escaped, and the most of them wounded. Then the Muslims collected their horses and arms, the loads and tents of the enemy, and dispatched them to Kufa with an escort of a thousand horse. And Shahrazad perceived at dawn of day, and ceased saying a permitted say. When it was the six hundred and forty-fifth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Jamar Khan, in his battle with Jawamad, slew him and slew his men, and, after taking many prisoners and much money, and many horses and loads, sent them with an escort of a thousand riders to Kafir city. Then he and the army of al-Islam dismounted and expounded the saving fate to the prisoners, who made profession with heart and tongue, whereupon they released them from bonds, and embraced them and rejoiced in them. Then Jamal Khan made his troops, who had swelled to a mighty many, Rest a day and a night, and march of the dawn, intending to attack Jalan bin Karkar, in the city of Amman, whilst a thousand horse fed back to Kufa, with a loot. When they reached the city, they went into King Garib, and told him what had passed. Whereat he rejoiced and gave them joy, and turning to the goal of the mountain, said, Take horse at twenty thousand, and follow Jamal Khan. So Sa'adan, 
and his sons mounted and set out amid twenty thousand horse for Oman. Meanwhile, the fugitives of the defeated Kafirs reached Oman and went into Jalan, weeping and crying, Woe! and Run! where he was confounded and said to them, What calamity had befallen you? So they told him what had happened, and he said, Woe to you! How many men were they? They replied, O king, there were twenty standards, under each a thousand men. When Jalan heard his words, he said, May the sun pour no blessing on you, fear upon you. What shall twenty thousand overcome you, and you seventy thousand horse in Jawamad able to withstand three thousand field to fight? Then, in the excess of his rage and mortification, he bared his blade and cried out of those who were present, saying, Fall on them! So the courtiers drew their swords upon the fugitives, and annihilated them to the last man, and cast him to the dogs. Then Jalan cried out to his son, saying, Take an hundred thousand horse and go to Al Iraq, and lay it waste altogether. Now this son's name was Kujaran, and there were no daughter and knights in all the force, for he could charge single handed three thousand riders. So he and his host made haste to equip themselves and march in a battle array, rank following rank, with the prince at the head, glorifying in himself and improvising his couplets. I'm Al Kurajan, and my name is known to be all who in war or in city won. How many soldier my soul at will, struck down like a cow on a ground bestrown? How many a soldier are forced to fly, and have rolled their heads as a ball is thrown? Now I'll drive and harry the land, Iraq, and like rain I'll shower the blood of foam, and lay hands on Ghanib and his men, whose doom to the wise a warning shall soon be shown. The host fared on twelve days' journey, and, while they were still marching, behold, a great dust cloud arose before them, and wore the horizon, and the whole region. So Kurajan sent out scouts, saying, Go forward and bring me tidings of what he meaneth this just. They went till they passed under the enemy's standards, and presently returning, said, O king, verily this is the dust of the Moslems. Whereat he was glad, and said, Did ye count them? And they answered, We counted the colours, and they numbered twenty, quoth he. By my faith, I will not send one man at arms against them, but will go forth of them alone by myself, and strew their heads under the horses' hooves. Now this was the army of Jamakan, who, spying the hosts of the Kafirs, and seeing them as a surging sea, called a halt. So his troops pitched the tent and set up the standards, calling upon the name of the all-wise one the creator of lights and gloom, lord of all creatures, who seeth while him none see, the high to infinity, extolled and exalted be he, there is no goal but he. The miscreants also halted and pitched the tents, and Kurajan said to them, Keep on your arms, and in armor sleep, for during the last watch of the night we will mount and trample yonder handful and defeat. Now one of Jamal Khan's spies was standing nigh, and heard what Kurajan had contrived. So he returned to the host, and told his chief, who said to them, Arm yourselves, and as soon as it is night, bring me all the mules and camels, and hang all the bells and clinkets and rattles ye have about the necks. Now they had with them more than twenty thousand camels and mules, so they waited till the infidels fell asleep. When Jamal Khan commanded them to mount, and they rose to ride, and on the lord of the wells they rely. Then said Jamal Khan, Drive the camels and mules to the miscreants' camp, and push them with your spears for goats. They did as he bade, and the beasts rushed up upon the enemy's tents, whilst the bells and clinkets and rattles jangled, and the Muslims followed at the hills, shouting, God is most great, till all the hills and mountains resounded, with the name of the highmost deity, to him belong glory and majesty. The cattle, hearing this terrible din, took fright and rushed upon the tents and trembled the folk as he lay asleep. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section three. Recording by April Gonzalez in Cavita, Philippines.
Section four of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume seven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume seven, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section four. When it was the six hundred and forty-sixth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Jamrakan fell upon them with his men and steeds and camels, and the camp lay sleeping, the idolaters started up in confusion, and, snatching up their arms, fell upon one another with smiting, till the most part was slaughtered. And when the day broke, they looked and found no Muslim slain but saw them all on horseback, armed and armoured, wherefore they knew that this was a slight which had been played upon them. And Karujan cried out to the remnant of his folk, O sons of whores, what we had a mind to do with them, that have done with us, and their craft hath gotten the better of our cunning. And they were about to charge, when, lo and behold, a cloud of dust rose high and walled the horizon sky, when the wind smote it, so that it spired aloft and spread pavilion-wise in the lift, and there it hung, and presently appeared beneath it the glint of helmet and gleam of hauberk, and splendid warriors, baldricked with their tempered swords and holding in rest their supple spears. When the Kafirs saw this, they held back from the battle, and each army sent out, to know the meaning of this dust, scouts who returned with the news that it was an army of Muslims. Now this was the host of the mountain ghoul, whom Garib had dispatched to Jamrkan's aid, and Sadan himself rode in their van. So the two hosts of the true believers joined company, and rushing upon the Painimri, like a flame of fire, plied them with keen sword, and Rudinian spear, and quivering lance, what while day was darkened, and eyes for the much dust starkened. The valiant stood fast, and the faint-hearted coward fled, and to the wilds, and the words swift sped, whilst the blood over earth was like torrent shed. Nor did they cease from flight, till the day took flight, and in gloom came the night. Then the Muslims drew apart from the miscreants, and returned to their tents, where they ate and slept, till the darkness fled away, and gave place to smiling day. Then they prayed the dawn prayer, and mounted to battle. Now Kurajan had said to his men, as they drew off from fight, for indeed two-thirds of their number had perished by sword and spear, O folk, to-morrow I will champion it in the stead of war, where cut and thrust draw, and where braves push and wheel, I will take the field. So, as soon as light was seen, and morn appeared with its shine and sheen, took horse the hosts twain and shouted their slogans amain, and bared the brown and hent lace in hand, and in ranks took stand. The first to open the door of war was Kurajan, who cried out, saying, Let no coward come out to me this day, nor craven. Whereupon Jamukan and Sadan stood by the colours, but there ran at him a captain in the Banu Amir, and the two crave each other a while, like two rams butting. Presently, Kurajan seized the Muslim by the jerkin under his hauberk, and, dragging him from his saddle, dashed him to the ground where he left him, upon which the Kafirs laid hands on him, and bound him, and bore him off to their tents, whilst Kurajan wheeled about and careered and offered battle, till another captain came out, whom also he took prisoner. Nor did he leave to do thus till he had made prize of seven captains before midday. Then Jamakan cried out with so mighty a cry that the whole field made reply and heard it the armies twain, and ran at Kurajan with a heart in rageful pain, improvising these couplets. Jamakan am I, and a man of might, whom the warriors fear with a sore affright. I waste the forts and I leave the walls to wail and weep for the whites I smite. Then, O Kurajan, tread the rightful road, and quit the paths of thy foul upright. 
own the one true God who disped the skies and made founts to flow and the hills peg tight and the slave embrace the true faith he'll scape hell pains and in heaven be dex and dight when kurajan heard these words he sparked and snorted and foully abused the sun and the moon and crave at jamakan versifying with these couplets i'm kurajan of this age the night and my shade to the lions of shara is blight i storm the forts and snare kings of beasts and warriors fear me in field of fight then hark ye jamrakan if thou doubt my word come forth to the combat and try my might when jamrakan heard these verses he charged him with a stout heart and they smote at each other with swords till the two hosts lamented for them and they lunged with lance and great was the clamour between them nor did they leave fighting till the time of mid-afternoon prayer was past and the day began to wane then jamrkan craved at kurajan and smiting him on the breast with his mace cast him to the ground as he were the trunk of a palm tree and the muslims pinioned him and dragged him off with ropes like a camel now when the miscreants saw their prince captive a hot fever fit of ignorance seized on them and they bore down upon the true believers thinking to rescue him but the muslim champions met them and left most of them prostrate on the earth whilst the rest turned and sought safety in flight seeking surer sight while the clanking sabres their backsides smite the muslims ceased not pursuing them till they had scattered them over mount and word when they returned from them to the spoil whereof was great store of horses and tents and so forth good look to it for a spoil then Jamakan went to Kurajan and expounded to him al-Islam, threatening him with death unless he embraced the faith. But he refused, so they cut off his head and stuck it on a spear, after which they fared on towards Oman city. But as regards the Kafirs, the survivors returned to Jayland and made known to him the slaying of his son and the slaughter of his host, hearing which he cast his crown to the ground and buffeting his face, till the blood ran from his nostrils fell fainting to the floor they sprinkled rose water on his head till he came to himself and cried to his wazir write letters to all my governors and nabobs and bid them leave not a smiter with the sword nor a lunger with the lance nor a bender of the bow but bring them all to me in one body so he wrote letters and dispatched them by runners to the governors who levied their power and joined the king with a prevailing host whose number was one hundred and eighty thousand men then they made ready tents and camels and noble steeds and were about to march when behold up came jamrkan and sadan the ghul with seventy thousand horse as they were lions fierce-faced all steel encased when jalan saw the muslims trooping on he rejoiced and said by the virtue of the sun and her resplendent light i will not leave alive one of my foes no not one to carry the news and i will lay waste the land of al iraq that i may take my wreak for my son the havoc making champion bold nor shall my fire be quenched or cooled then he turned to ajib and said to him o dog of al iraq twas thou broughtest this calamity on us but by the virtue of that which i worship except i avenge me of mine enemy i will do thee die after foulest fashion when ajib heard these words he was troubled with sore trouble and blamed himself but he waited till nightfall when the muslims had pitched their tents for rest now he had been degraded and expelled the royal camp together with those who were left to him of his suite so he said to them o my kinsmen know that jayland and i are dismayed with exceeding dismay at the coming of the muslims and i know that he will not avail to protect me from my brother nor from any other so it is my counsel that we make our escape whilst all eyes sleep and flee to king ya'arub bin Katan, for that he hath more of men and is stronger of rain they hearing his advice exclaimed write as i read whereupon he bade them kindle fires at their tent doors and march under cover of the night they did his bidding and set out so by daybreak they had already fared far away 
As soon as it was morning, Jaland mounted with two hundred and sixty thousand fighting men, clad cap a pied in hauberks and cuirasses, and straight knit mail coats. The kettle drums beat a point of war, and all drew out for cut and thrust, and fight and fray. Then Jamrkan and Sadan rode out with forty thousand stalwart fighting men, under each standard a thousand cavaliers, doughty champions, foremost in Champagne. The two hosts drew out in battles and bared their blades and levelled their limber lances for the drinking of the cup of death. The first to open the gate of strife was Sadan, as he were a mountain of cyanite or a maride of the jinn. Then dashed out to him a champion of the infidels, and the ghoul slew him and casting him to the earth cried out to his sons and slaves, saying, Light the fire and roast me this dead one. They did as he bade, and brought him the roast, and he ate it, and crunched while the Kafirs stood looking on from afar, and they cried out, O oh, for aid from the light-giving sun, and were affrighted at the thought of being slain by Sadan. Then Jaland shouted to his men, saying, Slay me yonder loathsome beast, whereupon another captain of his host drove at the ghoul. But he slew him, and he ceased not to slay horsemen after horsemen, till he had made an end of thirty men. With this the blamed Kafirs held back and feared to face him, crying, Who shall cope with jinns and ghouls? But Jaland raised his voice, saying, Let a hundred horse charge him, and bring him to me, bound or slain. So a hundred horse set upon Sadan, with swords and spears, and he met them with a heart firmer than flint, proclaiming the unity of the requiting king, whom no one thing diverted from another thing. Then he cried aloud, Allahu Akbar, and, smiting them with his sword, made their heads fly, and in one onset he slew of them four and seventy, whereupon the rest took flight. So Jalan shouted aloud to ten of his captains, each commanding a thousand men, and said to them, Shoot his horse with arrows till it fall under him, and then lay hands on him. Therewith ten thousand horse drove at Sadan, who met them with a stout heart, and Jamrkan, seeing this, bore down upon the miscreants with his Muslims, crying out, God is most great. Before they could reach the ghoul, the enemy had slain his steed and taken him prisoner. But they ceased not to charge the infidels, till the day grew dark for dust and eyes were blinded, and the sharp sword clanged while firm stood the valiant cavalier, and destruction overtook the faint heart in his fear. Till the Muslims were amongst the Paynims like a white patch on a black's bull, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and forty seventh night, she pursued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that battle raged between the Muslims and the Paynims till the true believers were like a white patch on a black bull. Nor did they stint from the melee till the darkness fell down, when they drew apart, after there had been slain of the infidels men without compte. Then Jamrkan and his men returned to their tents, but they were in great grief for Sadan, so that neither meat nor sleep was sweet to them, and they counted their host and found that less than a thousand had been slain. But Jamrkan said, O folk, to-morrow I will go into the battle plain, and place where cut and thrust obtain, and slay their champions, and make prize of their families, after taking them captive, and I will ransom Sadan therewith by the leave of the requiting king, whom no one thing diverteth from other thing. Wherefore their hearts were heartened, and they joyed as they separated to their tents. Meanwhile, Jaland entered his pavilion, and setting down on his sofa with his folk about him, called for Sadan, and forthright on his coming said to him, O dog run wood and least of the Arab brood and carrier of firewood, who was it slew my son Kurajan? the brave of the age, slayer of heroes, and caster down of warriors. Quoth the ghoul, Jamrkan slew him, captain of the armies of King Garib, prince of cavaliers, and I roasted and ate him, for I was unhungered. When Jaland heard these words, his eyes sank into his head for rage, and he bade his sword-bearer smite Sedan's neck. So he came forward in that intent, whereupon Sedan stretched himself mightily, and bursting his bonds, snatched the sword from the headsman, and hewed off his head. Then he made at Jaland, 
who threw himself down from the throne and fled while sadan fell on the bystanders and killed twenty of the king's chief officers and all the rest took flight therewith loud rose the crying in the camp of the infidels and the ghoul sallied forth of the pavilion and falling upon the troops smote them with the sword right and left till they opened and left a lane for him to pass nor did he cease to press forward cutting at them on either side till he won free of the miscreants tents and made for the muslim camp now these had heard the uproar among the enemies and said haply some calamity have befallen them and whilst they were in perplexity behold sedan stood amongst them and they rejoiced at his coming with exceeding joy more especially jamrkan who saluted him with the salam as did other true believers and gave him joy of his escape such was the case with the muslims but as regards the miscreants when after the ghouls departure they and their king returned to their tents jalan said to them o folk by the virtue of the sun's light giving ray and by the darkness of the night and the light of the day and the stars that stray i thought not this day to have escaped death in melee for had i fallen into yonder fellow's hands he had eaten me as i were a kernel of wheat or a barley corn or any other grain they replied o king never saw we any do the like of this ghoul and he said o folk to-morrow do ye all don arms and mount steed and trample them under your horses hoofs meanwhile the muslims had ended their rejoicings at sadan's return and jamrkan said to them to-morrow i will show you my daring do and what behoveth the like of me for by the virtue of abraham the friend i will slay them with the foulest of slaughters and smite them with the bite of the sword till all who have understanding confounded at them shall stand but i mean to attack both right and left wings so when you see me drive at the king under the standards do ye charge behind me with a resolute charge and allah's it is to decree what thing shall be accordingly these two sides lay upon their arms till the day broke through night and the sun appeared to sight then they mounted swiftlier than the twinkling of the eyelid the raven of the wold croaked and the two hosts looking each at other with the eye of fascination formed in line array and prepared for fight and fray the first to open the chapter of war was jamrkan who wheeled and careered and offered fight in field and jaland and his men were about to charge when behold a cloud of dust uprolled till it walled the wold and overlaid the day then the four winds smote it and away it floated torn to rags and there appeared beneath it cavaliers with helms black and garb white and many a princely knight and lances that bite and swords that smite and footmen who lion-like knew no affright seeing this both armies left fighting and sent out scouts to reconnoitre and report who thus had come in main and might so they went and within the dust cloud disappeared from sight and returned after a while with the news aright that the approaching host was one of the muslims under the command of king garib when the true believers heard from the scouts of the coming of the king they rejoiced and driving out to meet him dismounted and kissed the earth between his hands and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the six hundred and forty-eighth night she pursued it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the muslims saw the presence of their king garib they joyed with exceeding joy and kissing the earth between his hands saluted him and get around him whilst he welcomed them and rejoiced in their safety then they escorted him to their camp and pitched pavilions for him and set up standards and garib sat down on his couch of estate with his grandees about him and they related to him all that had befallen especially to saddam meanwhile the kafirs sought for ajib and finding him not among them nor in their tents told jaland of his flight whereat his doomsday rose and he bit his fingers saying by the sun's light giving round he is a perfidious hound and has fled with his rascal rout to desert ground but naught save force of hard fighting will serve us to repeal these foes so fortify your resolves and hearten your heart 
and beware of the Muslims. And Garib also said to the true believers, Strengthen your courage and fortify your hearts, and seek aid of your Lord, beseeching him to vouchsafe you in victory over your enemies. They replied, O king, thou shalt see what we will do in battle plain, where men cut and thrust amain. So the two hosts slept, till the day arose with its sheen, and shone, and the rising sun rained light upon hill and down, when Garib prayed the two-bow prayer, after the right of Abraham the friend, on whom be the peace, and wrote a letter, which he dispatched by his brother Sahim, to the king of the Kafirs. When Sahim reached the enemy's camp, the guards asked him what he wanted, and he answered them, I want your ruler, quoth they, wait till we consult him, and then thee. And he waited, whilst they went to their sovereign, and told him of the coming of a messenger, and he cried, Hither with him to me. So they brought Sahim before Jaland, who said to him, Who hath sent thee? Quoth he, King Garib sends me whom Allah hath made ruler over Arab and Ajam. Receive his letter and return its reply. Jalan took the writ and, opening it, read as follows. In the name of Allah, the compassionating and compassionate, the one, the all-knowing, the supremely great, the immemorial, the lord of Noah and Saleh, and Hud, and Abraham, and of all things he made, the peace be on him who followeth in the way of righteousness, and feareth the issues of forwardness, who obeyeth the Almighty King, and followeth the faith, saving and prefereth the next world to any present king. But afterwards, O Jaland, none is worthy of worship save Allah alone, the victorious, the one, creator of night and day, and the sphere revolving alway, who sendeth the holy prophets, and gareth the streams to flow, and the trees to grow, who vaulted the heavens, and spread out the earth like a carpet below, who feedeth the birds in the nests, and the wild beasts in the deserts. For he is Allah, the all-powerful, the forgiving, the long-suffering, the protector, whom I comprehendeth on no wise, and who maketh night on day arise. He who sent down the apostles and their holy writ, know, O Jaland, that there is no faith but the faith of Abraham the friend, so cleave to the creed of salvation, and be saved from the biting glaive, and the fire which followeth the grave. But, and thou refuse al-Islam, look for ruin to haste, and thy reign to be waste, and thy traces untraced. And lastly, send me the dog Ajib, hide that I may take from him my father's and mother's blood wit. When Jaland had read this letter, he said to Sahim, Tell thy lord that Ajib hath fled, he and his folk, and I know not whither he is gone. But as for Jaland, he will not forswear his faith, and to-morrow there shall be battle between us, and the sun shall give us the victory. So Sahim returned to his brother with this reply, and when the morning morrowed, the Muslims donned their arms and armour, and bestrode their stout steeds, calling aloud on the name of the all-conquering king, creator of bodies and souls, and magnifying him with Allahu Akbar. Then the kettle drums of battle beat until the earth trembled, and sought the field all the lordly warriors and doughty champions. The first to open the gate of battle was Jamakan, who craved his charger into mid-plain, and played with sword and javelin, till the understanding was amazed. After which he cried out, saying, Ho, who is for tilting? Ho, who is for fighting? Let no sluggard come out to me to-day, nor weakling. I am the slayer of Kurajan bin Jaland. Who will come forth to avenge him? When Jaland heard the name of his son, he cried out to his men, O horse sons, bring me yonder horseman who slew my son, that I may eat his flesh and drink his blood. So an hundred fighting men charged at Jamakan, but he slew the most part of them and put their chief to flight, which feat when Jalan saw, he cried out to his folk, At him all at once, and assault him with one assault. Accordingly they weaved the awe-striking banners, and host was heaped upon host. Garib rushed on with his men, and Jamakan did the same, and the two sides met like two seas together clashing. 
the Yamani sword and spear wrought havoc and breasts and bellies were rent, whilst both armies saw the angel of death face to face and the dust of the battle rose to the skirts of the sky. Ears went deaf and tongues went dumb and doom from every side came on whilst valiant stood fast and faint heart fled and they ceased not from fight and fray till ended the day. When the drums beat the retreat and the two hosts drew apart and returned, each to its tents. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section four. Section five of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume seven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pam Castillo. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume seven, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section five. When it was the six hundred and forty-ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when King Garib ended the battle, and the two hosts drew apart, and each had returned to his own tents, he sat down on the throne of his realm and the place of his reign, whilst his chief officers ranged themselves about him, and he said, I am sore concerned for the flight of the Kur Ajib, and I know not whither he has gone. Except I overtake him and take my wreck of him, I shall die of despite. Whereupon Sahim came forward, and kissing the earth before him, said, O king, I will go to the army of the Kafirs, and find out what is come of the perfidious dog Ajib. Quoth Garib, Go, and learn the truth anent the hog. So Sahim disguised himself in the habit of the infidels, and became as he were of them. Then making for the enemy's camp, he found them all asleep, drunken with war and battle, and none were on wake save only the guards. He passed on, and presently came to the king's pavilion, where he found King Jaland asleep unattended. So he crept up and made him smell and sniff up levigated bang, and he became as one dead. Then Sahim went out and took a male mule, and wrapping the king in the coverlet of his bed, laid him on its back, after which he threw a mat over him and led the beast to the Muslim camp. Now when he came to Garib's pavilion and would have entered, the guards knew him not and prevented him, saying, Who art thou? He laughed and uncovered his face, and they knew him and admitted him. When Garib saw him, he said, What bearest there, O Sahim? And he replied, O king, this is Jalan bin Karkar. Then he uncovered him, and Garib knew him and said, Arouse him, O Sahim. So he made him smell vinegar and frankincense, and he cast the bang from his nostrils, and opening his eyes, found himself among the Muslims, whereupon quoth he, What is this foul dream? And closing his eyelids again, would have slept. But Sahim dealt him a kick, saying, Open thine eyes, O accursed. So he opened them, and asked, Where am I? And Sahim answered, Thou art in the presence of King Garib bin Kundamir, king of Iraq. When Jaland heard this, he said, O king, I am under thy protection. Know that I am not at fault, but that who led us forth to fight thee was thy brother, and the same cast enmity between us, and then fled. Quoth Garib, Knowest thou whither he is gone? And quoth Jaland, no, by the light-giving sun, I know not whither. Then Garib bade him lay in bonds, and set guards over him, whilst each captain returned to his own tent, and Jamrkan went winding, said to his men, O sons of my uncle, I purpose this night to do a deed wherewith I may whiten my face with King Garib. Quoth they, Do as thou wilt, we hearken to thy commandment and obey it. 
quoth he, Arm yourselves, and muffling your steps while I go with you, let us fare softly and disperse about the infidel's camp, so that the very ants shall not beware of you. And when you hear me cry, Allahu Akbar, do ye the like, and cry out, saying, God is most great. And hold back, and make for the city gate, and we seek aid from the Most High. So the folk armed themselves cap a pie, and waited till the noon of night, when they dispersed about the enemy's camp, and tarried a while when, lo and behold, Jamrkan smote shield with sword, and shouted, Allahu Akbar! Thereupon they all cried out the like, till rang again valley and mountain, hills, sands, and ruins. The miscreants awoke in dismay, and fell one upon other, and the sword went round amongst them. The Muslims drew back and made for the city gates, where they slew the warders, and entering, made themselves masters of the town, with all that was therein of treasure and women. Thus it befell with Jamrkan, but as regards King Garib, hearing the noise and clamour of, God is most great, he mounted with his troops to the last man, and sent on in advance Sahim, who, when he came near the field of fight, saw that Jamrkan had fallen upon the Kafirs with the Banu Amir by night, and made them drink the cup of death. So he returned, and told all to his brother, who called down blessings on Jamrkan. And the infidels ceased not to smite one another with the biting sword, and expending their strength till the day rose and lighted up the land, when Garib cried out to his men, Charge, O ye noble, and do a deed to please the all-knowing king. So the true believers fell upon the idolaters, and plied upon every false hypocritical breast the keen sword and the quivering spear. They sought to take refuge in the city, but Jamrkan came forth upon them with his kinsmen, who hemmed them in between two mountain ranges, and slew an innumerable host of them, and the rest fled into the waste and words. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and fiftieth night, she continued, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the Muslim host charged upon their miscreants, they hewed them in pieces with the biting scimitar, and the rest fled to the waste and words. Nor did the Muslims cease pursuing them with the sword, till they had scattered them abroad in the plains and stony places. Then they returned to Oman city, and King Garib entered the palace of the king, and sitting down on the throne of his kingship, with his grandees and officers, ranged right and left, sent for Jaland. They brought him in haste, and Garib expounded to him al-Islam, but he rejected it. Wherefore Garib bade crucify him on the gate of the city, and they shot at him with shafts, till he was like unto a porcupine. Then Garib honorably robed Jamrkan, and said to him, Thou shalt be lord of this city, arid ruler thereof with power, to loose and to bind therein, for it was thou didst open it with thy sword and thy folk. And Jamrkan kissed the king's feet, thanked him, and wished him abiding victory and glory, and every blessing. Moreover, Garib opened Jalan's treasuries, and saw what was therein of coin, whereof he gave largesse to his captains and standard-bearers and fighting men, yea, even to the girls and children, and thus he lavished his gifts ten days long. After this, one night he dreamt a terrible dream and awoke, troubled and trembling. So he roused his brother Sahim and said to him, I saw in my vision that we were in a wide valley, when there pounced down on us two ravening birds of prey, never in my life saw I greater than they. Their legs were like lances, and as they swooped we were in sore fear of them. Replied Sahim, O king, this be some great enemy, so stand on thy guard against him. Garib slept not the rest of the night, and when the day broke he called for his courser, and mounted. Quoth Sahim, Whither goest thou, my brother? 
and quoth Garib, I awoke heavy at heart, so I mean to ride abroad ten days and broaden my breast. Said Sahim, Take with thee a thousand braves. But Garib replied, I will not go forth, but with thee and only thee. So the two brothers mounted, and seeking the dales and lisos, fared on from wadi to wadi, and from meadow to meadow, till they came to a valley abounding in streams and sweet-smelling flowers, and trees laden with all manner edible fruits, two of each kind. Birds warbled on the branches their various strains, the mockingbird trilled out her sweet notes fain, and the turtle filled with her voice the plain. There sang the nightingale, whose chant arouses the sleeper, and the merle with his note like the voice of man, and the cushat and the ring-dove, whilst the parrot with its eloquent tongue answered the twain. The valley pleased them, and they ate of its fruits and drank of its waters, after which they sat under the shadow of its trees till drowsiness overcame them, and they slept. Glory be to him who sleepeth not. As they lay asleep, lo, two fierce marids swooped down on them, and taking each one on his shoulders, towered with them high in air, till they were above the clouds. So Garib and Sahim awoke, and found themselves betwixt heaven and earth, whereupon they looked at those who bore them, and saw that they were two marids, the head of the one being as that of a dog, and the head of the other as that of an ape, with hair like horses' tails, and claws like lions' claws, and both were big as great palm-trees. When they espied this case, they exclaimed, there is no majesty, and there is no might, save in Allah, the glorious, the great. Now the cause of this was that a certain king of the kings of the jinn, Hiz Murash, had a son called Saik, who loved a damsel of the jinn named Najma. And the twain used to foregather in that wadi under the semblance of two birds. Garib and Sahim saw them thus, and deeming them birds, shot at them with shafts, but wounding only Saik, whose blood flowed. Najma mourned over him, then, fearing lest the like calamity befall herself, snatched up her lover and flew with him to his father's palace, where she cast him down at the gate. The warders bore him in, and laid him before his sire, who— seeing the pile sticking in his rib, exclaimed, Alas, my son, who hath done with thee this thing, that I may lay waste his abiding place, and hurry on his destruction, though he were the greatest of the kings of the jinn? Thereupon Saik opened his eyes, and said, O oh, my father, none slew me save a mortal in the valley of springs. Hardly had he made an end of these words, when his soul departed, whereupon his father buffeted his face till the blood streamed from his mouth, and cried out to two marids, saying, Hie ye to the valley of springs, and bring me all who are therein. So they betook themselves to the wadi in question, where they found Garib and Sahim asleep, and snatching them up carried them to King Muraash. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and fifty-first night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the two Marids, after snatching up Garib and Sahim in their sleep, carried them to Muraash, king of the Jinn, whom they saw seated on the throne of his kinship, as he were a huge mountain, with four heads on his body, the first that of a lion, the second that of an elephant, the third that of a panther, and the fourth that of a lynx. The Marids set them down before Murash and said to him, O king, these twain be they we found in the valley of springs. Thereupon he looked at them with wraithful eyes, and sparked and snorted, and shot sparks from his nostrils, 
so that all who stood by feared him. Then said he, O dogs of mankind, ye have slain my son, and lighted fire in my liver. Quoth Garib, Who is thy son, and who hath seen him? Quoth Murash, Were ye not in the valley of springs, and did ye not see my son there in the guise of a bird, and did ye not shoot at him with wooden bolts that he died? Replied Garib, I know not who slew him, and by the virtue of the great God, the one, the immemorial who knoweth things all, and of Abraham the friend, we saw no bird, neither slew we bird or beast. Now when Murash heard Garib swear by Allah and his greatness, and by Abraham the friend, he knew him for a Muslim, he himself being a worshipper of fire, not of the all-powerful sire. So he cried out to his folk, Bring me my goddess. Accordingly they brought a brazier of gold, and setting it before him, kindled therein fire, and cast on drugs, whereupon there arose therefrom green and blue and yellow flames, and the king and all who were present prostrated themselves before the brazier, whilst Garid and Sahim ceased not to attest the unity of Allah Almighty, to cry out, God is most great, and to bear witness to his omnipotence. Presently Murash raised his head, and seeing the two princes standing in lieu of falling down to worship, said to them, O oh, dogs, why do ye not prostrate yourselves? replied Garib. Out on you, O ye accursed! Prostration befitteth not man save to the worshipful king, who bringeth forth all creatures into beingness from nothingness, and maketh water to well from the barren rock well. Him who inclineth heart of sire unto newborn Sion, and who may not be described as sitting or standing, the God of Noah, and Sali, and Hud, and Abraham the friend, who created heaven and hell, and trees and fruit as well, for he is Allah the One, the All-Powerful. When Murash heard this, his eyes sank into his head, and he cried out to his guards, saying, Pinion me these two dogs, and sacrifice them to my goddess. So they bound them, and were about to cast them into the fire, when, behold, one of the crenels of the palace parapet fell down upon the brazier, and brake it, and put out the fire, which became ashes flying in air. Then quoth Garib, God is most great, he giveth aid and victory, and he forsaketh those who deny him, worshipping fire and not the Almighty King. Presently quoth Murash, Thou art a sorcerer, and hast bewitched my goddess, so that this thing hath befallen her. Garib replied, O oh, madman, and the fire had soul or sense, it would have warded off from self all that hurteth it. When Murash heard these words, he roared and bellowed and reviled the fire, saying, By my faith I will not kill you save by the fire. Then he bade cast them into jail, and calling an hundred merids, made them bring much fuel and set fire thereto. So they brought great plenty of wood, and made a huge blaze, which flamed up mightily till the morning, when Murash mounted an elephant, bearing on its back a throne of gold dubbed with jewels, and the tribes of the jinn gathered about him in their various kinds. Presently they brought in Garib and Sahim, who, seeing the flaming of the fire, sought help of the one and all-conquering Creator of night and day, Him of all might, whom no sight comprehendeth, but who comprehendeth all sights, for He is the subtle, the all-knowing. And they ceased not humbly beseeching Him, till, behold, a cloud arose from west to east, pouring down showers of rain, like the swollen sea, quenched the fire. When the king saw this, he was affrighted, he and his troops, and entered the palace, where he turned to the wazirs and grandees, and said to them, 
How say ye of these two men? They replied, O king, had they not been in the right, this thing had not befallen the fire. Wherefore we say that they be true men, which speak sooth. Rejoined Murash, Verily the truth hath been displayed to me, I and the manifest way, and I am certified that the worship of the fire is false, for were it goddess, it had warded off from itself the rain which quenched it, and the stone which broke its brazier and beat it into ashes. Wherefore I believe in him who created the fire and the light and the shade and the heat. And ye, what say ye? They answered, O king, we also hear and follow and obey. So the king called for Garib, and embraced him, and kissed him between the eyes, and then summoned Sahim, whereupon the bystanders all crowded to kiss their hands and heads. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 5 Recording by Pam Castile Section 6 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pam Castile. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 6 When it was the six hundred and fifty-second night, she pursued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Miraash and his men found salvation in the saving faith al-Islam, he called for Garib and Sahim, and kissed them between the eyes, and so did all the grandees who crowded to bust their hands and heads. Then Murash sat down on the throne of his kingship, and seating Garib on his right, and Sahim on his left hand, said to them, O mortals, what shall we say, that we may become Muslims? Replied Garib, Say, There is no God but the God, and Abraham is the friend of God. So the king and his folk professed al-Islam with heart and tongue, and Garib abode with them a while, teaching them the ritual of prayer. But presently he called to mind his people and sighed, whereupon quoth Murash, Verily trouble is gone, and joy and gladness are come. Quoth Garib, O king, I have many foes, and I fear for my folk from them. Then he related to him his history with his brother Ajib from first to last, and the king of the jinns said, O king of men, I will send one who shall bring thee news of thy people, for I will not let thee go till I have had my fill of thy face. Then he called two doughty marids by name Kalajan and Kirajan, and after they had done him homage, he bade them repair to Al-Yaman, and bring him news of Garib's army. They replied, To hear is to obey, and departed. Thus far concerning the brothers, but as regards the Muslims, they arose in the morning, and led by their captains, rode to King Garib's palace to do their service to him. But the eunuchs told them that the king had mounted with his brother, and had ridden forth at peep o' day. So they made for the valleys and mountains, and followed the track of the princes, till they came to the valley of springs, where they found their arms cast down, and their two gallant steeds grazing, and said, The king is missing from this place, by the glory of Abraham the friend. Then they mounted and sought in the valley and the mountains three days, but found no trace of them. Whereupon they began the morning ceremonies, and sending for couriers said to them, 
do ye disperse yourselves about the cities and sconces and castles, and seek ye news of our king? Hearkening and obedience, cried the couriers, who dispersed hither and thither each over one of the seven climes, and sought everywhere for Garib, but found no trace of him. Now when the tidings came to Ajib by his spies, that his brother was lost, and there was no news of the missing, he rejoiced, and going in to King Ya'arub bin Katan, sought of him aid, which he granted, and gave him two hundred thousand Amalekites, wherewith he set out for Al-Yaman, and sat down before the city of Oman. Jamrakan and Sa'adan sallied forth and offered him battle, and there were slain of the Muslims much folk. So the true believers retired into the city, and shut the gates, and manned the walls. At this moment came up the two Marids, Kalajan and Kurajan, and seeing the Muslims beleaguered, waited till nightfall, when they fell upon the miscreants, and plied them with sharp swords of the swords of the jinn, each twelve cubits long. If a man smote therewith a rock, verily he would cleave it in sunder. They charged the idolaters, shouting, Allahu Akbar, God is most great. He giveth aid and victory, and forsaketh those who deny the faith of Abraham the friend. And whilst they raged amongst the foes, fire issued from their mouths and nostrils, and they made great slaughter amongst them. Thereupon the infidels ran out of their tents, offering battle, but seeing these strange things were confounded and their hair stood on end and their reason fled so they snatched up their arms and fell one upon other whilst the marids shore off their heads as a reaper eareth grain crying god is most great we are the lads of king garib the friend of murash king of the jinn the sword ceased not to go round amongst them till the night was half spent, when the misbelievers, imagining that the mountains were all ifrits, loaded their tents and treasure and baggage upon camels and made off, and the first to fly was Ajib. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and fifty-third night, she resumed, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the misbelievers made off, and the first to fly was Ajib. Thereupon the Muslims gathered together, marveling at this that had betided the infidels, and fearing the tribesmen of the jinn. But the Marids ceased not from pursuit, till they had driven them far away into the hills and woods. And but fifty thousand rebels of two hundred thousand escaped with their lives, and made for their own land, wounded and sore discomforted. Then the two jinns returned and said to them, O host of the Muslims, your lord King Garib and his brother Sahim salute you. They are the guests of Murash, king of the jinn, and will be with you anon. When Garib's men heard that he was safe and well, they joyed with exceeding joy, and said to the Marids, Allah gladden you twain with good news, O noble spirits. So Kirajan and Kalajan returned to Murash and Garib, and acquainted them with that which had happened. Whereat Garib, finding the two sitting together, felt heart at ease, and said, Allah abundantly requite you. Then quoth King Murash, O oh, my brother, I am minded to show thee our country, and the city of Japhet, son of Noah, on whom be peace. Quoth Garib, O oh, king, do what seemeth good to thee. So he called for three noble steeds, and mounting, he and Garib and Sahim set out with a thousand marids, as they were a piece of a mountain cloven lengthwise. 
they fared on, solacing themselves with the sight of valleys and mountains, till they came to Jabarsa, the city of Japhet, son of Noah, on whom be peace, where the townsfolk, all, great and small, came forth to meet King Murash, and brought them into the city in great state. Then Murash went up to the palace of Japhet, son of Noah, and sat down on the throne of his kingship, which was of alabaster, ten stages high, and latticed with wands of gold, wherefrom hung all manner colored silks. The people of the city stood before him, and he said to them, O seed of Yafis bin Nu, what did your fathers and grandfathers worship? They replied, We found them worshipping fire, and followed their example, as thou well knowest. O folk, rejoined Murash, we have been shown that the fire is but one of the creatures of Almighty Allah, creator of all things, and when we knew this we submitted ourselves to God, the One, the All-Powerful, Maker of night and day, and the sphere revolving alway whom comprehendeth no sight, but who comprehendeth all sights, for he is the subtle, the all-wise. So seek ye salvation, and ye shall be saved from the wrath of the Almighty One, and from the fiery doom in the world to come. And they embraced Al-Islam with heart and tongue. Then Murash took Garib by the hand, and showed him the palace, and its ordinance, and all the marvels it contained, till they came to the armory, wherein were the arms of Japhet son of Noah. Here Garib saw a sword hanging to a pin of gold, and asked, O king, whose is that? Murash answered, Tis the sword of Yafis bin Nu wherewith he was wont to do battle against men and jinn. The sage Jardum forged it and graved on its back names of might. It is named Al-Mahik, the Annihilator, for that it never descendeth upon a man, but it annihilateth him, nor upon a jinni, but it crusheth him, and if one smote therewith a mountain, twould overthrow it. When Garib heard tell of the virtues of the sword, he said, I desire to look on this blade. And Murash said, Do as thou wilt. So Garib put out his hand, and hending the sword, drew it from its sheath, whereupon it flashed, and death crept on its edge and glittered, and it was twelve spans long and three broad. Now Garib wished to become owner of it, and King Murash said, And thou canst smite with it, take it. Tis well, Garib replied, and took it up, and it was in his hand as a staff, wherefore all who were present, men and jinn, marveled and said, Well done, O prince of knights. Then said Murash, Lay thy hand on this hoard, for which the kings of the earth sigh in vain, and mount, that I may show thee the city. Then they took horse and rode forth the palace, with men and jinns attending them on foot. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and fifty-fourth night, she pursued, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Garib and King Murash rode forth the palace of Japhet, with men and jinns attending them on foot, they passed through the streets and thoroughfares of the town, by palaces and deserted mansions and gilded doorways, till they issued from the gates and entered gardens full of trees fruit-bearing, and waters welling, and birds speaking and celebrating the praises of him to whom belong majesty and eternity. Nor did they cease to solace themselves in the land till nightfall, when they returned to the palace of Japhet, son of Noah, and they brought them the table of food, so they ate, and Garib turned to the king of the jinn and said to him, 
O king, I would fain return to my folk and my force, for I know not their plight after me. Replied Murash, By Allah, O my brother, I will not part with thee for a full month till I have had my fill of thy sight. Now Garib could not say nay, so he abode with him in the city of Japhet, eating and drinking and making merry, till the month ended, when Murash gave him great store of gems and precious ores, emeralds and balas rubies, diamonds and other jewels, ingots of gold and silver, and likewise ambergis and musk and brocaded silks and else of rarities and things of price. Moreover, he clad him and Sahim in silken robes of honor, gold inwoven, and set on Garib's head a crown jeweled with pearls and diamonds of inestimable value. All these treasures he made up into even loads for him, and calling five hundred marids, said to them, Get ye ready to travel on the morrow, that we may bring King Garib and Sahim back to their own country. And they answered, We hear and we obey. So they passed the night in the city, purposing to depart on the morrow. But next morning, as they were about to set forth, behold, they espied a great host advancing upon the city, with horses neighing, and kettle-drums beating, and trumpets braying, and riders filling the earth, for they numbered threescore and ten thousand marids, flying and diving under a king called Barkhan. Now this Barkhan was lord of the city of Carnelian, and the castle of gold, and under his rule were five hill strongholds, in each five hundred thousand marids, and he and his tribe worshipped the fire, not the omnipotent sire. He was a cousin of Murash, the son of his father's brother, and the cause of his coming was that there had been among the subjects of King Murash a misbelieving Marid who professed al hypocritically, and he stole away from his people and made for the valley of Carnelian, where he went in to King Barkhan and kissing the earth before him, wished him abiding glory and prosperity. Then he told him of Mirash being converted to al-Islam, and Barkhan said, How came he to tear himself away from his faith? So the rebel told him what had passed, and when Barkhan heard it, he snorted and sparked and railed at sun and moon and sparkling fire, saying, by the virtue of my faith, I will surely slay mine uncle's son, and his people, and this mortal, nor will I leave one of them alive. Then he cried out to the legions of the jinn, and choosing of them seventy thousand marids, set out and fared on till he came to Jabarsa, the city of Japhet, and encamped before its gates. When Murash saw this, he dispatched a marid, saying, Go to this host, and learn all that it wanteth, and return hither in haste. So the messenger rushed away to Barkhan's camp, where the marids flocked to meet him, and said to him, Who art thou? Replied he, An envoy from King Murash, whereupon they carried him in to Barkhan before whom he prostrated himself, saying, O oh, my lord, my master hath sent me to thee, to learn tidings of thee. Quoth Barkhan, Return to thy lord, and say to him, This is thy cousin Barkhan, who is come to salute thee. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section six. Recording by Pam Castile. Section seven of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume seven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pam Castile. 
The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7, by Anonymous, translated by Richard Francis Burton, Section 7. When it was the six hundred and fifty-fifth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the married envoy of Murash was born before Barkan and said to him, O oh, my lord, my master hath sent me to thee to learn tidings of thee. Barkan replied, Return to thy lord and say to him, This is thy cousin Barkan, who is come to salute thee. So the messenger went back and told Murash, who said to Garib, Sit thou on thy throne, whilst I go and salute my cousin and return to thee. Then he mounted and rode to the camp of his uncle's son. Now this was a trick of Barkan, to bring Murash out and seize upon him, and he said to his marids, whom he had stationed about him, When ye see me embrace him, lay hold of him and pinion him. And they replied, To hear is to obey. So when King Murash came up and entered Barkan's pavilion, the owner rose to him and threw his arms round his neck, whereat the jinn fell upon Murash and pinioned him and chained him. Murash looked at Barkan and said, What manner of thing is this? Quoth Barkan, O dog of the jinn, wilt thou leave the faith of thy fathers and grandfathers, and enter a faith thou knowest not? Rejoined Murash, O son of my uncle, indeed I have found the faith of Abraham the friend to be the true faith, and all other than it vain. Asked Barkan, And who told thee of this? And Murash answered, Garib, king of Iraq, whom I hold in the highest honor. By the right of the fire and the light and the shade and the heat, cried Barkan, I will assuredly slay both thee and him. And he cast him into jail. Now when Murash's henchman saw what had befallen his lord, he fled back to the city and told the king's legionnaires, who cried out and mounted. Quoth Garib, What is the matter? And they told him all that had passed, whereupon he cried out to Sahim, Saddle me one of the chargers that King Murash gave me. Said Sahim, O oh, my brother, wilt thou do battle with the jinn? Garib replied, Yes, I will fight them with the sword of Japhet, son of Noah, seeking help of the Lord of Abraham, the friend, on whom be the peace. For he is the Lord of all things and sole creator. So Sahim saddled him a sorrel horse of the horses of the jinn, as he were a castle strong among castles, and he armed and mounting, rode out with the legions of the jinn, Halbert Kappa P. Then Barkan and his host mounted also, and the two hosts drew out in lines facing each other. The first to open the gate of war was Scarib, who crave his steed into the midfield and barred the enchanted blade, whence issued a glittering light that dazzled the eyes of all the jinn and struck terror to their hearts. Then he played with the sword till their wits were wildered, and cried out, saying, Allahu Akbar, I am Garib, king of Iraq. There is no faith save the faith of Abraham the friend. Now when Barkan heard Garib's words, he said, This is he who seduced my cousin from his religion. So by the virtue of my faith, I will not sit down on my throne till I have decapitated this Garib and suppressed his breath of life and forced my cousin and his people back to their belief. And whoso balketh me, him will I destroy. Then he mounted an elephant paper white as he were a tower plastered with gypsum and goaded him with a spike of steel which ran deep into his flesh 
whereupon the elephant trumpeted and made for the battle plain where cut and thrust obtain and when he drew near garib he cried out to him saying o dog of mankind what made thee come into our land to debauch my cousin and his folk and pervert them from one faith to other faith know that this day is the last of thy worldly days garib replied avaunt o vilest of the jinn therewith barkan drew a javelin and making it quiver in his hand cast it at garib but it missed him so he hurled a second javelin at him but garib caught it in mid-air and after poising it launched it at the elephant it smote him on the flank and came out on the other side whereupon the beast fell to the earth dead and barkan was thrown to the ground like a great palm tree before he could stir garib smote him with the flat of japhet's blade on the nape of the neck and he fell upon the earth in a fainting fit whereupon the marids swooped down on him and surrounding him pinioned his elbows when barkan's people saw their king a prisoner they drove at the others seeking to rescue him but garib and the islamized jinn fell upon them and gloriously done for garib indeed that day he pleased the lord who answereth prayer and slaked his vengeance with the talisman's sword whomsoever he smote he clove him in sunder and before his soul could depart he became a heap of ashes in the fire whilst the two hosts of the jinn shot each other with flamy meteors till the battlefield was wrapped in smoke and garib turned right and left among the kafirs who gave way before him till he came to king barkan's pavilion with kalajan and kurajan on his either hand and cried out to them loose your lord so they unbound murash and broke his fetters and and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the six hundred and fifty-sixth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when King Garib cried out to Kalajan and Kurajan, saying, Loose your lord, they unbound Murash and broke his fetters, and he said to them, Bring me my arms and my winged horse. Now he had two flying steeds, one of which he had given to Garib, and the other he had kept for himself and this he mounted after he had donned his battle harness then he and garib fell upon the enemy flying through the air on their winged horses and the true believing jinn followed them shouting allah akbar god is most great till plains and hills valleys and mountains reworded the cry the infidels fled before them and they returned after having slain more than thirty thousand marids and satans to the city of japhet where the two kings sat down on their couches of estate and sought barkan but found him not for after capturing him they were diverted from him by stress of battle where an ifrit of his servants made his way to him and loosing him carried him to his folk of whom he found part slain and the rest in full flight so he flew up with the king high in air and sat him down in the city of carnelian and castle of gold where barkan seated himself on the throne of his kingship presently those of his people who had survived the affair came in to him and gave him joy of his safety and he said o folk where is safety my army is slain and they took me prisoner and have rent in pieces mine honour among the tribes of the jinn quoth they o king tis ever thus that kings still afflict and are afflicted quoth he there is no help but i take my reek and wipe out my shame else shall i be for ever disgraced among the tribes of the jinn 
Then he wrote letters to the governors of his fortresses, who came to him right loyally, and when he received them he found three hundred and twenty thousand fierce marids and satans who said to him, What is thy need? And he replied, Get ye ready to set out in three days' time, whereto they rejoined, Hearkening and Obedience. On this wise it befell King Barkan, but as regards Muraash, when he discovered his prisoner's escape, it was grievous to him, and he said, Had we set a hundred marids to guard him, he had not fled, but whither shall he go from us? Then said he to Garib, Know, O my brother, that Barkan is perfidious, and will never rest from wreaking blood revenge on us, but will assuredly assemble his legions, and return to attack us. Wherefore I am minded to forestall him, and follow the trail of his defeat, whilst he is yet weakened thereby. Replied Garib, This is the right reed, and will best serve our need. And Muraash said, O oh, my brother, let the Marids bear thee back to thine own country, and leave me to fight the battles of the faith against the infidels, that I may be lightened of my sin-load. But Garib rejoined, By the virtue of the clement, the bountiful, the veiler, I will not go hence till I do to death all the misbelieving jinn and allah hasten their souls to the fire and dwelling place dire and none shall be saved but those who worship allah the one the victorious but do thou send sahim back to the city of oman so haply he may be healed of his ailment for sahim was sick so muraash cried to the marid saying take ye up sahim and these treasures and bear them to oman city and after replying we hear and we obey they took them and made for the land of men then muraash wrote letters to all his governors and captains of fortresses and they came to him with an hundred and sixty thousand warriors so they made them ready and departed for the city of cornelian and the castle of gold covering in one day a year's journey and halted in a valley where they encamped and passed the night. Next morning, as they were about to set forth, behold, the vanguard of Barkan's army appeared, whereupon the jinn cried out, and the two hosts met and fell each upon other in that valley. Then the engagement was dight, and there befell a sore fight, as though an earthquake shook the sight, and fair plight waxed foul plight, Ernest came, and jest took flight, and parley ceased twixt white and white, whilst long lives were cut short in a trice, and the unbelievers fell into disgrace and despite. For Garib charged them, proclaiming the unity of the worshipful, the all might, and sure through necks and left heads rolling in the dust, nor did night betide before nigh seventy thousand of the miscreants were slain and of the moslemized over ten thousand marids had fallen then the kettle drums beat the retreat and the two hosts drew apart and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the six hundred and fifty-seventh night she resumed it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the two hosts drew apart, Garib and Muraash returned to their tents, after wiping their weapons, and supper being set before them. They ate and gave each other joy of their safety, and the loss of their marids being so small. As for Barkan, he returned to his tent, grieving for the slaughter of his champions, and said to his officers, O oh, folk, and we tarry here and do battle with them on this wise, in three days' time we shall be cut off to the last white. Quoth they, And how shall we do, O king? Quoth Barkan, We will fall upon them under cover of night, 
whilst they are deep in sleep, and not one of them shall be left to tell the tale. So take your arms, and when I give the word of command, attack and fall on your enemies as one. Now there was amongst them a Marid named Jandal, whose heart inclined to al-Islam. So when he heard the Kafir's plot, he stole away from them, and going in to King Murash and King Garib, told the twain what Barkan had devised. Whereupon Murash turned to Garib and said to him, O oh, my brother, what shall we do? Garib replied, To-night we will fall upon the miscreants, and chase them into the wilds and the woods, if it be the will of the omnipotent king. Then he summoned the captains of the jinn and said to them, Arm yourselves, you and yours, and as soon as tis dark, steal out of your tents on foot, hundreds after hundreds, and lie in ambush among the mountains. And when ye see the enemy engaged among the tents, do ye fall upon them from all quarters. Hearten your hearts, and rely on your Lord, and ye shall certainly conquer. And behold, I am with you. So as soon as it was dark night, the infidels attacked the camp, invoking aid of the fire and light. But when they came among the tents, the Moslems fell upon them, calling for help on the Lord of the worlds, and saying, O most merciful of mercifuls, O creator of all createds, till they left them like mown grass, cut down and dead. Nor did morning dawn before the most part of the unbelievers were species without souls, and the rest made for the waste and marshes, whilst Garib and Murash returned triumphant and victorious, and making prize of the enemy's baggage, they rested till the morrow, when they set out for the city of Carnelian and Castle of Gold. As for Barkan, when the battle had turned against him, and most of his lieges were slain, he fled through the dark with the remnant of his power to his capital, where he entered his palace, and assembling his legionaries said to them, O folk, whoso hath aught of price, let him take it and follow me to the mountain Kaf, to the blue king, lord of the pied palace, for he it is who shall avenge us. So they took their women and children and goods, and made for the Caucasus mountains. Presently Murash and Garib arrived at the city of Carnelian and Castle of Gold, to find the gates open, and none left to give them news. Whereupon they entered, and Murash led Garib that he might show him the city, whose walls were builded of emeralds and its gates of red Carnelian with studs of silver, and the terrace roofs of its houses and mansions reposed upon beams of lime aloes and sandalwood. So they took their pleasure in its streets and alleys, till they came to the palace of gold, and entering passed through seven vestibules, when they drew near to a building, whose walls were of royal ballast rubies, and its pavement of emerald and jacinth. The two kings were astounded at the goodliness of the place, and fared on from vestibule to vestibule, till they had passed through the seventh, and happened upon the inner court of the palace, wherein they saw four daisies, each different from the others, and in the midst a jetting font of red gold, compassed about with golden lions, from whose mouths issued water. These were things to daze man's wit. The estrade at the upper end was hung and carpeted with brocaded silks of various colors, and thereon stood two thrones of red gold, inlaid with pearls and jewels. So Murash and Garib sat down on Barkan's thrones, and held high state in the palace of gold. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say, her permitted say. End of section seven. Recording by Pam Castile. Section eight 
of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pam Castile. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 8. When it was the six hundred and fifty-eighth night, she pursued. It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Mira Ash and Garib took seat on Barkan's thrones and held high state. Then said Garib to Mira Ash, What thinkest thou to do? And Mira Ash replied, O king of mankind, have dispatched a hundred horse to learn where Barkan is, that we may pursue him. Then they abode three days in the palace. The scouting Merids returned with the news that Barkan had fled to the mountain Kaf, and craved protection of the blue king who granted it. Whereupon quoth Murash to Garib, What sayest thou, O my brother? And quoth Garib, Except we attack them, they will attack us. So they bade the host make ready for departure, and after three days they were about to set out with their troops, when the Marids, who had carried Sahim and the presents back to Oman, returned, and kissed ground before Garib. He questioned them of his people, and they replied, After the last affair, thy brother Ajib, leaving Ya'aru bin Katan, fled to the king of Hind, and submitting his case, sought his protection. The king granted his prayer, and writing letters to all his governors, levied an army as it were the surging sea, having neither beginning nor end, wherewith he purposeth to invade Al-Iraq and lay it waste. When Garib heard this, he said, Perish the misbelievers! Verily Allah Almighty shall give the victory to Al-Islam, and I will soon show them hue and foin. Said Mirash, O king of the humans, by the virtue of the mighty name, I must needs go with thee to thy kingdom, and destroy thy foes, and bring thee to thy wish. Garib thanked him, and they rested on this resolve till the morrow, when they set out, intending for Mount Caucasus, and marched many days till they reached the city of Alabaster and the Pied Palace. Now this city was fashioned of alabaster and precious stones by Barik bin Faki, father of the Jinn, and he also founded the Pied Palace, which was so named because he edified with one brick of gold, alternating with one of silver, nor was there builded aught like it in all the world. When they came within half a day's journey of the city, they halted to take their rest, and Mira Ash sent out to reconnoitre a scout who returned and said, O king, within the city of Alabaster are legions of the jinn, for number as the leaves of the trees, or as the drops of rain. So Mira Ash said to Garib, How shall we do, O king of mankind? He replied, O king, divide your men into four bodies, and encompass with them the camp of the infidels. Then in the middle of the night let them cry out, saying, God is most great, and withdraw, and watch what happeneth among the tribes of the jinn. So Mira Ash did as Garib counseled, and the troops waited till midnight, when they encircled the foe and shouted, Allahu Akbar, ho for the faith of Abraham the friend, on whom be the peace. The misbelievers at this cry awoke in a fright, and snatching up their arms fell one upon other till the morning, when most part of them were dead bodies, and but few remained. Then Garib cried out to the true believers, saying, Up and at the remnant of the Kafirs, behold, I am with you, and Allah is your helper. So the Muslims crave at the enemy, and Garib bared his magical blade, Al-Mahik, and fell upon the foe, lopping off noses and making heads wax hoary, and whole ranks turn tail. At last he came up with Barkan, and he smote him, and bereft him of life, and he fell down drenched in his blood. On likewise he did with the blue king, and by undern hour not one of the Kafirs was left alive to tell the tale. 
Then Garib and Mirash entered the Pied Palace, and found its walls builded of alternate courses of gold and silver, with door sills of crystal and keystones of greenest emerald. In its midst was a fountain adorned with bells and pendants, and figures of birds and beasts spouting forth water, and thereby a dais furnished with gold brocaded silk, bordered or embroidered with jewels, and they found the treasures of the palace past count or description. Then they entered the women's court, where they came upon a magnificent seraglio, and Garib saw among the blue kin's womenfolk a girl clad in a dress worth a thousand dinars. Never had he beheld a goodlier. About her were an hundred slave girls, upholding her train with golden hooks, and she was in their midst as the moon among stars. When he saw her, his reason was confounded, and he said to one of the waiting women, Who may be yonder maid? Quoth they, This is the blue king's daughter, star of morn. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and fifty-ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Garib asked the slave women, saying, Who may be yonder maid? They replied, This is Star of Morn, daughter to the blue king. Then Garib turned to Mura'ash and said to him, O king of the jinn, I have a mind to take yonder damsel to wife, replied Mura'ash. The palace and all that therein is, live stock and dead, are the prize of thy right hand. For hadst thou not devised a stratagem to destroy the blue king and Barkan, they had cut us off to the last one. Wherefore the treasure is thy treasure, and the folk thy thralls. Garib thanked him for his fair speech, and going up to the girl, gazed steadfastly upon her, and loved her with exceeding love, forgetting Fakir Taj, the princess, and even Madia. Now her mother was the Chinese king's daughter, whom the blue king had carried off from her palace, and perforce deflowered, and she conceived by him and bare this girl, whom he named Star of Morn, by reason of her beauty and loveliness, for she was the very princess of the fair. Her mother died when she was a babe of forty days, and the nurses and eunuchs reared her till she reached the age of seventeen. But she hated her sire, and rejoiced in his slaughter. So Garib put his palm to hers, and went in unto her that night, and found her a virgin. Then he bade pull down the pied palace, and divided the spoil with the true-believing jinn, and there fell to his share one and twenty thousand bricks of gold and silver, and money and treasure beyond speech and count. Then Mira Ash took Garib and showed him the mountain Kaf and all its marvels, after which they returned to Barkan's fortress, and dismantled it, and shared the spoil thereof. Then they repaired to Mira Ash's capital, where they tarried five days, when Garib sought to revisit his native country, and Mira Ash said, O king of mankind, I will ride at thy stirrup, and bring thee to thine own land. Replied Garib, No, by the virtue of Abraham the friend, I will not suffer thee to weary thyself thus, nor will I take any of the jinn, save Kalajan and Kurajan. Quoth the king, Take with thee ten thousand horsemen of the jinn, to serve thee. But quoth Garib, I will take only as I said to thee. So Mirash bade a thousand marids carry him to his native land, with his share of the spoil, and he commanded Kalajan and Kurajan to follow him and obey him, and they answered, Hearkening and obedience. Then said Garib to the Marids, Do ye carry the treasure and star of morn, for he himself thought to ride his flying steed. But Mirash said to him, This horse, O my brother, will live only in our region, and if it come upon man's earth, twill die. But I have in my stables a sea-horse, whose fellow is not found in al Iraq, no, nor in all the world is its like. So he caused bring forth the horse, and when Garib saw it, it interposed between him and his wits. Then they bound it, and Kalajan bore it on his shoulders, and Kurajan took what he could carry. 
and Mirash embraced Garib and wept for parting from him, saying, O my brother, if aught befall thee wherein thou art powerless, send for me, and I will come to thine aid with an army able to lay waste the whole earth and what is thereon. Garib thanked him for his kindness and zeal for the true faith, and took leave of him. Whereupon the Merids set out with Garib and his goods, and after traversing fifty years' journey in two days and a night, alighted near the city of Oman, and halted to take rest. Then Garib sent out Kalajan to learn news of his people, and he returned and said, O king, the city is beleaguered by a host of infidels as they were the surging sea, and thy people are fighting them. The drums beat to battle, and Jamrakan goeth forth as champion in the field. When Garib heard this, he cried aloud, God is most great, and said to Kalajan, Saddle me the steed, and bring me my arms and spear, for to-day the valiant shall be known from the coward in the place of war and battle steed. So Kalajan brought him all he sought, and Garib armed and belting in Baldric al-Mahik, mounted the sea-horse and made toward the host. Quoth Kalajan and Kurajan to him, Set thy heart at rest, and let us go to the Kafirs, and scatter them abroad in the waste and wilds, till, by the help of Allah the All-Powerful, we leave not a soul alive, no, not a blower of the fire. But Garib said, by the virtue of Abraham the friend, I will not let you fight them without me, and behold, I mount. Now the cause of the coming of that great host was right marvellous. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and sixtieth night, she continued, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Garib had bidden Kalajan go and learn news of his people, the jinn fared forth and presently returning said, Verily around thy city is a mighty host. Now the cause of its coming was that Ajib, having fled the field after Ya'arub's army had been put to the root, said to his people, O folk, if we return to Ya'arub bin Qatan, he will say to us, but for you my son and my people had not been slain, and he will put us to death even to the last man. Wherefore methinks we were better go to Tarkanon, king of Hind, and beseech him to avenge us. Replied they, Come, let us go thither, and the blessing of the fire be upon thee. So they fared days and nights till they reached King Tarkanon's capital city, and after asking and obtaining permission to present himself, Ajib went in to him and kissed ground before him. Then he wished him what men used to wish to monarchy, and said to him, O king, protect me, so may protect thee the sparkling fire and the night with its thick darkness. Tarkanon looked at Ajib and asked, Who art thou, and what dost thou want? To which the other answered, I am Ajib, king of al Iraq. My brother hath wronged me, and gotten the mastery of the land, and the subjects have submitted themselves to him. Moreover, he hath embraced the faith of al-Islam, and he ceaseth not to chase me from country to country. And behold, I am come to seek protection of thee and thy power. When Tarkanon heard Ajib's words, he rose and sat down and cried, by the virtue of the fire, I will assuredly avenge thee, and will let none serve other than my goddess the fire. And he called aloud to his son, saying, O my son, make ready to go to al Iraq and lay it waste, and bind all who serve aught but the fire, and torment them, and make example of them. Yet slay them not, but bring them to me, that I may ply them with various tortures, and make them taste the bitterness of humiliation, and leave them a warning to whoso will be warned in this our while. Then he chose out to accompany him eighty thousand fighting men on horseback, and the like number on giraffes, besides ten thousand elephants, bearing on their backs seats of sandalwood, latticed with golden rods, plated and studded with gold and silver, and shielded with pavoises of gold and emerald. Moreover he sent good store of war chariots, in each eight men fighting with all kinds of weapons. 
Now the prince's name was Ra'ad Shah, and he was the champion of his time, for prowess having no peer. So he and his army equipped them in ten days' time, then set out, as they were a bank of clouds, and fared on two months' journey, till they came upon Oman city, and encompassed it, to the joy of Ajib, who thought himself assured of victory. Jamarkhan and Sa'adan and all their fighting men sallied forth into the field of fight, whilst the kettle-drums beat to battle and the horses neighed. At this moment up came King Garib, who, as we have said, had been warned by Kalajan, and he urged on his destrier, and entered among the infidels, waiting to see who should come forth and open the chapter of war. Then out rushed Sa'adan the ghoul, and offered combat, whereupon there issued forth to him one of the champions of Hind. But Sa'adan scarce let him take stand in front, ere he smote him with his mace, and crushed his bones, and stretched him on the ground. And so did he with a second, and a third, till he had slain thirty fighting men. Then there dashed out at him an Indian cavalier by name Batash al-Akran, uncle to King Tarkanon, and of his day the doughtiest men reckoned worth five thousand horse in battle plain, and cried out to Sa'adan, saying, O thief of the Arabs, hath thy daring reached that degree that thou shouldst slay the kings of Hind, and their champions, and capture their horsemen? but this day is the last of thy worldly days. When Sa'adan heard these words, his eyes waxed blood-red, and he craved at Batash, and aimed a stroke at him with his club. But he evaded it, and the force of the blow bore Sa'adan to the ground, and before he could recover himself, the Indians pinioned him, and haled him off to their tents. Now when Jamrakan saw his comrade, a prisoner, he cried out, saying, Ho for the faith of Abraham the friend, and clapping heel to his horse, ran at Batash. They wheeled about a while, till Batash charged Jamrakan, and catching him by his jerkin, tear him from his saddle, and cast him to the ground, whereupon the Indians bound him, and dragged him away to their tents. And Batash ceased not to overcome all who came out to him, captain after captain, till he had made prisoners of four-and-twenty chiefs of the Muslims, whereat the true believers were sore dismayed. When Garib saw what had befallen his braves, he drew from beneath his knee a mace of gold weighing six-score pounds, which had belonged to Barkan, king of the Jinn. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section eight. Recording by Pam Castile. Section nine of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume seven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by P. J. Hurry The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7, by Anonymous Translated by Richard Francis Burton Section 9 When it was the six hundred and sixty-first night, she said, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Karib beheld what had befallen his braves, he drew forth a golden mace which had belonged to Barkan, king of the jinn, and clapped heel to his seahorse, which bore him like the wind gust in mid-field. Then he let drive at Batash, crying out, God is most great, he giveth aid and victory, and he abaseth whoso reject the faith of Abraham the friend, and smote him with the mace, whereupon he fell to the ground, and Karib, turning to the Muslims, saw his brother Sahim, and said to him, Pinion me this hound. When Sahim heard his brother's words, he ran to Batash, and bound him hard and fast, and bore him off, whilst the Muslim braves wondered who this knight could be, and the Indians said one to other, 
Who is this horseman which came out from among them and hath taken our chief prisoner? Meanwhile, Karib continued to offer battle, and there issued forth to him a captain of the Hindis, whom he fell to earth with his mace, and Kailajan and Kurajan pinioned him and delivered him over to Sahim. Nor did Karib leave to do thus till he had taken prisoner two and fifty of the doughtiest captains of the army of Hind. Then the day came to an end, and the kettle drums beat the retreat, whereupon Karib left the field and rode toward the Muslim camp. The first to meet him was Sahim, who kissed his feet in the stirrups and said, May thy hand never wither, O champion of the age, tell us who thou art among the braves. So Karib raised his visor of mail, and Sahim knew him, and cried out, saying, This is your king and your lord Karib, who is come back from the land of the jinn. When the Muslims heard Karib's name, they threw themselves off their horses' backs, and, crowding about him, kissed his feet in the stirrups and saluted him, rejoicing in his safe return. Then they carried him into the city of Amman, where he entered his palace and sat down on the throne of his kingship, whilst his officers stood around him in the utmost joy. Food was set on, and they ate, after which Karib related to them all that had betided him with the jinn in Mount Kaf, and they marvelled thereat with exceeding marvel, and praised Allah for his safety. Then he dismissed them to their sleeping places. So they withdrew to their several lodgings, and when none abode with him but Kailajan and Kurajan, who never left him, he said to them, Can ye carry me to Kufa, that I may take my pleasure in my harem, and bring me back before the end of the night? They replied, O oh, our Lord, this thou askest is easy. Now, the distance between Kufa and Oman is sixty days' journey for a diligent horseman. And Kailajan said to Kurajan, I will carry him going and thou coming back. So he took up Karib and flew off with him in company with Kurajan. Nor was an hour passed before they set him down at the gate of his palace in Kufa. He went in to his uncle al Dameh who rose to him and saluted him, after which quoth Karib, How is it with my wives Fakir Taj and Mahdia? al Damih answered, They are both well and in good case. Then the eunuch went in and acquainted the women of the harem with Karib's coming, whereat they rejoiced and raised the trill of joy and gave him the reward for good news. Presently in came King Karib, and they rose and saluting him conversed with him till al Dameh entered. When Karib related to them all that had befallen him in the land of the jinn, whereat they all marvelled, then he lay with Fekir Taj till near daybreak, when he took leave of his wives and his uncle and mounted Kurajan's back. Nor was the darkness dispelled before the two marids set him down in the city of Amman. Then he and his men armed, and he bade open the gates, when, behold, up came a horseman from the host of the Indians, with Jamrakan and Sa'adan, and the rest of the captive captains whom he had delivered, and committed them to Karib. The Muslims rejoicing in their safety donned their mails and took horse, while the kettle drums beat a point of war, and the miscreants also drew up in line. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and sixty-second night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the Muslim host mounted, and rode to the plain of cut and thrust, the first to open the door of war was King Karib, who, drawing his sword al Mahik, 
drove his charger between the two ranks and cried out, saying, Whoso knoweth me hath enough of my mischief, and whoso unknoweth me, to him I will make myself known. I am Karib, king of Al-Iraq and Al-Yaman, brother of Ajib. When Ra'ad Shah, son of the king of Hind, heard this, he shouted to his captains, Bring me Ajib. So they brought him, and Ra'ad Shah said to him, Thou wottest that this quarrel is thy quarrel, and thou art the cause of all this slaughter. Now yonder standeth thy brother Karib, amiddlemost the fight field and steed, where sword and spear we shall wield. Go thou to him, and bring him to me a prisoner, that I may set him on a camel arsi versi, and make a show of him, and carry him to the land of Hind. Answered Ajib, O king, send out to him other than I, for I am in ill health this morning. But Ra'ad Shah sparked and snorted and cried, By the virtue of the sparkling fire and the light and the shade and the heat, unless thou fare forth to thy brother and bring him to me in haste, I will cut off thy head and make an end of thee. So Ajib took heart, and urging his horse up to his brother in midfield, said to him, O dog of the Arabs, and vilest of all who hammer down tent pegs, wilt thou contend with kings? Take what to thee cometh, and receive the glad tidings of thy death. When Karib heard this, he said to him, Who art thou among the kings? And Ajib answered, saying, I am thy brother, and this day is the last of thy worldly days. Now, when Karib was assured that he was indeed his brother Ajib, he cried out and said, Ho oh, to avenge my father and mother! Then, giving his sword to Kalajan, he crave at Ajib and smote him with his mace a smashing blow and a swashing that went nigh to beat in his ribs and seizing him by the male gorges, tore him from the saddle and cast him to the ground. Whereupon the two marids pounced upon him, and binding him fast, dragged him off dejected and abject. Whilst Karib rejoiced in the capture of his enemy, and repeated these couplets of the poet. I have won my wish, and my need have scored. Unto thee be praise, and the thanks O oh, our Lord, I grew up dejected and abject poor, but Allah vouchsafed me all boons implored. I have conquered countries and mastered men, but for thee were I naught, O oh, thou Lord adored. When Ra'ad Shah saw how evilly Ajib fared with his brother, he called for his charger and donning his harness and haberdashery, mounted and dashed out a field. As soon as he drew near King Karib, he cried out at him, saying, O oh, basest of Arabs and bearer of scrubs, who art thou that thou shouldest capture kings and braves? Down from thy horse and put elbows behind back and kiss my feet and set my warriors free and go with me in bonds of chains to my reign, that I may pardon thee, and make thee a sheath in our own land, so mayest thou eat there a bittock of bread. When Karib heard these words, he laughed till he fell backwards, and answered, saying, O mad hound and mangy wolf, soon shalt thou see against whom the shifts of fortune will turn. Then he cried out to Sahim, saying, Bring me the prisoners. So he brought them, and Karib smote off their heads, whereupon Ra'ad Shah crave at him with the driving of a lordly champion and the onslaught of a fierce slaughterer, and they falsed and fainted and fought till nightfall when the kettledrums beat the retreat.
and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and sixty-third night, she resumed, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the kettle drums beat the retreat, the two kings parted and returned, each to his own place, where his people gave him joy of his safety. And the Muslim said to Kharib, Tis not thy want, O king, to prolong a fight? And he replied, O folk, I have done battle with many royalties and champions, but never saw I a harder hitter than this one. Had I chosen to draw al-Mahik upon him, I had mashed his bones and made an end of his days. But I delayed with him, thinking to take him prisoner and give him part enjoyment in al-Islam. Thus far concerning Karib, but as regards Ra'ad Shah, he returned to his marquee and sat upon his throne. When his chiefs came in to him and asked him of his adversary, and he answered, By the truth of thy sparkling fire, never in my life saw I the like of yonder brave. But tomorrow I will take him prisoner and lead him away, dejected and abject. Then they slept till daybreak, when the battle drums beat to fight and the swords in baldric were dight, and war cries were cried amain, and all mounted their horses of generous strain, and drew out into the field, filling every wide place, and hill, and plain. The first to open the door of war was the rider outrageous, and the lion rageous, King Karib, who crave his steed between the two hosts, and wheeled and careered over the field, crying, Who is for fray? Who is for fight? Let no sluggard come out to me this day, nor dullard. Before he had made an end of speaking, out rushed Ra'ad Shah, riding on an elephant as he were a vast tower, in a seat girthed with silken bands, and between the elephant's ears at the driver bearing in hand a hook, wherewith he goaded the beast and directed him right and left. When the elephant drew near Karib's horse and the steed saw a creature it had never before set eyes on, it took fright. Wherefore Karib dismounted and gave the horse to Kalajan. Then he drew Al-Mahik and advanced to meet Ra'ad Shah afoot, walking on till he faced the elephant. Now it was Ra'ad Shah's want, when he found himself overmatched by any brave, to mount an elephant, taking with him an implement called the lasso, which was in the shape of a net, wide at base and narrow at top, with a running cord of silk passed through rings along its edges. With this he would attack horsemen, and casting the meshes over them, draw the running noose, and drag the rider off his horse and make him prisoner. And thus had he conquered many cavaliers. So, as Karib came up to him, he raised his hand and, dispreading the net over him, pulled him onto the back of the elephant and cried out to the beast to return to the Indian camp. But Kalajan and Kurajan had not left Karib, and, when they beheld what had befallen their lord, they laid hold of the elephant, whilst Karib strove with the net, till he rent it in sunder. Upon this the two marids seized Ra'ad Shah and bound him with a cord of palm fibre. Then the two armies drove each at other and met with a shock like two seas crashing or two mountains together dashing, whilst the dust rose to the confines of the sky and blinded was every eye. The battle waxed fierce and fell, the blood ran in rills, nor did they cease to wage war with lunge of lance and sway of sword in lustiest way, till the day darkened and the night starkened when the drums beat the retreat and the two hosts drew asunder. 
Now the Muslims were evilly entreated that day by reason of the riders on elephants and giraffes, and many of them were killed, and most of the rest were wounded. This was grievous to Kharib, who commanded the hurt to be medicined, and turning to his chief officers, asked them what they counseled. Answered they, O oh, king, tis only the elephants and giraffes that irk us. Were we but quit of them, we should overcome the enemy. Quoth Kailajan and Kurajan, We twain will unsheath our swords and fall on them and slay the most part of them. But there came forward a man of Oman, who had been privy counsellor to Jalan, and said, O king, I will be surety for the host, and thou wilt but hearken to me and follow my counsel. Karib turned to his captains and said to them, Whatsoever this wise man shall say to you, that do. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 9 Recording by P.J. Hurry. Section 10 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by P.J. Hurry. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 10 When it was the six hundred and sixty-fourth night, she pursued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Karib said to his captains, Whatsoever this wise man shall say to you, that do. They replied, Hearing and obeying. So the Amani chose out ten captains and asked them, How many braves have ye under your hands? And they answered, Ten thousand fighting men. Then he carried them into the armory and armed five thousand of them with harquebuses and the other five thousand with crossbows and taught them to shoot with these new weapons. Now as soon as it was day, the Indians came out to the field, armed cap -a -pee, with the elephants, giraffes, and champions in their van, and both hosts drew out and the big drums beat to battle. Then the man of Oman cried out to the archers and harquebusiers to shoot, and they plied the elephants and giraffes with shafts and leaden bullets, which entered the beast's flanks whereat they roared out, and turning upon their own ranks, trod them down with their hoofs. Presently the Muslims charged the misbelievers, and outflanked them right and left, whilst the elephants and giraffes trampled them, and drove them into the hills and woods, whither the Muslims followed hard upon them with the keen-edged sword, and but few of the giraffes and elephants escaped. Then King Karib and his folk returned, rejoicing in their victory. And on the morrow they divided the loot and rested five days. After which King Karib sat down on the throne of his kingship and, sending for his brother Ajib, said to him, O dog, why hast thou assembled the kings against us? But he who hath power over all things hath given us the victory over thee. So embrace the saving faith, and thou shalt be saved, and I will forbear to avenge my father and mother on thee therefore, and I will make thee king again, as thou wast, placing myself under thy hand. But Ajib said, I will not leave my faith. So Karib bade lay him in irons, and appointed an hundred stalwart slaves to guard him, after which he turned to Ra'ad Shah and said to him, How sayest thou of the faith of al-Islam? Replied he, O oh my lord, 
I will enter thy faith, for, were it not a true faith and a goodly, thou hadst not conquered us. Put forth thy hand, and I will testify that there is no God but the God, and that Abraham the friend is the apostle of God. At this Karib rejoiced, and said to him, Is thy heart indeed established in the sweetness of this belief? And he answered, saying, Yes, O my Lord. Then quoth Karib, O Ra'ad Shah, wilt thou go to thy country and thy kingdom? And quoth he, O my Lord, my father will put me to death for that I have left his faith. Karib rejoined, I will go with thee and make thee king of the country and constrain the folk to obey thee by the help of Allah, the bountiful, the beneficent. And Ra'ad Shah kissed his hands and feet. Then Karib rewarded the counsellor who had caused the rout of the foe and gave him great wealth. After which he turned to Kalajan and Kurajan and said to them, Hark ye, chief of the jinn, tis my will that ye carry me together with Ra'ad Shah and Jamlakan and Sa'adan to the land of Hind. We hear and we obey, answered they. So Kurajan took up Jamlakan and Sa'adan whilst Kalajan took Karib and Ra'ad Shah and made for the land of Hind. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and sixty-fifth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the two Murids had taken up Karib and Jamrakan, Sa'adan the Kul and Ra'ad Shah, they flew on with them from sundown till the last of the night, when they set them down on the terrace of King Tarkanan's palace at Kashmir. Now news was brought to Tarkanan by the remnants of his host of what had befallen his son, whereat he slept not, neither took delight in aught, and he was troubled with sore trouble. As he sat in his harem, pondering his case, behold, Karib and his company descended the stairways of the palace and came in to him, and when he saw his son and those who were with him, he was confused and fear took him of the Marids. Then Ra'ad Shah turned to him and said, How long wilt thou persist in thy forwardness, O traitor and worshipper of the fire? Woe to thee! Leave worshipping the fire! and serve the magnanimous sire, creator of day and night, whom attaineth no sight. When Tarkanan heard his son's speech, he cast at him an iron club he had by him, but it missed him and fell upon a buttress of the palace and smote out three stones. Then cried the king, O dog, thou hast destroyed mine army and hast forsaken thy faith, and cometh now to make me do likewise? With this, Karib went up to him, and dealt him a cuff on the neck, which knocked him down. Whereupon the Marids bound him fast, and all the harem women fled. Then Karib sat down on the throne of kingship, and said to Ra'ad Shah, Do thou justice upon thy father. So, Ra'ad Shah turned to him and said, O perverse old man, become one of the saved, and thou shalt be saved from the fire and the wrath of the all-powerful. But Tarkanan cried, I will not die save in my own faith. Whereupon Karib drew al-Mahik and smote him therewith, and he fell to the earth in two pieces. And Allah, hurried his soul to the fire, and abiding place dire. Then Karib bade hang his body over the palace gate, and they hung one half on the right hand, and the other on the left, and waited till day, when Karib caused Ra'ad Shah don the royal habit, and sit down on his father's throne, with himself on his dexter hand, and Jamlakan and Sa'adan and the Marids 
standing right and left, and he said to Kailajan and Kurajan, Whoso entereth of the princes and officers, seize him and bind him, and let not a single captain escape you. And they answered, Hearkening and obedience. Presently the officers made for the palace to do their service to the king, and the first to appear was the chief captain, who, seeing King Tarkanan's dead body cut in half and hanging on either side of the gate, was seized with terror and amazement. Then Kailajan laid hold of him by the collar and threw him and intoned him, after which he dragged him into the palace, and before sunrise they had bound three hundred and fifty captains, and set them before Karib, who said to them, O folk, have you seen your king hanging at the palace gate? asked they. Who hath done this deed? And he answered, I did it by the help of Allah Almighty, and whoso opposeth me I will do with him likewise. Then quoth they, What is thy will with us? And quoth he, I am Karib, king of Al-Iraq, he who slew your warriors. And now Ra'ad Shah hath embraced the faith of salvation and is become a mighty king and ruler over you. So do ye become true believers and all shall be well with you. But if ye refuse, you shall repent it. So they pronounced the profession of the faith and were enrolled among the people of Felicity. Then said Karib, Are your hearts indeed established in the sweetness of the belief? And they replied, Yes. Whereupon he bade release them and clad them in robes of honor, saying, Go to your people and expound al-Islam to them. Whoso accepteth the faith, spare him. But if he refuse, slay him. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and sixty-sixth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that King Kharib said to the troops of Ra'ad Shah, Go to your people and offer al-Islam to them. Whoso accepteth the faith, spare him. But if he refuse, slay him. So they went out and, assembling the men under their command, explained what had taken place and expounded al-Islam to them. And they all professed, except a few, whom they put to death. After which they returned and told Karib, who blessed Allah and glorified him, saying, Praised be the Almighty who hath made this thing easy to us without strife. Then he abode in Kashmir of India forty days till he had ordered the affairs of the country and cast down the shrines and temples of the fire and built in their stead mosques and cathedrals whilst Ra'ad Shah made ready for him rarities and treasures beyond count and dispatched them to Al-Iraq in ships. Then Karib mounted on Kailajan's back and Jamlakan and Sa'adan on that of Kurajan, after they had taken leave of Ra'ad Shah, and journeyed through the night till break of day, when they reached Oman city, where their troops met them and saluted them and rejoiced in them. Then they set out for Kufa, where Karib called for his brother Ajib, and commanded to hang him. So, Sahim brought hooks of iron and driving them into the tendons of Ajib's heels, hung him over the gate, and Karib bade them shoot him. So they riddled him with arrows till he was like unto a porcupine. Then Karib entered his palace and sitting down on the throne of his kingship, passed the day in ordering the affairs of the state. At nightfall he went into his harem, where Star Umorn came to meet him and embraced him and gave him joy, she and her women.
of his safety. He spent that day and lay that night with her, and on the morrow, after he had made the Khusul ablution and prayed the dawn prayer, he sat down on his throne and commanded preparation to be made for his marriage with Mahdiya. Accordingly, they slaughtered three thousand head of sheep and two thousand oxen and a thousand he-goats and five hundred camels and the like number of horses beside four thousand fowls and great store of geese. Never was such a wedding in al-Islam to that day. Then he went into Mahdiya and took her maidenhead and abode with her ten days, after which he committed the kingdom to his uncle al-Dimih, charging him to rule the lieges justly, and journeyed with his women and warriors, till he came to the ships laden with the treasures and rarities which Ra'ad Shah had sent him, and divided the monies among his men, who from poor became rich. Then they fared on till they reached the city of Babel, where he bestowed on Sahim al alal a robe of honor, and appointed him Sultan of the city. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 10 Recording by P.J. Huri Section 11 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel Vermont. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 11. When it was the six hundred and sixty-seventh night, she resumed. It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Kharib, after robing his brother Sahim and appointing him sultan, abode with him ten days, after which he set out again and journeyed nor stinted travel till he reached the castle of Sadan the Khul, where they rested five days. Then quoth Kharib to Kailajan and Kurajan, Pass over to Ispanir al-Madayin, to the palace of the Khosro, and find what is come of Fakhartaj, and bring me one of the king's kinsmen, who shall acquaint me with what hath passed. Quoth they, We hear, and we obey, and set out forthright for Ispanir. As they flew between heaven and earth, behold, they caught sight of a mighty army, as it were the surging sea. And Kailajan said to Kurajan, Let us descend, and determine what be this host. So they alighted, and walking among the troops, found them Persians, and questioned the soldiers whose men they were, and whither they were bound. Whereto they made answer, We are en route for al-Iraq, to slay Kharib, and all who company him. When the Marids heard these words, they repaired to the pavilion of the Persian general, whose name was Rustam, and waited till the soldiers slept. When they took up Rustam, bed and all, and made for the castle where Kharib lay, they arrived there by midnight, and going to the door of the king's pavilion, cried, Permission! Which, when he heard, he sat up and said, Come in! So they entered, and set down the couch with Rustam asleep thereon. Kharib asked, Who be this? And they answered, This be a Persian prince, whom we met coming with a great host, thinking to slay thee and thine, and we have brought him to thee, that he may tell thee what thou hast a mind to know. Fetch me an hundred braves, cried Kharib, and they fetched them, whereupon he bade them, Draw your swords, and stand at the head of this Persian carl. Then they awoke him, and he opened his eyes, and, finding an arch of steel over his head, shut them again, crying, What be this foul dream? But Kailajan pricked him with his sword point, and he sat up and said, Where am I? Quoth Sahim, Thou art in the presence of King Kharib, son-in-law of the king of the Persians, 
What is thy name, and whither goest thou? When Rustam heard Kharib's name, he bethought himself, and said in his mind, Am I asleep or awake? Whereupon Sahim dealt him a buffet, saying, Why dost thou not answer? And he raised his head and asked, Who brought me from my tent, out of the midst of my men? Kharib answered, These two marids brought thee. So he looked at Kailajan and Kurajan and skited in his bag trousers. Then the marids fell upon him, bearing their tusks and brandishing their blades, and said to him, Wilt thou not rise and kiss ground before King Kharib? And he trembled at them and was assured that he was not asleep. So he stood up and kissed the ground between the hands of Kharib, saying, The blessing of the fire be on thee, and long life be thy life, O king. Kharib cried, O dog of the Persians, fire is not worshipful, for that it is harmful and profiteth not save in cooking food. Asked Rustam, Who then is worshipful? And Kharib answered, Alone worshipworth is God, who formed thee and fashioned thee and created the heavens and the earth. Quoth the Ajami, What shall I say that I may become of the party of this Lord and enter thy faith? And quoth Kharib, Say, There is no God but the God, and Abraham is the friend of God. So Rustam pronounced the profession of the faith, and was enrolled among the people of Felicity. Then said he to Kharib, Know, O my lord, that thy father-in-law, King Sabur, seeketh to slay thee. And indeed he hath sent me with an hundred thousand men, charging me to spare none of you. Kharib rejoined, Is this my reward for having delivered his daughter from death and dishonor? Allah will requite him his ill intent. But what is thy name? The Persian answered, My name is Rustam, general of Sabur, and Kharib. Thou shalt have the like rank in my army, adding, But tell me, O Rustam, how is it with the princess, Fakhartaj? May thy head live, O king of the age. What was the cause of her death? Rustam replied, O oh, my lord, no sooner hadst thou left us than one of the princess's women went into King Sabur and said to him, O oh, my master, didst thou give Kharib leave to lie with the princess my mistress? Whereto he answered, No, by the virtue of the fire, and drawing his sword, went into his daughter and said to her, O oh, foul baggage, why didst thou suffer yonder Badawi to sleep with thee without dower or even wedding? She replied, O oh, my papa, twas thou gayest him leave to sleep with me. Then he asked, Did the fellow have thee? But she was silent and hung down her head. Hereupon he cried out to the midwives and slave girls, saying, Pinion me this harlot's elbows behind her, and look at her privy parts. So they did as he bade them, and after inspecting her slit said to him, O king, she hath lost her maidenhead. Whereupon he ran at her, and would have slain her, but her mother rose up and threw herself between them, crying, O king, slay her not, lest thou be for ever dishonored, but shut her in a cell till she die. So he cast her into prison till nightfall, when he called two of his courtiers, and said to them, Carry her afar off, and throw her into the river Jaihun, and tell none. They did his commandment, and indeed her memory is forgotten, and her time is past. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and sixty-eighth night, she pursued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Kharib asked news of Fakhartaj, Rustam informed him that she had been drowned in the river by her sire's command. And when Kharib heard this, the world waxed wan before his eyes, and he cried, By the virtue of Abraham the friend, I will assuredly go to yonder dog and overwhelm him, and lay waste to his realm. Then he sent letters to Jamarkan and to the governors of Mosul and Mayafarikin, and turning to Rustam, said to him, 
How many men hadst thou in thine army? He replied, An hundred thousand Persian horse. And Kharib rejoined, Take ten thousand horse, and go to thy people, and occupy them with war. I will follow on thy trail. So Rustam mounted, and taking ten thousand Arab horse, made for his tribe, saying in himself, I will do a deed shall whiten my face with King Kharib. So he fared on seven days, till there remained but half a day's journey between him and the Persian camp, when, dividing his host into four divisions, he said to his men, Surround the Persians on all sides, and fall upon them with the sword. They rode on from eventide till midnight, when they had compassed the camp of the Ajamis, who were asleep in security, and fell upon them, shouting, God is most great! Whereupon the Persians started up from sleep, and their feet slipped, and the saber went round amongst them. For the all-knowing king was wroth with them, and Rustam wrought amongst them as fire in dry fuel, till by the end of the night the whole of the Persian host was slain or wounded or fled, and the Moslems made prize of their tents and baggage, horses, camels, and treasure chests. Then they alighted and rested in the tents of the Ajamis, till King Kharib came up, and, seeing what Rustam had done, and how he had gained by stratagem a great and complete victory, he invested him with a robe of honor, and said to him, O Rustam, it was thou didst put the Persians to the rout, wherefore all the spoil is thine. So he kissed Kharib's hand and thanked him, and they rested till the end of the day, when they set out for King Sabur's capital. Meanwhile, the fugitives of the defeated force reached Ispanir and went into Sabur, crying out and saying, Alas! and Well away! and Woe worth the day! Quoth he, What hath befallen you? And who with his mischief hath smitten you? So they told him all that had passed and said, Naught befell us except that thy general Rustam fell upon us in the darkness of the night because he had turned Moslem, nor did Kharib come near us. When the king heard this, he cast his crown to the ground and said, There is no worth left us. Then he turned to his son, Ward Shaw, and said to him, O oh, my son, there is none for this affair save thou, answered Ward Shaw. By thy life, O oh my father, I will assuredly bring Kharib and his chiefs of the people in chains and slay all who are with him. Then he numbered his army and found it two hundred and twenty thousand men. So they slept, intending to set forth on the morrow. But next morning, as they were about to march, behold, a cloud of dust arose and spread till it walled the world and baffled the sight of the farthest seeing white. Now Sabur had mounted to farewell his son, and when he saw this mighty great dust, he let call a runner and said to him, Go find me out the cause of this dust cloud. The scout went and returned, saying, O oh, my lord, Kharib and his braves are upon you. Whereupon they unloaded their bot beasts and drew out in line of battle. When Kharib came up and saw the Persians ranged in row, he cried out to his men, saying, Charge with the blessing of Allah. So they waved the flags, and the Arabs and the Ajamis crave one another, and folk were heaped upon folk. Blood ran like water, and all souls saw death face to face. The brave advanced and pressed forward to assail, and the coward hung back and turned tail, and they ceased not from fight and fray till ended day, when the kettle drums beat the retreat, and the two hosts drew apart. Then Sabur commanded to pitch his camp hard over the city gate, and Kharib set up his pavilions in front of theirs, and every one went to his tent and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and sixty-ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the two hosts drew apart, every one went to his tent until the morning. As soon as it was day, the two hosts mounted their strong steeds, and leveled their lances, and wore their harness of war. Then they raised their slogan cries, and drew out in battle array, whilst came forth all the lordly knights and the lions of fights. 
Now the first to open the gate of battle was Rustam, who urged his charger into midfield and cried out, God is most great. I am Rustam, champion in chief of the Arabs and Ajamis. Who is for tilting? Who is for fighting? Let no sluggard come out to me this day, nor weakling. Then there rushed forth to him a champion of the Persians. The two charged each other, and there befell between them a sore fight, till Rustam sprang upon his adversary and smote him with a mace he had with him, seventy pounds in weight, and beat his head down upon his breast, and he fell to the earth, dead, and in his blood drowned. This was no light matter to Sabur, and he commanded his men to charge, so they crave at the Moslems, invoking the aid of the light-giving sun, whilst the true believers called for help upon the magnanimous king. But the Ajamis, the miscreants, outnumbered the Arabs, the Moslems, and made them drain the cup of death, which when Kharib saw, he drew his sword, Al-Mahik, and crying out his war-cry, fell upon the Persians, with Kailajan and Kurajan at either stirrup. Nor did he leave playing upon them with blade till he hewed his way to the standard-bearer and smote him on the head with the flat of his sword, whereupon he fell down in a fainting fit, and the two marids bore him off to their camp. When the Persians saw the standard fall, they turned and fled, and for the city gates made. But the Moslems followed them with the blade, and they crowded together to enter the city, so that they could not shut the gates, and there died of them much people." Then Rustam and Sadan, Jamrkan and Sahim, Aldamich, Kailajan and Kurajan, and all the braves Mohammedan, and the champions of faith Unitarian, fell upon the misbelieving Persians in the gates, and the blood of the Kafirs ran in the streets like a torrent, till they threw down their arms and harness, and called out for quarter whereupon the Moslems stayed their swords from the slaughter and drove them to their tents, as one driveth a flock of sheep. Meanwhile, Kharib returned to his pavilion, where he doffed his gear and washed himself of the blood of the infidels, after which he donned his royal robes and sat down on his chair of estate. Then he called for the king of the Persians and said to him, O dog of the Ajams, what moved thee to deal thus with thy daughter? How seest thou me unworthy to be her baron? And Sabur answered, saying, O king, punish me not because of that deed which I did, for I repent me, and confronted thee not in fight, but in my fear of thee. When Kharib heard these words, he bade throw him flat and beat him. So they bastinadoed him, till he could no longer groan and cast him among the prisoners. Then Kharib expounded al-Islam to the Persians, and one hundred and twenty thousand of them embraced the faith, and the rest he put to the sword. Moreover, all the citizens professed al-Islam, and Kharib mounted and entered in great state the city Izbanir al-Madayin. Then he went into the king's palace, and sitting down on Sabur's throne, gave robes and largesse, and distributed the booty and treasure among the Arabs and Persians, wherefore they loved him, and wished him victory and honor, and endurance of days. But Fakhartaj's mother remembered her daughter, and raised the voice of mourning for her, and the palace was filled with wails and cries. Kharib heard this, and entering the harim, asked the women what ailed them, whereupon the princess's mother came forward and said, O oh, my lord, thy presence put me in mind of my daughter, and how she would have joyed in thy coming, had she been alive and well. Kharib wept for her, and sitting down on his throne, called for Sabur, and they brought him stumbling in his shackles. Quoth Kharib to him, O oh, dog of the Persians, what didst thou do with thy daughter? I gave her to such an one and such an one, quoth the king, saying, Drown her in the river Jaihun. So Kharib sent for the two men and asked them, Is what he saith true? Answered they, Yes, but, O king, we did not drown her. Nay, we took pity on her and left her on the bank of the Jaihun, saying, 
save thyself, and return not to the city, lest the king slay thee, and slay us with thee. This is all we know of her. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 11. Recording by Daniel Vermont in Osaka, Japan. Section 12 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel Vermont. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 12. When it was the six hundred and seventieth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the two men ended the tale of Fakhrtaj with these words, And we left her upon the bank of the river Jaihun. Now when Kharib heard this, he bade bring the astrologers, and said to them, Strike me aboard of geomancy, and find out what is come of Fakhrtaj, and whether she is still in the bonds of life or dead. They did so, and said, O oh, king of the age, it is manifest to us that the princess is alive, and hath borne a male child, but she is with the tribe of the Jeanne, and will be parted from thee twenty years. Count, therefore, how many years thou hast been absent in travel. So he reckoned up the years of his absence, and found them eight years, and said, There is no majesty, and there is no might, save in Allah, the glorious, the great. Then he sent for all Sabur's governors of towns and strongholds, and they came and did him homage. Now one day after this, as he sat in his palace, behold, a cloud of dust appeared in the distance, and spread, till it walled the whole land, and darkened the horizon. So he summoned the two Marids, and bade them reconnoiter. And they went forth under the dust-cloud, and snatching up a horseman of the advancing host, returned, and set him down before Kharib, saying, Ask this fellow, for he is of the army. Quoth Kharib, Whose power is this? And the man answered, O king! "'Tis the army of Hirat Shah, king of Shiraz, who is come forth to fight thee. Now the cause of Hirat Shah's coming was this. When Kharib defeated Sabur's army, as hath been related, and took him prisoner, the king's son fled with a handful of his father's force, and ceased not flying till he reached the city of Shiraz, where he went in to King Hirat Shah, and kissed ground before him, whilst the tears ran down his cheeks. When the king saw him in this case, he said to him, Lift thy head, O youth, and tell me what maketh thee weep. He replied, O king, a king of the Arabs, by name Kharib, hath fallen on us, and captured the king my sire, and slain the Persians, making them drain the cup of death. And he told him all that had passed from first to last. Quoth Hiraja, Is my wife well? And quoth the prince, Kharib hath taken her, cried the king. As my head liveth, I will not leave a Badawi or a Moslem on the face of the earth. So he wrote letters to his viceroys, who levied their troops and joined him with an army, which, when reviewed, numbered eighty-five thousand men. Then he opened his armories and distributed arms and armor to the troops, after which he set out with them and journeyed till he came to Ispanir, and all encamped before the city gate. Hereupon Kailajan and Kurajan came in to Kharib and, kissing his knee, said to him, O oh, our Lord, heal our hearts, and give us this host to our share. And he said, Up, and at them. So the two Marids flew aloft high in the lift, and lighting down in the pavilion of the king of Shiraz, 
found him seated on his chair of estate, with the Prince of Persia, Ward Shaw, son of Sabur, sitting on his right hand, and about him his captains, with whom he was taking counsel for the slaughter of the Moslems. Kailajan came forward and caught up the prince, and Kurajan snatched up the king, and the twain flew back with them to Kharib, who caused beat them till they fainted. Then the Marids returned to the Shirazian camp, and drawing their swords, which no mortal man had strength to wield, fell upon the misbelievers, and Allah hurried their souls to the fire and abiding place dire, whilst they saw no one and nothing save two swords flashing and reaping men, as a husbandman reaps corn. So they left their tents, and mounting their horses barebacked, fled, and the Marids pursued them two days, and slew of them much people, after which they returned and kissed Kharib's hand. He thanked them for the deed they had done, and said to them, The spoil of the infidels is yours alone. None shall share with you therein. So they called down blessings on him, and going forth, gathered the booty together, and abode in their own homes. On this wise it fared with them. But as regards Kharib and his lieges, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and seventy-first night, she resumed. It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that after Kharib had put to flight the host of Khiraj Shah, he bade Kailajan and Kurajan take the spoil to their own possession, nor share it with any. So they gathered the booty and abode in their own homes. Meanwhile, the remains of the beaten force ceased not flying till they reached the city of Shiraz, and there lifted up the voice of weeping, and began the ceremonial lamentations for those of them that had been slain. Now King Khiraj Shah had a brother, Siran the sorcerer Hais, than whom there was no greater wizard in his day, and he lived apart from his brother in a certain stronghold called the Fortless of Fruits in a place abounding in trees and streams, and birds and blooms, half a day's journey from Shiraz. So the fugitives betook them thither, and went in to Siron the sorcerer, weeping and wailing aloud. Quoth he, O oh, folk, what careth you weep? And they told him all that had happened, especially how the two Marids had carried off his brother, Khiraj Shah, whereupon the light of his eyes became night, and he said, By the virtue of my faith, I will certainly slay Kharib and all his men, and leave not one alive to tell the tale. Then he pronounced certain magical words, and summoned the Red King, who appeared, and Siran said to him, Fare for Isbanir and fall on Kharib, as he sitteth upon his throne, replied he, hearkening and obedience, and gathering his troops, repaired to Ispanir, and assailed Kharib, who, seeing him, drew his sword Al-Mahik, and he, and Kailajan and Kurajan, fell upon the army of the Red King, and slew of them five hundred and thirty, and wounded the king himself with a grievous wound, whereupon he and his people fled, and stayed not in their flight, till they reached the fortalice of fruits, and went into Siran, crying out and exclaiming, Woe! and Ruin! And the Red King said to Siran, O oh, sage! Kharib hath with him the enchanted sword of Japhet, son of Noah, and whomsoever he smiteth therewith, he severeth him in sunder, and with him also are two Marids from Mount Caucasus, given to him by King Murash. He it is who slew the Blue King and Barkin Lord of the Carnelian city, and did to death much people of the Jin. When the enchanter heard this, he said to the Red King, Go! And he went his ways, whereupon he resumed his conjurations, and calling up a Marid by name Zuazia, gave him a dram of levigated bong, and said to him, 
go thou to Isbanir, and enter King Kharib's palace, and assume the form of a sparrow. Wait till he fall asleep, and there be none with him. Then put the bong up his nostrils, and bring him to me. To hear is to obey, replied the Marid, and flew to Isbanir, where, changing himself into a sparrow, he perched on the window of the palace, and waited till all Kharib's attendants retired to their rooms, and the king himself slept. Then he flew down and going up to Kharib, blew the powdered bong into his nostrils till he lost his senses, whereupon he wrapped him in the bed coverlet and flew off with him like the storm wind to the fortalice of fruits, where he arrived at midnight and laid his prize before Siran. The sorcerer thanked him and would have put Kharib to death as he lay senseless under bong, but a man of his people withheld him, saying, O oh, sage, and thou slay him, his friend King Murash will fall on us with all his ifrits and lay waste our realm. How then shall we do with him? asked Siran, and the other answered, Cast him into the Shaihun while he is still in Bang, and he shall be drowned, and none will know who threw him in. And Siran bade the Marid take Kharib and cast him into Jaihun River. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and seventy-second night, she resumed, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the Marid took Kharib and carried him to the Jaihun, purposing to cast him therein, but it was grievous to him to drown him. Wherefore, he made a raft of wood, and binding it with cords, pushed it out, and Kharib thereon, into the current, which carried it away. Thus fared it with Kharib, but as regards his people, when they awoke in the morning, and went in to do their service to their king, they found him not, and seeing his rosary on the throne, awaited him a while, but he came not. So they sought out the head chamberlain, and said to him, Go into the harem, and look for the king, for it is not his habit to tarry till this time. Accordingly, the chamberlain entered the seraglio, and inquired for the king. But the women said, Since yesterday we have not seen him. Thereupon he returned and told the officers, who were confounded, and said, Let us see if he have gone to take his pleasure in the gardens. Then they went out and questioned the gardeners if they had seen the king, and they answered, No, whereat they were sore concerned, and searched all the garths till the end of the day, when they returned in tears. Moreover, the two Marids sought for him all round the city, but came back after three days, without having happened on any tidings of him. So the people donned black, and made their complaint to the Lord of all worshipping men who cloth as he is fain. Meanwhile, the current bore the raft along for five days, till it brought it to the salt sea, where the waves disported with Kharib, and his stomach, being troubled, threw up the bong. Then he opened his eyes, and finding himself in the midst of the main, a plaything of the billows, said, There is no majesty, and there is no might, save in Allah, the glorious, the great, would to heaven I wot who hath done this deed by me. Presently, as he lay, perplexed concerning his case, lo, he caught sight of a ship sailing by, and signalled with his sleeve to the sailors, who came to him and took him up, saying, Who art thou, and whence comest thou? He replied, Do ye feed me, and give me to drink, till I recover myself, and after I will tell you who I am. So they brought him water and victual, and he ate and drank, and Allah restored to him his reason. Then he asked them, O folk, what countrymen are ye, and what is your faith? And they answered, We are from Karaj, and we worship an idol called Minkash. Cried Kharib, Perdition to you and your idol! O dogs, none is worthy of worship save Allah! who created all things, who saith to a thing, be, 
and it becometh. When they heard this, they rose up and fell upon him in great wrath, and would have seized him. Now he was without weapons, but whomsoever he struck, he smote down and deprived of life, till he had felled forty men, after which they overcame him by force of numbers, and bound him fast, saying, We will not slay him save in our own land, that we may first show him to our king. Then they sailed on, till they came to the city of Karaj. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 12 Recording by Daniel Vermont in Osaka, Japan Section 13 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Kluckner. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 13. When it was the six hundred and seventy-third night, she pursued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the ship's crew seized Harib and bound him fast, they said, We will not slay him save in our own land. Then they sailed on till they came to the city of Karaj, the builder whereof was an Amalekite, fierce and furious, and he had set up at each gate of the city a magical figure of copper which, whenever a stranger entered, blew a blast on a trumpet, that all in the city heard it and fell upon the stranger and slew him, except they embraced their creed. When Harib entered the city, the figure stationed at the gate blew such a horrible blast that the king was affrighted, and going into his idol, found fire and smoke issuing from its mouth, nose and eyes. Now a Satan had entered the belly of the idol, and speaking as with its tongue, said, O king, there is come to thy city one Haiz Harib, king of al-Iraq, who biddeth the folk quit their belief and worship his lord. Wherefore, when they bring him before thee, look thou spare him not. So the king went out and sat down on his throne, and presently the sailors brought in Harib, and set before the presence, saying, O king, we found this youth shipwrecked in the midst of the sea, and he is a kafir, and believeth not in our gods. Then they told him all that had passed, and the king said, Carry him to the house of the great idol, and cut his throat before him, so haply our god may look lovingly upon us. But the wazir said, O king, it befitteth not to slaughter him thus, or he would die in a moment. Better we imprison him, and build a pyre of fuel, and burn him with fire. Thereupon the king commanded to cast Harib into jail, and caused wood to be brought, and they made a mighty pyre, and set fire to it, and it burnt till the morning. Then the king and the people of the city came forth, and the ruler sent to fetch Harib, but his lieges found him not. So they returned and told their king, who said, And how made he his escape? Quoth they, We found the chains and shackles cast down, and the doors fast locked. Whereat the king marveled, and asked, Hath this fellow to heaven upflown, or into the earth gone down? And they answered, We know not. Then said the king, I will go and question my God, and he will inform me whither he is gone. So he rose and went in, to prostrate himself to his idol, but found it not, and began to rub his eyes, and say, Am I in sleep, or on wake? Then he turned to his wazir, and said to him, Where is my God, and where is my prisoner? By my faith, O dog of wazirs, haddest thou not counselled me to burn him? I had slaughtered him, for it is he who hath stolen my god and fled, and there is no help but I take brood reek of him. Then he drew his sword and struck off the wazir's head. Now there was for Harib's escape with the idol a strange cause, and it was on this wise. When they had shut him up in a cell adjoining the doomed shrine under which stood the idol, he rose to pray, calling upon the name of Almighty Allah and seeking deliverance of him to whom be honor and glory. The Marid, who had charge of the idol and spoken its name, heard him, and fear got hold upon his heart, and he said, O oh, shame upon me! Who is this seeth me while I see him not? So he went in to Harib, and throwing himself at his feet, said to him, O oh, my lord, what must I say that I may become of thy company and enter thy religion? Replied Harib, Say, there is no God but thee, God, and Abraham is the friend of God. So the Marid pronounced the profession of faith, and was enrolled among the people of Felicity. Now his name was Zalzal, son of al-Muzalzil, 
one of the chiefs of the kings of the jinn. Then he unbound Harib, and taking him and the idol, made for the higher air. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and seventy-fourth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the Marid took up Harib, and the idol, and made for the higher air. Such was his case, but as regards the king, when his soldiers saw what had befallen, and the slaughter of the wazir, they renounced the worship of the idol, and, drawing their swords, slew the king, after which they fell on one another, and the sword went round amongst them three days, till there abode alive but two men, one of whom prevailed over the other, and killed him. Then the boys attacked the survivor, and slew him, and fell to fighting amongst themselves, till they were all killed, and the women and girls fled to the hamlets and forted villages, wherefore the city became desert, and none dwelt therein but the owl. Meanwhile the Marid Zauzaal flew with Harib towards his own country, the island of Camphor, and the castle of Crystal, and the land of the enchanted calf, so called because its king al Murzazil had a pied calf, which he had clad in housings brocaded with red gold, and worshipped as a god. One day the king and his people went into the calf, and found him trembling. So the king said, O oh my god, what hath troubled thee? Whereupon the Satan in the calf's belly cried out and said, O oh Muzazil, verily thy son hath deserted to the faith of Abraham the friend at the hands of Harib, lord of al Iraq, and went on to tell him all that had passed from first to last. When the king heard the words of his calf, he was confounded, and going forth, sat down upon his throne. Then he summoned his grandees who came in a body, and he told them what he had heard from the idol, whereat they marveled and said, What shall we do, O king? Quoth he, When my son cometh, and ye see him, embrace him, do ye lay hold of him. And they said, Hearkening and obedience. After two days came Zalzal and Harib, with the king's idol of Karaj, but no sooner had they entered the palace gate than the jinn seized on them and carried them before al muzazil who looked at his son with eyes of ire and said to him o dog of the jan hast thou left thy faith and that of thy fathers and grandfathers quoth zalzal i have embraced the true faith and on like wise do thou woe be to thee seek salvation and thou shalt be saved from the wrath of the king almighty in sway creator of night and day Therewith his father waxed wroth, and said, O son of adultery, dost confront me with these words? Then he bade clap him in prison, and turning to Harib, said to him, O wretch of a mortal, how hast thou abused my son's wit, and seduced him from his faith? Quoth Harib, Indeed, I have brought him out of wrongousness into the way of righteousness, out of hell into heaven, and out of unfaith to the true faith. Whereupon the king cried out to a marid called Sayyar, saying, Take this dog and cast him into the wadi of fire, that he may perish. Now this valley was in the waste quarter, and was thus named from the excess of its heat and the flaming of its fire, which was so fierce that none who went down therein could live an hour, but was destroyed, and it was compassed about by mountains high and slippery, wherein was no opening. So Sayahar took up Harib and flew with him towards the valley of fire, till he came within an hour's journey thereof, when, being weary, he alighted in a valley full of trees and streams and fruits, and setting down from his back Harib, chained as he was, fell asleep for fatigue. When Harib heard him snore, he strove with his bonds till he burst them, then, taking up a heavy stone, he cast it down on the Marid's head and crushed his bones, so that he died on the spot. Then he fared on into the valley. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and seventy-fifth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Harib, after killing the Marid, fared on into the valley, and found himself in a great island in mid-ocean, full of all fruits that lips and tongue could desire. So he abode alone on the island, drinking of its waters and eating of its fruits and of fish that he caught, and days and years passed over him, till he had sojourned there in his solitude seven years. One day, as he sat, behold, there came down on him from the air two Marids, each carrying a man, and seeing him they said, Who art thou, O fellow, and of which of the tribes art thou? Now they took him for a jinni, because his hair was grown long, and he replied, saying, I am not of the Jan, whereupon they questioned him, and he told them all that had befallen him. They grieved for him, and one of the Ifrits said, Abide thou here till we bear these two lambs to our king, that he may break his fast on the one, and sup on the other, and after we will come back and carry thee to thine own country. He thanked them and said, 
Where be the lambs? Quoth they, These two mortals are the lambs. And Harib said, I take refuge with Allah, the God of Abraham the friend, the Lord of all creatures, who hath power over everything. Then the Marids flew away, and Harib abode awaiting them two days, when one of them returned, bringing with him a suit of clothes, wherewith he clad him. Then he took him up, and flew with him sky-high out of sight of earth, till Harib heard the angels glorifying God in heaven, and a flaming shaft issued from amongst them, and made for the Marid, who fled from it towards the earth. The meteor pursued him, till he came within a spear's cast of the ground, when Harib leaped from his shoulders, and the fiery shaft overtook the Marid, who became a heap of ashes. As for Harib, he fell into the sea and sank two fathoms deep, after which he rose to the surface and swam for two days and two nights, till his strength failed him and he made certain of death. But, on the third day, as he was despairing, he caught sight of an island steep and mountainous, so he swam for it and, landing, walked on inland, where he rested a day and a night, feeding on the growth of the ground. Then he climbed to the mountain top and, descending the opposite slope, fared on two days till he came in sight of a walled and bulwarked city, abounding in trees and rills. He walked up to it, but, when he reached the gate, the warders seized on him and carried him to their queen, whose name was Jahan Shaha. Now she was five hundred years old, and every man who entered the city they brought to her and she made him sleep with her, and when he had done his work she slew him, and so had she slain many men. When she saw Harib, he pleased her mightily, so she asked him, What be thy name and faith, and whence comest thou? And he answered, My name is Harib, king of Iraq, and I am a Moslem. Said she, Leave this creed, and enter mine, and I will marry thee, and make thee king. But he looked at her with eyes of ire, and cried, Perish thou and thy faith. Cried she, Dost thou blaspheme my idol, which is of red carnelian, set with pearls and gems? And she called out to her men, saying, Imprison him in the house of the idol, haply it will soften his heart. So they shut him up in the domed shrine, and, locking the doors upon him, went their way. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 13. Recording by Jeff Kluckner. Plymouth, UK. Section 14 of A Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Kluckner. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 14. When it was the 676th night, she resumed, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when they took Harib, they jailed him in the idol's domed shrine, and locking the doors upon him, went their way. As soon as they were gone, Harib gazed at the idol, which was of red carnelian, with collars of pearls and precious stones about its neck, and presently he went close to it, and lifting it up, dashed it on the ground, and brake it in bits, after which he lay down and slept till daybreak. When morning morrowed, the queen took seat on her throne, and said, O men, bring me the prisoner. So they opened the temple doors, and entering, found the idol broken in pieces, whereupon they buffeted their faces till the blood ran from the corners of their eyes. Then they made at Harib to seize him, but he smote one of them with his fist, and slew him, and so did he with another, and yet another, till he had slain five and twenty of them, and the rest fled, and went in to Queen Jahan Shaha, shrieking loudly. Quoth she, What is the matter? And quoth they, the prisoner hath broken thine idol, and slain thy men, and told her all that had passed. When she heard this, she cast her crown to the ground, and said, There is no worth left in idols. Then she mounted amid a thousand fighting men, and rode to the temple, where she found Harib had gotten him a sword, and come forth, and was slaying men, and overthrowing warriors. When she saw his prowess, her heart was drowned in the love of him, and she said to herself, I have no need of the idol, and care for naught save this Harib, that he may lie in my bosom the rest of my life. Then she cried to her men, Hold aloof from him, and leave him to himself. Then, going up to him, she muttered certain magical words, whereupon his arm became benumbed, his forearm relaxed, and the sword dropped from his hand. So they seized him, and pinioned him, as he stood confounded, stupefied. 
Then the queen returned to her palace, and seating herself on her seat of estate, bade her people withdraw and leave Harib with her. When they were alone, she said to him, O dog of the Arabs, wilt thou shiver my idol and slay my people? He replied, O accursed woman, had he been a god he had defended himself. Quoth she, Stroke me, and I will forgive thee all thou hast done. But he replied, saying, I will do naught of this. And she said, By the virtue of my faith, I will torture thee with grievous torture. So she took water, and conjuring over it, sprinkled it upon him, and he became an ape. And she used to feed and water, and keep him in aloses, appointing one to care for him, and in this plight he abode two years. Then she called him to her one day, and said to him, Wilt thou hearken to me? And he signed to her with his head, Yes. So she rejoiced, and freed him from the enchantment. Then she brought him food, and he ate, and toyed with her, and kissed her, so that she trusted in him. When it was night she lay down, and said to him, Come, do thy business. He replied, Tis well, and, mounting on her breast, seized her by the neck, and brake it, nor did he arise from her till life had left her. Then, seeing an open cabinet, he went in and found there a sword of damascened steel and a targe of Chinese iron. So he armed himself cape up high, and waited till the day. As soon as it was morning, he went forth and stood at the gate of the palace. When the emirs came, and would have gone in to do their service to the queen, they found Harib standing at the gate, clad in complete war-gear, and he said to them, O folk, leave the service of idols, and worship the all-wise king, creator of night and day, the lord of men, the quickener of dry bones, for he made all things, and hath dominion over all. When the kafirs heard this, they ran at him, but he fell on them like a rending lion, and charged through them again and again, slaying of them much people. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and seventy-seventh night, she pursued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the kafirs fell upon Harib, he slew of them much people. But when the night came, they overcame him by dint of numbers, and would have taken him by strenuous effort, when, behold, there descended upon the infidels a thousand marids, under the command of Zalzal, who plied them with the keen saber, and made them drink the cup of destruction, whilst Allah hurried their souls to hell-fire, till but few were left of the people of Jahan Shah, to tell the tale, and the rest cried out, Quarter! Quarter! And believed in their requiting king, whom no one thing diverteth from other thing, the destroyer of the Jababira, an exterminator of the Akasira, Lord of this world and of the next. Then Zalzal saluted Harib, and gave him joy of his safety, and Harib said to him, How knowest thou of my case? And he replied, O oh, my lord, my father kept me in prison two years, after sending thee to the valley of fire. Then he released me, and I abode with him another year, till I was restored to favor with him, when I slew him, and his troops submitted to me. I ruled them for a year's space till, one night, I lay down to sleep, having thee in thought, and saw thee in a dream, fighting against the people of Jahan Shah. Wherefore I took these thousand marids and came to thee. And Harib marveled at this happy conjuncture. Then he seized upon Jahan Shah's treasures, and those of the slain, and appointed a ruler over the city. After which the marids took up Harib and the monies, and he lay the same night in the castle of crystal. He abode Zalzal's guest six months, when he desired to depart. So Zalzal gave him rich presents, and dispatched three thousand marids, who brought the spoils of Karaj city, and added them to those of Jahan Shah. Then Zalzal loaded forty thousand marids with the treasure, and himself taking up Harib, flew with his host toward the city of Izbanir al madain where they arrived at midnight. But as Harib glanced around, he saw the walls invested on all sides by a conquering army, as it were the surging sea. So he said to Zalzal, O oh, my brother, what is the cause of this siege, and whence came this army? Then he alighted on the terrace roof of his palace, and cried out, saying, Ho, star o morn, ho, Madia! Whereupon the twain started up from sleep in amazement, and said, Who calleth us at this hour? Quoth he, Tis I, your lord Harib, the marvellous one of the deeds wondrous. When the princesses heard their lord's voice, they rejoiced, and so did the women and the eunuchs. Then Harib went down to them, and they threw themselves upon him, and lullilooed with cries of joy. 
so that all the palace rang again, and the captains of the army awoke and said, What is to do? So they made for the palace and asked the eunuchs, Hath one of the king's women given birth to a child? And they answered, No, but rejoice ye, for King Harib hath returned to you. So they rejoiced, and Harib, after salams to the women, came forth amongst his comrades, who threw themselves upon him and kissed his hands and feet, returning thanks to Almighty Allah and praising him. Then he sat down on his throne, with his officers sitting about him, and questioned them of the beleaguering army. They replied, O king, these troops sat down before the city three days ago, and there are amongst them jinns as well as men, but we know not what they want, for we have had with them neither battle nor speech. And presently they added, The name of the commander of the besieging army is Murad Shah, and he hath with him a hundred thousand horse and three thousand foot, besides two hundred tribesmen of the jinn. Now the manner of his coming was wondrous. And Shah Razad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and seventy-eighth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the cause of this army coming upon Izbanir city was wondrous. When the two men, whom Sabur had charged to drown his daughter of Hakhar Taj, let her go, bidding her flee for her life, she went forth distracted, unknowing whither to turn, and saying, where is thine eye, O Harib, that thou mayest see my case and the misery I am in? And wandered on from country to country and valley to valley, till she came to a wadi abounding in trees and streams, in whose midst stood a strong-based castle, and a lofty builded as it were one of the pavilions of paradise. So she betook herself thither, and entering the fortalice, found it hung and carpeted with stuffs of silk and great plenty of gold and silver vessels, and therein were a hundred beautiful damsels. When the maidens saw Fakhar Taj, they came up to her and saluted her, deeming her of the virgins of the jinn, and asked her of her case. Quoth she, I am daughter to the Persian's king, and told them all that had befallen her, which, when they heard, they wept over her, and condoled with her, and comforted her, saying, Be of good cheer, and keep thine eyes cool and clear, for here shalt thou have meat and drink and raiment, and we are all thy handmaids. She called down blessings on them, and they brought her food, of which she ate till she was satisfied. Then quoth she to them, Who is the owner of this palace, and lord over you girls? And quoth they, King Sal Sahal, son of Dal, is our master. He passeth a night here once in every month, and fareth in the morning to rule over the tribes of the Jan. So Fakhar Taj took up her abode with them, and after five days she gave birth to a male child, as he were the moon. They cut his navel cord, and coaled his eyes, then they named him Murad Shah, and he grew up in his mother's lap. After a while came King Sal Sal, riding on a paper-white elephant, as he were a tower plastered with lime, and attended by the troops of the jinn. He entered the palace, where the hundred damsels met him, and kissed ground before him, and amongst them Fakhar Taj. When the king saw her, he looked at her, and said to the others, Who is yonder damsel? And they replied, she is the daughter of Sabur, king of the Persians, and Turks, and Dalamites. Quoth he, Who brought her hither? So they repeated to him her story, whereat he was moved to pity with her, and said to her, Grieve not, but take patience till thy son be grown a man, when I will go to the land of the Ajamis, and strike off thy father's head from between his shoulders, and seat thy son on the throne in his stead. So she rose and kissed his hands and blessed him, then she abode in the castle, and her son grew up, and was reared with the children of the king. They used to ride forth together a-hunting and birding, and he became skilled in the chase of wild beasts and ravening lions, and ate of their flesh, till his heart became harder than the rock. When he reached the age of fifteen, his spirit waxed big in him, and he said to Fakhar Taj, O oh, my mamma, who is my papa? She replied, O oh, my son, Harib, king of Iraq, is thy father, and I am the king's daughter of the Persians, and she told him her story. Quoth he, Did my grandfather indeed give orders to slay thee, and my father Harib? And quoth she, Yes. Whereupon he, By the claim thou hast on me for rearing me, I will assuredly go to thy father's city, and cut off his head, and bring it to thy presence. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 14. Recording by Jeff Kluckner, Plymouth, UK.
Section 15 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Kluckner. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 15. When it was the six hundred and seventy-ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Murad Shah, son of Hakartaj, thus bespake his mother, she rejoiced in his speech. Now he used to go a-riding with two hundred marids till he grew to man's estate, when he and they fell to making raids and cutting off the roads, and they pushed the razias farther till one day he attacked the city of Shiraz and took it. Then he proceeded to the palace and cut off the king's head, as he sat on his throne, and slew many of his troops, whereupon the rest cried, Quarter! Quarter! and kissed his stirrups. Finding that they numbered ten thousand horse, he led them to Balk, where he slew the king of the city, and put his men to the rout, and made himself master of the riches of the place. Thence he passed to Nurain, at the head of an army of thirty thousand horse, and the lord of Nurain came out to him, with treasure and tribute, and did him homage. Then he went on to Samarkand of the Persians, and took the city, and after that to Akhlahat, and took that town also, nor was there any city he came to, but he captured it. Thus Murad Shah became the head of a mighty host, and all the booty he made, and spoils in the sundry cities he divided among his soldiery, who loved him for his velour and munificence. At last he came to Isbanir al Madain and sat down before it, saying, Let us wait till the rest of my army come up, when I will seize on my grandfather and solace my mother's heart by smiting his neck in her presence. So he sent for her, and by reason of this there was no battle for three days, when Harib and Zalzal arrived with the forty thousand marids, laden with treasure and presents. They asked concerning the besiegers, but none could enlighten them beyond saying that the host had been there encamped for three days without a fight taking place. Presently came Fakhartaj, and her son Murad Shah embraced her, saying, Sit in thy tent till I bring thy father to thee. And she sought succor for him of the Lord of the worlds, the Lord of the heavens, and the Lord of the earths. Next morning, as soon as it was day, Murad Shah mounted and rode forth, with the two hundred marids on his right hand, and the kings of men on his left, whilst the kettle drums beat to battle. When Harib heard this, he also took to horse, and calling his people to the combat, rode out, with the jinn on his dexter hand, and the men on his sinistral. Then came forth Murad Shah, armed cape up high, and crave his charger right and left, crying, O folk, let none come forth to me but your king. If he conquer me, he shall be lord of both armies, and if I conquer him, I will slay him, as I have slain others. When Harib heard his speech, he said, Avant, O dog of the Arabs! and they charged at each other, and lunged with lances, till they broke, then hewed at each other with swords, till the blades were notched. Nor did they cease to advance, and retire, and wheel, and career, till the day was half spent, and their horses fell down under them, when they dismounted and gripped each other. Then Murad Shah, seizing Harib, lifted him up, and strove to dash him to the ground, but Harib caught him by the ears, and pulled him with his might, till it seemed to the youth as if the heavens were falling on the earth, and he cried out, with his heart in his mouth, saying, I yield myself to thy mercy, O knight of the age. So Harib bound him. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and eightieth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Harib caught Murad Shah by the ears, and well nigh tore them off, he cried, I yield myself to thy mercy, O knight of the age. So Harib bound him, and the marids, his comrades, would have charged and rescued him, but Harib fell on them with a thousand marids, and was about to smite them down, when they cried out, Quarter! Quarter! and threw away their arms. Then Harib returned to his Shah Mayana, which was of green silk, embroidered with red gold and set with pearls and gems, and, seating himself on his throne, called for Murad Shah. So they brought him, shuffling in his manacles and shackles. When the prisoner saw him, he hung down his head for shame, and Harib said to him, O dog of the Arabs, who art thou that thou shouldst ride forth and measure thyself against kings? Replied Murad Shah, O my lord, reproach me not, for indeed I have excuse. Quoth Harib, 
what manner of excuse hast thou? And quoth he, No, O my lord, that I came out to avenge my mother and my father on Sabur, king of the Persians, for he would have slain them, but my mother escaped, and I know not whether he killed my father or not. When Harib heard these words, he replied, By Allah, thou art indeed excusable. But who are thy father and mother, and what are their names? Murad Shah said, My sire was Harib, king of al-Iraq, and my mother Fakhar Taj, daughter of King Sabur of Persia. When Harib heard this, he gave a great cry and fell down fainting. They sprinkled rose-water on him, till he came to himself, when he said to Murad Shah, Art thou indeed Harib's son by Fakhar Taj? And he replied, Yes. Cried Harib, Thou art a champion, the son of a champion. Loose my child. And Sahim and Kailajan went up to Murad Shah and set him free. Then Harib embraced his son, and, seating him beside himself, said to him, Where is thy mother? She is with me in my tent, answered Murad Shah. And Harib said, Bring her to me. So Murad Shah mounted and repaired to his camp, where his comrades met him, rejoicing in his safety, and asked him of his case. But he answered, This is no time for questions. Then he went in to his mother and told her what had passed, whereat she was gladdened with exceeding gladness. So he carried her to Harib, and they too embraced and rejoiced in each other. Then Fakhartaj and Murad Shah Islamized and expounded the faith to their troops, who all made profession with heart and tongue. After this, Harib sent for Sabur and his son Ward Shah, and upbraided them for their evil dealing, and expounded al-Islam to them. But they refused to profess, wherefore he crucified them on the gate of the city, and the people decorated the town and held high festival. Then Harib crowned Murad Shah with the crown of the Hosros, and made him king of the Persians, and Turks, and Medes. Moreover, he made his uncle al-Damai king over al-Iraq, and all the peoples and lands submitted themselves to Harib. Then he abode in his kingship, doing justice among his lieges, wherefore all the people loved him, and he and his wives and comrades ceased not from all solace of life, till there came to them the destroyer of delights, and sunderer of societies. And extolled be the perfection of him whose glory endureth for ever and aye, and whose boons embrace all his creatures. This is everything that hath come down to us of the history of Harib and Ajib. And Abdullah bin Ma'amar al kazi hath thus related the tale of Atba and Raya. I went one year on the pilgrimage to the holy house of Allah, and when I had accomplished my pilgrimage, I turned back for visitation of the tomb of the Prophet, whom Allah bless and keep. One night, as I sat in the garden, between the tomb and the pulpit, I heard a low moaning in a soft voice, so I listened to it, and it said, Have the doves that moan in the lotus tree, Woke grief in thy heart, and bred misery? Or doth memory of maiden in beauty decked Cause this doubt in thee, this despondency? O knight, thou art longsome for love's sick sprite, Complaining of love and its ecstasy. Thou makest him wakeful who burns with fire, Of a love like the live coal's ardency. The moon is witness, my heart is held, By a moonlight brow of the brightest blee. I recked not to see me by love ensnared, till ensnared before I could wreck or see. Then the voice ceased, and not knowing whence it came to me, I abode perplexed, but lo, it again took up its lament, and recited, Came Raya's phantom to grieve thy sight, in the thickest gloom of the black-haired night, and hath love of slumber deprived those eyes, and the phantom vision vexed thy sprite. I cried to the night whose glooms were like, Seas that surge and billow with might, with might, O night, thou art longsome to lover who Hath no aid nor help save the morning light. She replied, Complain not that I am long. Tis love is the cause of thy longsome plight. Now, at the first of the couplets, I sprang up and made for the quarter whence the sound came, nor had the voice ended repeating them, ere I was with the speaker and saw a youth of the utmost beauty, the hair of whose side face had not sprouted, and in whose cheeks tears had worn twin trenches and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and eighty-first night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Abdullah bin Ma'amar al kazi thus continued. So I sprang up and made for the quarter whence the sound came, nor had the voice ended repeating the verses, 
ere I was with the speaker, and saw a youth on whose side face the hair had not sprouted, and in whose cheeks tears had worn twin trenches. Quoth I to him, Fair befall thee for a youth. And quoth he, And thee also, who art thou? I replied, Abdullah bin Ma'amar al kazi and he said, Dost thou want aught? I rejoined, I was sitting in the garden, and naught hath troubled me this night but thy voice. With my life would I ransom thee. What aileth thee? He said, Sit thee down. So I sat down, and he continued, I am Otba bin al-Hubab bin al-Mundhir bin al-Jamu the Ansari. I went out in the morning to the mosque al-Al-Zahab, and occupied myself there a while with prayer bows and prostrations, after which I withdrew apart to worship privately. But lo, up came women, as they were moons, walking with a swaying gait, and surrounding a damsel of passing loveliness, perfect in beauty and grace, who stopped before me and said, O Atba, what sayest thou of union with one who seeketh union with thee? Then she left me and went away, and since that time I have had no tidings of her, nor come upon any trace of her, and behold, I am distracted and do not but remove from place to place. Then he cried out and fell to the ground fainting. When he came to himself, it was as if the damask of his cheeks were dyed with safflower, and he recited these couplets. I see you with my heart from far country. Would heaven you also me from far could see. My heart and eyes for you are sorrowing. My soul with you abides and you with me. I take no joy in life when you're unseen, or heaven or garden of eternity. Said I, O Atba, O son of my uncle, Repent to thy Lord, and crave pardon for thy sin, for before thee is the terror of standing up to judgment. He replied, Far be it from me so to do. I shall never leave to love till the two mimosa gatherers return. I abode with him till daybreak, when I said to him, Come, let us go to the mosque al-Azahab. So we went thither, and sat there, till we had prayed the midday prayers, when, lo, up came the women, but the damsel was not among them. Quoth they to him, O Atba, what thinkest thou of her who seeketh union with thee? He said, And what of her? And they replied, Her father hath taken her, and departed to al Samawa. I asked them the name of the damsel, and they said, She is called Raya, daughter of al Khitrif al-Sulami. Whereupon Atba raised his head, and recited these verses. My friends, Raya hath mounted soon as morning shone, and to Samawa's wilds her caravan is gone. My friends, I've wept till I can weep no more, O oh say. Hath any one a tear that I can take on loan? Then I said to him, O oh, Atba, I have brought with me great wealth, wherewith I desire to succor generous men, and by Allah I will lavish it before thee, so thou mayest attain thy desire, and more than thy desire. Come with me to the assembly of the Ansaris. So we rose and went, till we entered their assembly, when I salamed to them, and they returned my greeting civilly. Then quoth I, O assembly, what say ye of Atba and his father? And they replied, They are of the princes of the Arabs. I continued, Know that he is smitten with the calamity of love, and I desire your furtherance to al-Samawa. And they said, To hear is to obey. So they mounted with us, the whole party, and we rode till we drew near the palace of the Banu Sulaim. Now when Hitrif heard of our being near, he hastened forth to meet us, saying, Long life to you, O nobles, whereto we replied, And to thee also, behold, we are thy guests. Quoth he, Ye have lighted down at a most hospitable abode, and ample. And alighting, he cried out, Ho, all ye slaves, come down. So they came down, and spread skin rugs and cushions, and slaughtered sheep and cattle. But we said, We will not taste of thy food, till thou have accomplished our need. He asked, And what is your need? And we answered, we demand thy noble daughter in marriage for Otba bin Hubab bin Mundhir the illustrious and well-born. O my brethren, said he, she whom you demand is owner of herself, and I will go in to her and tell her. So he rose in wrath and went in to Raya, who said to him, O my papa, why do I see thee show anger? And he replied, saying, Certain of the Ansaris have come upon me to demand thy hand of me in marriage. Quoth she, They are noble chiefs, the Prophet, on whom be the choicest blessings and peace, intercedeth for them with Allah. For whom among them do they ask me? Quoth he, 
for a youth known as Otba bin al-Hubab. And she said, I have heard of Otba that he performeth what he promised, and findeth what he seeketh. Khitrif cried, I swear that I will never marry thee to him. No, never, for there hath been reported to me somewhat of thy converse with him. Said she, What was that? But in any case, I swear that the Ansari shall not be uncivilly rejected, wherefore do thou offer them a fair excuse? How so? Make the dowry heavy to them, and they will desist. Thou sayest well, said he, and going out in haste, told the Ansaris, The damsel of the tribe consenteth, but she requireth a dowry worthy herself. Who engageth for this? I, answered I. Then said he, I require for her a thousand bracelets of red gold, and five thousand dirhams of the coinage of Hajar, and a hundred pieces of woolen cloth and striped stuffs of Al-Yaman, and five bladders of ambergris. Said I, Thou shalt have that much. Dost thou consent? And he said, I do consent. So I dispatched to al Medina the Illumined, a party of the Ansaris, who brought all for which I had become surety, whereupon they slaughtered sheep and cattle, and the folk assembled to eat of the food. We abode thus forty days, when Hitrif said to us, Take your bride. So we sat her in a dromedary litter, and her father equipped her with thirty camel-loads of things of price, after which we farewelled him, and journeyed till we came within a day's journey of al Medina the Illumined, when there fell upon us horsemen, with intent to plunder, and methinks they were of the Banu Sulaim. Otba drove at them, and slew of them much people, but fell back, wounded by a lance-thrust, and presently dropped to the earth. Then there came to us succor of the country people, who drove away the highwaymen, but Otba's days were ended. So we said, Alas for Otba, oh! And the damsel hearing it cast herself down from the camel, and throwing herself upon him, cried out grievously, and repeated these couplets. Patient I seemed, yet patience shown by me, was but self-guiling till thy sight I see. Had my soul done as due my life had gone, had fled before mankind forestalling thee, then after me and thee none shall to friend, be just nor any soul with soul agree. Then she sobbed a single sob, and gave up the ghost. We dug one grave for them, and laid them in the earth, and I returned to the dwellings of my people, where I abode seven years. Then I betook me again to al Hajaz, and entering al Medina the Illumined for pious visitation, said in my mind, By Allah, I will go again to Atba's tomb. So I repaired thither, and behold, over the grave was a tall tree, on which hung fillets of red and green and yellow stuffs. So I asked the people of the place, How be this tree called? And they answered, The tree of the bride and the bridegroom. I abode by the tomb a day and a night, then went my way, and this is all I know of Atba. Almighty Allah have mercy upon him. And they also tell this tale of Hind, daughter of Al-Numan and Al-Hajai. It is related that Hind, daughter of Al-Numan, was the fairest woman of her day, and her beauty and loveliness were reported to Al-Hajai, who sought her in marriage and lavished much treasure on her. So he took her to wife, engaging to give her a dowry of two hundred thousand dirhams in case of divorce, and when he went into her, he abode with her a long time. One day after this he went into her, and found her looking at her face in the mirror, and saying, Hind is an Arab filly purest bred, which hath been covered by a mongrel mule. And colt of horse she throw by Allah, well, if mule, it but results from mulish rule. When al Hajai heard this, he turned back and went his way, unseen of Hind, and, being minded to put her away, he sent Abdullah bin Tahir to her, to divorce her. So Abdullah went in to her, and said to her, al Hajai Abu Muhammad saith to thee, Here be the two hundred thousand dirhams of thy contingent dowry he oweth thee, and he hath deputed me to divorce thee. Replied she, O Ibn Tahir, I gladly agree to this, for know that I never for one day took pleasure in him. So, if we separate, by Allah, I shall never regret him, and these two hundred thousand dirhams I give to thee as a reward for the glad tidings thou bringest me of my release from yonder dog of the Thakafites. After this, the commander of the faithful, Abd al-Malik bin Marwan, heard of her beauty and loveliness, her stature and symmetry, her sweet speech, and the amorous grace of her glances, and sent to her, to ask her in marriage. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. 
End of section 15. Recording by Jeff Kluckner, Plymouth, UK. Section 16 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pam Castile. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 16. When it was the six hundred and eighty-second night, she resumed, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the prince of true believers, Abid al-Malik bin Marwan, hearing of the lady's beauty and loveliness, sent to ask her in marriage, and she wrote him in reply a letter, in which, after the glorification of Allah and benediction of his prophet, she said, But afterwards... Know, O commander of the faithful, that the dog hath lapped in the vase. When the caliph read her answer, he laughed and wrote to her, citing his saying, Whom may Allah bless and keep. If a dog lap in the vessel of one of you, let him wash seven times, once thereof with earth, and adding, Wash the affront from the place of use. With this she could not gainsay him, so she replied to him, saying, after praise and blessing, O commander of the faithful, I will not consent save on one condition, and if thou ask me what it is, I reply that Al-Hajjai lead my camel to the town where thou tarriest, barefoot and clad as he is. When the caliph read her letter, he laughed long and loudly, and sent to Al-Hajjai, bidding him to do as she wished. He dared not disobey the order, so he submitted to the caliph's commandment, and sent to Hind, telling her to make ready for the journey. So she made ready and mounted her litter. When Al-Hajjai, with his suite, came up to Hind's door, and as she mounted and her damsels and eunuchs rode around her, he dismounted and took the halter of her camel and led it along, barefooted, whilst she and her damsels and tirewomen laughed and jeered at him and made mock of him. Then she said to her tirewomen, Draw back the curtain of the litter and she drew back the curtain, till Hind was face to face with Al-Hajjai, whereupon she laughed at him, and he improvised this couplet. Though now thou jeer, O Hind, how many a night! I've left thee wakeful, sighing for the light. And she answered him with these two. We reck not, and our life escape from bane, for waste of wealth and gear that went in vain. Money may be regained and rank rewon, when one is cured of malady and pain. And she ceased not to laugh at him and make sport of him, till they drew near the city of the caliph, when she threw down a dinar with her own hand and said to Al-Hajjai, O camel-driver, I have dropped a dirham, look for it and give it to me. So he looked and seeing naught but the dinar said, This is a dinar. She replied, Nay, tis a durham. But he said, This is a dinar. Then quoth she, Praise be Allah, who hath given us in exchange for a paltry durham a dinar. Give it to us. And Al-Hashai was abashed at this. Then he carried her to the palace of the commander of the faithful, and she went in to him and became his favorite. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and eighty-third night, she pursued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that men also tell a tale anent. Kajima bin Bishir and Ikram al-Fuyaz, there lived once, in the days of the caliph Suleiman bin Abid al-Malik, a man of the banu asad by name kajima bin bishr who was famed for bounty and abundant wealth and excellence and righteous dealing with his brethren 
He continued thus till times grew straight with him, and he became in need of the aid of those Muslim brethren on whom he had lavished favour and kindness. So they succoured him a while, and then grew weary of him, which when he saw, he went in to his wife, who was the daughter of his father's brother, and said to her, O oh, my cousin, I find a change in my brethren, wherefore I am resolved to keep my house till death come to me. So he shut his door and abode in his home, living on that which he had by him, till it was spent, and he knew not what to do. Now Ikram al-Rabai, surnamed al-Fuyaz, governor of Mesopotamia, had known him, and one day, as he sat in his audience chamber, mention was made of Kajima, whereupon quoth Ikram, How is it with him? And quoth they, He is in a plight past telling, and hath shut his door, and keepeth the house. Ikram rejoined, This cometh but of his excessive generosity, but how is it that Kajima bin Bashir findeth nor comforter nor requiter? And they replied, He hath found naught of this. So when it was night, Ikram took four thousand dinars and laid them in one purse. Then, bidding saddle his beast, he mounted and rode privily to Kajima's house, attended only by one of his pages, carrying the money. When he came to the door, he alighted, and taking the purse from the page, made him withdraw afar off, after which he went up to the door and knocked. Kajima came out to him, and he gave him the purse, saying, Better thy case herewith. He took it, and finding it heavy, put it from his hand, and laying hold of the bridle of Ikram's horse, asked, Who art thou? My soul be thy ransom, answered Ikram. O oh man, I come not to thee at a time like this, desiring that thou shouldst know me. Kajima rejoined, I will not let thee go till thou make thyself known to me. Whereupon Ikram said, I am Hait Jabir Atharat al Kiram. Quoth Kajima, Tell me more. But Ikram cried, No, and fared forth, whilst Kajima went into his cousin and said to her, Rejoice, for Allah hath sent us speedy relief and wealth. If these be but durhams, yet they are many. Arise and light the lamp. She said, I have not wherewithal to light it. So he spent the night handling the coins, and felt by their roughness that they were dinars, but could not credit it. Meanwhile Ikram returned to his own house, and found that his wife had missed him, and asked for him, and when they told her of his riding forth, she misdoubted of him, and said to him, Verily, the wali of al Jazeera rideth not abroad after such an hour of the night, unattended and secretly, save to a wife or a mistress. He answered, Allah knoweth that I went not forth to either of these. Tell me, then, wherefore thou wentest forth? I went not forth at this hour, save that none should know it. I must needs be told. Wilt thou keep the matter secret, if I tell thee? Yes. So he told her the state of the case, adding, Wilt thou have me swear to thee? Answered she, No, no, my heart is set at ease, and trusteth in that which thou hast told me. As for Kajima, soon as it was day he made his peace with his creditors, and set his affairs in order, after which he got him ready, and set out for the court of Suleiman bin Abid al-Malik, who was then sojourning in Palestine. When he came to the royal gate, he sought admission of the chamberlain, who went in and told the caliph of his presence. Now he was renowned for his beneficence, and Suleiman knew of him, so he bade admit him. When he entered, he saluted the caliph after the usual fashion of saluting, and the king asked, O Kajima, what hath kept thee so long from us? Answered he, Evil case, and quoth the caliph, What hindered thee from having recourse to us? Quoth he, My infirmity, O commander of the faithful. And why, said Saluman, comest thou to us now? Kajima replied, no, O commander of the faithful, 
that I was sitting one night late in my house, when a man knocked at the door and did thus and thus, and he went on to tell him of all that had passed between Ikram and himself from first to last. Salomon asked, Knowest thou the man? And Kajima answered, No, O commander of the faithful, he was reserved, and would say naught save, I am hight Jabir Atharat al Kiram. When Suleiman heard this, his heart burned within him for anxiety to discover the man, and he said, If we knew him, truly we would requite him for his generosity. Then he bound for Kajima a banner, and made him governor of Mesopotamia, in the stead of Ikram al-Fuyaz, and he set out for al Jazeera. When he drew near the city, Ikram and the people of the place came forth to meet him, and they saluted each other, and went on into the town, where Kajima took up his lodging in the government house, and bade take security for Ikram, and that he should be called to account. So an account was taken against him, and he was found to be in default for much money, whereupon Kajima required of him payment, but he said, I have no means of paying aught. Quoth Kajima, It must be paid, and quoth Ikram, I have it not, do what thou hast to do. So Kajima ordered him to jail. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and eighty-fourth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Kajima, having ordered the imprisonment of Ikram al-Fuyaz, sent to him again to demand payment of the debt. But he replied, I am not of those who preserve their wealth at the expense of their honor. Do what thou wilt. Then Kajima bade load him with irons, and kept him in prison a month or more till confinement began to tell upon him, and he became wasted. After this, tidings of his plight travelled to the daughter of his uncle, who was troubled with sore concern thereat, and sending for a freedwoman of hers, a woman of abundant judgment and experience, said to her, Go forthwith to the emir Kajima's gate, and say, I have a counsel for the emir. If they ask what it is, add, I will not tell it save to himself. And when thou enterest to him, beg to see him in private, and when private ask him, What be this deed thou hast done? Hath Jabir Atharat al Kiram deserved of thee no better reward than to be cast into straight prison and hard bond of irons? The woman did as she was bid, and when Kajima heard her words, he cried out at the top of his voice, saying, Alas, the baseness of it! Was it indeed he? And she answered, Yes. Then he bade saddle his beast forthwith, and summoning the honorable men of the city, repaired with them to the prison, and opening the door, went in with them to Ikram, whom they found sitting in evil case, worn out and wasted with blows and misery. When he looked at Kajima, he was abashed, and hung his head. But the other bent down to him, and kissed his face, whereupon he raised his head, and asked, what maketh thee do this? answered Kajima, the generosity of thy dealing and the vileness of my requital. And Ikram said, Allah, pardon us and thee. Then Kajima commanded the jailer to strike off Ikram's fetters and clap them on his own feet. But Ikram said, What is this thou wilt do? quoth the other, I have a mind to suffer what thou hast suffered. Quoth Ikram, I conjure thee by Allah, do not so. Then they went out together and returned to Kajima's house, where Ikram would have farewelled him and wended his way. But he forbade him, and Ikram said, What is thy will of me? Replied Kajima, I wish to change thy case, for my shame before the daughter of thine uncle is yet greater than my shame before thee. So he bade clear the bath, and entering with Ikram, served him there in person, and when they went forth he bestowed on him a splendid robe of honour, and mounted him, and gave him much money.
Then he carried him to his house, and asked his leave to make his excuses to his wife, and obtained her pardon. After this he besought him to accompany him to the caliph, who was then abiding at Ramla, and he agreed. So they journeyed thither, and when they reached the royal quarters the chamberlain went in, and acquainted the caliph Suleiman bin Abid al-Malik with Kajima's arrival, whereat he was troubled, and said, What? Is the governor of Mesopotamia come without our command? This can be only on some grave occasion. Then he bade admit him, and said, before saluting him, What is behind thee, O Kajima? replied he. Good, O commander of the faithful, asked Solomon, What bringeth thee? And he answered, saying, I have discovered Jabir Atharat al Kiram, and thought to gladden thee with him, knowing thine excessive desire to know him, and thy longing to see him. Who is he? quoth the caliph, and quoth Kazuma. He is Ikram al Fuyaz. So Solomon called for Ikram, who approached and saluted him as caliph, and the king welcomed him, and making him draw near his sitting place, said to him, O Ikram, thy good deed to him hath brought thee naught but evil, adding, Now write down in a note thy needs, each and every, and that which thou desirest. He did so, and the caliph commanded to do all that he required, and that forthwith. Moreover, he gave him ten thousand dinars more than he asked for, and twenty chests of clothes, over and above that he sought, and calling for a spear, bound him a banner, and made him governor over Armenia and Azerbaijan and Mesopotamia, saying, Kajima's case is in thy hands, and thou wilt continue him in his office, and if thou wilt, degrade him. And Ikram said, Nay, but I restore him to his office, O commander of the faithful. Then they went out from him, and ceased not to be governors under Salaman bin Abid al-Malik all the days of his caliphate. And they also tell a tale of Yunus the scribe and the caliph Walid bin Sal. There lived in the reign of the caliph Hisham, son of Abid al-Malik, a man called Yunus the scribe, well known to the general, and he set out one day on a journey to Damascus, having with him a slave-girl of surpassing beauty and loveliness, whom he had taught all that was needful to her, and whose price was a hundred thousand dirhams. When they drew near to Damascus, the caravan halted by the side of a lake, and Eunice went down to a quiet place with his damsel, and took out some victual he had with him, and a leather bottle of wine. As he sat at meat, behold, came up a young man of goodly favor and dignified presence, mounted on a sorrel horse, and followed by two eunuchs, and said to him, "'Wilt thou accept me to guest?' Yes, replied Eunice. So the stranger alighted and said, Give me to drink of thy wine. Eunice gave him to drink, and he said, If it please thee, sing us a song. So Eunice sang this couplet extempore. She joineth charms where never seen conjoined in mortal dress, and for her love she makes me love my tears and wakefulness at which the stranger rejoiced with exceeding joy, and Eunice gave him to drink again and again, till the wine got the better of him, and he said, Bid thy slave-girl sing. So she improvised this couplet. Ahari, by whose charms my heart is moved to sore distress, nor wand of tree, nor sun, nor moon, her rivals I confess. The stranger was overjoyed with this, and they sat drinking till nightfall, when they prayed the evening prayer, and the youth said to Eunice, What bringeth thee to our city? He replied, Quest of wherewithal to pay my debts and better my case. Quoth the other, Wilt thou sell me this slave-girl for thirty thousand dirhams? Whereto quoth Eunice, I must have more than that, he asked. Will forty thousand content thee? But Eunice answered, That would only settle my debts, and I should remain empty-handed. Rejoined the stranger, 
we will take her of thee of fifty thousand dirhams and give thee a suit of clothes to boot and the expenses of thy journey and make thee a sharer in my condition as long as thou livest cried yunus i sell her to thee on these terms then said the young man wilt thou trust me to bring thee the money to-morrow and let me take her with me or shall she abide with thee till i pay down her price whereto wine and shame and awe of the stranger led yunus to reply i will trust thee take her and allah bless thee in her whereupon the visitor bade one of his pages sit her before him on his beast and mounting his own horse farewelled of yunus and rode away out of sight hardly had he left him when the seller bethought himself and knew that he had erred in selling her and said to himself what have i done i have delivered my slave-girl to a man with whom i am unacquainted neither know i who he is and grant that i were acquainted with him how am i to get at him so he abode in thought till the morning when he prayed the dawn prayers and his companions entered damascus whilst he sat perplexed and wotting not what to do till the sun scorched him and it irked him to abide there he thought to enter the city but said in his mind if i enter damascus i cannot be sure but that the messenger will come and find me not in which case i shall have sinned against myself a second sin accordingly he sat down in the shade of a wall that was there and towards the wane of day up came one of the eunuchs whom he had seen with the young man whereat great joy possessed eunice and he said to himself i know not that aught hath ever given me more delight than the sight of this castrato when the eunuch reached him he said to him o oh, my lord we have kept thee long waiting but eunice disclosed nothing to him of the torments of anxiety he had suffered then quoth the castrato knowest thou the man who bought the girl of thee and quoth eunice no to which the other rejoined "'Twas Walid bin Sal, the heir apparent, and Yunus was silent. Then said the eunuch, "'Ride,' and made him mount a horse he had with him, and they rode till they came to a mansion, where they dismounted and entered. Here Yunus found the damsel, who sprang up at his sight and saluted him. He asked her how she had fared with him who had bought her, and she answered, "'He lodged me in this apartment, and ordered me all I needed.' Then he sat with her a while, till suddenly one of the servants of the house-owner came in, and bade him rise and follow him. So he followed the man into the presence of his master, and found him yesternight's guest, whom he saw seated on his couch, and who said to him, Who art thou? I am Eunice the scribe. Welcome to thee, O Eunice. By Allah I have long wished to look on thee, for I have heard of thy report. How didst thou pass the night? Well, may Almighty Allah advance thee. Peradventure thou repentedest thee of that thou didst yesterday, and saidst to thyself, I have delivered my slave-girl to a man with whom I am not acquainted, neither know I his name nor whence he cometh? Allah forbid, O Emir, that I should repent over her. Had I made gift of her to the prince, she were the least of the gifts that are given unto him. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 16 Recording by Pam Castile Section number 17 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lauren Jane. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7 by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. When it was the six hundred and eighty-fifth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Yunus the scribe said to Walid, Allah forbid I should repent over her, 
Had I made gift of her to the prince, she were the least of gifts that are given to him, nor indeed is she worthy of his rank. Walid rejoined, By Allah, but I repented me of having carried her away from thee, and said to myself, This man is a stranger, and knoweth me not, and I have taken him by surprise, and acted inconsiderately by him in my haste to take the damsel. Dost thou recall what passed between us? Quoth Yunus, Yes. And quoth Walid, Dost thou sell this damsel to me for fifty thousand dirhams? And Yunus said, I do. Then the prince called to one of his servants to bring him fifty thousand dirhams, and a thousand and five hundred dinars to boot, and gave them all to Yunus, saying, Take the slave's price. The thousand dinars are for thy fair opinion of us, and the five hundred are for thy viaticum, and for what present thou shalt buy for thy people. Art thou content? I am content, answered Yunus, and kissed his hands, saying, By Allah, thou hast filled my eyes and my hands and my heart. Quoth Walid, By Allah, I have as yet had no privacy of her, nor have I taken my fill of her singing. Bring her to me. So she came, and he bade her sit, then said to her, Sing. And she sang these verses, O thou who dost comprise all beauty's boons, O sweet of nature, fain of coquetry, in Turks and Arabs many beauties dwell, but, O my fawn, in none thy charms I see. Turn to thy lover, O my fair, and keep thy word, though but in visioned fantasy. Shame and disgrace are lawful for thy sake, and wakeful nights fulfill with joy and glee. I'm not the first for thee who fair distraught. Slain by thy love, how many a many be. I am content with thee for worldly share, Dearer than life and good art thou to me. When he heard this, he was delighted exceedingly, and praised Eunice for his excellent teaching of her and her fair education. Then he bade his servants bring him a roadster with saddle and housings for his riding, and a mule to carry his gear, and said to him, O Eunice, when it shall reach thee that command hath come to me, do thou join me, and by Allah I will fill thy hands with good, and advance thee to honour and make thee rich as long as thou livest. So Yunus said, I took his goods and went my ways, and when Walid succeeded to the caliphate, I repaired to him, and by Allah he kept his promise and entreated me with high honour and munificence. Then I abode with him in all content of case and rise of rank, and mine affairs prospered, and my wealth increased, and goods and farms became mine, such as sufficed me and will suffice my heirs after me. Nor did I cease to abide with Walid till he was slain, the mercy of Almighty Allah be on him. And men tell a tale concerning Harun al-Rashid and the Arab girl. The Caliph Harun al-Rashid was walking one day with Ja'afar the Barmecide, when he espied a company of girls drawing water and went up to them having a mind to drink. As he drew near, one of them turned to her fellows and improvised these lines. Thy phantom bid thou fleet, and fly far from the couch whereon I lie, so I may rest and quench the fire, bonfire in bones I flaming high. My lovesick form, love's restless palm, rolls o'er the rug whereon I sigh. How tis with me thou wottest well, how long then union wilt deny? The caliph marvelled at her elegance and eloquence, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and eighty-sixth night, she resumed, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the caliph, hearing the girl's verses, marvelled at her elegance and eloquence, and said to her, O daughter of nobles, are these thine own, or a quotation? Replied she, They are my very own. And he rejoined, And thou say sooth, keep the sense, and change the rhyme. So she said, Bid thou thy phantom distance keep, and quit this couch the while I sleep, so I may rest and quench the flames, through all my body rageful creep, in lovesick one whom passion's palms roll o'er the bed where grief I weep. How tis with me thou wottest well, all but thy union hold I cheap. Quoth the caliph, This also is stolen. And quoth she, Nay, tis my very own. He said, if it be indeed thine own, change the rhyme again, and keep the sense. So she recited the following. Unto thy phantom deal behest, to shun my couch the while I rest. 
So I repose and quench the fire That burns what lieth in my breast. My weary form loves restless palm, Rolls o'er with boon of sleep unblest. How tis with me thou wottest well, When union's bought tis haply best. Quoth al-Rashid, this too is stolen, And quoth she, not so, tis mine. He said, if thy words be true, Change the rhyme once more. And she recited, Drive off the ghost that ever shows Beside my couch when I'd repose, So I may rest and quench the fire Beneath my ribs ere flames and glows. In lovesick one whom passion's palms Roll o'er the couch where weeping flows, How tis with me thou wottest well, Will union come as union goes? Then said the caliph, Of what part of this camp art thou? And she replied, Of its middle in dwelling, And of its highest in tent poles. Wherefore he knew that she was the daughter of the tribal chief. And thou, quoth she, Of what art thou among the guardians of the horses? And quoth he, Of the highest in tree, And of the ripest in fruit. Allah protect thee, O commander of the faithful, said she, And kissing the ground called down blessings on him. Then she went away with the maidens of the Arabs, and the caliph said to Ja'afar, There is no help for it, but I take her to wife. So Ja'afar repaired to her father, and said to him, The commander of the faithful hath a mind to thy daughter. He replied, With love and good will, she is a gift as a handmaid to his highness our lord, the commander of the faithful. So he equipped her and carried her to the caliph, who took her to wife and went into her, and she became of the dearest of his women to him. Furthermore, he bestowed on her father largesse such as succored him among Arabs, till he was transported to the mercy of Almighty Allah. The caliph, hearing of his death, went into her greatly troubled. And when she saw him looking afflicted, she entered her chamber, and doffing all that was upon her of rich raiment, donned mourning apparel, and raised lament for her father. It was said to her, What is the reason of this? And she replied, My father is dead. So they repaired to the caliph, and told him. And he rose, and going in to her, asked her who had informed her of her father's death. And she answered, It was thy face, O commander of the faithful. Said he, How so? And she said, Since I have been with thee, I never saw thee on such wise till this time. And there was none for whom I feared save my father by reason of his great age. But may thy head live, O commander of the faithful. The caliph's eyes filled with tears, and he condoled with her. But she ceased not to mourn for her father till she followed him. Allah have mercy on the twain. And a tale is also told of al Asmai and the three girls of Basara. The commander of the faithful, Harun al-Rashid, was exceeding restless one night, and rising from his bed, paced from chamber to chamber, but could not compose himself to sleep. As soon as it was day, he said, Fetch me al Asmai. So the eunuch went out and told the doorkeepers. These sent for the poet, and when he came, informed the caliph, who bade admit him, and said to him, O Asmai, I wish thee to tell me the best thou hast heard of stories of women and their verses. Answered al Asmai, Hearkening and obedience. I have heard great store of women's verses, but none pleased me save three sets of couplets I once heard from three girls and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the six hundred and eighty-seventh night, she pursued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that al Asmai said to the prince of true believers, Verily I have heard much, but nothing pleased me save three sets of couplets improvised by as many girls. Quoth the caliph, Tell me of them. And quoth he, Know then, O commander of the faithful, that I once abode in Bassorah. And one day, as I was walking, the heat was sore upon me, and I sought for a siesta place, but found none. However, by looking right and left, I came upon a porch, swept and sprinkled, at the upper end whereof was a wooden bench under an open lattice window, whence exhaled a scent of musk. I entered the porch, and sitting down on the bench, would have stretched me at full length, when I heard from within a girl's sweet voice talking and saying, O my sisters, we are here seated to spend our day in friendly converse. So come, let us each put down an hundred dinars and recite a line of verse. And whoso extemporizeth the goodliest and sweetest line, 
the three hundred dinars shall be hers. With love and gladness, said the others. And the eldest recited the first couplet, which is thus. Would he come to my bed during sleep twere delight, but a visit on wake were delightsome or sight. Quoth the second, Naught came to salute me in sleep save his shade, but welcome, fair welcome, I cried to the sprite. Then said the youngest, My soul and my folk I engage for the youth, musk scented I see in my bed every night. Quoth I, And she be fair as her verse hath grace, the thing is complete in every case. Then I came down from my bench, and was about to go away, when, behold, the door opened, and out came a slave girl, who said to me, Sit, O Sheikh. So I climbed up and sat down again, when she gave me a scroll, wherein was written, in characters of the utmost beauty, with straight alifs, big-bellied has, and rounded was, the following. We would have the Sheikh, Allah lengthen his days, to know that we are three maidens, sisters, sitting in friendly converse who have laid down each an hundred dinars, conditioning that whoso recite the goodliest and sweetest couplet shall have the whole three hundred dinars, and we appoint the umpire between us. So decide as thou seest best, and the peace be on thee. Quoth I to the girl, Hear to me ink case and paper. So she went in, and returning after a little, brought me a silvered ink case and gilded pens, with which I wrote these couplets. They talked of three beauties, whose converse was quite like the talk of a man with experience dight. Three maidens who borrowed the bloom of the dawn, making hearts of their lovers in sorriest plight. They were hidden from eyes of the prior and spy, who slept and their modesty mote not affright. So they opened whatever lay hid in their hearts, and in frolicsome fun began verse to indict. Quoth one fair coquette with her amorous grace, whose teeth for the sweet of her speech flashed bright, would he come to my bed during sleep twere delight, but a visit on wake were delightsome or sight. When she ended, her verse by her smiling was gilt. Then the second gan singing as nightingale might. Naught came to salute me in sleep save his shade, but welcome, fair welcome, I cried to the sprite. But the third I preferred, for she said in reply, with expression most apposite, exquisite. My soul and my folk I engage for the youth, musk scented I see in my bed every night. So when I considered their words to decide, and not make me the mock of the cynical wight, I pronounced for the youngest, declaring her verse, Of all verses be that which is nearest the right. Then I gave scroll to the slave girl, who went upstairs with it, and behold, I heard a noise of dancing and clapping of hands, and doomsday astir. Quoth I to myself, Tis no time of me to stay here. So I came down from the platform, and was about to go away, when the damsel cried out to me, Sit down, O Asmai. Asked I, Who gave thee to know that I was al Asmai? And she answered, O Sheikh, and thy name be unknown to us, thy poetry is not. So I sat down again, and suddenly the door opened, and out came the first damsel, with a dish of fruits and another of sweetmeats. I ate of both, and praised their fashion, and would have ganged my gate, but she cried out, Sit down, O Asmai wherewith I raised my eyes to her and saw a rosy palm in a saffron sleeve. Meseemed it was the full moon rising splendid in the cloudy east. Then she threw me a purse containing three hundred dinars and said to me, This is mine, and I give it to thee by way of douceur in requital of thy judgment. Quoth the caliph, Why didst thou decide for the youngest? And quoth al Asmai, O commander of the faithful, whose life Allah prolong. The eldest said, I should delight in him if he visited my couch in sleep. Now this is restricted and dependent upon a condition which may befall or may not befall. Whilst for the second, an image of dreams came to her in sleep, and she saluted it. But the youngest's couplet said that she actually lay with her lover, and smelt his breath sweeter than musk, and she engaged her soul and her folk for him, which she had not done were he not dearer to her than her sprite. Said the caliph, Thou didst well, O Asmai, and gave him other three hundred ducats in payment of his story. And I have heard a tale concerning Ibrahim of Mosul and the Devil. Quoth Abu Ishaq Ibrahim al-Masili, I asked our Rashid once to give me a day's leave, that I might be private with the people of my household and my brethren. And he gave me leave for Saturday the Sabbath. So I went home and betook myself to making ready meat and drink and other necessaries, 
and bade the doorkeepers shut the doors and let none come in to me. However, presently, as I sat in my sitting chamber with my women, who were looking after my wants, behold, there appeared an old man of comely and reverend aspect, clad in white clothes and a shirt of fine stuff, with a doctor's turban on his head and a silver-handled staff in his hand. And the house and porch were full of the perfumes wherewith he was scented. I was greatly vexed at his coming in to me, and thought to turn away the doorkeepers. But he saluted me after the goodliest fashion, and I returned his greeting and bade him be seated. So he sat down and began entertaining me with stories of the Arabs and their verses, till my anger left me, and methought my servants had sought to pleasure me by admitting a man of such good breeding and fine culture. Then I asked him, Art thou for meat? And he answered, I have no need of it. And for drink? quoth I. And quoth he, That is as thou wilt. So I drank off a pint of wine, and poured him out the like. Then he said, O Abu Ishaq, wilt thou sing us somewhat, so we may hear of thine art, that wherein thou excellest high and low? His words angered me, but I swallowed my anger, and taking the lute, played and sang. Well done, O Abu Ishaq, said he. Whereat my wrath redoubled, and I said to myself, Is it not enough that he should intrude upon me without my leave, and importune me thus, but that he must call me by name, as though he knew not the right way to address me? Quoth he, And thou wilt sing something more, we will requite thee. I dissembled my annoyance, and took the lute and sang again, taking pains with what I sang, and rising thereto altogether, in consideration of his saying, We will requite thee. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 17 Recording by Lauren Jane, Dublin, Ireland Section 18 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 18. When it was the six hundred and eighty-eighth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the sheikh said to Abu Ishaq, If thou wilt sing something more, we will requite thee. I dissembled my annoyance, continued Ibrahim, and taking the lute, sang again with great attention to my singing, and rising altogether thereto in consideration of his saying, We will requite thee. He was delighted, and cried, Well done, O my lord, presently adding, Dost thou give me leave to sing? As thou wilt, answered I, deeming him weak of wit, in that he should think to sing in my presence after that which he had heard from me. So he took the lute and swept the strings, and by Allah I fancy they spoke in Arabic tongue, with a sweet and liquid and murmurous voice. Then he began and sang these couplets. I bear a hurt heart, who will sell me for this a heart whole, and free from all canker and smart? Nay, none will consent or to barter or buy such loss, ne'er from sorrow and sickness to part. I groan with the groaning of wine-wounded men, and pine for the pining ne'er freeth my heart. And by Allah, meseemed, the doors and the walls and all that was in the house, answered and sang with him for the beauty of his voice, so that I fancied my very limbs and clothes replied to him, and I abode amazed and unable to speak or move for the trouble of my heart. Then he sang these couplets. Culvers of Liwa, to your nests return, your mournful voices thrill this heart of mine. Then back a copse they flew, and well nigh took my life and made me tell my secret pine. With cooing call they one who's gone, as though their breasts were maddened with the rage of wine. Ne'er did mine eyes their like for culver see, who weep yet teardrops ne'er die their eyn. And also these couplets. O Zephyr of Naj, when from Naj thou blow, thy breathings heap only new woe on woe. The turtle bespake me in bloom of morn from the cassia twig and the willow bow. She moaned with the moaning of love-sick youth, and exposed love's secret I ne'er would show. 
they say lover wearies of love when near and is cured of love and afar he go i tried either cure which ne'er cured my love but that nearness is better than farness i know yet the nearness of love shall no vantage prove and whoso thou lovest deny thee of love then said he o oh, ibrahim sing this song after me and preserving the mode thereof in thy singing teach it to thy slave girls quoth i repeat it to me but he answered there needs no repetition thou hast it by heart nor is there more to learn then he suddenly vanished from my sight at this i was amazed and running to my sword drew it and made for the door of the harem but found it closed and said to the women what have ye heard quoth they we have heard the sweetest of singing and the goodliest then i went forth amazed to the house door and finding it locked questioned the doorkeepers of the old man they replied what old man by allah no one hath gone in to thee this day so i returned pondering the matter when behold there arose from one of the corners of the house a vox et preteria nihil saying o abu ishak no harm shall befall thee tis i abu murrah who have been thy cup companion this day so fear nothing then i mounted and rode to the palace where i told al rashid what had passed and he said repeat to me the airs thou heardest from him so i took the lute and played and sang them to him for behold they were rooted in my heart the caliph was charmed with them and drank thereto albeit he was no confirmed wine-bibber saying would he would some day pleasure us with his company as he hath pleasured thee then he ordered me a present and i took it and went away and men relate this story anent the lovers of the banu uzra quoth masrur the eunuch the caliph harun al rashid was very wakeful one night and said to me see which of the poets is at the door to-night so i went out and finding jamil bin Ma'amar al uzri in the antechamber said to him answer the commander of the faithful quoth he i hear and i obey and going in with me saluted the caliph who returned his greeting and bade him sit down then he said to him o jamil hast thou any of thy wonderful new stories to tell us he replied yes o commander of the faithful wouldst thou fainer hear that which i have seen with mine eyes or that which i have only heard quoth the caliph tell me something thou hast actually beheld quoth jamil tis well o prince of true believers incline thy heart to me and lend me thy ears the caliph took a bolster of red brocade purfled with gold and stuffed with ostrich feathers and laying it under his thighs propped up both elbows thereon then he said to jamil now for thy tale o jamil thereupon he began know o commander of the faithful that i was once desperately enamoured of a certain girl and used to pay her frequent visits and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the six hundred and eighty-ninth night she pursued it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the caliph had propped his elbows upon the brocaded cushion he said out with thy tail o jamil and the poet began no o commander of the faithful i was desperately in love with a girl and used often to visit her because she was my desire and delight of all the things of this world after a while her people removed with her by reason of scarcity of pasture and i abode some time without seeing her till i grew restless for desire and longed for her sight and the flesh urged me to journey to her one night i could hold out no longer so i rose and saddling my she-camel bound on my turban and donned my oldest dress then i baldricked myself with my sword and slinging my spear behind me mounted and rode forth in quest of her i fared on fast till one night it was pitch dark and exceeding black yet i persisted in the hard task of climbing down wadis and up hills hearing on all sides the roaring of lions and howling of wolves and the cries of the wild beasts my reason was troubled thereat and my heart sank within me but for all that my tongue ceased not to call on the name of almighty allah as i went along thus sleep overtook me and the camel carried me aside out of my road 
till presently something smote me on the head and i woke startled and alarmed and found myself in a pasturage full of trees and streams and birds on the branches warbling their various speech and notes as the trees were tangled i alighted and taking my camel's halter in hand fared on softly with her till i got clear of the thick growth and came out into the open country where i adjusted her saddle and mounted again knowing not where to go nor whither the fates should lead me but presently peering afar into the desert i espied a fire in its middle depth so i smote my camel and made for the fire when i drew near i saw a tent pitched and fronted by a spear stuck in the ground with a pennon flying and horses tethered and camels feeding and said in myself doubtless there hangeth some grave matter by this tent for i see none other than it in the desert so i went up thereto and said peace be with you o people of the tent and the mercy of allah and his blessing whereupon there came forth to me a young man as youths are when nineteen years old who was like the full moon shining in the east with valour written between his eyes and answered saying and with thee be the peace and allah's mercy and his blessing o brother of the arabs methinks thou hast lost thy way replied i even so direct me right allah have mercy on thee he rejoined o brother of the arabs of a truth this our land is infested with lions and the night is exceeding dark and dreary beyond measure cold and gloomy and i fear lest the wild beasts rend thee in pieces wherefore do thou alight and abide with me this night in ease and comfort and to-morrow i will put thee in the right way accordingly i dismounted and hobbled my she-camel with the end of her halter then i put off my heavy upper clothes and sat down presently the young man took a sheep and slaughtered it and kindled a brisk fire after which he went into the tent and bringing out finely powdered salt and spices fell to cutting off pieces of mutton and roasting them over the fire and feeding me therewith weeping at one while and sighing at another then he groaned heavily and wept sore and improvised these couplets there remains to him naught save a flitting breath and an eye whose babe ever wandereth there remains not a joint in his limbs but what disease firm fix it ever tortureth his tears are flowing his vitals burning yet for all his tongue still he silenceth all foemen in pity beweep his woes ah oh, for freak whom the foemen pitieth by this i knew o commander of the faithful that a youth was a distracted lover for none knoweth passion save he who hath tasted the passion savour and quoth i to myself shall i ask him but i consulted my judgment and said how shall i assail him with questioning and i in his abode so i restrained myself and ate my sufficiency of the meat when we had made an end of eating the young man arose and entering the tent brought out a handsome basin and ewer and a silken napkin whose ends were purfled with red gold and a sprinkling bottle full of rose water mingled with musk i marvelled at his dainty delicate ways and said in my mind never wot i of delicacy in the desert then we washed our hands and talked a while after which he went into the tent and making a partition between himself and me with a piece of red brocade said to me enter o chief of the arabs and take thy rest for thou hast suffered more of toil and travel than sufficeth this night and in this thy journey so i entered and finding a bed of green brocade doffed my dress and passed a night such as i had never passed in my life and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the six hundred and ninetieth night she resumed it hath reached me o auspicious king that jamil spoke saying never in my life passed i a night like that i pondered the young man's case till the world was dark and all eyes slept when i was aroused by the sound of a low voice never heard i a softer or sweeter i raised the curtain which hung between us and saw a damsel never beheld i a fairer of face by the young man's side and they were both weeping and complaining 
one to other of the pangs of passion and desire and of the excess of their longing for union quoth i by allah i wonder who may be this second one when i entered this tent there was none therein save this young man and after reflection i added doubtless this damsel is of the daughters of the jinn and is enamoured of this youth so they have secluded themselves with each other in this solitary place then i considered her closely and behold she was a mortal and an arab girl whose face when she unveiled shamed the shining sun and the tent was lit up by the light of her countenance when i was assured that she was his beloved i bethought me of lover jealousy so i let drop the curtain and covering my face fell asleep as soon as it was dawn i arose and donning my clothes made the wuzu ablution and prayed such prayers as are obligatory and which i had deferred then i said o brother of the arabs wilt thou direct me into the right road and thus add to thy favours he replied at thy leisure o chief of the arabs the term of the guest right is three days and i am not one to let thee go before that time so i abode with him three days and on the fourth day as we sat talking i asked him of his name and lineage quoth he as for my lineage i am of the banu odra my name is such an one son of such an one and my father's brother is called such an one and behold o commander of the faithful he was the son of my paternal uncle and of the noblest house of the banu zra said i o oh, my cousin what moved thee to act on this wise secluding thyself in the waste and leaving thy fair estate and that of thy father and thy slaves and handmaids when he heard my words his eyes filled with tears and he replied know o oh cousin that i fell madly in love of the daughter of my father's brother fascinated by her distracted for her passion possessed as by a jinn wholly unable to let her out of my sight so i sought her in marriage of her sire but he refused and married her to a man of the banu odra who went into her and carried her to his abiding place this last year when she was thus far removed from me and i was prevented from looking on her the fiery pangs of passion and excess of love-longing and desire drove me to forsake my clan and friends and fortune and take up my abode in this desert where i have grown used to my solitude i asked where are their dwellings and he answered they are hard by on the crest of yonder hill and every night at the dead time when all eyes sleep she stealeth secretly out of the camp unseen of any one and i satisfy my desire of her converse and she of mine so i abide thus solacing myself with her a part of the night till allah work out that which is to be wrought either i shall compass my desire in spite of the envious or allah will determine for me and he is the best of determinators now when the youth told me his case o commander of the faithful i was concerned for him and perplexed by reason of my jealousy for his honour so i said to him o son of my uncle wilt thou that i point out to thee a plan and suggest to thee a project whereby please allah thou shalt find perfect welfare and the way of right and successful issue whereby the almighty shall do away from thee that thou dreadest he replied say on o my cousin and quoth i when it is night and the girl cometh set her on my she-camel which is swift of pace and mount thou thy steed whilst i bestride one of these dromedaries so we will fare on all night and when the morrow morns we shall have traversed wolds and wastes and thou wilt have attained thy desire and won the beloved of thy heart the almighty's earth is wide and by allah i will back thee with heart and wealth and sword and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say End of section 18. Recording by Maricel Cui. Section 19 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 19. When it was the six hundred and ninety-first night, she said, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Jamil advised the elopement and night journey, promising his aid as long as he lived, the youth accepted and said, O cousin, wait till I take counsel with her, for she is quick-witted and prudent and hath insight into affairs. So, continued Jamil, when the night darkened and the hour of her coming arrived, and he awaiting her at the appointed tide, she delayed beyond her usual time and i saw him go forth the door of the tent and opening his mouth inhale the wafts of breeze that blew from her quarter as if to snuff her perfume and he repeated these two couplets breeze of east who bringest me gentle air from the place of sojourn where dwells my fair o breeze of the lover thou bearest sign canst not of her coming some signal bear then he entered the tent and sat weeping a while after which he said to me o my cousin some mischance must have betided the daughter of mine uncle or some accident must have hindered her from coming to me this night presently adding but abide where thou art till i bring thee the news and he took sword and shield and was absent a while of the night after which he returned carrying something in hand and called aloud to me so i hastened to him and he said o oh, my cousin knowest thou what had happened i replied no by allah quoth he verily i am distraught concerning my cousin this night for as she was coming to me a lion met her in the way and devoured her and there remaineth of her but what thou seest so saying he threw down what he had in his hand and behold it was the damsel's turban and what was left of her bones then he wept sore and casting down his bow took a bag and went forth again saying stir not hence till i return to thee if it please almighty allah he was absent a while and presently returned bearing in his hand a lion's head which he threw on the ground and called for water so i brought him water with which he washed the lion's mouth and fell to kissing it and weeping and he mourned for her exceedingly and recited these couplets o oh, thy lion who broughtest thyself to woe thou art slain and worse sorrows my bosom rend thou hast reft me of fairest companionship made her home earth's womb till the world shall end to time who hath wrought me such grief i say Allah granting her stead never show a friend. Then he said to me, O cousin, I conjure thee by Allah, and the claims of kindred and consanguinity between us, keep thou my charge. Thou wilt presently see me dead before thee, whereupon do thou wash me and shroud me, and these that remain of my cousin's bones in this robe, and bury us both in one grave, and write thereon these two couplets on earth's surface we lived in rare ease and joy by fellowship joined in one house and home but fate with her changes departed us and the shroud conjoins us in earth's cold womb then he wept with sore weeping and entering the tent was absent a while after which he came forth groaning and crying out then he gave one sob and departed this world when i saw that he was indeed dead it was grievous to me and so sore was my sorrow for him that i had well nigh followed him for excess of mourning over him then i laid him out and did as he had enjoined me shrouding his cousin's remains with him in one robe and laying the twain in one grave i abode by their tomb three days after which i departed and continued to pay frequent pious visits to the place for two years this then is their story o commander of the faithful al rashid was pleased with jamil's story and rewarded him with a robe of honour and a handsome present 
and men also tell a tale concerning the badawi and his wife caliph muawiyah was sitting one day in his palace at damascus in a room whose windows were open on all four sides that the breeze might enter from every quarter now it was a day of excessive heat with no breeze from the hills stirring and the middle of the day when the heat was at its height and the caliph saw a man coming along scorched by the heat of the ground and limping as he fared on barefoot muawiyah considered him a while and said to his courtiers hath allah may he be extolled and exalted created any miserabler than he who need must hie abroad at such an hour and in such sultry tide as this quoth one of them haply he seeketh the commander of the faithful and quoth the caliph by allah if he seek me i will assuredly give to him and if he be wronged i will certainly succour him ho oh boy stand at the door and if yonder wild arab seek to come in to me forbid him not therefrom so the page went out and presently the arab came up to him and he said what dost thou want answered the other i want the commander of the faithful and the page said enter so he entered and saluted the caliph and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the six hundred and ninety-second night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the page allowed him to enter the badawi saluted the caliph who said to him who art thou replied the arab i am a man of the banu tamim and what bringeth thee here at this season asked muawiyah and the arab answered i come to thee complaining and thy protection imploring against whom against marwan bin al hakam thy deputy replied he and began reciting muawiyah thou generous lord and best of men that be and o oh, thou lord of learning grace and fair humanity thee wards i come because my way of life is straight to me o oh, help and let me not despair thine equity to see deign thou redress the wrong that dealt the tyrant whim of him who better had my life destroyed than made such wrong to dree he robbed me of my wife suad and proved him worst of foes stealing mine honour mid my folk with foul iniquity and went about to take my life before the pointed day hath dawned which allah made my lot by destiny's decree now when muawiyah heard him recite these verses with a fire flashing from his mouth he said to him welcome and fair welcome o brother of the arabs tell me thy tale and acquaint me with thy case replied the arab o commander of the faithful i had a wife whom i loved passing dear with love none came near and she was the coolth of mine eyes and the joy of my heart and i had a herd of camels whose produce enabled me to maintain my condition but there came upon us a bad year which killed off hoof and horn and left me naught when what was in my hand failed me and wealth fell from me and i lapsed into evil case i at once became abject and a burden to those who erewhile wished to visit me and when her father knew it he took her from me and abjured me and drove me forth without ruth so i repaired to thy deputy marwan bin al hakam and asked his aid he summoned her sire and questioned him of my case when he denied any knowledge of me quoth i allah assign the emir and it pleased him to send for the woman and question her of her father's saying the truth will appear so he sent for her and brought her but no sooner had he set eyes on her than he fell in love with her so becoming my rival he denied me succour and was wroth with me and sent me to prison where i became as i had fallen from heaven and the wind had cast me down in a far land then said marwan to her father with thy give her to me to wife on a present settlement of a thousand dinars and a contingent dowry of ten thousand dirhams and i will engage to free her from yonder wild arab her father was seduced by the bribe and agreed to the bargain whereupon marwan sent for me and looking at me like an angry lion said to me 
O Arab, divorce Suad. I replied, I will not put her away. But he sent on me a company of his servants, who tortured me with all manner of tortures, till I found no help for it but to divorce her. I did so, and he sent me back to prison, where I abode till the days of her purification were accomplished, when he married her and let me go. So now I come hither in thee hoping, and thy succour imploring, and myself on thy protection throwing. And he spoke these couplets. Within my heart is fire, whichever flameth higher. Within my frame are pains, for skill of leech too dire. Live coals in vitals burn, and sparks from coal upspire. Tears flood mine eyes and down, coursing my cheek ne'er tire. Only God's aid and thine I crave for my desire. Then he was convulsed, and his teeth chattered, and he fell down in a fit squirming like a scotched snake when muawiyah heard his story in his verse he said marwan bin al hakam hath transgressed against the laws of the faith and hath violated the harem of true believers and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the six hundred and ninety-third night she continued it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the caliph muawiyah heard the wild arab's words he said the son of al hakam hath indeed transgressed against the laws of the faith and hath violated the harem of true believers presently adding o arab thou comest to me with a story the like whereof i never heard then he called for ink-case and paper and wrote to marwan as follows Verily it hath reached me that thou transgressest the laws of the faith, with regard to thy lieges. Now it behoveth the wali who governeth the folk to keep his eyes from their lusts, and stay his flesh from its delights. And after he wrote many words, which, quoth he who told me the tale, I omit, for brevity's sake, and amongst them these couplets. Thou wast invested, woe to thee! with rule for the unfit crave thou of allah pardon for thy foul adultery the unhappy youth to us is come complaining mid his groans and asks for redress for parting grief and sadden me through thee an oath have i to allah sworn shall never be forsworn nay for i'll do what faith and creed command me to decree and thou dare cross me in whate'er to thee i now indite i of thy flesh assuredly will make the vulture free divorce suad equipped her well and in the hottest haste with al and ziban's son hight nasser send to me then he folded the letter and sealing it with his seal delivered it to al and nasser bin ziban whom he was wont to employ on weighty matters because of their trustiness who took the missive and carried it to al medina where they went in to marwan and saluting him delivered to him the writ and told him how the case stood he read the letter and fell a weeping but he went in to suad as twas not in his power to refuse obedience to the caliph and acquainting her with the case divorced her in the presence of al kumait and nasser after which he equipped her and delivered her to them together with a letter to the caliph wherein he versified as follows hurry not prince of faithful men with best of grace thy vow i will accomplish as twas vowed and with the gladdest gree i sinned not adulterous sin when i loved her i then how canst charge me with a vulture's deed or any villainy soon comes to thee that splendid sun which hath no living peer on earth nor aught in mortal men of jinns her like shalt see this he sealed with his own signet and gave to the messengers who returned with suad to damascus and delivered to muawiyah the letter and when he had read it he cried verily he hath obeyed handsomely but he exceedeth in his praise of the woman then he called for her and saw beauty such as he had never seen for comeliness and loveliness stature and symmetrical grace moreover he talked with her and found her fluent of speech and choice in words quoth he bring me the arab 
so they fetched the man who came sore disordered for shifts and changes of fortune and muawiyah said to him o arab an thou wilt freely give her up to me i will bestow upon thee in her stead three slave-girls high-bosomed maids like moons with each a thousand dinars and i will assign thee on the treasury such an annual sum as shall content thee and enrich thee when the arab heard this he groaned one groan and swooned away so that muawiyah thought he was dead and as soon as he revived the caliph said to him what aileth thee the arab answered with heavy heart and in sore need have i appealed to thee from the injustice of marwan bin al hakam but to whom shall i appeal from thine injustice and he versified in these couplets make me not allah save the caliph one of the betrayed who from the fiery sands to fire must sue for help and aid deign thou restore suad to this afflicted heart distraught with every morn and eve by sorest sorrow is waylaid loose thou my bonds and grudge me not and give her back to me and if thou do so ne'er thou shalt for lack of thanks upbraid then said he by allah o commander of the faithful wert thou to give me all the riches contained in the caliphate yet would i not take them without suad and he recited this couplet i love suad and unto all but hers my love is dead each morn i feel her love to me is drink and daily bread quoth the caliph thou confessest to having divorced her and marwan owned the like so now we will give her free choice and she choose other than thee we will marry her to him and if she choose thee we will restore her to thee replied the arab do so so muawiyah said to her what sayest thou o suad which dost thou choose the commander of the faithful with his honour and glory and dominion and palaces and treasures and all else thou seest at this command or marwin bin al hakam with his violence and tyranny or this arab with his hunger and poverty so she improvised these couplets this one whom hunger plagues and rags unfold dearer than tribe and kith and kin i hold than crowned head or deputy marwan or all who boast of silver coins and gold then said she by allah o commander of the faithful i will not forsake him for the shifts of fortune or the perfidies of fate there being between us old companionship we may not forget and love beyond stay and let and indeed tis but just that i bear with him in his adversity even as i shared with him in prosperity the caliph marvelled at her wit and love and constancy and ordering her ten thousand dirhams delivered her to the arab who took his wife and went away and they likewise tell a tale of the lovers of bassora the caliph harun al rashid was sleepless one night so he sent for al asma'i and husayn al kalia and said to them tell me a story you twain and do thou begin o husayn he said tis well o commander of the faithful and thus began some years ago i dropped down stream to bassora to present to muhammad bin sulaiman al rabii a kasida or elegy i had composed in his praise and he accepted it and bade me abide with him one day i went out to al mirbad and by way of al muhalia and being oppressed by the excessive heat went up to a great door to ask for drink when i was suddenly aware of a damsel as she were a branch swaying with eyes languishing eyebrows arched and finely pencilled and smooth cheeks rounded clad in a shift the colour of a pomegranate flower and a mantilla of sana'a work but the perfect whiteness of her body overcame the redness of her shift through which glittered two breasts like twin granados and a waist as it were a roll of fine coptic linen with creases like scrolls of pure white paper stuffed with musk moreover o prince of true believers round her neck was slung an amulet of red gold that fell down between her breasts and on the plain of her forehead were brow locks like jet her eyebrows joined and her eyes were like lakes she had an aquiline nose and thereunder shell-like lips showing teeth like pearls 
pleasantness prevailed in every part of her but she seemed dejected disturbed distracted and in the vestibule came and went walking upon the hearts of her lovers whilst her legs made mute the voices of their ankle rings and indeed she was as saith the poet each portion of her charms we see seems of the whole a simile i was overawed by her o commander of the faithful and drew near her to greet her and behold the house and vestibule and highways breathe fragrant with musk so i saluted her and she returned my salam with a voice dejected and heart depressed and with the ardour of passion consumed then i said to her o my lady i am an old man and a stranger and sore troubled by thirst wilt thou order me a draught of water and win reward in heaven she cried away o shake from me i am distracted from all thought of meat and drink and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say End of section 19. Recording by Maricel Qui. Section 20 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night volume seven by anonymous translated by richard francis burton section twenty when it was the six hundred and ninety-fourth night she pursued it hath reached me o auspicious king that the damsel said o sheik i am distracted from all thought of meat and drink quoth i continued hussein by what ailment o my lady and quoth she i love one who dealeth not justly by me and i desire one who of me will none wherefore i am afflicted with the wakefulness of those who wake star-gazing i asked o oh, my lady is there on the wide expanse of earth one to whom thou hast a mind and who to thee hath no mind answered she yes and this for the perfection of beauty and loveliness and goodliness wherewith he is endowed and why standest thou in this porch inquired i this is his road replied she and the hour of his passing by i said o oh, my lady have ye ever foregathered and had such commerce and converse as might cause this passion at this she heaved a deep sigh the tears rained down her cheeks as they were dew falling upon roses and she versified with these couplets we were like willow bows in garden shining and scented joys in happiest life combining when as one bow from other self would rend and oh thou seest this for that repining quoth i o oh maid and what betideth thee of thy love for this man and quoth she i see the sun upon the walls of his folk and i think the sun is he or haply i catch sight of him unexpectedly and am confounded and the blood and the life fly my body and i abide in unreasoning plight a week or e'en a sen night said i excuse me for i also have suffered that which is upon thee of love longing and distraction of soul and wasting of frame and loss of strength and i see in thee pallor of complexion and emaciation such as testify of the fever fits of desire but how shouldst thou be unsmitten of passion and thou a sojourner in the land of basura said she by allah before i fell in love of this youth i was perfect in beauty and loveliness and amorous grace which ravished all the princes of basura till he fell in love with me i asked o maid and who parted you and she answered the vicissitudes of fortune but the manner of our separation was strange and twas on this wise one new year's day i had invited the damsels of basura and amongst them a girl belonging to siran who had bought her out of oman for fourscore thousand dirhams she loved me and loved me to madness and when she entered she threw herself upon me and well nigh tore me in pieces with bites and pinches then we withdrew apart 
to drink wine at our ease till our meat was ready and our delight was complete and she toyed with me and i with her and now i was upon her and now she was upon me presently the fumes of the wine moved her to strike her hand on the inkle of my petticoat trousers whereby it became loosened unknown of either of us and my trousers fell down in our play at this moment he came in unobserved and seeing me thus was wroth at the sight and made off as the arab filly hearing the tinkle of her bridle and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the six hundred and ninety-fifth night she resumed it hath reached me o auspicious king that the maiden said to hussein al khalia when my lover saw me playing as i described to thee with siran's girl he went forth in anger and tis now o sheik three years ago and since then i have never ceased to excuse myself to him and coax him and crave his indulgence but he will neither cast a look at me from the corner of his eye nor write me a word nor speak to me by messenger nor hear from me aught quoth i hark ye maid is he an arab or an ajam and quoth she out on thee he is of the princess of bassora is he old or young asked i and she looked at me laughingly and answered thou art certainly a simpleton he is like the moon on the night of its full smooth-cheeked and beardless nor is there any defect in him except his aversion to me then i put the question what is his name and she replied what wilt thou do with him i rejoined i will do my best to come at him that i may bring about reunion between you said she i will tell thee on condition that thou carry him a note and i said mm, i have no objection to that then quoth she his name is zamra bin al mugaira hight abu al saka and his palace is in the mirbad therewith she called to those within for ink-case and paper and tucking up her sleeves showed two wrists like broad rings of silver she then wrote after the basmala as follows my lord the omission of blessings at the head of this my letter shows my insufficiency and know that had my prayer been answered thou hast never left me for how often have i prayed that thou shouldest not leave me and yet thou didst leave me were it not that distress with me exceeded the bounds of restraint that which thy servant hath forced herself to do in writing this writ were an aidance to her despite her despair of thee because of her knowledge of thee that thou wilt fail to answer do thou fulfil her desire my lord for a sight of thee from the porch as thou passest in the street wherewith thou wilt quicken the dead soul in her or far better for her still than this do thou write her a letter with thine own hand allah endow it with all excellence and appoint it in requital of the intimacy that was between us in the nights of time past whereof thou must preserve the memory my lord was i not to thee a lover sick with passion and thou answer my prayer i will give to thee thanks and to allah praise and so the peace then she gave me the letter and i went away next morning i repaired to the door of the viceroy mohammed bin sulaiman where i found an assembly of the notables of bassorah and amongst them a youth who adorned the gathering and surpassed in beauty and brightness all who were there and indeed the emir mohammed set him above himself i asked who he was and behold it was zamra himself so i said in my mind verily there hath befallen yonder unhappy one that which hath befallen her then i betook myself to the mirbad and stood waiting at the door of his house till he came riding up in state when i accosted him and invoking more than usual blessings on him handed him the missive when he read it and understood it he said to me o sheikh we have taken other in her stead say me wilt thou see the substitute i answered yes whereupon he called out a woman's name and there came forth a damsel who shamed the two greater lights swelling breasted walking the gait of one who hasteneth without fear to whom he gave the note saying do thou answer it when she read it she turned pale at the contents and said to me 
O old man, crave pardon of Allah for this that thou hast brought. So I went out, O commander of the faithful, dragging my feet and returning to her, asked leave to enter. When she saw me, she asked, What is behind thee? And I answered, Evil and despair. Quoth she, Have thou no concern of him? Where are Allah and his power? Then she ordered me five hundred dinars, and I took them and went away. Some days after, I passed by the place and saw there horsemen and footmen. So I went in, and lo, these were the companions of Zamra, who were begging her to return to him. But she said, No, by Allah, I will not look him in the face. And she prostrated herself in gratitude to Allah and exultation over Zamra's defeat. Then I drew near her, and she pulled out to me a letter wherein was written after the bismillah, my lady but for my forbearance towards thee whose life allah lengthen i would relate somewhat of what betided from thee and set out my excuse in that thou transgressest against me whenas thou wast manifestly a sinner against thyself and myself in breach of vows and lack of constancy and preference of another over us for by allah on whom we call for help against that which was of thy free will thou didst transgress against the love of me and so the peace then she showed me the presents and rarities he had sent her which were of the value of thirty thousand dinars i saw her again after this and zamra had married her quoth al rashid had not zamra been beforehand with us i should certainly have had to do with her myself and men tell the tale of ishak of musul and his mistress and the devil Quoth Ishak bin Ibrahim al Mausili, I was in my house one night in the winter time when the clouds had dispread themselves and the rains poured down in torrents as from the mouths of water skins, and the folk forbore to come and go about the ways for that which was therein of rain and slough. Now I was straitened in breast because none of my brethren came to me, nor could I go to them by reason of the mud and mire. So I said to my servant, bring me wherewithal i may divert myself accordingly he brought me meat and drink but i had no heart to eat without some one to keep me company and i ceased not to look out of window and watch the ways till nightfall when i bethought myself of a damsel belonging to one of the sons of al mahdi whom i loved and who was skilled in singing and playing upon instruments of music and said to myself were she here with us to-night my joy would be complete and my night would be abridged of the melancholy and restlessness which are upon me. At this moment one knocked at the door, saying, Shall a beloved enter in who standeth at the door? Quoth I to myself, Meseems the plant of my desire hath fruited. So I went to the door and found my mistress with a long green skirt wrapped about her and a kerchief of brocade on her head to fend her from the rain. She was covered with mud to her knees, and all that was upon her was drenched with water from gargoyles and house-spouts. In short, she was in sorry plight. So I said to her, O oh, my mistress, what bringeth thee hither through all this mud? Replied she, Thy messenger came and set forth to me that which was with thee of love and longing, so that I could not choose but yield and hasten to thee. I marvelled at this, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the six hundred and ninety-sixth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the damsel came and knocked at ishak's door he went forth to her and cried o oh, my lady what bringeth thee hither through all this mud and she replied thy messenger came and set forth to me that which was with thee of love and longing so that i could not choose but yield and hasten to thee i marvelled at this but did not like to tell her that i had sent no messenger wherefore i said praised be allah for that he hath brought us together after all i have suffered by the mortification of patience verily hast thou delayed an hour longer i must have run to thee because of my much love for thee and longing for thy presence then i called to my boy for water that i might better her plight and he brought a kettle full of hot water such as she wanted i bade pour it over her feet whilst i set to work to wash them myself 
after which i called for one of my richest dresses and clad her therein after she had doffed the muddy clothes then as soon as we were comfortably seated i would have called for food but she refused and i said to her art thou for wine and she replied yes so i fetched cups and she asked me who shall sing i o oh my princess i care not for that one of my damsels i have no mind to that either then sing thyself not i who then shall sing for thee i inquired and she rejoined go out and seek some one to sing for me so i went out in obedience to her though i despaired of finding any one in such weather and fared on till i came to the main street where i suddenly saw a blind man striking the earth with his staff and saying may allah not requite with will those with whom i was when i sang they listened not and when i was silent they made light of me so i said to him art thou a singer and he replied yes quoth i wilt thou finish thy night with us and cheer us with thy company and quoth he if it be thy will take my hand so i took his hand and leading him to my house said to the damsel o oh, my mistress i have brought a blind singer with whom we may take our pleasure and he will not see us she said bring him to me so i brought him in and invited him to eat he ate but very little and washed his hands after which i brought him wine and he drank three cups full then he said to me who art thou and i replied i am ishak bin ibrahim al mausili quoth he i have heard of thee and now i rejoice in thy company and i o my lord i am glad in thy gladness he said o ishak sing to me so i took the lute by way of jest and cried i hear and i obey when i had made an end of my song he said to me o ishak thou comest nigh to be a singer his words belittled me in my own eyes and i threw the lute from my hand whereupon he said hast thou not with thee some one who is skilled in singing quoth i i have a damsel with me and quoth he bid her sing i asked him wilt thou sing when thou hast had enough of her singing and he answered yes so she sang and he said nay thou hast shown no art whereupon she flung the lute from her hand in wrath and cried we have done our best if thou have aught favour us with it by way of an alms quoth he bring me a lute hand hath not touched so i bade the servant bring him a new lute and he tuned it and preluding in a mode i knew not began to sing improvising these couplets clove through the shades and came to me in night so dark and sore the lover waiting of herself twas trysting tied once more naught startled us but her salam and first of words she said may a beloved enter in who standeth at the door when the girl heard this she looked at me askance and said what secret was between us could not thy breast hold for one hour but thou must discover it to this man however i swore to her that i had not told him and excused myself to her and fell to kissing her hands and tickling her breasts and biting her cheeks till she laughed and turning to the blind man said to him sing o my lord so he took the lute and sang these two couplets ah often have i sought the fair how often fief and fain my palming felt the finger ends that bear the varied stain and tickled pouting breasts that stand firm as pomegranates twain and bit the apple of her cheek kissed o'er and o'er again so i said to her o oh, my princess who can have told him what we were about replied she true and we moved away from him presently quoth he i must make water and quoth i o oh boy take the candle and go before him then he went out and tarried a long while so we went in search of him but could not find him and behold the doors were locked and the keys in the closet and we knew not whether to heaven he had flown or into earth had sunk wherefore i knew that he was iblis and that he had done me pimp's duty and i returned 
recalling to myself the words of abu nuwas in these couplets i marvel in iblis such pride to see beside his low intent and villainy he sinned to adam who to bow refused yet pimps for all of adam's progeny and they tell a tale concerning the lovers of al medina quoth ibrahim the father of ishak i was ever a devoted friend to the barmeside family and it so happened to me one day as i sat at home quite alone a knock was heard at the door so my servant went out and returned saying a comely youth is at the door asking admission i bade admit him and there came in to me a young man on whom were signs of sickness and he said i have long wished to meet thee for i have need of thine aid what is it thou requirest asked i whereupon he pulled out three hundred dinars and laying them before me said i beseech thee to accept these and compose me an air to two couplets i have made said i repeat them to me and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say end of section twenty recording by maricel qui Section 21 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7 by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 21. When it was the 697th night, she continued, it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the youth came in to ibrahim and placed the gold in his hands saying prithee accept it and compose me an heir to two couplets he replied recite them to me whereupon he recited by allah glance of mine thou hast oppressed my heart so quench the fire that burns my breast blames me the world because in him i live yet cannot see him till in shroud i rest accordingly quoth ibrahim i set the verses to an air plaintive as a dirge and sang it to him whereupon he swooned away and i thought that he was dead however after a while he came to himself and said to me repeat the air but i conjured him by allah to excuse me saying i fear lest thou die would heaven it were so replied he and ceased not humbly to importune me till i had pity on him and repeated it whereupon he cried out with a grievous cry and fell into a fit worse than before and i doubted not but that he was dead but i sprinkled rose-water on him till he revived and sat up i praised allah for his recovery and laying the ducats before him said take thy money and depart from me quoth he i have no need of the money and thou shalt have the like of it if thou wilt repeat the air my breast broadened at the mention of the money and i said i will repeat it but on three conditions the first that thou tarry with me and eat of my victual till thou regain strength the second that thou drink wine enough to hearten thy heart and the third that thou tell me thy tale he agreed to this and ate and drank after which he said i am of the citizens of al medina and i went forth one day a pleasuring with my friends and following the road to alakik saw a company of girls and amongst them a damsel as she were a branch pearled with dew with eyes whose sidelong glances were never withdrawn till they had stolen away his soul who looked on them the maidens rested in the shade till the end of the day when they went away leaving in my heart wounds slow to heal i returned next morning to send out news of her but found none who could tell me of her so i sought her in the streets and markets but could come on no trace of her wherefore i fell ill of grief and told my case to one of my kinsmen who said to me no harm shall befall thee the days of spring are not yet past and the skies show sign of rain whereupon she will go forth and i will go out with thee and do thou thy will his words comforted my heart and i waited till al-akik ran with water 
when I went forth with my friends and kinsmen, and sat in the very same place where I first saw her. We had not been seated long before up came the women, like horses, running for a wager, and I whispered to a girl of my kindred, Say to yonder damsel, Quoth this man to thee, He did well who spoke this couplet. She shot my heart with shaft, then turned on heel, and flying dealt fresh wound and scarring wheel. So she went to her and repeated my words, to which she replied, saying, Tell him that he said well who answered in this couplet, The like of what so feelest thou we feel, Patience, perchance, swift cure our hearts shall heal. I refrained from further speech, for fear of scandal, and rose to go away. She rose at my rising, and I followed, and she looked back at me, till she saw I had noted her abode. Then she began to come to me, and I to go to her, so that we foregathered and met often, till the case was noised abroad, and grew notorious, and her sire came to know of it. However, I ceased not to meet her, most assiduously, and complained of my condition to my father, who assembled our kindred, and repaired to ask her in marriage for me, of her sire, who cried, had this been proposed to me before he gave her a bad name by his assignations, I would have consented. But now the thing is notorious, and I am loath to verify the saying of the folk. Then, continued Ibrahim, I repeated the air to him, and he went away, after having acquainted me with his abode, and we became friends. Now I was devoted to the Barmacides. So next time Jafar bin Yahya sat to give audience, I attended, as was my wont, and sang to him the young man's verses. They pleased him, and he drank some cups of wine, and said, Fie upon thee, whose song is this? So I told him the young man's tale, and he bade me ride over to him, and give him assurances of the winning of this wish. Accordingly I fetched him to Jafar, who asked him to repeat his story. He did so, and Jafar said, Thou art now under my protection. Trust me to marry thee to her so his heart was comforted and he abode with us when the morning morrowed jafar mounted and went in to al rashid to whom he related the story the caliph was pleased with it and sending for the young man and myself commanded me to repeat the air and drank thereto then he wrote to the governor of al hijaz bidding him despatch the girl's father and his household in honourable fashion to his presence and spare no expense for their outfit. So in a little while they came, and the caliph, sending for the man, commanded him to marry his daughter to her lover, after which he gave him an hundred thousand dinars, and the father went back to his folk. As for the young man, he abode one of Jafar's cup companions, till there happened what happened, whereupon he returned with his household to al Medina may almighty allah have mercy upon their souls one and all and they also tell o auspicious king a tale of al malik al nasir and his wazir there was given to abu amir bin marwan a boy of the christians than whom never fell eyes on a handsomer al nasir the conquering soldan saw him and said to abu amir who was his wazir whence come this boy replied he from allah whereupon the other wilt thou terrify us with stars and make us prisoner with moons abu amir excused himself to him and preparing a present sent it to him with the boy to whom he said be thou part of the gift were it not of necessity my soul had not consented to give thee away and he wrote with him these two couplets my lord this full moon takes in heaven of thee new birth nor can deny we heaven excelleth humble earth thee with my soul i please and oh the pleasant case no man error saw i who to give his soul prefereth the thing pleased al nasr and he requited him with much treasure and the minister became high in favour with him after this there was presented to the wazir a slave girl one of the loveliest women in the world, and he feared lest this should come to the king's ear, and he desire her, and the like should happen as with the boy. 
so he made up a present still costlier than the first and sent it with her to the king and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the six hundred and ninety-eighth night she pursued it hath reached me o auspicious king that the wazir abu amir when presented with a beautiful slave girl feared lest it come to the conquering king's ears and that the like should happen as with the boy so he made up a present still costlier than the first and sent it with her to his master accompanying it with these couplets my lord this be the sun the moon thou hadst before so the two greater lights now in thy heaven unite conjunction promising to me prosperity and kausar draught to thee and eden's long delight earth shows no charms by allah ranking as their third nor king who secondeth our conquering king in might wherefore his credit redoubled with al nasr but after a while one of his enemies maligned him to the king alleging that there still lurked in him a hot lust for the boy and that he ceased not to desire him whenever the cool northern breezes moved him and to gnash his teeth for having given him away cried the king wag not thou thy tongue at him or i will shear off thy head however he wrote abu amir a letter as from the boy to the following effect o my lord thou knowest that thou wast all and one to me and that i never ceased from delight with thee albeit i am with the sultan yet would i choose rather solitude with thee but that i fear the king's majesty wherefore devise thou to demand me of him this letter he sent to abu amir by a little foot-page whom he enjoined to say this is from such a one the king never speaketh to him when the wazir read the letter and heard the cheating message he noted the poison draught and wrote on the back of the note these couplets shall man experience lectured ever care fool like to thrust his head in a lion's lair i'm none of those whose wits to love succumb nor witless of the snares my foes prepare wert thou my sprite i'd give thee loyally shall sprite from body sundered backwards fare when al nasr knew of this answer he marvelled at the wazir's quickness of wit and would never again lend ear to aught of insinuations against him then said he to him how didst thou escape falling into the net and he replied because my reason is unentangled in the toils of passion and they also tell a tale of the rogueries of dalila the crafty and her daughter zainab the coney catcher there lived in the time of harun al rashid a man named ahmad al danaf and another hasan shuman hight the twain passed masters in fraud and feints who had done rare things in their day wherefore the caliph invested them with captains of honour and made them captains of the watch for baghdad ahmad of the right hand and hasan of the left hand and appointed to each of them a stipend of a thousand dinars a month and forty stalwart men to be at their bidding moreover to calamity ahmad was committed the watch of the district outside the walls so ahmad and hasan went forth in company of the emir khalid the wali or chief of police attended each by his forty followers on horseback and preceded by the crier crying aloud and saying by command of the caliph none is captain of the watch of the right hand but ahmad al danaf and none is captain of the watch of the left hand but hasan shuman and both are to be obeyed when they bid and are to be held in all honour and worship now there was in the city an old woman called dalila the wily who had a daughter named zainab the coney catcher they heard the proclamation made and zainab said to dalila see o oh my mother this fellow ahmad al danaf he came hither from cairo a fugitive and played the double dealer in baghdad till he got into the caliph's company and is now become captain of the right hand whilst that mangy chap hasan shuman is captain of the left hand and each hath a table spread morning and evening and a monthly wage of a thousand dinars whereas we abide unemployed and neglected in this house without estate and without honour and have none to ask of us 
now the lila's husband had been town captain of baghdad with a monthly wage of one thousand dinars but he died leaving two daughters one married and with a son by name ahmad al lakit or ahmad the abortion and the other called zainab a spinster and this dalila was a past mistress in all manner of craft and trickery and double dealing she could wile the very dragon out of his den and iblis himself might have learnt deceit of her her father had also been governor of the carrier pigeons to the caliph with a sold of one thousand dinars a month he used to rear the birds to carry letters and messages wherefore in time of need each was dearer to the caliph than one of his own sons so zainab said to her mother up and play off some feint and fraud that may haply make us notorious and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the six hundred and ninety-ninth night she resumed it hath reached me o auspicious king that zainab thus addressed her dam up and play off some feint and fraud which may haply make us notorious in baghdad so perchance we shall win our father's stipend for ourselves replied the old trot as thy head liveth o my daughter i will play off higher class rogueries in baghdad than ever played calamity ahmad or hassan the pestilent so saying she rose and threw over her face the lisam veil and donned clothes such as the poorer sufis wear petticoat trousers falling over her heels and a gown of white wool with a broad girdle she also took a pitcher and filled it with water to the neck after which she set three dinars in the mouth and stopped it up with a plug of palm fibre then she threw round her shoulder baldric wise a rosary as big as a load of firewood and taking in her hand a flag made of parti-coloured rags red and yellow and green went out crying allah allah with tongue celebrating the praises of the lord whilst her heart galloped in the devil's race-course seeking how she might play some sharping trick upon town she walked from street to street till she came to an alley swept and watered and marble paved where she saw a vaulted gateway with a threshold of alabaster and a moorish porter standing at the door which was of sandalwood plated with brass and furnished with a ring of silver for knocker now this house belonged to the chief of the caliph's sergeant ushers a man of great wealth in fields houses and allowances called the emir hassan shar al tariq or evil of the way and therefore called because his blow forwent his word he was married to a fair damsel katun hight whom he loved and who had made him swear on the night of his going in unto her that he would take none other to wife over her nor lie abroad for a single night and so things went on till one day he went to the divan and saw that each emir had with him a son or two then he entered the hammam bath and looking at his face in the mirror noted that the white hairs in his beard overlay its black and he said in himself will not he who took thy sire bless thee with a son so he went in to his wife in angry mood and she said to him good evening to thee but he replied get thee out of my sight from the day i saw thee i have seen naught of good how so quoth she quoth he on the night of my going in unto thee thou madest me swear to take no other wife over thee and this very day i have seen each emir with a son and some with two so i minded me of death and also that to me hath been vouchsafed neither son nor daughter and that whoso leaveth no male hath no memory this then is the reason of my anger for thou art barren and knowing thee is like planing a rock cried she allah's name upon thee indeed i have worn out the mortars with beating wool and pounding drugs and i am not to blame the barrenness is with thee for that thou art a snub-nosed mule and thy sperm is weak and watery and impregnateth not neither getteth children said he when i return from my journey i will take another wife and she my luck is with allah then he went out from her and both repented of the sharp words spoken to each other now as the emir's wife looked forth of her lattice 
as she were a bride of the hordes for the jewelry upon her behold there stood dalila espying her and seeing her clad in costly clothes and ornaments said to herself twould be a rare trick o dalila to entice yonder young lady from her husband's house and strip her of all her jewels and clothes and make off with the whole lot so she took up her stand under the windows of the emir's house and fell to calling aloud upon allah's name and saying be present o ye walis ye friends of the lord whereupon every woman in the street looked from her lattice and seeing a matron clad after sufi fashion in clothes of white wool as she were a pavilion of light said allah bring us a blessing by the agents of this pious old person from whose face issueth light and katun the wife of the emir hasan burst into tears and said to her handmaid get thee down o makbulah and kiss the hand of sheikh abu ali the porter and say to him let yonder religious enter to my lady so haply she may get a blessing of her so she went down to the porter and kissing his hand said to him my mistress telleth thee let yonder pious old woman come in to me so may i get a blessing of her and belike her benediction may extend to us likewise and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say end of section twenty one recording by maricel qui section twenty two of the book of a thousand nights and a night volume seven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jeff kluckner the book of a thousand nights and a night volume seven by anonymous translated by richard francis burton section twenty two when it was the seven hundredth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the handmaid went down and said to the porter suffer yonder religious enter to my lady so haply she may get a blessing of her and we too may be blessed one and all the gatekeeper went up to delilah and kissed her hand but she forbade him saying away from me lest my ablution be made null and void thou also art of the attracted god wards and kindly looked upon by allah's saints and under his especial guardianship may he deliver thee from this servitude o abu ali now the emir owed three months wage to the porter who was straitened thereby but knew not how to recover his due from his lord so he said to the old woman o my mother give me to drink from thy pitcher so i may win a blessing through thee she took the ewer from her shoulder and whirled it about in air so that the plug flew out of its mouth and the three dinars fell to the ground the porter saw them and picked them up saying in his mind glory to god this old woman is one of the saints that have hordes at their command it hath been revealed to her of me that i am in want of money for daily expenses so she hath conjured me these three dinars out of the air then said he to her take o my aunt these three dinars which fell from thy pitcher and she replied away with them from me i am of the folk who occupy not themselves with the things of the world no never take them and use them for thine own benefit in lieu of those the emir oweth thee. Quoth he, Thanks to Allah for succor, this is of the chapter of revelation. Thereupon the maid accosted her, and kissing her hand, carried her up to her mistress. She found the lady as she were a treasure, whose guardian talisman had been loosed, and Katun bade her welcome and kissed her hand. Quoth she, O oh, my daughter, I come not to thee save for thy weal and by Allah's will. Then Katun set food before her, but she said, O oh my daughter, I eat not except of the food of paradise, and I keep continual fast, breaking it but five days in the year. But, O oh my child, I see thee chagrined, and desire that thou tell me the cause of thy concern. O oh my mother, replied Katun, I made my husband swear, on my wedding night, that he would wive none but me, and he saw others with children, and longed for them, and said to me, Thou art a barren thing. I answered, Thou art a mule which begetteth not. So he left me in anger, saying, When I come back from my journey, I will take another wife, for he hath villages and lands and large allowances, and if he begat children by another, they will possess the money and take the estates from me. Said Dalila, O my daughter, knowest thou not of my master, the Shaykh Abu al-Hamlahat, 
whom if any debtor visit, Allah quitteth him his debt, and if a barren woman, she conceiveth. Khatun replied, O my mother, since the day of my wedding I have not gone forth the house, no, not even to pay visits of condolence or congratulation. The old woman rejoined, O my child, I will carry thee to him, and do thou cast thy burden on him, and make a vow to him. Happily when thy husband shall return from his journey, and lie with thee, thou shalt conceive by him, and bear a girl or a boy. But, be it female or male, it shall be a dervish of the Shaykh Abu al-Hamlahat. Thereupon Khatun rose and arrayed herself in her richest raiment, and donning all her jewellery, said, Keep thou an eye on the house, to her maid, who replied, I hear and obey, O my lady. Then she went down, and the porter, Abu Ali, met her, and asked her, Whither away, O my lady? I go to visit the Shaykh Abu al-Hamlahat, answered she, and he, Be a year's fast incumbent on me. Verily yon religious is of Allah's saints, and full of holiness, O my lady, and she hath hidden treasure at her command, for she gave me three dinars of red gold, and divined my case, without my asking her, and knew that I was in want. Then the old woman went out with the young lady Khatun, saying to her, Inshallah, O my daughter, when thou hast visited the Shaykh Abu al-Hamlahat, there shall betide thee solace of soul, and by leave of Almighty Allah thou shalt conceive, and thy husband the Emir shall love thee by the blessing of the Shaykh, and shall never again let thee hear a despiteful word. Quoth Khatun, I will go with thee to visit him, O my mother. But Delilah said to herself, where shall I strip her and take her clothes and jewelry, with the folk coming and going? Then she said to her, O my daughter, walk thou behind me, within sight of me, for this thy mother is a woman sorely burdened. Every one who hath a burden casteth it on me, and all who have pious offerings to make, give them to me, and kiss my hand. So the young lady followed her at a distance, whilst her anklets tinkled and her hair coins clinked as she went, till they reached the bazaar of the merchants. Presently they came to the shop of a young merchant, by name Sidi Hassan, who was very handsome, and had no hair on his face. He saw the lady approaching, and fell to casting stolen glances at her, which, when the old woman saw, she beckoned to her, and said, Sit down in this shop, till I return to thee. Khatun obeyed her, and sat down in the shop-front of the young merchant, who cast at her one glance of eyes that cost him a thousand sighs. Then the old woman accosted him, and saluted him, saying, Tell me, is not thy name Sidi Hassan, son of the merchant Mosin? He replied, Yes, who told thee my name? Quoth she, Folk of good repute direct me to thee. Know that this young lady is my daughter, and her father was a merchant who died and left her much money. She is come of marriageable age, and the wise say, Offer thy daughter in marriage, and not thy son. And all her life she hath not come forth the house till this day. Now a divine warning and a command given in secret, bid me wed her to thee. So, if thou art poor, I will give thee capital, and will open for thee instead of one shop, two shops. Thereupon quoth the young merchant to himself, I asked Allah for a bride, and he hath given me three things, to wit, coin, clothing, and cunt. Then he continued to the old trot, O my mother, that whereto thou directest me is well, but this long while my mother saith to me, I wish to marry thee, but I object, replying, I will not marry except on the sight of my own eyes. Said Delilah, Rise and follow my steps, and I will show her to thee, naked. So he rose and took a thousand dinars, saying in himself, Haply we may need to buy somewhat. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the seven hundred and first night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the old woman said to Hassan, son of Mosin the merchant, Rise up and follow me, and I will show her naked to thee. So he rose, and took with him a thousand dinars, saying in himself, Haply we may need to buy somewhat, or pay the fees for drawing up the marriage contract. The old woman bade him walk behind the young lady at a distance, but within shot of sight, and said to herself, Where wilt thou carry the young lady and the merchant, that thou mayest strip them both whilst his shop is still shut? Then she walked on, and Katun after her, followed by the young merchant, till she came to a diary, kept by a master dyer, by name Haj Mohammed, a man of ill repute, like the Caucasia seller's knife cutting male and female, and loving to eat both figs and pomegranates. He heard the tinkle of the ankle rings, and, 
raising his head, saw the lady on the young man. Presently the old woman came up to him, and, after salaaming to him and sitting down opposite him, asked him, Art thou not Haj Muhammad the dyer? He answered, Yes, I am he. What dost thou want? Quoth she, Verily, folks of fair repute have directed me to thee. Look at yonder handsome girl, my daughter, and that comely beardless youth, my son. I brought them both up, and spent much money on both of them. Now thou must know that I have a big old ruinous house which I have shored up with wood, and the builder saith to me, Go and live in some other place, lest belike it fall upon thee, and when this is repaired return hither. So I went forth to seek me a lodging, and people of worth directed me to thee, and I wish to lodge my son and daughter with thee. Quoth the dyer in his mind, Verily, here is fresh butter upon cake come to thee. But he said to the old woman, "'Tis true I have a house and saloon and upper floor, but I cannot spare any part thereof, for I want it all for guests and for the indigo growers, my clients. She replied, "'O my son, twill be only for a month or two at the most, till our house be repaired, and we are strange folk. Let the guest-chamber be shared between us and thee, and by thy life, O my son, and thou desire that thy guests be ours, we will welcome them, and eat with them, and sleep with them.' Then he gave her the keys, one big and one small and one crooked, saying to her, The big key is that of the house, the crooked one that of the saloon, and the little one that of the upper floor. So Dalila took the keys and fared on, followed by the lady who forewent the young merchant, till she came to the lane wherein was the house. She opened the door and entered, introducing the damsel to whom said she, O oh, my daughter, this, pointing to the saloon, is the lodging of the Shaikh Abu al-Hamlahat, but go thou into the upper floor, and loose thy outer veil, and wait till I come to thee. So she went up and sat down. Presently appeared the young merchant, whom Delilah carried into the saloon, saying, Sit down whilst I fetch my daughter and show her to thee. So he sat down, and the old trot went up to Khatun, who said to her, I wish to visit the Shaikh before the folk come. Replied the beldame, O my daughter, we fear for thee. Asked Khatun, Why so? And Delilah answered, Because here is a son of mine, a natural who knoweth not summer from winter, but goeth ever naked. He is the Shaikh's deputy, and, if he saw a girl like thee come to visit his chief, he would snatch her earrings, and tear her ears, and rend her silken robes. So do thou doff thy jewellery and clothes, and I will keep them for thee, till thou hast made thy pious visitation. Accordingly the damsel did off her outer dress and jewels, and gave them to the old woman, who said, I will lay them for thee on the shaykh's curtain, that a blessing may betide thee. Then she went out, leaving the lady in her shift and petticoat trousers, and hid the clothes and jewels in a place on the staircase, after which she betook herself to the young merchant, whom she found impatiently awaiting the girl, and he cried, Where is thy daughter, that I may see her? But she smote palm on breast, and he said, What aileth thee? Quoth she, Would there were no such thing as the ill neighbor and the envious, they saw thee enter the house with me, and asked me of thee, and I said, This is a bridegroom I have found for my daughter. So they envied me on thine account, and said to my girl, Is thy mother tired of keeping thee, that she marrieth thee to a leper? Thereupon I swore to her that she should not see thee save naked. Quoth he, I take refuge with Allah from the envious, and bearing his forearm, showed her that it was like silver. Said she, Have no fear, thou shalt see her naked, even as she shall see thee naked. And he said, Let her come and look at me. Then he put off his pelisse and sables, and his girdle and dagger, and the rest of his raiment, except his shirt and bag trousers, and would have laid the purse of a thousand dinars with them. But Delilah cried, Give them to me, that I may take care of them. So she took them, and fetching the girl's clothes and jewellery, shouldered the whole, and locking the door upon them, went her ways. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the seven hundred and second night, she pursued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the old woman had taken the property of the young merchant and the damsel and wended her ways, having locked the door upon them, she deposited her spoils with a druggist of her acquaintance, and returned to the dyer, whom she found sitting, awaiting her. Quoth he, Inshallah, the house pleaseth thee? And quoth she, There is a blessing in it, and I go now to fetch porters to carry hither our goods and furniture. But my children would have me bring them a panade with meat, 
so do thou take this dinar and buy the dish and go and eat the morning meal with them ask the dyer who shall guard the diary meanwhile and the people's goods that be therein and the old woman answered thy lad so be it rejoined he and taking a dish and cover went out to do her bidding so far concerning the dyer who will again be mentioned in the tale but as regards the old woman she fetched the clothes and jewels she had left with the druggist and going back to the diary said to the lad run after thy master and i will not stir hence till you both return to hear is to obey answered he and went away while she began to collect all the customer's goods presently there came up an ass driver a scavenger who had been out of work for a week and who was a hashish eater to boot and she called him saying hither o donkey boy so he came to her and she asked knowest thou my son the dyer whereto he answered yes i know him then she said the poor fellow is insolvent and loaded with debts and as often as he is put in prison i set him free now we wish to see him declared bankrupt and i am going to return the goods to their owners so do thou lend me thine ass to carry the load and receive this dinar to its hire when i am gone take the handsaw and empty out the vats and jars and break them so that if there come an officer from the kazi's court he may find nothing in the diary. Quoth he, I owe the Hajj a kindness, and will do something for Allah's love. So she laid the things on the ass, and, the protector protecting her, made for her own house, so that she arrived there in safety, and went in to her daughter Zainab, who said to her, O oh my mother, my heart hath been with thee. What hast thou done by way of roguery? Delilah replied, I have played off four tricks on four whites, the wife of the sergeant usher, a young merchant, a dyer, and an ass-driver, and have brought thee all their spoil on the donkey-boy's beast. Cried Zainab, O oh, my mother, thou wilt never more be able to go about the town, for fear of the sergeant usher, whose wife's raiment and jewellery thou hast taken, and the merchant whom thou hast stripped naked, and the dyer whose customer's goods thou hast stolen, and the owner of the ass. Rejoined the old woman, Pooh, my girl, I reck not of them, save the donkey-boy who knoweth me. Meanwhile, the dyer bought the meat panad and set out for the house, followed by his servant with the food on head. On his way thither he passed his shop, where he found the donkey-boy breaking the vats and jars, and saw that there was neither stuff nor liquor left in them, and that the diary was in ruins. So he said to him, Hold thy hand, O ass-driver! And the donkey-boy desisted and cried, Praise be Allah for thy safety, O master! Verily my heart was with thee. Why so? Thou art become bankrupt, and they have filed a docket of thy insolvency. Who told thee this? Thy mother told me, and bade me break the jars and empty the vats, that the Kazi's officers might find nothing in the shop, if they should come. Allah confound the far one, cried the dyer. My mother died long ago. And he beat his breast, exclaiming, Alas, for the loss of my goods and those of the folk. The donkey boy also wept and ejaculated, Alas, for the loss of my ass and he said to the dyer, Give me back my beast which thy mother stole from me. The dyer laid hold of him by the throat, and fell to buffeting him, saying, Bring me the old woman, while the other buffeted him in return, saying, Give me back my beast. So they beat and cursed each other, till the folk collected around them. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 22 Recording by Jeff Kluckner, Plymouth, UK Section 23 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Kluckner. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 23. When it was the seven hundred and third night, she resumed. It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the dyer caught hold of the donkey-boy, and the donkey-boy caught hold of the dyer, and they beat and cursed each other, till the folk collected round them, and one of them asked, What is the matter, O master Mohammed? The ass-driver answered, I will tell thee the tale, and related to them his story, saying, I deemed I was doing the dyer a good turn, but, when he saw me, he beat his breast and said, My mother is dead. And now I for one require my ass of him it being he who hath put this trick on me, that he might make me lose my beast. Then said the folk to the dyer, O Master Mohammed, 
Dost thou know this matron, that thou didst entrust her with the diary and all therein? And he replied, I know her not, but she took lodgings with me to-day, she and her son and daughter. Quoth one, In my judgment, the dyer is bound to indemnify the ass-driver. Quoth another, Why so? Because, replied the first, he trusted not the old woman, nor gave her his ass, save only because he saw that the dyer had entrusted her with the diary and its contents. And a third said, O master, since thou hast lodged her with thee, it behoveth thee to get the man back his ass. Then they made for the house, and the tale will come round to them again. Meanwhile, the young merchant remained awaiting the old woman's coming with her daughter, but she came not, nor did her daughter, whilst the young lady in like manner sat expecting her return with leave from her son, the god attended one, the shaykh's deputy, to go into the holy presence. So, weary of waiting, she rose to visit the shaykh by herself, and went down into the saloon, where she found the young merchant, who said to her, Come hither, where is thy mother, who brought me to marry thee? She replied, My mother is dead. Art thou the old woman's son, the ecstatic, the deputy of the shaykh Abu al-Hamlahat? Quoth he, The swindling old trot is no mother of mine. She hath cheated me, and taken my clothes and a thousand dinars. Quoth Katun, And me also hath she swindled, for she brought me to see the shaykh Abu al-Hamlahat, and in lieu of doing so, she hath stripped me. Thereupon he, I look to thee to make good my clothes and my thousand dinars. And she, I look to thee to make good my clothes and jewellery. And behold, at this moment in came the dyer, and seeing them both stripped of their raiment, said to them, Tell me where your mother is. So the young lady related all that had befallen her, and the young merchant related all that had betided him, and the master dyer exclaimed, Alas, for the loss of my goods and those of the folk! And the ass-driver ejaculated, Alas, for my ass! Give me, O dyer, my ass! Then said the dyer, This old woman is a sharper. Come forth that I may lock the door. Quoth the young merchant, Twere a disgrace to thee that we should enter thy house dressed, and go forth from it undressed. So the dyer clad him and the damsel, and sent her back to her house, where we shall find her after the return of her husband. Then he shut the diary, and said to the young merchant, Come, let us go and search for the old woman, and hand her over to the wali, the chief of police. So they and the ass-man repaired to the house of the master of police, and made their complaint to him. Quoth he, O folk, what want ye? And when they told him, he rejoined, How many old women are there not in the town? Go ye and seek for her and lay hands on her, and bring her to me, and I will torture her for you, and make her confess. So they sought for her all round the town, and an account of them will presently be given. As for old Delilah the wily, she said, I have a mind to play off another trick, to her daughter, who answered, O my mother, I fear for thee. But the beldame cried, I am like the bean-husks which fall, proof against fire and water. So she rose, and donning a slave-girl's dress of such as serve people of condition, went out to look for some one to defraud. Presently she came to a by-street, spread with carpets and lighted with hanging lamps, and heard a noise of singing women and drumming of tambourines. Here she saw a handmaid bearing on her shoulder a boy, clad in trousers laced with silver, and a little abba cloak of velvet, with a pearl-embroidered tarbush cap on his head, and about his neck a collar of gold set with jewels. Now the house belonged to the provost of the merchants of Baghdad, and the boy was his son. He had a virgin daughter, to boot, who was promised in marriage, and it was her betrothal they were celebrating that day. There was with her mother a company of noble dames and singing women, and whenever she went upstairs or down, the boy clung to her. So she called the slave girl, and said to her, Take thy young master and play with him, till the company break up. Seeing this, Delilah asked the handmaid, What festivities are these in your mistress's house? And was answered, She celebrates her daughter's betrothal this day and she hath singing women with her. Quoth the old woman to herself, O oh, Delilah, the thing to do is to spirit away this boy from the maid. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the seven hundred and fourth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the old trot said to herself, O oh, Delilah, the thing to do is to spirit away this boy from the maid, she began crying out, O oh, disgrace! O oh, ill luck! Then pulling out a brass token, resembling a dinar, she said to the maid, who was a simpleton, Take this ducat, and go into thy mistress, and say to her, 
Um al Kair rejoiceth with thee, and is beholden to thee for thy favours, and on the day of assembly she and her daughters will visit thee, and Hansel the tiring women with the usual gifts. Said the girl, O my mother, my young master here catcheth hold of his mamma whenever he seeth her. And she replied, Give him to me, while thou goest in and comest back. So she gave her the child, and taking the token, went in, whereupon Delilah made off with the boy to a by-lane, where she stripped him of his clothes and jewels, saying to herself, O Delilah, twould indeed be the finest of tricks, even as thou hast cheated the maid and taken the boy from her, so now to carry on the game and pawn him for a thousand dinars. So she repaired to the jewel bazaar, where she saw a Jew goldsmith, seated with a cage full of jewelry before him, and said to herself, "'Twould be a rare trick to chouse this Jew fellow, and get a thousand gold pieces worth of jewelry from him, and leave the boy in pledge for it. Presently the Jew looked at them, and seeing the boy with the old woman, knew him for the son of the provost of the merchants. Now the Israelite was a man of great wealth, but would envy his neighbor if he sold, and himself did not sell. So espying Delilah, he said to her, "'What seekest thou, O my mistress?' She asked, Art thou Master Azariah the Jew? having first inquired his name of others, and he answered, Yes. Quoth she, This boy's sister, daughter of the Shah Bandar of the merchants, is a promised bride, and today they celebrate her betrothal, and she hath need of jewelry. So give me two pair of gold ankle rings, a brace of gold bracelets, and pearl ear drops, with a girdle, a poignard, and a seal ring. He brought them out, and she took of him a thousand dinars worth of jewellery, saying, I will take these ornaments on approval, and what so pleaseth them, they will keep, and I will bring thee the price, and leave this boy with thee till then. He said, Be it as thou wilt. So she took the jewellery, and made off to her own house, where her daughter asked her how the trick had sped. She told her how she had taken and stripped the Shabandar's boy, and Zainab said, Thou wilt never be able to walk abroad again in the town. Meanwhile the maid went into her mistress and said to her, O my lady, Um al Kair saluteth thee and rejoiceth with thee, and on assembly day she will come, she and her daughters, and give the customary presents. Quoth her mistress, Where is thy young master? Quoth the slave girl, I left him with her lest he cling to thee, and she gave me this, as largesse for the singing women. So the lady said to the chief of the singers, Take thy money, and she took it and found it a brass counter whereupon the lady cried to the maid, Get thee down, O whore, and look to thy young master. Accordingly she went down, and finding neither boy nor old woman, shrieked aloud and fell on her face. Their joy was changed into annoy, and behold, the provost came in, when his wife told him all that had befallen, and he went out in quest of the child, whilst the other merchants also fared forth, and each sought his own road. Presently the Shah Bandar, who had looked everywhere, espied his son seated, naked, in the Jew's shop, and said to Tile owner, This is my son. Tis well, answered the Jew. So he took him up, without asking for his clothes, of the excess of his joy at finding him. But the Jew laid hold of him, saying, Allah succor the caliph against thee. The provost asked, What aileth thee, O Jew? And he answered, Verily the old woman took of me a thousand dinars worth of jewelry for thy daughter, and left this lad in pledge for the price, and I had not trusted her, but that she offered to leave the child whom I knew for thy son. Said the provost, My daughter needeth no jewelry. Give me the boy's clothes. Thereupon the Jew shrieked out, Come to my aid, O Moslems. But at that moment up came the dyer and the assman and the young merchant, who were going about, seeking the old woman, and inquired the cause of their jangle. So they told them the case, and they said, This old woman is a cheat, who hath cheated us before you. Then they recounted to them how she had dealt with them, and the provost said, Since I have found my son, be his clothes his ransom. If I come upon the old woman, I will require them of her. And he carried the child home to his mother, who rejoiced in his safety. Then the Jew said to the three others, Whither go ye? And they answered, We go to look for her. Quoth the Jew, Take me with you, presently adding, Is there any one of you knoweth her? The donkey boy cried, I know her. And the Jew said, if we all go forth together, we shall never catch her, for she will flee from us. Let each take a different road, and be our rendezvous at the shop of Haj Masud, the Moorish barber. They agreed to this, and set off, each in a different direction. Presently, Delilah sallied forth again to play her tricks, and the ass-driver met her and knew her. So he caught hold of her, and said to her, Woe to thee! 
Hast thou been long at this trade? She asked, What aileth thee? And he answered, Give me back my ass. Quoth she, Cover what Allah covereth, O my son. Dost thou seek thine ass and the people's things? Quoth he, I want my ass, that's all. And quoth she, I saw that thou wast poor, so I deposited thine ass for thee with the Moorish barber. Stand off whilst I speak him fair, that he may give thee the beast. So she went up to the Maghrabi, and kissed his hand, and shed tears. He asked her what ailed her, and she said, O my son, look at my boy who standeth yonder. He was ill, and exposed himself to the air, which injured his intellect. He used to buy asses, and now, if he stand, he saith nothing but, My ass. If he sit, he crieth, My ass. And if he walk, he crieth, My ass. Now I have been told by a certain physician that his mind is disordered, and that nothing will cure him but drawing two of his grinders and cauterizing him twice on either temple. So do thou take this dinar and call him to thee, saying, Thine ass is with me, said the barber. May I fast for a year if I do not give him his ass in his fist. Now he had with him two journeymen, so he said to one of them, Go, heat the irons. Then the old woman went her way, and the barber called to the donkey-boy, saying, Thine ass is with me, good fellow. Come and take him, and as thou livest, I will give him into thy palm. So he came to him, and the barber carried him into a dark room, where he knocked him down, and the journeyman bound him hand and foot. Then the Maghrabi arose, and pulled out two of his grinders, and fired him on either temple, after which he let him go, and he rose and said, O Moor, why hast thou used me with this usage? Quoth the barber, Thy mother told me that thou hadst taken cold whilst ill, and hadst lost thy reason, so that, whether sitting or standing or walking, thou wouldst say nothing but, My ass. So here is thine ass in thy fist. Said the other, Allah requite thee for pulling out my teeth. Then the barber told him all that the old woman had related, and he exclaimed, Allah torment her! And the twain left the shop and went out, disputing. When the barber returned, he found his booth empty, for, whilst he was absent, the old woman had taken all that was therein, and made off with it to her daughter, whom she acquainted with all that had befallen, and all she had done. The barber, seeing his place plundered, caught hold of the donkey-boy, and said to him, Bring me thy mother. But he answered, saying, she is not my mother, she is a sharper who hath cousined much people, and stolen my ass. And lo, at this moment up came the dyer, and the Jew, and the young merchant, and seeing the Moorish barber holding on to the ass-driver, who was fired on both temples, they said to him, What hath befallen thee, O donkey-boy? So he told them all that had betided him, and the barber did the like, and the others in turn related to the Moor the tricks the old woman had played them. Then he shut up his shop, and went with them to the office of the police-master, to whom they said, We look to thee for our case and our coin. Quoth the wali, And how many old women are there not in Baghdad? Say me, doth any of you know her? Quoth the ass-man, I do, so give me ten of thine officers. He gave them half a score archers, and they all five went out, followed by the sergeants, and patrolled the city, till they met the old woman, when they laid hands on her, and carrying her to the house of the chief of police, stood waiting under his office windows till he should come forth. Presently the warders fell asleep, for excess of watching with their chief, and old Delilah feigned to follow their example, till the ass-man and his fellows slept likewise, when she stole away from them, and, going into the wali's harim, kissed the hand of the mistress of the house, and asked her, Where is the chief of police? The lady answered, He is asleep. What wouldst thou with him? Quoth Delilah, My husband is a merchant of chattels, and gave me five mamelukes to sell, whilst he went on a journey. The master of police met me, and bought them of me for a thousand dinars, and two hundred for myself, saying, Bring them to my house. So I have brought them. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the seven hundred and fifth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the old woman, entering the harem of the police master, said to his wife, Verily, the wali bought of me five slaves for one thousand ducats, and two hundred for myself, saying, Bring them to my quarters. So I have brought them. Hearing the old woman's story, she believed it, and asked her, Where are the slaves? Delilah replied, O my lady, they are asleep under the palace window. Whereupon the dame looked out, and seeing the Moorish barber clad in a mameluke habit, and the young merchant as he were a drunken mameluke, and the Jew and the dyer and the ass-driver as they were shaven mamelukes, said in herself, Each of these white slaves is worth more than a thousand dinars. 
So she opened her chest, and gave the old woman the thousand ducats, saying, Fare thee forth now, and come back anon. When my husband waketh, I will get thee the other two hundred dinars from him. Answered the old woman, O my lady, an hundred of them are thine, under the sherbet guglet whereof thou drinkest, and the other hundred do thou keep for me against I come back, presently adding, Now let me out by the private door. So she let her out, and the protector protected her, and she made her way home to her daughter, to whom she related how she had gotten a thousand gold pieces, and sold her five pursuers into slavery, ending with, O my daughter, the one who troubleth me most is the ass-driver, for he knoweth me. Said Zainab, O my mother, abide quiet a while, and let what thou hast done suffice thee, for the crock shall not always escape the shock. When the chief of police awoke, his wife said to him, I give thee joy of the five slaves thou hast bought of the old woman. Asked he, What slaves? And she answered, Why dost thou deny it to me? Allah willing, they shall become like thee people of condition. Quoth he, As my head liveth, I have bought no slaves. Who saith this? Quoth she, The old woman, the brokeress, from who thou boughtest them, and thou didst promise her a thousand dinars for them, and two hundred for herself. Cried he, Didst thou give her the money? And she replied, Yes, for I saw the slaves with my own eyes, and on each is a suit of clothes worth a thousand dinars. So I sent out to bid the sergeants have an eye to them. The wali went out, and, seeing the five plaintiffs, said to the officers, Where are the five slaves we bought for a thousand dinars of the old woman? Said they, There are no slaves here, only these five men, who found the old woman, and seized her and brought her hither. We fell asleep whilst waiting for thee, and she stole away and entered the harim. Presently out came a maid and asked us, Are the five with you with whom the old woman came? And we answered, Yes. Cried the master of police, By Allah, this is the biggest of swindles. And the five men said, We look to thee for our goods. Quoth the wali, The old woman, your mistress, sold you to me for a thousand gold pieces. Quoth they, That were not allowed of Allah. We are free-born men and may not be sold, and we appeal from thee to the caliph rejoined the master of police. None showed her the way to the house save you, and I will sell you to the galleys for two hundred dinars apiece. Just then, behold, up came the emir Hassan Shar al-Tariq, who, on his return from his journey, had found his wife stripped of her clothes and jewelry, and heard from her all that had passed. Whereupon quoth he, The master of police shall answer me this, and repairing to him said, Dost thou suffer old women to go round about the town and cousin folk of their goods? This is thy duty, and I look to thee for my wife's property. Then said he to the five men, What is the case with you? So they told him their stories, and he said, Ye are wronged men, and turning to the master of police, asked him, Why dost thou arrest them? Answered he, None brought the old wretch to my house save these five, so that she took a thousand dinars of my money, and sold them to my women. Whereupon the five cried, O Emir Hassan, be thou our advocate in this cause. Then said the master of police to the emir, Thy wife's goods are at my charge, and I will be surety for the old woman. But which of you knoweth her? They cried, We all know her. Send ten apparitors with us, and we will take her. So he gave them ten men, and the ass-driver said to them, Follow me, for I should know her with blue eyes. Then they fared forth, and lo, they meet old Delilah coming out of a by-street. So they at once laid hands on her, and brought her to the office of the wali, who asked her, where are the people's goods? But she answered, saying, I have neither gotten them nor seen them. Then he cried to the jailer, Take her with thee, and clap her in jail till the morning. But he replied, I will not take her, nor will I imprison her, lest she play a trick on me, and I be answerable for her. So the master of police mounted, and rode out with Delilah and the rest to the bank of the Tigris, where he bade the lamplighter crucify her by her hair. He drew her up by the pulley, and bound her on the cross after which the master of police set ten men to guard her, and went home. Presently the night fell down, and sleep overcame the watchman. Now a certain Badawi had heard one man say to a friend, Praise be to Allah for thy safe return. Where hast thou been all this time? Replied the other, In Baghdad, where I broke my fast on honey fritters. Quoth the Badawi to himself, Needs must I go to Baghdad and eat honey fritters therein for in all his life he had never entered Baghdad, nor seen fritters of the sort. So he mounted his stallion and rode on towards Baghdad, 
saying in his mind, "'Tis a fine thing to eat honey fritters. On the honor of an Arab, I will break my fast with honey fritters, and not else." And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 23 Recording by Jeff Kluckner, Plymouth, UK Section 24 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Kluckner The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7, by Anonymous Translated by Richard Francis Burton Section 24 When it was the seven hundred and sixth night, she pursued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the wild Arab mounted horse, and made for Baghdad, saying in his mind, "'Tis a fine thing to eat honey fritters. On the honor of an Arab I will break my fast with honey fritters and naught else. And he rode on till he came to the place where Delilah was crucified, and she heard him utter these words. So he went up to her, and said to her, "'What art thou?' Quoth she, "'I throw myself on thy protection, O Shaikh of the Arabs.' And quoth he, "'Allah indeed protect thee, but what is the cause of thy crucifixion?' Said she, "'I have an enemy, an oilman, who frieth fritters, and I stopped to buy some of him, when I chanced to spit, and my spittle fell on the fritters. So he complained of me to the governor who commanded to crucify me, saying, I adjudge that ye take ten pounds of honey fritters, and feed her therewith upon the cross. If she eat them, let her go, but if not, leave her hanging. And my stomach will not brook sweet things. Cried the Badawi, By the honor of the Arabs, I departed not the camp, but that I might taste of honey fritters. I will eat them for thee. Quoth she, None may eat them, except he be hung up in my place. So he fell into the trap and unbound her, whereupon she bound him in her stead, after she had stripped him of his clothes and turbaned, and put them on. Then covering herself with his burnous, and mounting his horse, she rode to her house, where Zainab asked her, What meaneth this plight? And she answered, They crucified me, and told her all that had befallen her with the Badawi. This is how it fared with her, but as regards the watchman, the first who woke roused his companions, and they saw that the day had broken. So one of them raised his eyes and cried, Delilah! replied the Badawi, by Allah, I have not eaten all night. Have you brought the honey fritters? All exclaimed, This is a man and a Badawi. And one of them asked him, O Badawi, where is Delilah, and who loosed her? He answered, T'was I. She shall not eat the honey fritters against her will, for her soul abhorreth them. So they knew that the Arab was ignorant of her case, whom she had cousined, and said to one another, Shall we flee, or abide the accomplishment of that which Allah hath written for us? As they were talking, up came the chief of police, with all the folk whom the old woman had cheated, and said to the guards, Arise, loose Delilah. Quoth the Badawi, We have not eaten to-night. Hast thou brought the honey fritters? Whereupon the Wali raised his eyes to the cross, and seeing the Badawi hung up in the stead of the old woman, said to the watchman, What is this? Pardon, O our Lord. Tell me what hath happened. We were weary with watching with thee on guard, and— Delilah is crucified. So we fell asleep, and when we awoke, we found the Badawi hung up in her room, and we were at thy mercy. O folk, Allah's pardon be upon you, she is indeed a clever cheat. Then they unbound the Badawi, who laid hold of the master of police, saying, Allah succor the caliph against thee, I look to none but thee for my horse and clothes. So the Wali questioned him, and he told him what had passed between Delilah and himself. The magistrate marvelled, and asked him, why didst thou release her? And the Badawi answered, I knew not that she was a felon. Then said the others, O chief of police, we look to thee in the matter of our goods, for we deliver the old woman into thy hands, and she was in thy guard, and we cite thee before the divan of the caliph. Now the emir Hassan had gone up to the divan, when in came the wali with the Badawi and the five others, saying, Verily, we are wronged men. Who hath wronged you? asked the caliph. So each came forward in turn and told his story, after which said the master of police, O commander of the faithful, the old woman cheated me also, and sold me these five men as slaves for a thousand dinars, albeit they are freeborn. Quoth the prince of true believers, I take upon myself all that you have lost. 
adding to the master of police, I charge thee with the old woman. But he shook his collar, saying, O commander of the faithful, I will not answer for her, for, after I had hung her on the cross, she tricked this Badawi, and, when he loosed her, she tied him up in her room, and made off with his clothes and horse. Quoth the caliph, Whom but thee shall I charge with her? And quoth the wali, Charge Ahmad al-Danaf, for he hath a thousand dinars a month, and one and forty followers, at a monthly wage of a hundred dinars each. So the caliph said, Hark ye, Captain Ahmad. At thy service, O commander of the faithful, said he. And the caliph cried, I charge thee to bring the old woman before us. Replied Ahmad, I will answer for her. Then the caliph kept the Badawi and the five with him. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the seven hundred and seventh night, she resumed, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the caliph said to Calamity Ahmad, I charge thee to bring the old woman before us, he said, I will answer for her, O commander of the faithful. Then the caliph kept the Badawi and the five with him, whilst Ahmad and his men went down to their hall, saying to one another, How shall we lay hands on her, seeing that there are many old women in the town? And quoth Ahmad to Hassan Chuman, What counselest thou? Whereupon quoth one of them, by name Ali Katif al-Jamal, to al Danaf, Of what dost thou take counsel with Hassan Chuman? Is the pestilent one any great shakes? Said Hassan, O Ali, why dost thou disparage me? By the most great name I will not company with thee at this time. And he rose and went out in wrath. Then said Ahmad, O my braves, let every sergeant take ten men, each to his own quarter, and search for Delilah. All did his bidding, Ali included, and they said, Ere we disperse, let us agree to rendezvous in the quarter al Kalk. It was noised abroad in the city that Calamity Ahmad had undertaken to lay hands on Delilah the wily, and Zainab said to her, O my mother, and thou be indeed a trickstress, do thou befool Ahmad al Danaf and his company? Answered Delilah, I fear none save Hassan Shuman. And Zainab said, By the life of my brow lock, I will assuredly get thee the clothes of all the one and forty. Then she dressed and veiled herself, and going to a certain druggist, who had a saloon with two doors, salamed to him, and gave him an ashrafi, and said to him, Take this gold piece as a douceur for thy saloon, and let it to me till the end of the day. So he gave her the keys, and she fetched carpets and so forth, on the stolen ass, and furnishing the place, set on each raised pavement a tray of meat and wine. Then she went out and stood at the door, with her face unveiled, and behold, up came Ali Katif al-Jamal and his men. She kissed his hand, and he fell in love with her, seeing her to be a handsome girl, and said to her, What dost thou want? Quoth she, Art thou Captain Ahmad al-Danaf? And quoth he, No, but I am of his company, and my name is Ali Camel Shoulder. Asked she, Whither fare you? And he answered, We go about in quest of a sharkish old woman, who hath stolen folk's good, and we mean to lay hands on her. But who art thou, and what is thy business? She replied, my father was a taverner at Mosul, and he died and left me much money. So I came hither, for fear of the dignities, and asked the people who would protect me, to which they replied, None but Ahmad al-Danaf. Said the men, From this day forth thou art under his protection. And she replied, Hearten me by eating a bit, and drinking a sup of water. They consented, and entering, ate and drank till they were drunken, when she drugged them with bang, and stripped them of their clothes and arms, and on likewise she did with the three other companions. Presently Calamity Ahmad went out to look for Delilah, but found her not, neither set eyes on any of his followers, and went on till he came to the door where Zainab was standing. She kissed his hand, and he looked on her and fell in love with her. Quoth she, Art thou Captain Ahmad al-Danaf? And quoth he, Yes, who art thou? She replied, I am a stranger from Mosul, my father was a vintner at that place, and he died and left me much money, wherewith I came to this city, for fear of the powers that be, and opened this tavern. The master of police hath imposed a tax on me, but it is my desire to put myself under thy protection, and pay thee what the police would take of me, for thou hast the better right to it. Quoth he, Do not pay him aught, thou shalt have my protection and welcome. Then quoth she, Please to heal my heart and eat of my victual. So he entered and ate and drank wine, till he could not sit upright, when she drugged him and took his clothes and arms. 
Then she loaded her purchase on the Badawi's horse and the donkey boy's ass and made off with it, after she had aroused Ali Katif al-Jamal. Camel Shoulder awoke and found himself naked, and saw Ahmad and his men drugged and stripped. So he revived them with the counter-drug, and they awoke and found themselves naked. Quoth Calamity Ahmad, O lads, what is this? We were going to catch her, and lo, this strumpet hath caught us. How Hassan Shuman will rejoice over us! But we will wait till it is dark, and then go away. Meanwhile Pestilence Hassan said to the hall-keeper, Where are the men? And as he asked, up they came naked, and he recited these two couplets. Men in their purposes are much alike, but in their issues difference comes to light. Of men some wise are, others simple souls, as of the stars some dull, some pearly bright. Then he looked at them and asked, Who hath played you this trick and made you naked? And they answered, We went in quest of an old woman, and a pretty girl stripped us. Quoth Hassan, She hath done right well. They asked, Dost thou know her? And he answered, Yes, I know her, and the old trot, too. Quoth they, What shall we say to the caliph? And quoth he, O Danaf, do thou shake thy collar before him, and he will say, Who is answerable for her? And if he ask why thou hast not caught her, say thou, We know her not, but charge Hassan Shuman with her. And if he give her into my charge, I will lay hands on her. So they slept that night, and on the morrow they went up to the caliph's divan, and kissed ground before him. Quoth he, Where is the old woman, O Captain Ahmad? But he shook his collar. The caliph asked him why he did so, and he answered, I know her not, but do thou charge Hassan Shuman to lay hands on her, for he knoweth her, and her daughter also. Then Hassan interceded for her with the caliph, saying, Indeed, she hath not played off these tricks, because she coveted the folk's stuff, but to show her cleverness and that of her daughter, to the intent that thou shouldst continue her husband's stipend to her, and that of her father to her daughter. So an thou wilt spare her life, I will fetch her to thee. Cried the caliph, By the life of my ancestors, if she restore the people's goods, I will pardon her on thine intercession. And said the pestilence, Give me a pledge, O prince of true believers. Whereupon al-Rashid gave him the kerchief of pardon. So Hassan repaired to Delilah's house and called to her. Her daughter Zainab answered him, and he asked her, Where is thy mother? Upstairs, she answered, and he said, Bid her take the people's goods and come with me to the presence of the caliph, for I have brought her the kerchief of pardon, and if she will not come with a good grace, let her blame only herself. So Delilah came down, and tying the kerchief about her neck, gave him the people's goods on the donkey boy's ass and the Badawi's horse. Quoth he, There remain the clothes of my chief and his men. And quoth she, By the most great name, t'was not I who stripped them. Rejoined Hassan, Thou sayest sooth, it was thy daughter Zainab's doing, and this was a good turn she did thee. Then he carried her to the divan, and laying the people's goods and stuff before the caliph, set the old trot in his presence. As soon as he saw her, he bade throw her down on the carpet of blood, whereat she cried, I cast myself on thy protection, O Shuman. So he rose, and kissing the caliph's hands, said, Pardon, O commander of the faithful, indeed thou gavest me the kerchief of pardon, said the prince of true believers. I pardon her for thy sake. Come hither, O old woman, what is thy name? My name is Wily Delilah, answered she, and the caliph said, Thou art indeed crafty and full of guile. Whence she was dubbed Delilah the wily one. Then quoth he, Why hast thou played all these tricks on the folk, and wearied our hearts? And quoth she, I did it not of lust for their goods, but because I had heard of the tricks which Ahmad al-Danaf and Hassan Shuman played in Baghdad, and said to myself, I too will do the like. And now I have returned the folk their goods. But the ass-driver rose, and said, I invoke Allah's law between me and her, for it sufficed her not to take my ass, but she must needs egg on the Moorish barber to tear out my eye-teeth and fire me on both temples. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the seven hundred and eighth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the donkey-boy rose and cried out, I invoke Allah's law between me and her, for it sufficed her not to take my ass, but she must needs egg on the barber to tear out my eye-teeth and fire me on both temples. Thereupon the caliph bade give him a hundred dinars, and ordered the dyer the like, saying, Go, set up thy diary again. 
so they called down blessings on his head and went away. The Badawi also took his clothes and horse and departed, saying, "'Tis henceforth unlawful and forbidden me to enter Baghdad and eat honey fritters." And the others took their goods and went away. Then said the caliph, "'Ask a boon of me, O Delilah.' And she said, "'Verily, my father was governor of the carrier pigeons to thee, and I know how to rear the birds, and my husband was town captain of Baghdad. Now I wish to have the reversion of my husband, and my daughter wishes to have that of her father.' The caliph granted both their requests, and she said, I ask of thee that I may be portress of thy khan. Now he had built a khan of three stories, for the merchants to lodge in, and had assigned to its service forty slaves, and also forty dogs he had brought from the king of Sulaymaniyah when he deposed him. And there was in the khan a cook-slave, who cooked for the chattels and fed the hounds for which he let make collars. Said the caliph, O Delilah, I will write thee a patent of guardianship of the khan, and if aught be lost therefrom, thou shalt be answerable for it. "'Tis well, replied she, but do thou lodge my daughter in the pavilion over the door of the khan, for it hath terraced roofs, and carrier pigeons may not be reared to advantage save in an open space. The caliph granted her this also, and she and her daughter removed to the pavilion in question, where Zainab hung up the one and forty dresses of Calamity Ahmad and his company. Moreover, they delivered to Delilah the forty pigeons which carried the royal messages, and the caliph appointed the wily one mistress over the forty slaves, and charged them to obey her. She made the place of her sitting behind the door of the khan, and every day she used to go up to the caliph's divan, lest he should need to send a message by pigeon post, and stay there till eventide whilst the forty slaves stood on guard at the khan. And when darkness came on, they loosed the forty dogs that they might keep watch over the place by night. Such were the doings of Delilah the wily one in Baghdad and much like them were the adventures of Mercury Ali of Cairo. Now as regards the works of Mercury Ali, there lived once at Cairo, in the days of Salah the Egyptian, who was chief of the Cairo police, and had forty men under him, a sharper named Ali, for whom the master of police used to set snares, and think that he had fallen therein. But, when they sought for him, they found that he had fled like Zabak, or Quicksilver, wherefore they dubbed him Ali Zabak, or Mercury Ali of Cairo. Now one day, as he sat with his men in his hall, his heart became heavy within him, and his breast was straightened. The hall-keeper saw him sitting with frowning face, and said to him, What aileth thee, O my chief? If thy breast be straightened, take a turn in the streets of Cairo, for assuredly walking in her markets will do away with thy irk. So he rose up and went out, and threaded the streets a while, but only increased in cark and care. Presently he came to a wine-shop, and said to himself, I will go in and drink myself drunken. So he entered, and seeing seven rows of people in the shop, said, Hark ye, taverner, I will not sit except by myself. Accordingly, the vintner placed him in a chamber alone, and set strong pure wine before him, whereof he drank till he lost his senses. Then he sallied forth again, and walked till he came to the road called Red, whilst the people left the street clear before him, out of fear of him. Presently he turned and saw a water-carrier trudging along, with his skin and gugglet, crying out and saying, O oh, exchange, there is no drink but what raisins make, there is no love delight but what of the lover we take, and none sitteth in the place of honour save the sensible freak. So he said to him, Here, give me to drink. The water-carrier looked at him, and gave him the gugglet which he took, and gazing into it, shook it up, and lastly poured it out on the ground. Asked the water-carrier, Why dost thou not drink? And he answered, saying, give me to drink. So the man filled the cup a second time, and he took it, and shook it, and emptied it on the ground, and thus he did a third time. Quoth the water-carrier, And thou wilt not drink, I will be off. And Ali said, Give me to drink. So he filled the cup a fourth time, and gave it to him, and he drank, and gave the man a dinar. The water-carrier looked at him with disdain, and said, belittling him, Good luck to thee, good luck to thee, my lad. Little folk are one thing, and great folk another. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 24. Recording by Jeff Kluckner, Plymouth, UK. Section 25 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Kluckner. 
The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 25. When it was the seven hundred and ninth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the water-carrier receiving the dinar, looked at the giver with disdain, and said, Good luck to thee, good luck to thee. Little folk are one thing, and great folk another. Now when Mercury Ali heard this, he caught hold of the man's gabardine, and drawing on him a poniard of price, such an one as that whereof the poet speaketh in these two couplets, Watered steel blade the world perfection calls, Drunk with the viper poison foes appalls, Cuts lively, burns the blood whenever it falls, And picks up gems from pave of marble halls. Cried to him, O Shaikh, speak reasonably to me, Thy water-skin is worth if dear three dirhams, and the guglets I emptied on the ground held a pint or so of water. Replied the water-carrier, "'Tis well. And Ali rejoined, "'I gave thee a golden ducat. Then dost thou belittle me? Say me, hast thou ever seen any more valiant than I, or more generous than I?' Answered the water-carrier, "'I have indeed seen one more valiant than thou, and eke more generous than thou, for never, since women bear children, was there on earth's face a brave man who was not generous. Quoth Ali, And who is he thou deemest braver and more generous than I? Quoth the other, Thou must know that I have had a strange adventure. My father was a shaykh of the water-carriers, who give drink in Cairo, and, when he died, he left me five male camels, a he-mule, a shop, and a house. But the poor man is never satisfied, or, if he be satisfied, he dieth. So I said to myself, I will go up to Al-Hijaz, and, taking a string of camels, bought goods on tick, till I had run in debt for five hundred ducats, all of which I lost in the pilgrimage. Then I said in my mind, If I return to Cairo, the folk will clap me in jail for their goods. So I fared with the pilgrim's caravan of Damascus to Aleppo, and thence I went on to Baghdad where I sought out the shaykh of the water-carriers of the city, and finding his house, I went in and repeated the opening chapter of the Koran to him. He questioned me of my case, and I told him all that had betided me, whereupon he assigned me a shop, and gave me a water-skin and gear. So I sallied forth a morn, trusting in Allah to provide, and went round about the city. I offered the guglet to one, that he might drink, but he cried, I have eaten naught whereon to drink, for a niggard invited me this day, and set two guglets before me. So I said to him, O son of the sordid, hast thou given me aught to eat, that thou offerest me drink after it? Wherefore wend thy ways, O water-carrier, till I have eaten somewhat, then come and give me to drink. Thereupon I accosted another, and he said, Allah provide thee. And so I went on till noon, without taking hansel, and I said to myself, Would heaven I had never come to Baghdad! Presently I saw the folk running as fast as they could, so I followed them, and behold, a long file of men riding two and two and clad in steel, with double neck-rings and felt bonnets and burnouses and swords and bucklers. I asked one of those folk whose sweet this was, and he answered, That of Captain Ahmad al-Danaf. Quoth I, And what is he? And quoth the other, He is town captain of Baghdad and her divan, and to him is committed the care of the suburbs, he getteth a thousand dinars a month from the caliph, and Hassan Shuman hath the like. Moreover, each of his men draweth an hundred dinars a month, and they are now returning to their barrack from the divan. And lo! Calamity Ahmad saw me, and cried out, Come give me drink. So I filled the cup and gave it to him, and he shook it and emptied it out, like unto thee, and thus he did a second time. Then I filled the cup a third time, and he took a draught as thou didst, after which he asked me, O water-carrier, whence comest thou? And I answered, From Cairo. And he, Allah keep Cairo and her citizens. What may bring thee thither? So I told him my story, and gave him to understand that I was a debtor fleeing from debt and distress. He cried, Thou art welcome to Baghdad. Then he gave me five dinars, and said to his men, For the love of Allah, be generous to him. So each of them gave me a dinar, and Ahmad said to me, O Shaikh, what while thou abidest in Baghdad, thou shalt have of us the like every time thou givest us to drink. Accordingly, I paid them frequent visits, and goods ceased not to come to me from the folk, till, one day, reckoning up the profit I had made of them, 
I found it a thousand dinars, and said to myself, The best thing thou canst do is to return to Egypt. So I went to Ahmad's house and kissed his hand, and he said, What seekest thou? Quoth I, I have a mind to depart, and I repeated these two couplets. Sojourn of stranger in whatever land is like castle based upon the wind. The breaths of breezes level all he raised, and so on homeward ways the stranger's mind. I added, The caravan is about to start for Cairo, and I wish to return to my people. So he gave me a she-mule and a hundred dinars, and said to me, I desire to send somewhat by thee, O Shaikh. Dost thou know the people of Cairo? Yes, answered I. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the seven hundred and tenth night, she pursued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Ahmad al Danaf had given the water carrier a she mule and a hundred dinars, and said to him, I desire to send a trust by thee, dost thou know the people of Cairo? I answered, quoth the water carrier, Yes. And he said, Take this letter, and carry it to Ali Zabak of Cairo, and say to him, Thy captain saluteth thee, and he is now with the caliph. So I took the letter, and journeyed back to Cairo, where I paid my debts, and plied my water-carrying trade. But I have not delivered the letter, because I know not the abode of Mercury Ali. Quoth Ali, O elder, be of good cheer, and keep thine eyes cool and clear. I am that Ali, the first of the lads of Captain Ahmad, here with the letter. So he gave him the missive, and he opened it, and read these two couplets. O adornment of beauties to thee right eye, on a paper that flies as the winds go by. Could I fly, I had flown to their arms in desire. But a bird with cut wings, how shall ever he fly? But after salutation from Captain Ahmad al Danaf to the eldest of his sons, Mercury Ali of Cairo, Thou knowest that I tormented Salah al-Din the Kerin, and befooled him till I buried him alive, and reduced his lads to obey me, and amongst them Ali Katif al-Jamal, and I now become town captain of Baghdad, in the divan of the caliph, who hath made me overseer of the suburbs. And thou be still mindful of our covenant. Come to me. Haply thou shalt play some trick in Baghdad, which may promote thee to the caliph's service, so he may appoint thee stipends and allowances, and assign thee a lodging which is what thou wouldst see, and so peace be on thee. When Ali read this letter, he kissed it, and laying it on his head, gave the water-carrier ten dinars, after which he returned to his barracks and told his comrades, and said to them, I commend you one to other. Then he changed all his clothes, and, donning a travelling cloak and a tarbouche, took a case, containing a spear of bamboo cane, four and twenty cubits long, made in several pieces, to fit into one another. Quoth his lieutenant, Wilt thou go a journey when the treasury is empty? And quoth Ali, When I reach Damascus, I will send you what shall suffice you. Then he set out and fared on, till he overtook a caravan about to start, whereof were the Shabandar, or provost of the merchants, and forty other traders. They had all loaded their beasts, except the provost, whose loads lay upon the ground, and Ali heard his caravan leader, who was a Syrian, say to the muleteers, Bear a hand, one of you. But they reviled him and abused him. Quoth Ali in himself, None will suit me so well to travel withal as this leader. Now Ali was beardless and well favored, so he went up to and saluted the leader, who welcomed him, and said, What seekest thou? Replied Ali, O my uncle, I see thee alone with forty mule loads of goods, but why hast thou not brought hands to help thee? Rejoined the other, O my son, I hired two lads and clothed them, and put in each one's pocket two hundred dinars, and they helped me till we came to the dervish's convent, when they ran away. Quoth Ali, Whither are you bound? And quoth the Syrian, To Aleppo, when Ali said, I will lend thee a hand. Accordingly they loaded the beasts, and the provost mounted his she-mule, and they set out, he rejoicing in Ali. And presently he loved him, and made much of him, and on this wise they fared on till nightfall when they dismounted and ate and drank. Then came the time of sleep, and Ali lay down on his side and made as if he slept, whereupon the Syrian stretched himself near him, and Ali rose from his stead and sat down at the door of the merchant's pavilion. Presently the Syrian turned over and would have taken Ali in his arms, but found him not, and said to himself, Happily he hath promised another, and he hath taken him, 
but I have the first right, and another night I will keep him. Now Ali continued sitting at the door of the tent till nigh upon daybreak, when he returned and lay down near the Syrian, who found him by his side when he awoke, and said to himself, If I ask him where he hath been, he will leave me and go away. So he dissembled with him, and they went on till they came to a forest, in which was a cave, where dwelt a rending lion. Now whenever a caravan passed, they would draw lots among themselves, and him on whom the lot fell they would throw to the beast. So they drew lots, and the lot fell not save upon the provost of the merchants. And lo, the lion cut off their way, awaiting his prey, wherefore the provost was sore distressed, and said to the leader, Allah disappoint the fortunes of the far one, and bring his journey to naught. I charge thee, after my death, give my loads to my children. Quoth Ali the clever one, What meaneth all this? So they told him the case, and he said, Why do ye run from the tomcat of the desert? I warrant you I will kill him. So the Syrian went to the provost and told him of this, and he said, If he slay him, I will give him a thousand dinars. And said the other merchants, We will reward him likewise, one and all. With this Ali put off his mantle, and there appeared upon him a suit of steel. Then he took a chopper of steel, and opening it turned the screw, after which he went forth alone, and standing in the road before the lion, cried out to him. The lion ran at him, but Ali of Cairo smote him between the eyes with his chopper, and cut him in sunder, whilst the caravan leader and the merchants looked on. Then said he to the leader, Have no fear, O nuncle. And the Syrian answered, saying, O my son, I am thy servant for all future time. Then the provost embraced him and kissed him between the eyes, and gave him the thousand dinars, and each of the other merchants gave him twenty dinars. He deposited all the coin with the provost, and they slept that night till the morning, when they set out again, intending for Baghdad, and fared on till they came to the lion's clump and the wadi of dogs, where lay a villain Badawi, a brigand and his tribe, who sallied forth on them. The folk fled from the highwaymen, and the provost said, My monies are lost. When, lo, up came Ali in a buff coat hung with bells, and bringing out his long lance, fitted the pieces together. Then he seized one of the Arab's horses, and mounting it, cried out to the Badawi chief, saying, Come out to fight me with spears. Moreover, he shook his bells, and the Arab's mare took fright at the noise, and Ali struck the chief's spear and broke it. Then he smote him on the neck and cut off his head. When the Badawin saw their chief fall, they ran at Ali, but he cried out, saying, Allahu Akbar, God is most great, and, falling on them, broke them and put them to flight. Then he raised the chief's head on his spear-point, and returned to the merchants, who rewarded him liberally and continued their journey, till they reached Baghdad. Thereupon Ali took his money from the provost, and committed it to the Syrian caravan leader, saying, When thou returnest to Cairo, ask for my barracks and give these monies to my deputy. Then he slept that night, and on the morrow he entered the city, and threading the streets inquired for Calamity Ahmad's quarters, but none would direct him thereto. So he walked on, till he came to the square Al-Nafs, where he saw children at play, and amongst them a lad called Ahmad al-Lakit, and said to himself, O my Ali, thou shalt not get news of them but from their little ones. Then he turned, and seeing a sweet meat-seller, bought halwa'a of him, and called to the children. But Ahmad al-Lakit drove the rest away, and coming up to him, said, What seekest thou? Quoth Ali, I had a son, and he died, and I saw him in a dream asking for sweetmeats, wherefore I have bought them, and wish to give each child a bit. So saying, he gave Ahmad a slice, and he looked at it, and seeing a dinar sticking to it, said, Begone! I am no catamite! Seek another than I! Quoth Ali, O my son, none but a sharp fellow taketh the hire, even as he is a sharp one who giveth it. I have sought all day for Ahmad al danaf's barrack, but none would direct me thereto, so this dinar is thine, and thou wilt guide me thither. Quoth the lad, I will run before thee, and do thou keep up with me, till I come to the place, when I will catch up a pebble with my foot, and kick it against the door, and so shalt thou know it. Accordingly he ran on, and Ali after him, till they came to the place, when the boy caught up a pebble between his toes, and kicked it against the door, so as to make the place known and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the seven hundred and eleventh night, she resumed, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Ahmad the abortion had made known the place, 
Ali laid hold of him and would have taken the dinar from him, but could not. So he said to him, Go, thou deservest largesse, for thou art a sharp fellow, whole of wit and stout of heart. Inshallah, if I become a captain to the caliph, I will make thee one of my lads. Then the boy made off, and Ali Zabak went up to the door and knocked, whereupon quoth Ahmad al Danaf, O doorkeeper, open the door. That is the knock of Quicksilver Ali, the Kyrene. So he opened the door, and Ali entered, and saluted with the salam Ahmad who embraced him, and the forty greeted him. Then Calamity Ahmad gave him a suit of clothes, saying, When the caliph made me captain, he clothed my lads, and I kept this suit for thee. Then they seated him in the place of honor, and setting on meat they ate well, and drink they drank hard, and made merry till the morning, when Ahmad said to Ali, Beware thou walk not about the streets of Baghdad, but sit thee still in this barrack. Asked Ali, Why so? Have I come hither to be shut up? No, I came to look about me and divert myself. Replied Ahmad, O my son, think not that Baghdad be like Cairo. Baghdad is the seat of the caliphate. Sharpers abound therein, and rogueries spring therefrom as warts spring out of earth. So Ali abode in the barrack three days, when Ahmad said to him, I wish to present thee to the caliph, that he may assign thee an allowance. But he replied, When the time cometh. So he let him go his own way. One day, as Ali sat in the barrack, his breast became straitened, and his soul troubled, and he said to himself, Come, let us up and thread the ways of Baghdad, and broaden my bosom. So he went out and walked from street to street, till he came to the middle bazaar, where he entered a cook-shop and dined, after which he went out to wash his hands. Presently he saw forty slaves, with felt bonnets and steel cutlasses, come walking two by two, and last of all came Delilah the Wily, mounted on a she-mule, with a gilded helmet which bore a ball of polished steel, and clad in a coat of mail and such like. Now she was returning from the divan to the khan of which she was portress, and when she espied Ali, she looked at him fixedly, and saw that he resembled Calamity Ahmad in height and breadth. Moreover, he was clad in a striped Aba'a cloak and a burnous, with a steel cutlass by his side and similar gear, while valor shone from his eyes, testifying in favor of him and not in disfavor of him. So she returned to the Khan, and going in to her daughter, fetched a table of sand, and struck a geomantic figure, whereby she discovered that the stranger's name was Ali of Cairo, and that his fortune overcame her fortune, and that of her daughter. Asked Zainab, O my mother, what hath befallen thee that thou hast recourse to the sand-table? Answered Delilah, O my daughter, I have seen this day a young man who resembleth Calamity Ahmad, and I fear lest he come to hear how thou didst strip Ahmad and his men, and enter the Khan and play us a trick, in revenge for what we did with his chief and the forty, for methinks he has taken up his lodging in al Danaf's barrack. Zainab rejoined, What is this? Methinks thou hast taken his measure. Then she donned her fine clothes and went out into the streets. When the people saw her, they all made love to her, and she promised and sware and listened and coquetted and passed from market to market, till she saw Ali the Kyrene coming, when she went up to him and rubbed her shoulder against him. Then she turned and said, Allah give long life to folk of discrimination. Quoth he, How goodly is thy form! To whom dost thou belong? And quoth she, To the gallant like thee. And he said, Art thou wife or spinster? Married, said she. Asked Ali, Shall it be in my lodging or thine? And she answered, I am a merchant's daughter and a merchant's wife, and in all my life I have never been out of doors till to-day, and my only reason was that when I made ready food and thought to eat, I had no mind thereto without company. When I saw thee, love of thee entered my heart. So wilt thou deign solace my soul and eat a mouthful with me? Quoth he, Whoso is invited, let him accept. Thereupon she went on, and he followed her from street to street, but presently he bethought himself and said, what wilt thou do, and thou a stranger? Verily tis said, Whoso doth whoredom in his strangerhood, Allah will send him back disappointed. But I will put her off from thee with fair words. So he said to her, Take this dinar, and appoint me a day other than this. And she said, By the mighty name, it may not be but thou shalt go home with me as my guest this very day, and I will take thee to fast friend. So he followed her till she came to a house with a lofty porch and a wooden bolt on the door, and said to him, open this lock. Asked he, Where is the key? And she answered, 
tis lost. Quoth he, Whoso openeth a lock without a key is a knave whom it behoveth the ruler to punish, and I know not how to open doors without keys. With this she raised her veil and showed him her face, whereat he took one glance of eyes that cost him a thousand sighs. Then she let fall her veil on the lock, and repeating over it the names of the mother of Moses, opened it without a key, and entered. He followed her, and saw swords and steel weapons hanging up, and she put off her veil and sat down with him. Quoth he to himself, Accomplish what Allah hath decreed to thee, and bent over her, to take a kiss of her cheek. But she caught the kiss upon her palm, saying, This beseemeth not but by night. Then she brought a tray of food and wine, and they ate and drank, after which she rose, and drawing water from the well, poured it from the ewer over his hands, whilst he washed them. Now whilst they were on this wise, she cried out and beat upon her breast, saying, My husband had a signet ring of ruby, which was pledged to him for five hundred dinars, and I put it on, but t'was too large for me, so I straightened it with wax, and when I let down the bucket, that ring must have dropped into the well. So turn thy face to the door, the while I doff my dress and go down into the well and fetch it. Quoth Ali, T'were shame on me that thou shouldst go down there, I being present. None shall do it save I. So he put off his clothes, and tied the rope about himself, and she let him down into the well. Now there was much water therein, and she said to him, The rope is too short. Loose thyself, and drop down. So he did himself loose from the rope, and dropped into the water, in which he sank fathoms deep without touching bottom, whilst she donned her mantilla, and taking his clothes, returned to her mother. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 25 Recording by Jeff Kluckner, Plymouth, UK Section 26 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Jeff Kluckner The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7 by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 26. When it was the seven hundred and twelfth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Ali of Cairo was in the well, Zainab donned her mantilla, and, taking his clothes, returned to her mother, and said, I have stripped Ali the Egyptian, and cast him into the Emir Hassan's well, whence, alas, for his chance of escaping. Presently the Emir Hassan, the master of the house, who had been absent at the divan, came home and, finding the door open, said to his syce, Why didst thou not draw the bolt? O oh, my lord, replied the groom, indeed I locked it with my own hand. The Emir cried, As my head liveth, some robber hath entered my house. Then he went in and searched, but found none, and said to the groom, Fill the ewer, that I may make the wuzu ablution. So the man lowered the bucket into the well, but, when he drew it up, he found it heavy, and looking down, saw something therein sitting, whereupon he let it fall into the water, and cried out, saying, O oh my lord, an ifrit came up to me out of the well, replied the emir. Go and fetch four doctors of the law, that they may read the Koran over him, till he go away. So he fetched the doctors, and the emir said to them, Sit round this well, and exorcise me this ifrit. They did as he bade them, after which the groom and another servant lowered the bucket again, and Ali clung to it, and hid himself under it patiently, till he came near the top, when he sprang out and landed among the doctors, who fell a-cuffing one another, and crying out, Ifrit! Ifrit! The emir looked at Ali, and seeing him a young man, said to him, Art thou a thief? No, replied Ali. Then what dost thou in the well? asked the emir. And Ali answered, I was asleep and dreamt a wet dream, so I went down to the Tigris to wash myself and dived, whereupon the current carried me under the earth, and I came up in this well. Quoth the other, Tell the truth. So Ali told him all that had befallen him, and the emir gave him an old gown and let him go. He returned to Calamity Ahmad's lodging and related to him all that had passed. Quoth Ahmad, Did I not warn thee that Baghdad is full of women who play tricks upon men? And quoth Ali Katif al-Jamal, I conjure thee by the mighty name. Tell me how it is that thou art the chief of the lads of Cairo, and yet hast been stripped by a girl. This was grievous to Ali, and he repented him of not having followed Ahmad's advice. 
Then the calamity gave him another suit of clothes, and Hassan Shuman said to him, Dost thou know the young person? No, replied Ali, and Hassan rejoined, "'Twas Zainab, the daughter of Delilah the Wily, the portress of the caliph's Khan, and hast thou fallen into her toils, O Ali? Quoth he, Yes, and quoth Hassan, O Ali, "'Twas she who took thy chief's clothes and those of all his men. "'This is a disgrace to you all. "'And what thinkest thou to do? "'I purpose to marry her. "'Put away that thought far from thee, and console thy heart of her. "'O oh, Hassan, do thou counsel me how I shall do to marry her. "'With all my heart, if thou wilt drink from my hand and march under my banner, "'I will bring thee to thy will of her. "'I will well.' "'So Hassan made Ali put off his clothes, and— taking a cauldron heated therein somewhat as if it were pitch, wherewith he anointed him, and he became like unto a blackamoor slave. Moreover, he smeared his lips and cheeks, and penciled his eyes with red coal. Then he clad him in a slave's habit, and giving him a tray of kebabs and wine, said to him, There is a black cook in the khan who requires from the bazaar only meat, and thou art now become his like. So go thou to him civilly, and accost him in friendly fashion, and speak to him in the black's lingo and salute him, saying, "'Tis long since we met in the beer-ken. He will answer thee, I have been too busy. On my hands be forty slaves, for whom I cook dinner and supper, besides making ready a tray for Delilah and the like for her daughter Zainab and the dog's food. And do thou say to him, Come, let us eat kebabs and lush swipes. Then go with him into the saloon, and make him drunken, and question him of his service, how many dishes, and what dishes he hath to cook, and ask him of the dog's food, and the keys of the kitchen, and the larder. And he will tell thee, for a man, when he is drunken, telleth all he would conceal were he sober. When thou hast done this, drug him, and don his clothes, and sticking the two knives in thy girdle, take the vegetable basket, and go to the market, and buy meat and greens, with which do thou return to the khan, and enter the kitchen, and the larder, and cook the food. Dish it up, and put bang in it, so as to drug the dogs, and the slaves, and Delilah, and Zainab, and lastly serve up. When all are asleep, hie thee to the upper chamber, and bring away every suit of clothes thou wilt find hanging there. And if thou have a mind to marry Zainab, bring with thee also the forty carrier pigeons. So Ali went to the khan, and going into the cook, saluted him, and said, "'Tis long since I have met thee in the beer ken. The slave replied, "'I have been busy cooking for the slaves and the dogs.' Then he took him, and making him drunken, questioned him of his work. Quoth the kitchener, Every day I cook five dishes for dinner, and the like for supper, and yesterday they sought of me a sixth dish, yellow rice, and a seventh, a mess of cooked pomegranate seed. Ali asked, And what is the order of thy service? And the slave answered, First I serve up Zainab's tray, next Delilah's. Then I feed the slaves, and give the dogs their sufficiency of meat and the least that satisfies them is a pound each. But, as fate would have it, he forgot to ask him of the keys. Then he drugged him and donned his clothes, after which he took the basket and went to the market. There he bought meat and greens. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the seven hundred and thirteenth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Ali of Cairo, after drugging the cook-slave with bang, took the two knives which he stuck in his belt, and, carrying the vegetable basket, went to the market where he bought meat and greens, and, presently returning to the khan, he saw Delilah seated at the gate, watching those who went in and came out, and the forty slaves with her, armed. So he hardened his heart and entered, but Delilah knew him and said to him, Back, O captain of thieves! Wilt thou play a trick on me in the khan? Thereupon he, dressed as a slave, turned and said to her, what sayest thou, O portress? She asked, What hast thou done with the slave, our cook? Say me if thou hast killed or drugged him. He answered, What cook? Is there here another slave cook than I? She rejoined, Thou liest. Thou art Mercury Ali, the Kyrene. And he said to her, in slave's patois, O portress, are the Kyrenes black or white? I will slave for you no longer. Then said the slaves to him, what is the matter with thee, O our cousin? cried Delilah. This is none of your uncle's children, but Ali Zabak the Egyptian, and meseems he hath either drugged your cousin or killed him. But they said, 
Indeed, this is our cousin, Sa'adullah, the cook. And she said, Not so. Tis Mercury Ali, and he hath dyed his skin. Quoth the sharper, And who is Ali? I am Sa'adullah. Then she fetched unguent of proof, with which she anointed Ali's forearm and rubbed it, but the black did not come off. Whereupon quoth the slaves, Let him go and dress us our dinner. Quoth Delilah, If he be indeed your cousin, he knoweth what you sought of him yesternight, and how many dishes he cooketh every day. So they asked him of this, and he said, Every day I cook you five dishes for the morning, and the like for the evening meal, lentils and rice and broth and stew and sherbet of roses. And yesternight ye sought of me a sixth dish, and a seventh, to wit yellow rice and cooked pomegranate seed. And the slave said, Right. Then quoth Delilah, In with him, and if he know the kitchen and the larder, he is indeed your cousin, but if not, kill him. Now the cook had a cat which he had brought up, and whenever he entered the kitchen it would stand at the door and spring to his back as soon as he went in. So, when Ali entered, the cat saw him and jumped on his shoulders, but he threw it off, and it ran before him to the door of the kitchen and stopped there. He guessed that this was the kitchen door, so he took the keys, and seeing one with traces of feathers thereon, knew it for the kitchen key, and therewith opened the door. Then he entered, and setting down the greens, went out again, led by the cat, which ran before him and stopped at another door. He guessed that this was the larder, and seeing one of the keys marked with grease, knew it for the key, and opened the door therewith, whereupon quoth the slaves, O Delilah, were he a stranger, he had not known the kitchen on the larder, nor had he been able to distinguish the keys thereof from the rest. Verily, he is our cousin, Sa'adullah. Quoth she, He learned the places from the cat, and distinguished the keys one from the other by the appearance, but this cleverness imposeth not upon me. Then he returned to the kitchen where he cooked the dinner, and, carrying Zainab's tray up to her room, saw all the stolen clothes hanging up, after which he went down and took Delilah her tray, and gave the slaves and the dogs their rations. The like he did at sundown, and drugged Delilah's food and that of Zainab and the slaves. Now the doors of the khan were opened and shut with the sun. So Ali went forth and cried out, saying, O dwellers in the khan, the watch is set and we have loosed the dogs. Whoso stirreth out after this can blame none save himself. But he had delayed the dog's supper and put poison therein. Consequently, when he set it before them, they ate of it and died, while the slaves and Delilah and Zainab still slept under Bang. Then he went up and took all the clothes and the carrier pigeons and, opening the gate, made off to the barrack of the forty, where he found Hassan Shuman the pestilence, who said to him, How hast thou fared? Thereupon he told him what had passed, and he praised him. Then he caused him to put off his clothes, and boiled a decoction of herbs wherewith he washed him, and his skin became white as it was, after which he donned his own dress, and going back to the khan, clad the cook in the habit he had taken from him, and made him smell to the counter-drug, upon which the slave awoke, and going forth to the green grocers, bought vegetables, and returned to the khan. Such was the case with al Zabak of Cairo, but as regards Delilah the wily, when the day broke, one of the lodgers in the khan came out of his chamber, and, seeing the gate open, and the slaves drugged, and the dogs dead, he went into her, and found her lying drugged, with a scroll on her neck, and at her head a sponge, steeped in the counter-drug. He set the sponge to her nostrils, and she awoke, and asked, Where am I? The merchant answered, When I came down from my chamber, I saw the gate of the khan open, and the dogs dead, and found the slaves and thee drugged. So she took up the paper, and read therein these words, None did this deed, save Ali the Egyptian. Then she awoke the slaves and Zainab by making them smell the counterbang, and said to them, Did I not tell you that this was Ali of Cairo? Presently adding to the slaves, But do ye conceal the matter? Then she said to her daughter, How often have I warned thee that Ali would not forgo his revenge? He hath done this deed in requital of that which thou didst with him, and he had it in his power to do with thee other than this thing but he refrained therefrom out of courtesy, and a desire that there should be love and friendship between us. So saying, she doffed her man's gear and donned woman's attire, and, tying the kerchief of peace about her neck, repaired to Ahmad al-Danaf's barrack. Now when Ali entered with the clothes and the carrier pigeons, Hassan Shuman gave the hall-keeper the price of forty pigeons, and he bought them and cooked them amongst the men. Presently there came a knock at the door, and Ahmad said, That is Delilah's knock. Rise and open to her, O hall-keeper. 
so he admitted her and and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the seven hundred and fourteenth night she pursued it hath reached me o auspicious king that when delilah was admitted hasan asked her what bringeth thee hither o ill-omened old woman verily thou and thy brother zurek the fishmonger are of a piece and she answered o captain i am in the wrong and this my neck is at thy mercy but tell me which of you it was that played me this trick quoth calamity ahmad twas the first of my lads rejoined delilah for the sake of allah intercede with him to give me back the carrier pigeons and what not and thou wilt lay me under great obligation when hasan heard this he said allah requite thee o ali why didst thou cook the pigeons and ali answered i knew not that they were carrier pigeons then said ahmad o hall-keeper bring us the cooked pigeons so he brought them and delilah took a piece and tasting it said this is none of the carrier pigeons flesh for i fed them on grains of musk and their meat has become even as musk quoth shuman and thou desire to have the carrier pigeons comply with ali's will asked she what is that and hasan answered he would have thee marry him to thy daughter zainab she said i have not command over her except of affection and hasan said to ali the kyrene give her the pigeons so he gave them to her and she took them and rejoiced in them then quoth hasan to her there is no help but thou return us a sufficient reply and delilah rejoined if it be indeed his wish to marry her it availed nothing to play this clever trick upon us it behoveth him rather to demand her in marriage of her mother's brother and her guardian captain zurek him who crieth out saying ho a pound of fish for two farthings and who hangeth up in his shop a purse containing two thousand dinars when the forty heard this they all rose and cried out saying what manner of blather is this o harlot dost thou wish to bereave us of our brother ali of cairo then she returned to the khan and said to her daughter ali the egyptian seeketh thee in marriage whereat zainab rejoiced for she loved him because of his chaste forbearance towards her and asked her mother what had passed so she told her adding i made it a condition that he should demand thy hand of thine uncle so i might make him fall into destruction meanwhile ali turned to his fellows and asked them what manner of man is this zurek and they answered he was chief of the sharpers of al Irak land and could all but pierce mountains and lay hold upon the stars he would steal the coal from the eye and in brief he had not his match for roguery but he hath repented his sins and forsworn his old way of life and opened him a fishmonger's shop and now he hath amassed two thousand dinars by the sale of fish and laid them in a purse with strings of silk to which he hath tied bells and rings and rattles of brass hung on a peg within the doorway every time he openeth his shop he suspendeth the said purse and crieth out saying where are ye o sharpers of egypt o prigs of al Irak, o tricksters of ajam land behold zurik the fishmonger hath hung up a purse in front of his shop and whoso pretendeth to craft and cunning and can take it by slight it is his so the long-fingered and greedy-minded come and try to take the purse but cannot for whilst he frieth his fish and tendeth the fire he layeth at his feet scone-like circles of lead and whenever a thief thinketh to take him unawares and maketh a snatch at the purse he casteth at him a load of lead and slayeth him or doeth him a damage so o ali wert thou to tackle him thou wouldst be as one who jostleth a funeral cortege unknowing who is dead for thou art no match for him and we fear his mischief for thee indeed thou hast no call to marry zainab and he who leaveth a thing alone liveth without it cried ali this were shame o comrades needs must i take the purse but bring me a young lady's habit so they brought him women's clothes and he clad himself therein and stained his hands with henna and modestly hung down his veil then he took a lamb and killing it cut out the long intestine which he cleaned and tied up below moreover he filled it with the blood and bound it between his thighs after which he donned petticoat trousers and walking boots he also made himself a pair of false breasts with bird crops and filled them with thickened milk and tied round his hips and over his belly a piece of linen which he stuffed with cotton girding himself over all with a kerchief of silk well starched then he went out whilst all who saw him exclaimed what a fine pair of hind cheeks presently he saw an ass-driver coming 
So he gave him a dinar, and mounting, rode till he came to Zurek's shop, where he saw the purse hung up, and the gold glittering through it. Now Zurek was frying fish, and Ali said, O oh, Asman, what is that smell? Replied he, It's the smell of Zurek's fish. Quoth Ali, I am a woman with child, and the smell harmeth me. Go fetch me a slice of the fish. So the donkey boy said to Zurek, What aileth thee to fry fish so early, and annoy pregnant women with the smell? I have here the wife of the emir Hassan Shar al Tariq, and she is with child, so give her a bit of fish, for the babe stirreth in her womb. O protector, O my God, avert from us the mischief of this day. Thereupon Zurek took a piece of fish and would have fried it, but the fire had gone out, and he went in to rekindle it. Meanwhile Ali dismounted, and sitting down, pressed upon the lamb's intestine till it burst, and the blood ran out from between his legs. Then he cried aloud, saying, O oh, my back! O oh, my side! Whereupon the driver turned, and seeing the blood running, said, What aileth thee, O oh, my lady? Replied Ali, I have miscarried. Whereupon Zurek looked out, and seeing the blood, fled affrighted into the inner shop. Quoth the donkey-driver, Allah torment thee, O Zurek! The lady hath miscarried, and thou art no match for her husband. Why must thou make a stench so early in the morning? I said to thee, Bring her a slice, but thou wouldst not. Thereupon he took his ass and went his way, and, as Zurek still did not appear, Ali put out his hand to the purse, but no sooner had he touched it than the bells and rattles and rings began to jingle, and the gold to chink. Quoth Zurek, who returned at the sound, Thy perfidy hath come to light, O gallows bird. Wilt thou put a cheat on me, and thou in a woman's habit? Now take what cometh to thee. And he threw a cake of lead at him, but it went aglay and lighted on another, whereupon the people rose against Zurek, and said to him, Art thou a tradesman or a swashbuckler? And thou be a tradesman, take down thy purse, and spare the folk thy mischief. He replied, Bismillah, in the name of Allah, on my head be it. As for Ali, he made off to the barrack, and told Hassan Shuman what had happened, after which he put off his woman's gear, and donning a groom's habit, which was brought to him by his chief, took a dish and five dirhams. Then he returned to Zurek's shop, and the fishmonger said to him, What dost thou want, O my master? He showed him the dirhams, and Zurek would have given him of the fish in the tray, but he said, I will have none save hot fish. So he set fish in the earthen pan, and finding the fire dead, went in to relight it, whereupon Ali put out his hand to the purse, and caught hold of the end of it. The rattles and rings and bells jingled, and Zurek said, Thy trick hath not deceived me. I knew thee for all thou art disguised, as a groom by the grip of thy hand on the dish and the dirhams. And Shah Razad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 26 Recording by Jeff Kluckner, Plymouth, UK Section 27 of the Book of the Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tex Savvy. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 27. Seven hundred and fifteenth night to seven hundred and seventeenth night. When it was seven hundred and fifteenth night, she resumed, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Ali of Egypt put out his hand to the purse, the bells and rings jingled, and Zurek said, Thy trick hath not deceived me, for all thou comest disguised as a groom, I knew thee by the grip of thy hand on the dish and the dirhams. So saying, he threw the lead at him, but he avoided it, and it fell into the pan full of hot fish, and broke it and overturned it, fat and all, upon the breast and shoulders of the Kazi, who was passing. The oil ran down inside his clothes to his privy pots, and he cried out, Oh! My privities, what a sad pickle you're in! Alas, unhappy I, who hath played me this trick, answered the people. Oh, but Lord, it was some small boy that threw a stone into the pan, but for Allah's word, it had been worse. Then they turned, and seeing the loaf of lead, and that it was Zurek who had thrown it, rose against him, and said to him, O oh, Zurek, 
this is not allowed of Allah. Take down the purse, or it shall go ill for thee. Answered he, I will take it down, inshallah. Meanwhile, Ali returned to the barrack and told his comrades, who cried, Where is the purse? All that had passed away, and they said, Thou hast exhausted two-thirds of his cunning. Then he changed his groom's dress for the garb of a merchant, and going out, met a snake charmer with a bag of serpents and a wallet containing his kit, to whom he said, O charmer, come and amuse my lads, and thou shalt have lodges. So he accompanied him to the barrack, where he fed him and drugging him with bong, doffed him his clothes and put them on. Then he took the bags, and repairing to Zuraik's shop, began to play the reed pipe. Quote Zuraik, Allah provide thee, but Ali pulled out the serpents, and cast them down before him, whereat the fish seller, who was afraid of snakes, fled from them into the inner shop. Thereupon Ali picked up the reptiles, and, thrusting them back into the bag, stretched out his hand, and caught hold of the end of the purse. The rings rang again, and the bells and rattles jangled, and Zurek cried, Will thou never cease to play me tricks, now thou fearest thyself a serpent charmer? So saying, he took up a piece of land, and hurled it at Ali. But it missed him and fell on the head of the groom, who was passing by, following his master, a trooper, and knocked him down. Quote the soldier, Who felled him? And the folk said, Twa, a stone fell from the roof. So the soldier passed on, and the people, seeing the piece of lead, went to Zurek and cried to him, Take down the purse! And he said, Insha'Allah! I will take it down this very night. Ali ceased not to practice upon Zurek till he had made seven different attempts, but without taking the purse. Then he returned the snake charmer his clothes and kit, and gave him due benevolence. After which he went back to Zurek's shop and heard him say, If I leave the purse here tonight, he will dig through the shop wall and take it. I will carry it home with me. So he arose and shut the shop. Then he took down the purse, and putting it in his bosom, set out home, till he came near his house, when he saw a wedding in a neighbor's lodging, and said to himself, I will hie home, and give my wife the purse, and don my fine clothes, and return to the marriage. And Ali followed him. Now Zuraik had married a black girl, one of the freed women of the Wazir Zafar, and she had borne him a son, whom he had named Abdullah, and he had promised her to spend the money in the purse on the occasion of the boy's circumcision and of his marriage procession. So he went into his house, and as he entered, his wife saw that his face was overcast and asked him, what had caused thy sadness? Quote he, Allah had afflicted me this day with a rascal who had made seven attempts to get the purse, but without avail. And quote she, Give it to me, that I may lay it up against the boy's festival day. Now Ali, who had followed him, lay hidden in the closet, whence he could see and hear all. So he gave her the purse and changed his clothes, saying, Keep the purse safely, O Umm Abdullah, for I am going to the wedding. But she said, Take thy sleep a while. So he lay down and fell asleep. Presently Ali rose and, going on tiptoe to the purse, took it and went to the house of the wedding and stood there, looking on at the fun. Now, meanwhile, Zurek dreamt that he saw a bird fly away with the purse, and, awaking in affright, said to his wife, Rise, look for the purse. So she looked, and finding it gone, buffeted her face, and said, Alas, the blackness of thy fortune, O oh, Abdullah, 
Ashoka had taken the purse. Code Zurek. By Allah, it can be none other than that rascal Ali who had plagued me all day. He had followed me home and seized the purse, and there is no help but that I go and get it back. Quoth she, Except thou bring it, I will lock on thee the door and leave thee to pass the night in the street. So he went up to the house of the wedding, and seeing Ali looking on, said to himself, this is he who took the purse, but he lodgeth with Ahmed al Danaf. So he forewent him to the barrack, and climbing up at the back, dropped down into the saloon, where he found every one asleep. Presently there came a rap at the door, and Zurek asked, Who is there? Ali of Cairo, answered the knocker, and Zurek said, Hast thou brought the purse? So Ali thought it was Hassan Shuman, and replied, I have brought it. Open the door. Quoth Zurek, Impossible that I open to thee till I see the purse, for thy chief and I have laid a wager about it. Said Ali, Put out thy hand. So he put out his hand through the hole in the side door, and Ali laid the purse in it. Whereupon Zurek took it, and going forth as he had come in, returned to the wedding. Ali stood for a long while at the door, but none opened to him, and at last he gave a thundering knock that awoke all the men, and he said, That is Ali of Cairo's peculiar rap. So the hall-keeper opened to him, and Hassan Shuman said to him, Hast thou brought the purse? Replied Ali, Enough of jesting, O Shuman, didst thou not swear that thou wouldst not open to me till I showed thee the purse, and did I not give it to thee through the hole in the side door? And didst thou not say to me, I am sworn never to open the door till thou show me the purse? Quoth Hassan, By Allah, twart not I who took it, but to rake. Quoth Ali, Needs must I get it again, and repaired to the house of the wedding, where he heard the buffoon say, Bravo, O Abu Abdullah, good luck to thee with thy son, said Ali. My luck is an ascendant and going to the fishmonger's lodging, climbed over the back wall of the house and found his wife asleep. So he drugged her with bong and clad himself in clothes. Then he took the child in his arms and went round searching till he found a palm-leaf basket containing buns, which Zurek of his niggardliness had kept from the greater feast. Presently the fishmonger returned and knocked at the door whereupon Ali imitated his wife's voice, and asked, Who is at the door? Abu Abdullah? Answered Zurek, and Ali said, I swore that I would not open the door to thee, except thou broughtest back the purse. Quoth the fishmonger, I have brought it, cried all. Hear with it into my hand before I open the door. And Zurek answered, saying, Let down the basket, and take it therein. So Sharper Ali let down the basket, and the other put the purse therein, whereupon Ali took it and drugged the child. Then he aroused the woman, and, making off by the back way as he had entered, returned with the child and the purse and the basket of cakes to the barrack, and showed them all to the forty who praised his dexterity. Thereupon he gave them cakes, which they ate, and made over the boy to Hassan Shuman, saying, This is the rake's child, hide it by thee. So he hid it, and fetching a lamp, gave it to the hall-keeper, who cooked it whole, wrapped in a cloth, and laid it out, shrouded as it were a dead body. Meanwhile Zurek stood a while, waiting at the door, then gave a knock like thunder, and his wife said to him, Hast thou brought the purse? He replied, Didst thou not take it up in the basket? Thou didst let down but now. And she rejoined, 
I let no basket down to thee, nor have I set eyes on the purse. Quoth he, By Allah, the shopper had been beforehand with me, and had taken the purse again. Then he searched the house, and found the basket of cakes gone, and the child missing, and cried out, saying, Alas, my child! Whereupon the woman beat her breast, and said, I am thee to the wazir, for none had killed my son, save the shopper, and all because of thee, cried the rake. I will answer for him. So he tied the handkerchief of truce about his neck, and going to Ahmed al Danaf's lodging, knocked at the door. The hall-keeper admitted him, and as he entered, Hassan Shuman asked him, What bringeth thee here? He answered, Do ye intercede with Ali the Cairene to restore me my child, and I will yield to him the purse of gold? Quote Hassan, Allah require thee, O Ali, why didst thou not tell me it was his child? Who had befallen him? cried Zurayk, and Hassan replied, We gave him raisins to eat, and he choked and died, and this is he, quoth Zurayk. Alas, my son, what shall I say to his mother? Then he rose, and opening the shroud, saw it was a lamb barbecued and said thou make sport of me o ali then they gave him the child and calamity ahmed said to him thou didst hang up the purse proclaiming that it should be the property of any sharpener who should be able to take it and ali had taken it so this is the very property of our kyrene zurek answered i make him a present of it but ali said to him do thou accept it on account of thy niece Zainab? And Zurek replied, I accept it. Then quoth the forty, We demand of thee Zainab in marriage for Ali of Cairo. But quoth he, I have no control over her, save of kindness. Hassan asked, Dost thou grant our suit? And he answered, Yes. I will grant her in marriage to him, who can avail to her mahar or marriage settlement. And what is her dowry? inquired Hassan, and Zurek replied, She hath sworn that none shall mount her breast, save the man who bringeth her the robe of Kamar, daughter of Azaria the Jew, and the rest of her gear. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say, when it was seven hundred and sixteenth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Zurek replied to Shuman, she hath sworn that none shall ride a straddle upon her breast, save the man who bringeth her clothes of Kamar, daughter of Azaria the Jew, and her crown and girdle and pantoufle of gold. Ali cried, if I do not bring her the clothes this very night, I renounce my claim to her, rejoined Zurey. O oh, Ali, thou art a dead man, if thou play any of thy pranks on Kamar. Why so? asked Ali, and the other answered. Her father, Jew Azuria, is a skilful, villi, perfidious magician, who had the jinn at his service. He owneth without the city a castle, whose walls are a one brick of gold and one of silver, and which is visible to the folk only whilst he is therein. Where he goes forth, it disappeareth. He brought his daughter this dress I speak of from an enchanted treasure, and every day he layeth in a charger of gold, and opening the windows of the palace, crieth out, where are the shoppers of Cairo, the prigs of Al Iraq, the master thieves of Ajumland? Whoso prevaileth to take this dress, tis his. So all the long fingered ones essayed the adventure, but failed to take it, and he turned them by his magic into apes and asses. But Ali said, I will assuredly take it, and Zainab shall be displayed therein. 
So he went to the shop of the Jew and found him a man of stern and forbidding aspect, seated with scales and stone weights, and gold and silver, and nests of drawers, and so forth before him, and a she mule tethered hard by. Presently he rose, and shutting his shop, laid the gold and silver in two purses, which he placed in a pair of saddlebags, and set on the she mule's back. Then he mounted and rode till he reached the city outskirts, followed, without his knowledge, by Ali, when he took out some dust from a pocket purse, and muttering over it, sprinkled it upon the air. No sooner had he done this, than sharper Ali saw a castle which had not its like, and the Jew mounted the steps upon his beast, which was a subject jinni, after which he dismounted, and taking the saddlebags off her back, dismissed the she mule, and she vanished. Then he entered the castle and sat down. Presently he arose, and opening the lattices, took a van of gold, which he set up in the open window, and, hanging thereto a golden charger by chains of the same metal, laid it in the dress, while Ali watched him from behind the door. And presently he cried out, saying, Where are the sharpers of Cairo? Where are the prigs of all Iraq, the master thieves of Ajumland? Whoso can take this dress by his sleigh, this is. Then he pronounced certain magical words, and a tray of food spread itself before him. He ate and conjured a second time, whereupon the tray disappeared, and yet a third time, when a table of wine was placed between his hands, and he drank. Quote Ali, I know not how I am to take the dress, except if he be drunken. Then he stole up behind the Jew, Winger and Grip, but the other turned and conjured, saying to his hand, Hold with the sword, whereupon Ali's right arm was held, and abode halfway in the air, handing the hanger. He put out his left hand to the weapon, but it also stood fixed in the air, and so with his right foot, leaving him standing on one foot, then the Jew dispelled the charm from him, and Ali became as before. Presently Azaria struck a table of sand, and found that the thief's name was Mercury Ali of Cairo. So he turned to him, and said, Come near, who art thou, and what do thou hear? He replied, I am Ali of Cairo, of the band of Ahmed al-Danaf. I sought the hand of Zainab, daughter of Dalila, the Vili and she demanded thy daughter's dress to her dowry. So do thou give it to me, and become a Muslim, and thou wouldst save thy life. Rejoined the Jew, After my death, many have gone about to steal the dress, but fail to take it from me. Wherefore, and thou deign be advised, thou wilt be gone and save thyself, for they only seek the dress of thee that thou may fall into destruction, and indeed had I not seen by geomancy that thy fortune overrided my fortunes, I had smitten thy neck. Ali rejoiced to hear that his luck overcame that of the Jew, and said to him, There is no help for it, but I must have the dress, and thou must become a true believer, asked the Jew. Is this thy will and last word? And Ali answered, Yes. So the Jew took a cup, and filling it with water, conjured over it, and said to Ali, Come forth from this shape of man into form of an ass. Then he sprinkled him with the water, and straightway he became a donkey, with hoofs and long ears, and fell to braying after the manner of Essenines. The Jew drew round him a circle which became a wall over against him, and drank on till the morning when he said to Ali, I will ride thee to-day, and give the she-mule a rest. So he locked up the dress, the charger, the rod, and the charms in a cupboard, and conjured over Ali, he followed him. Then he set the saddlebags on his back, and mounting, fared forth of the castle, whereupon it disappeared from sight, and rode into Baghdad till he came to his shop, where he alighted and emptied the bags of gold and silver into trays before him. As for Ali, he was tied up by the shop door, where he stood in his asinine form, hearing and understanding all that passed, without being able to speak. 
and behold up came a young merchant from whom fortune had played the tyrant and who could find no easier way of earning his livelihood than water carrying so he brought his wife's bracelets to the jew and said to him give me the price of these bracelets that i may buy me an ass asked the jew what wilt thou do with him and the other answered o oh, master i mean to fetch water from the river on his back and earn by living thereby quoth the jew take this ass of mine so he sold him the bracelets and received the ass-shaped ali of cairo in part payment and carried him home quoth ali to himself if the ass man clap the panel on thee and load thee with water skins and go with thee half a score journeys a day he will ruin thy health and thou wilt die so when the water carrier's wife came to bring him his fodder he buttered her with his head and she fell on her back whereupon he sprang on her and spitten her brow with his mouth put out and displayed that which his begetter left him she cried aloud and the neighbors came to her assistance and beat him and raised him off her breast when her husband the intended water carrier came home she said to him now either divorce me or return the ass to his owner he asked what had happened and she answered this is the devil in the guise of a donkey he sprang upon me and had not the neighbors beaten him off my bosom he had done with me a foul thing so he carried the ass back to the jew who said to him wherefore hast thou brought him back and he replied he did a foul thing with my wife so the jew gave him his money again and went away and azaria said to ali hast thou recourse to knavery unlucky wretch that thou art in order that and shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day and ceased saying her third say when it was seven hundred and seventeenth night she continued it had reached me o auspicious king that when the water carrier brought back the ass its due owner returned to him the monies and turning to ali of cairo said hast thou recourse to knavery unlucky wretch that thou art in order that he may return thee to me but since it pleaseth thee to be an ass i will make thee a spectacle and a laughing stock to great and small then he mounted him and rode till he came without the city when he brought out the ashes in powder and conjuring over it sprinkled it upon the air and immediately the castle appeared he entered and taking the saddle bags off the ass's back set up the rod and hung it to the charger wherein were the clothes proclaiming aloud where be the clever ones of all quarters who may avail to take this dress then he conjured as before and meat was set before him and he ate and then wine he drank after which he took a cup of water and muttering certain words thereover sprinkled it on the ass ali saying quit this form and return to thy former shape ali straightway became a man once more and azaria said to him o ali take good advice and be content with my mischief thou hast no call to marry zainab nor to take my daughter's dress for this no easy matter for thee so leave greed and twill be better for thee else will i turn thee into a bear or an ape or set on thee an infrit who will cast thee behind the mountain calf he replied i have engaged to take the dress and needs must i have it and thou must slam aside or i will slay thee rejoined the jew o ali thou art like a walnut unless it be broken it cannot be eaten then he took a cup of water and conjuring over it sprinkled ali with somewhat thereof saying take thy shape of bear whereupon he instantly became a bear and the jew put a collar about his neck muzzled him and chained him to a picket of iron then he sat down and ate and drank 
now and then throwing him a morsel of his oats and emptying the dregs of the cup over him till the morning when he rose and laid by the tray and dress and conjured over the bear which followed him to the shop there the jew sat down and and emptied the gold and silver into the trays before ali after binding him by the chain and the bear there abode seeing and comprehending but not able to speak Presently up came a man and a merchant, who accosted the Jew, and said to him, O master, wilt thou sell me yonder bear? I have a wife, who is my cousin, and is sick, and they have prescribed for her to eat bear's flesh, and anoint herself with bear's grease. At this the Jew rejoiced, and said to himself, I will sell him to this merchant, so he slaughter him, and we be at peace from him. And Ali also said in his mind, By Allah, this fellow meaneth to slaughter, but deliverance is with the Almighty. Then said the Jew, He's a present from me thee. So the merchant took him and carried him into the butcher, to whom he said, Bring thy tools and company me. The butcher took his knives and followed the merchant to his house, where he bound the beast and fell to sharpening his blade. But when he went up to him to slaughter him, the bear escaped from his hands, and rising into the air disappeared from sight between heaven and earth. Nor did he cease flying till he alighted at the Jew's castle. Now the reason thereof was on this wise. When the Jew returned home, his daughter questioned him of Ali, and he told her what had happened. Whereupon she said, Summon a genie, and ask him of the youth, whether he be indeed, Mercury Ali, or another who seeketh to put a cheat on thee. So Azaria called the genie by conjurations, and questioned him of Ali, and he replied, This is Ali of Cairo himself. The butcher had pinioned him, and whetted his knife to slaughter him. Quote the Jew, Go snatch him, and bring him hither, ere the butcher cut his throat. So the jinni flew off, and snatching Ali out of the butcher's hands, bore him to the palace, and set him down before the Jew, who took a cup of water, and conjuring over it, sprinkled him therewith, saying, Return on thine own shape. And he straightway became a man, again as before. The Jew's daughter, Kamar, seeing him to be a handsome young man, fell in love with him, and he fell in love with her. And she said to him, O oh, unlucky one, why do thou go about to take my dress, and forcing my father to deal thus with thee? Quote he, I have engaged to get it for Zainab and the coney catcher, that I may wed her therewith. And she said, Others than thou have played pranks with my father to get my dress, but could not win to it. Presently adding, So put away this thought from thee. But he answered, Needs must I have it, and thy father must become a Muslim, else I will slay him. And then said the Jew, See, O oh my daughter, how this unlucky fellow seeketh his own destruction. Adding, now i will turn thee into a dog so he took a cup graven with characters and full of water and conjuring over it sprinkled some of it upon ali saying take thou form of dog whereupon he straightway became a dog and the jew and his daughters drank together till the morning when the father laid up the dress and charger and mounted his mule then he conjured over the dog which followed him as he rode towards the town, and all dogs barked at Ali as he passed, till he came to the shop of a broker, a seller of the second-hand goods, who rose and drove away the dogs, and Ali lay down before him. The Jew turned and looked for him, but finding him not, passed onwards. Presently the broker shut up his shop and went home followed by the dog which when his daughter saw enter the house she veiled her face and said o oh, my papa do thou bring a strange man into me he replied o oh, my daughter this is a dog quoth she not so this ali the kyrene whom the jew azaria had enchanted and she turned to the dog and said to him art not 
Ali of Cairo. And he signed to her with his head. Yes. Then her father asked her, Why did the Jew enchant him? And she answered, Because of his daughter Kumar's dress, but I can release him, said the broker. And thou canst indeed do him this good office. Now is the time. And she, If he will marry me, I will release him. And he signed to her with his head, Yes. So she took a cup of water, graven with certain signs, and conjuring over it, was about to sprinkle Ali therewith. When, lo and behold, she heard a great cry, and the cup fell from her hand. She turned and found that it was her father's handmaid who had cried out, and she said to her, O oh, my mistress, it's thus thou keepest the covenant between me and thee. None taught thee this art save I, and thou didst agree with me that thou wouldst do not without consulting me, and that whoso married thee should marry me also, and that one night should be mine, and one night thine. And the broker's daughter said, "'Tis well. When the broker heard the maid's words, he asked his daughter, "'Who taught the maid?' And she answered, "'O oh, my papa, inquire of herself.' So he put the question, and she replied, "'Know, O oh my lord, that when I was with Azaria the Jew, I used to spy upon him and listen to him, when he performed his grammar, and when he went forth to his shop, in Baghdad, I opened his books and read in them till I became skilled in the Kabbalah signs. One day he was warm with wine, and would have me lie with him. I objected, saying, I may not grant thee this except thou become a Muslim. He refused, and I said to him, Now for the Sultan's market. So he sold me to thee, and I taught my young mistress, making it a condition with her that she should do not without my counsel, and that whoso might wed her should wed me also, one night for me and one night for her. Then she took a cup of water, and conjuring over it, sprinkled the dog therewith, saying, Return thou to form of a man. And he straight away was restored to his former shape, whereupon the broker saluted him with the salam, and asked him the reason for his enchantment. So Ali told him all that had passed, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 27 Recording by Tech Savvy www.techsavvy.wordpress.com Section 28 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ali Chinji. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 28. When it was the seven hundred and eighteenth night, she resumed, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the broker, having saluted Ali of Cairo with a salam, asked him the reason of his enchantment, and what had befallen him. And he answered by telling him all that had passed, when the broker said to him, Will not my daughter and the handmaid suffice thee? But he answered, Needs must I have Zainab also. Now suddenly there came a rap at the door, and the maid said, Who is at the door? The knocker replied, Kamar, daughter of Azariah the Jew, say me, is Ali of Cairo with you? Replied the broker's daughter, O oh, thou daughter of a dog, if he be with us, what wilt thou with him? Go down, O maid, and open to her. So the maid let her in, and when she looked upon Ali and he upon her, he said, what bringeth thee hither, O dog's daughter? Quoth she, I testify that there is no God but the God, 
and I testify that Muhammad is the Apostle of God. And having thus Islamized, she asked him, Two men in the faith of Al-Islam give marriage portions to women, or do women dower men? Quoth he, Men and our women. Then, said she, I come and dower myself for thee, bringing thee, as my marriage portion, my dress, together with the rod and charger and chains and the head of my father, the enemy of thee and the foeman of Allah. And she threw down the Jew's head before him. Now the cause of her slaying her sire was as follows. On the night of his turning Ali into a dog, she saw in a dream a speaker who said to her, Become a Moslema. She did so, and as soon as she awoke next morning, she expounded al-Islam to her father, who refused to embrace the faith. So she drugged him with bang and killed him. As for Ali, he took the gear and said to the broker, Meet we tomorrow at the Caliph's divan, that I may take thy daughter and the handmaid to wife. Then he set out rejoicing to return to the barrack of the forty. On his way he met a sweetmeat seller, who was beating hand upon hand, and saying, There is no majesty, and there is no might, save in Allah, the glorious, the great. Folk's labour hath waxed sinful, and man is active only in fraud. Then said he to Ali, I conjure thee, by Allah, taste of this confection. So Ali took a piece, and ate it, and fell down senseless, for there was bang therein. Whereupon the sweetmeat seller seized the dress, and the charger, and the rest of the gear, and thrusting them into the box where he kept his sweetmeats, hoisted it up, and made off. Presently he met Akazi, who called to him, saying, Come hither, O sweetmeat seller. So he went up to him, and setting down his sack, laid a tray of sweetmeats upon it, and asked, What dost thou want? Halwa and Rajais, answered the Kazi, and taking some in his hand, said, Both of these are adulterated. Then he brought out sweetmeats from his breast pocket, and gave them to the sweetmeat seller, saying, Look at this fashion, how excellent it is, eat of it and make the like of it. So he ate, and fell down senseless, for the sweetmeats were drugged with bang, whereupon the Kazi bundled him into the sack, and made off with him, charger and chest and all, to the barrack of the forty. Now the judge in question was Hassan Shuman, and the reason of this was as follows. When Ali had been gone some days in quest of the dress, and they heard no news of him, Calamity Ahmad said to his men, O oh, lads, go and seek for your brother Ali of Cairo. So they sallied forth in quest of him, and among the rest Hassan Shuman the pestilence, disguised in Akazi's gear. He came upon the sweetmeat seller, and knowing him for Ahmad al Lakit, suspected him of having played some trick upon Ali. So he drugged him, and did as we have seen. Meanwhile, the other forty fared about the streets and highways, making search in different directions, and amongst them Ali Kit Fal Jamal, who, espying a crowd, made towards the people and found the Kairin Ali lying drugged and senseless in their midst. So he revived him, and he came to himself, and seeing the folk flocking around him, asked, Where am I? Answered Ali Kamul Shoulder and his comrades, We found thee lying here drugged but know not who drugged thee. Quoth Ali, "'Twas a certain sweetmeat seller who drugged me, and took the gear from me, but where is he gone?' Quoth his comrades, "'We have seen nothing of him, but come, rise, and go home with us.' So they returned to the barrack, where they found Ahmad al-Danaf, who greeted Ali and inquired if he had brought the dress. He replied, I was coming hither with it and other matters, including a Jew's head, when a sweetmeat seller met me and drugged me with bang, and took them from me. Then he told him the whole tale, ending with, If I come across that man of goodies again, I will requite him. Presently Hassan Shuman came out of a closet and said to him, Hast thou gotten the gear, O Ali? So he told him what had befallen him, and added, If I know whither the rascal is gone, and where to find the knave, I will pay him out. Knowest thou whither he went? 
answered Hassan, I know where he is, and opening the door of the closet, showed him the sweetmeat cellar within, drugged and senseless. Then he aroused them, and he opened his eyes, and finding himself in presence of Mercury Ali and Calamity Ahmad and the Forty, started up and said, Where am I, and who hath laid hands on me? Replied Shuman, Twas I laid hands on thee. And Ali cried, O oh, perfidious wretch, will thou play thy pranks on me? And he would have slain him, but Hassan said to him, Hold thy hand, for this fellow is become thy kinsman. How, my kinsman? quoth Ali, and quoth Hassan. This is Ahmad al Lakid, son of Zainab's sister. Then said Ali to the prisoner, Why didst thou thus, O Lakid? And he replied, My grandmother, Delilah the wily, bade me do it. Only because Zuraik the fishmonger foregathered with the old woman and said, Mercury Ali of Cairo is a sharper and a past master in knavery, and he will certainly slay the Jew and bring hither the dress. So she sent for me and said to me, O oh, Ahmad, dost thou know Ali of Cairo? Answered I, Indeed I do, and twas I directed him to Ahmad al Danaf's lodging when he first came to Baghdad. Quoth she, Go and set thy nets for him, and if he have brought back the gear, put a cheat on him, and take it from him. So I went round about the highways of the city, till I met a sweetmeat seller, and buying his clothes and stock in trade and gear for ten dinars, did what was done. Thereupon quoth Ali, Go back to thy grandmother and Zuraik, and tell them that I have brought the gear and the Jew's head, and tell them to meet me tomorrow at the Caliph's divan, there to receive Zainab's dowry. And Calamity Ahmad rejoiced in this, and said, We have not wasted our pains in rearing thee, O Ali. Next morning Ali took the dress, the charger, the rod, and the chains of gold, together with the head of Azariah the Jew, mounted on a pike, and went up, accompanied by Ahmad al Danaf and the forty, to the divan, where they kissed ground before the caliph. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the seven hundred and nineteenth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Ali the Kyrene went up to the caliph's divan, accompanied by his uncle Ahmad al Danaf and his lads, they kissed ground before the caliph, who turned and seeing a youth of the most valiant aspect, inquired of Calamity Ahmad concerning him, and he replied, O commander of the faithful, this is Mercury Ali, the Egyptian captain of the brave boys of Cairo, and he is the first of my lads. And the caliph loved him for the valour that shone from between his eyes, testifying for him and not against him. Then Ali rose, and casting the Jew's head down before him, said, May thine every enemy be like this one, O prince of true believers. Quoth Ar Rashid, Whose head is this? And quoth Ali, Tis the head of Azariah the Jew. Who slew him? asked the Caliph. So Ali related to him all that had passed, from first to last, and the Caliph said, I had not thought thou wouldst kill him, for that he was a sorcerer. Ali replied, O commander of the faithful, my lord made me prevail to his slaughter. Then the caliph sent the chief of police to the Jew's palace, where he found him lying headless, so he laid the body on a bier, and carried it to a Rashid who commanded to burn it. Whereat, behold, up came Kamar, and kissing the ground before the caliph, informed him that she was the daughter of Jew Azariah, and that she had become a Moslemah. Then she renewed her profession of faith before the commander of the faithful, and said to him, Be thou my intercessor with Shah Ali, that he take me to wife. She also appointed him her guardian to consent to her marriage with the Kyrene, to whom he gave the Jew's palace and all its contents, saying, Ask a boon of me. Quoth Ali, I beg of thee to let me stand on thy carpet and eat of thy table. And quoth the caliph, O Ali, Hast thou any lads? He replied, I have forty lads, but they are in Cairo. Rejoined the caliph, Send to Cairo, and fetch them hither. Presently adding, But, O oh Ali, hast thou a barrack for them? 
No, answered Ali. And Hassan Shuman said, I make him a present of my barak with all that is therein, O commander of the faithful. However, the caliph retorted, saying, Thy lodging is thine own, O Hassan. And he bade his treasurer give the court architect ten thousand dinars that he might build Ali a hall with four daises and forty sleeping closets for his lads. Then said he, O Ali, hast thou any further wish that we may command its fulfilment? And said Ali, O king of the age, be thou my intercessor with Delilah the wily, that she give me her daughter Zainab to wife, and take the dress and gear of Azariah's girl, in lieu of dower. Delilah accepted the caliph's intercession, and accepted the charger and dress and what not, and they drew up the marriage contracts between Ali and Zainab and Kamar, the Jew's daughter and the broker's daughter and the handmaid. Moreover, the caliph assigned him a salt, with a table morning and evening, and stipends and allowances for fodder, all of the most liberal. Then Ali the Kyrene fell to making ready for the wedding festivities, and after thirty days he sent a letter to his comrades in Cairo, wherein he gave them to know the favours and honours which the caliph had bestowed upon him, and said, I have married four maidens, and needs must ye come to the wedding. So, after a reasonable time, the forty lads arrived, and they held high festival. He homed them in his barrack, and entreated them with the utmost regard, and presented them to the caliph, who bestowed on them robes of honour and largesse. Then the tiring women displayed Zainab before Ali in the dress of the Jew's daughter, and he went in unto her, and found her a pearl unthridden, and a filly by all save himself unridden. Then he went in unto the three other maidens, and found them accomplished in beauty and loveliness. After this, it befell that Ali of Cairo was one night on guard by the caliph, who said to him, I wish thee, O Ali, to tell me all that hath befallen thee from first to last with Delilah the wily, and Zainab the coney catcher, and Zuraik the fishmonger. So Ali related to him all his adventures, and the commander of the faithful, bade recall them and lay them up in the royal monument rooms. So they wrote down all that had befallen him, and kept it in store with other histories for the people of Mohammed, the best of men. And Ali and his wives and comrades abode in all solace of life and its joyance, till there came to them the destroyer of delights and sunderer of societies. And Allah, be he extolled and exalted, is all-knowing, and also men relate the tale of Ardashir and Hayat al-Nufus. There was once in the city of Shiraz a mighty king called Saif al ahzam Shah, who had grown old without being blessed with a son. So he summoned the physicists and physicians and said to them, I am now in years, and ye know my case and the state of the kingdom and its ordinance, and I fear for my subjects after me for that up to this present I have not been vouchsafed a son. Thereupon they replied, We will compound thee a somewhat of drugs, wherein shall be efficacy, if it please Almighty Allah. So they mixed him drugs, which he used, and knew his wife carnally, and she conceived by leave of the Most High Lord, who saith to a thing, Be, and it becometh. When her months were accomplished, she gave birth to a male child like the moon, whom his father named Ardashir. And he grew up and throve, and applied himself to the study of learning and letters, till he attained the age of fifteen. Now there was in al a king called Abd al-Qadir, who had a daughter by name Hayat al-Nufus, and she was like the rising full moon. But she had a hatred for men, and the folk very hardly dared name mankind in her presence. The kings of the Khosrois had sought her in marriage of a sire, but when he spoke with her thereof, she said, Never will I do this, and if thou force me thereto, I will slay myself. Now Prince Adashir heard of her fame, and fell in love with her, and told his father who, seeing his case, took pity on him, and promised him day by day that he should marry her. So he dispatched his wazir to demand her in wedlock, 
but King Abd al Kadir refused, and when the minister returned to King Saif al Assam and acquainted him with what had befallen his mission and the failure thereof, he was wroth with exceeding wrath and cried, Shall the like of me send to one of the kings on a requisition and he accomplish it not? Then he bade a herald make proclamation to his troops, bidding them bring out the tents and equip them for war with all diligence, though they should borrow money for the necessary expenses. And he said, I will on no wise turn back till I have laid waste King Abd al Qadir's dominions and slain his men and plundered his treasures and blotted out his traces. When the report of this reached Adashir, he rose from his carpet bed and going in to his father, kissed ground between his hands, and said, O mighty king, trouble not thyself with aught of this thing. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the seven hundred and twentieth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when report of this reached the prince, he went in to his sire the king, and kissing ground between his hands, said, O mighty king, trouble not thy soul with aught of this thing, and levy not thy champions and armies, neither spend thy monies. Thou art stronger than he, and if thou lose upon him this thy host, thou wilt lay waste his cities and dominions, and spoil his good, and slay his strong men and himself. But when his daughter shall come to know what hath befallen her father and his people by reason of her, she will slay herself, and I shall die on her account, for I can never live after her, no, never. Asked the king, And what then thinkest thou to do, O my son? And the prince answered, I will don a merchant's habit, and cast about how I may win to the princess, and compass my desire of her. Quoth Saif al Assam, Art thou determined upon this? And quoth the prince, Yes, O my sire. Whereupon the king called to his wazir, and said to him, Do thou journey with my son, the core of my heart, and help him to win his will, and watch over him, and guide him with thy sound judgment, for thou standest to him even in my stead. I hear and obey, answered the minister. And the king gave his son three hundred thousand dinars in gold, and great store of jewels, and precious stones, and goldsmiths' ware, and stuffs, and other things of price. Then Prince Adashir went in to his mother, and kissed the hands, and asked the blessing. She blessed him, and, forthright opening her treasures, brought out to him necklaces and trinkets and apparel and all manner of other costly objects hoarded up from the time of the bygone kings, whose price might not be evened with coin. Moreover, he took with him of his mamelukes and negro slaves and cattle all that he needed for the road and clad himself and the wazir and the company in trader's gear. Then he farewelled his parents and kinsfolk and friends and setting out, fared on over walls and wastes all hours of the day and watches of the night. And when as the way was longsome upon him, he improvised these couplets. My longing, bread of love, with mine unease forever grows, nor against all the wrongs of time one succour arose. When players and the fishes show in the sky the rise I watch, as worshipper within whose breast a pious burning glows. For star or morn I spear until at last when it is seen, I mad it with my passion, and my fancy woes and throes. I swear by you that never from your love have I been loosed. Nor am I, save a watcher who of slumber nothing knows. Though hard appear my hope to win, Though languor I increase, And after thee my patience fails, And ne'er a helper shows, Yet will I wait, Till Allah shall be pleased to join our loves, I'll mortify the jealous, And I'll mock me of my foes. When he ended his verse, he swooned away, And the wazir sprinkled rose water on him, Till the prince came to himself, When the minister said to him, O king's son, Possess thy soul in patience, for the consequence of patience is consolation, 
and behold, thou art on the way to whatso thou wishest. And he ceased not to bespeak him fair and comfort him till his trouble subsided, and they continued their journey with all diligence. Presently the prince again became impatient of the length of the way, and bethought him of his beloved, and recited these couplets. Longsome is absence, restlessness increaseth, and despite, and burn my vitals in the blaze my love and longing slight. Grows my hair grey from pains and pangs which I am doomed to bear, for pine while tear floods stream from my eyes and sore offend my sight. I swear, O hope of me, O end of every wish and will, by him who made mankind and every branch with leafage dight, a passion load for thee, O my desire, I must endure, and boast I that to bear such load no lover hath the might. Question the night of me, and nigh thy soul shall satisfy mine eyelids never close in sleep throughout the livelong night. Then he wept with sore weeping and plained of that he suffered for stress of love longing, but the wazir comforted him and spoke him fair, promising him the winning of his wish, after which they fared on again for a few days, when they drew near to the white city, the capital of King Abdul Qadir, soon after sunrise. Then said the minister to the prince, Rejoice, O king's son, in all good, for see, yonder is the white city, that which thou seekest. Whereat the prince rejoiced with exceeding joy, and recited these couplets. My friends, a yearning heart distraught for him, longing abides, and with sore pains a brim. I mourn like childless mother, nor can find one to console me when the light grows dim. Yet, when the breezes blow from off thy land, I feel the freshness shed on heart and limb, and rail mine eyes like water-laden clouds, while in a tear sea shed by heart I swim. Now, when they enter the white city, they ask for the merchant's khan, a place of moneyed men, and when shown the hostelry, they hide three magazines, and on receiving the keys, they laid up therein all their goods and gear. They abode in the Khan till they were rested, when the wazir applied himself to devise a device for the prince. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 28. Recording by Ali Chinji. Riska, South Wales, United Kingdom. Section 29 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ali Chinji. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7 by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 29. When it was the seven hundred and twenty-first night, she pursued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the prince and the minister alighted at the Khan, and lodged the goods in the ground-floor magazines, and there settled their servants. Then they tarried a while, till they had rested, when the wazir arose, and applied himself to devise a device for the prince, and said to him, I have bethought me of somewhat wherein, methinks, will be success for thee, so it please Almighty Allah. Quoth Adashir, O thou wazir of good counsel, do what cometh to thy mind, and may the Lord direct thy read aright. Quoth the minister, I purpose to hire thee a shop in the market street of the stuff sellers, and set thee therein, for that all, great and small, have recourse to their bazaar, and, meseems, when the folk see thee with their own eyes sitting in the shop, their hearts will incline to thee, and thou wilt thus be enabled to attain thy desire. For thou art fair of favour, and souls incline to thee, and sight rejoiceth in thee. The other replied, Do what seemeth good to thee. 
so the wazir forthright began to robe the prince and himself in the richest raiment and putting a purse of a thousand dinars in his breast pocket went forth and walked about the city whilst all who looked upon them marvelled at the beauty of the king's son saying glory be to him who created this youth of vile water blessed be allah excellent test of creators great was the talk anent him and some said this is no mortal this is naught save a noble angel and others hath rizwan the doorkeeper of the eden garden left the gate of paradise unguarded that this youth hath come forth the people followed them to the stuff market where they entered and stood till there came up to them an old man of dignified presence and venerable appearance who saluted them and they returned his salam then the sheikh said to them o my lords have ye any need that we may have the honour of accomplishing and the wazir asked him who art thou o elder he answered i am the overseer of the market quoth the wazir know then o sheikh that this youth is my son and i wish to hire him a shop in the bazaar that he may sit therein and learn to sell and buy and take and give and come to ken merchants ways and habits i hear and i obey replied the overseer and brought them without stay or delay the key of a shop which he caused the broker sweep and clean and they did his bidding then the wazir sent for a high mattress stuffed with ostrich down and set it up in the shop spreading upon it a small prayer carpet and a cushion fringed with broidery of red gold moreover he brought pillars and transported thither so much of the goods and stuffs that he had brought with him as filled the shop next morning the young prince came and opening the shop seated himself on the divan and stationed two mamelukes clad in the richest of raiment before him and two black slaves of the goodliest of the abyssinians in the lower part of the shop the wazir enjoined him to keep his secret from the folk so the bar he might find aid in the winning of his wishes then he left him and charging him to acquaint him with what befell him in the shop day by day returned to the khan the prince sat in the shop till night as he were the moon at its fullest whilst the folk hearing tell of his comeliness flocked to the place without errand to gaze on his beauty and loveliness and symmetry and perfect grace and glorify the almighty who created and shaped him till none could pass through that bazaar for the excessive crowding of the folk about him the king's son turned right and left abashed at the throng of people that stared at him hoping to make acquaintance with some one about the court of whom he might get news of the princess but he found no way to this wherefore his breast was straitened meanwhile the wazir daily promised him the attainment of his desire and the case so continued for a time till one morning as the youth sat in the shop there came up an old woman of respectable semblance and dignified presence clad in raiment of devotees and followed by two slave girls like moons she stopped before the shop and having considered the prince a while cried glory be to god who fashioned that face and perfected that figure then she saluted him and he returned her salam and seated her by his side quoth she whence cometh thou o fair of favour and quoth he from the parts of hind o my mother and i have come to this city to see the world and look about me honour to thee for a visitor what goods and stuffs hast thou show me something handsome fit for kings if thou wish for handsome stuffs i will show them to thee for i have wares that beseem persons of every condition o my son i want somewhat costly of price and seemly to sight brief the best thou hast thou must needs tell me for whom thou seekest it that i may show thee goods according to the rank of the requiter thou speakest sooth o my son said she
I want somewhat for my mistress, Hayat al Nufus, daughter of Abd al Kadir, lord of this land and king of this country. Now, when Adashir heard his mistress's name, his reason flew for joy and his heart fluttered, and he gave no order to slave or servant, but, putting his hand behind him, pulled out a purse of a hundred dinars and offered it to the old woman, saying, This is for the washing of thy clothes. Then he again put forth his hand, and brought out of a wrapper a dress worth ten thousand dinars or more, and said to her, This is of that which I have brought to your country. When the old woman saw it, it pleased her, and she asked, What is the price of this dress, O perfect in qualities? Answered he, I will take no price for it. Whereupon she thanked him, and repeated a question, but he said, by Allah, I will take no price for it. I make thee a present of it, and the princess will not accept it, and tis a guest gift from me to thee. Alhamdulillah, glory be to God, who hath brought us together, so that, if one day I have a want, I shall find in thee a helper to me in winning it. She marvelled at the goodliness of his speech, and the excess of his generosity, and the perfection of his courtesy, and said to him, What is thy name, O my lord? He replied, My name is Adashir. And she cried, By Allah, this is a rare name. There were the king's sons named, and thou art in a guise of the sons of the merchants. Quoth he, Of the love my father bore me, he gave me this name but a name signifieth naught. And quoth she in wonder, O oh, my son, take the price of thy goods. But he swore that he would not take aught. Then the old lady said to him, O oh, my dear one, truth, I would have thee know, is the greatest of all things, and thou hadst not dealt thus generously by me, but for a special reason. So tell me thy case, and thy secret thought, belike, Thou hast some wish to whose winning I may help thee. Thereupon he laid his hand in hers, and after exacting an oath of secrecy, told her the whole story of his passion for the princess, and his condition by reason thereof. The old woman shook her head, and said, True, but, O oh my son, the wise say, in the current adage, And thou wouldest be obeyed? Abstain from ordering what may not be made. And thou, my son, thy name is Merchant. And though thou hadst the keys of the hidden hoards, yet wouldst thou be called naught but Merchant. And thou wouldst rise to high rank, according to thy station, then seek the hand of a Kazi's daughter, or even an Emir's, but why, O oh my son, aspirest thou to none but the daughter of the king of the age and the time, and she a clean maid, who knoweth nothing of the things of the world, and hath never in her life seen anything but a palace wherein she dwelleth? Yet, for all her tender age, she is intelligent, shrewd, vivacious, penetrating, quick of wit, sharp of act, and rare of read. Her father hath no other child, and she is dearer to him than his life and soul. Every morning he cometh to her, and giveth her good morrow, and all who dwell in the palace stand in dread of her. Think not, O oh my son, that any dare be speaker with aught of these words, nor is there any way for me thereto. By Allah, O oh my son, my heart and vitals love thee, and were it in my power to give thee access to her, I would assuredly do it. But I will tell thee somewhat, wherein Allah may haply appoint the healing of the heart, and will risk life and goods for thee, till I win thy will for thee. He asked, And what is that, O my mother? And she answered, Seek of me the daughter of a wazir, or an emir, and I will grant thy request. But it may not be that one should mount from earth to heaven at one bound. When the prince heard this, he replied to her with courtesy and sense, O oh, my mother, 
thou art a woman of wit, and knowest how things go. Say me, doth a man, when his head irketh him, bind up his hand? Quoth she, No, by Allah, O my son. And quoth he, Even so, my heart seeketh none but her, and naught slayeth me but love of her. By Allah, I am a dead man, and I find not one to counsel me aright and succour me. Allah upon thee, O my mother, take pity on my strangerhood and the streaming of my tears. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the seven hundred and twenty-second night, she resumed, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Ardashir, the king's son, said to the old woman, Allah upon thee, O my mother, take pity on my strangerhood and the streaming of my tears. Replied she, By Allah, O my son, thy words rent my heart, but my hand hath no cunning wherewith to help thee. Quoth he, I beseech thee of thy favour, carry her a letter, and kiss her hands for me. So she had compassion on him, and said, Write what thou wilt, and I will bear it to her. When he heard this, he was ready to fly for joy, and calling for ink case and paper, wrote these couplets. O Hayat al Nufus, be generous and incline to one who loving thee for parting's doom to pine. I was in all delight, in gladsomest of life, but now I am distraught with sufferings condign. To wakefulness I cling through longsomeness of night, and with me sorrow chats through each sad eye of mine. Pity a lover sad, a sore afflicted wretch, whose eyelids ever also dar with tearful brine. And when the morning comes at last, the real morn, he finds him drunken and distraught with passion's wine. Then he folded the scroll and kissing it, gave it to the old woman after which he put his hand to a chest, and took out a second purse containing a hundred dinars, which he presented to her, saying, Divide this among the slave girls. She refused it, and cried, By Allah, O my son, I am not with thee for aught of this. However, he thanked her, and answered, There is no help but that thou accept of it. So she took it, and kissing his hands, returned home and going into the princess cried o oh, my lady i have brought thee somewhat the like whereof is not with the people of our city and it cometh from a handsome young man that womb there is not a goodlier on earth's face she asked o oh, my nurse and whence cometh the youth and the old woman answered from the parts of hind and he hath given me this dress of gold brocade embroidered with pearls and gems and worth the kingdom of crossroads and caesar thereupon she opened the dress and the whole palace was illuminated by its brightness because of the beauty of its fashion and the wealth of unions and jewels wherewith it was broidered and all who were present marvelled at it the princess examined it and judging it to be worth no less than the whole year's revenue of her father's kingdom said to the old woman O my nurse, cometh this dress from him or from another? replied she, from him. And Hayat al Nufus asked, Is this trader of our town or a stranger? The old woman answered, He is a foreigner, O my lady, newly come hither, and by Allah he hath servants and slaves, and he is fair of face, symmetrical of form, well mannered, open handed, and open hearted. Never so I a goodlier than he, save thyself. The king's daughter rejoined, Indeed, this is an extraordinary thing, that a dress like this, which money cannot buy, should be in the hands of a merchant. What price did he set on it, O my nurse? Quoth she, 
by Allah, he would set no price on it, but gave me back the money thou sentest by me, and swore that he would take naught thereof, saying, "'Tis a gift from me to the king's daughter, for it beseemeth none but her, and if she will not accept it, I make thee a present of it." cried the princess. By Allah, this is indeed marvellous generosity and wondrous munificence. But I fear the issue of his affair, lest, haply, he be brought to necessity. Why didst thou not ask him, O my nurse, if he had any desire, that we might fulfil it for him? The nurse replied, O my lady, I did ask him, and he said to me, I have indeed a desire. But he would not tell me what it was. However, he gave me this letter and said, Carry it to the princess. So Hayat al-Nufus took the letter and opened and read it to the end, whereupon she was so chafed and lost temper, and changing colour for anger, she cried out to the old woman, saying, Woe to thee, O nurse! What is the name of this dog who durst write this language to a king's daughter? What affinity is there between me and this hound that you should address me thus? By Almighty Allah, Lord of the world Zemzem and of the Hatim wall, but that I fear the Omnipotent, the Most High, I would send and bind the cur's hands behind him, and slit his nostrils, and shear off his nose and ears, and after, by way of example, crucify him on the gate of the bazaar wherein is his booth. When the old woman heard these words, she waxed yellow. Her side muscles quivered and her tongue clave to her mouth. But she heartened her heart and said, Softly, O oh my lady, what is there in his letter to trouble thee thus? Is it aught but a memorial containing his complaint to thee of poverty or oppression, from which he hopeth to be relieved by thy favour? replied she no by allah o oh my nurse tis naught of this but verses and shameful words however o oh my nurse this dog must be in one of three cases either he is gin mad and hath no wit or he seeketh his own slaughter or else he is assisted to his wish of me by some one of exceeding puissance and a mighty sultan or hath he heard that I am one of the baggages of the city, who lie a night or two with whosoever seeketh them, that he writeth me in modest verses to debauch my reason by talking of such matters? Rejoined the old woman, By Allah, O oh my lady, thou sayest sooth. But reck not thou of yonder ignorant hound, for thou art seated in thy lofty, firm-builded and unapproachable palace, to which the very birds cannot soar, neither the wind pass over it, and as for him, he is clean distraught. Wherefore do thou write him a letter, and chide him angrily, and spare him no manner of reproof, but threaten him with dreadful threats, and menace him with death, and say to him, Whence hast thou knowledge of me? that thou dost write me, O dog of a merchant, O thou who trudges far and wide all thy days in wilds and wolds for the sake of gaining a dirham or a dinar. By Allah, except thou awake from thy sleep and put off thine intoxication, I will assuredly crucify thee on the gate of the market street wherein is thy shop. Quoth the princess, I fear lest he presume, if I write to him, and quoth the nurse, And pray, what is he, and what is his rank, that he should presume to us? Indeed, we write him, but to the intent that his presumption may be cut off, and his fear magnified. And she ceased not craftily to persuade her, till she called for ink case and paper, and wrote him these couplets. O thou who claimest to be prey of love and ecstasy, thou who for passion spendest nights in grief and saddest gree. Say, dost thou, haughty one, desire enjoyment of the moon? 
Did man e'er sue the moon for grace, whate'er his lunacy? I verily will counsel thee with read the best to hear. Cut short this course, ere come thou nigh sore risk, nay death to dree. If thou to this request return, surely on thee shall fall sore punishment for vile offence a grievous penalty. Be reasonable then, be wise, hark back unto thy wits. Behold, in very truth I speak with best advice to thee. By him who did all things that be create from nothingness, who dressed the face of heaven with stars in brightest radiancy, if in the like of this thy speech thou dare to sin again, I'll surely have thee crucified upon a trunk of tree. Then she rolled up the letter and gave it to the old woman, who took it, and repairing to Adashir's shop, delivered it to him. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the seven hundred and twenty-third night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the old woman took that letter from Hayat al-Nufus, she fared forth till she found the youth who was sitting in his shop, and gave it to him, saying, Read thine answer, and know that when she perused thy paper, she was wroth with exceeding wrath, but I soothed her, and spake her fair, till she consented to write thee a reply. He took the letter joyfully, but when he had read it, and understood its drift, he wept sore, whereat the old woman's heart ached, and she cried, O oh, my son, Allah never caused thine eyes to weep, nor thy heart to mourn. What can be more gracious than that she should answer thy letter when thou hast done what thou didst? He replied, O oh, my mother, what shall I do for a subtle device? Behold, she writeth to me, threatening me with death and crucifixion, and forbidding me from writing to her. And I, by Allah, see my death to be better in my life. But I beg thee of thy grace to carry her another letter from me. She said, Write, and I warrant I'll bring thee an answer. By Allah, I will assuredly venture my life to win for thee thy wish, though I die to pleasure thee. He thanked her, and kissing her hands, wrote these verses. Do you threaten me with death for my loving you so well? When death to me will rest, and all dying is by fate. And man's death is but a boon, when so longsome to him grows his life, and rejected he lives in lone estate. Then visit ye a lover, who hath ne'er a soul to aid, for on pious works of men heaven's blessing shall await. But an ye be resolved on this deed, then up and on, I am in bonds to you, a bondsman confined within your gate. What path have I, whose patience without you is no more? How is this when a lover's heart in stress of love is straight? O oh, my lady, show me Ruth, who by passion am misused, for all who love the noble stand for evermore excused. He then folded the scroll and gave it to the old woman, together with two purses of two hundred dinars, which she would have refused, but he conjured her by oath to accept of them. So she took them both and said, Needs must they bring thee to thy desire despite the noses of thy foes. Then she repaired to the palace, and gave the letter to Hayat al-Nufus, who said, What is this, O my nurse? Here are we in a correspondence, and thou coming and going. Indeed, I fear lest the matter get wind, and we be disgraced. Rejoined the old woman, How so, O my lady? Who dares speak such word? So she took the letter, and after reading and understanding it, she smote hand on hand, saying, Verily, this is a calamity which is falling upon us, and I know not whence this young man came to us. Quoth the old woman, 
O oh, my lady, Allah upon thee, write him another letter, but be rough with him this time, and say to him, and thou write me another word after this, I will have thy head struck off. Quoth the princess, O oh, my nurse, I am assured that the matter will not end on such wise. To better to break off this exchange of letters, and except the puppy take warning by my previous threats, I will strike off his head. The old woman said, Then write him a letter, and give him to know this condition. So Hayat al Nufus called for pen case and paper and wrote these couplets. Ho, oh, thou heedless of time, and he sore despite. Ho, oh, thou heart, whom hopes of my favours excite. Think, O oh, pride fall, wouldst win for thyself the skies? Wouldst attain to the moon shining clear and bright? I will burn thee with fire that shall ne'er be quenched, or will slay thee with scimitar sharp as bite. Leave it, friend, and scape the tormenting pains, such as turn hair partings from black to white. Take my warning, and fly from the road of love. Draw thee back from a course nor seemly nor right. Then she folded the scroll and gave it to the old woman, who was puzzled and perplexed by the matter. She carried it to Adashir, and the prince read the letter and bowed his head to the youth, making as if he wrote with his finger and speaking not a word. Quoth the old woman, How is it I see thee silent stay and not say thy say? And quoth he, O my mother, what shall I say? seeing that she doth but threaten me, and redoubleth in hard-heartedness and aversion. Rejoined the nurse, Write her a letter of what thou wilt. I will protect thee, nor let thy heart be cast down, for needs must I bring you twain together. He thanked her for her kindness, and kissing her hand, wrote these couplets. A heart, by Allah, never soft to love a white, who sighs for union only with his friends, his pride, who with tear ulcered eyelids evermore must bide, when falleth upon earth first darkness of the night. Be just, be generous, lend thy ruth, and deign give alms, to love molested lover, parted, forced to flight. He spends the length of longsome night without a doze, Firebrand and drent in tear flood flowing infinite. Ah, cut not off the longing of my fondest heart, now disappointed, wasted, fluttering for its blight. Then he folded the scroll and gave it to the old woman, together with three hundred dinars, saying, This is for the washing of thy hands. She thanked him and kissed his hands after which she returned to the palace and gave the letter to the princess, who took it and read it, and throwing it from her fingers sprang to her feet. Then she walked, shod as she was with patterns of gold, set with pearls and jewels, till she came to her sire's palace, whilst the vein of anger started out between her eyes, and none dared ask her of her case. When she reached the palace, she inquired for the king, and the slave girls and concubines replied to her, O oh, my lady, he is gone forth a hunting and sporting. So she returned as she were a rending lioness, and bespake none for the space of three hours, when her brow cleared and her wrath called. As soon as the old woman saw that her irk and anger were past, she went up to her, and kissing ground between her hands, asked her, O oh, my lady, whither went those noble steps? The princess answered, To the palace of the king, my sire. And could no one do thine errand? inquired the nurse. Replied the princess, No, for I went to acquaint him of that which hath befallen me with yonder coup of a merchant, 
so he might lay hands on him and on all the merchants of his bazaar and crucify them over the shops, nor suffer a single foreign merchant to tarry in our town. Quoth the old woman, And was this thine only reason, O my lady, for going to thy sire? And quoth Hayat al Nufus, Yes, but I found him absent, a hunting and sporting, and now I await his return cried the old nurse. I take refuge with Allah, the all-hearing, the all-knowing. Praised be he. O oh, my lady, thou art the most sensible of women. And how couldst thou think of telling the king these fond words, which it behoveth none to publish? asked the princess. And why so? And the nurse answered, Suppose thou hadst found the king in his palace, and told him all this tale, and he had sent after the merchants, and commanded to hang them over the shops. The folk would have seen them hanging, and asked the reason, and it would have been answered them, they sought to seduce the king's daughter. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 29 Recording by Ali Chinji, Riska, South Wales United Kingdom. Section 30 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7 by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 30. When it was the 724th night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the old woman said to the princess, Suppose thou had told this to the king, and he had ordered the merchants to be hanged. Would not folk have seen them, and have asked the cause of the execution, when the answer would have been, they sought to seduce the king's daughter? Then they would have dispread diverse reports concerning thee, some saying, She abode with them ten days, away from her palace, till they had taken their fill of her, and other, some in other guise, for woman's honour, O oh my lady, is like ordered milk, the least dust fouleth it, and like glass, which, if it be cracked, may not be mended. So beware of telling thy sire, or any other of this matter, lest thy fair name be smirched, O oh mistress mine. For twill never profit thee to tell folk aught, no, never. Weigh what I say with thy keen wit. And if thou find it not just, do what so thou will. The princess pondered her words, and seeing them to be altogether profitable and right, said, Thou speakest sooth, O my nurse. But anger had blinded my judgment. Quoth the old woman, Thy resolve to tell no one is pleasing to the Almighty. But something remaineth to be done. We must not let the shamelessness of yonder vile dog of a merchant pass without notice. Write him a letter, and say to him, O oh, vilest of traders! But that I found the king my father absent, I had straightway commanded to hang thee and all thy neighbours. But thou shalt gain nothing by this, for I swear to thee, by Allah the Most High, that an thou return to the like of this talk, I will blot out the trace of thee from the face of the earth. And deal thou roughly with him in words, so shalt thou discourage him in this attempt, and arouse him from his heedlessness. And will these words cause him to abstain from his offending? asked the princess. And the old woman answered, How should he not abstain? Besides, I will talk with him, and tell him what hath passed. So the princess called for ink case and paper and wrote these couplets. To win our favours, 
still thy hopes are bent, and still to win thy will art confident. Nought save his prideful aim shall slay a man, and he by us shall die of his intent. Thou art no lord of might, no chief of men, Nabob or prince or soldan heaven sent. Had were this deed of one who is our peer, he had returned with hair for fear white sprent. Yet will I deign once more to excuse thy sin, so from this time thou prove thee penitent. Then she gave the missive to the old woman, saying, O my nurse, do thou admonish this puppy, lest I be forced to cut off his head and sin on his account. Replied the old woman, By Allah, O my lady, I will not leave him aside to turn on. Then she returned to the youth, and when salams had been exchanged, she gave him the letter. He read it, and shook his head, saying, Verily we are Allah's, and unto him shall we return, adding, O my mother, what shall I do? My fortitude faileth me, and my patience palleth upon me. She replied, O my son, be long-suffering, peradventure after this Allah shall bring somewhat to pass. Write that which is in thy mind, and I will fetch thee an answer. And be of good cheer, and keep thine eyes cool and clear, for needs must I bring about union between thee and her, Inshallah. He blessed her, and wrote to the princess a note containing these couplets. Since none will lend my love a helping hand, and I by passion's bale in death low lane, I bear a flaming fire within my heart, by day and night, nor place of rest attain. How cease to hope in thee, my wishes term, or with my loggings to be glad and fain? The Lord of highest heaven to grant my prayer, pray I, whom love of lady fair hath slain. And as I'm clean or thrown by love and fear, to grant me speedy union deign, O deign. Then he folded the scroll, and gave it to the old woman, bringing at the same time a purse of four hundred dinars. She took the whole, and returning to the palace, sought the princess, to whom she gave the letter. But the king's daughter refused to take it, and cried, What is this? replied the old woman, O oh, my lady, this is only the answer to the letter that thou sentest to that merchant dog. Quoth Hayat al Nufus, Didst thou forbid him as I told thee? And quoth she, Yes, and this is his reply. So the princess took the letter and read it to the end. Then she turned to the old woman and exclaimed, Where is the result of thy promise? O oh, my lady, saith he not in his letter that he repenteth and will not again offend, excusing himself for the past? Not so, by Allah, on the contrary, he increaseth. O oh, my lady, write him a letter, and thou shalt presently see what I will do with him. There needeth nor letter nor answer. I must have a letter that I may rebuke him roughly and cut off his hopes. Thou canst do that without a letter. I cannot do it without the letter. So Hyatal Nufus called for pen case and paper and wrote these verses. Long have I chid thee, but my chiding hindereth thee not. How often would my verse with writ, O hand, ensnare thee, ah! Then keep thy passion hidden deep and ever unrevealed, and if thou dare gainsay me, earth shall no more bear thee, ah! And if despite my warning thou dost to such words return, Death's messenger shall go his rounds, and dead declare thee, ah! Soon shall the world's fierce chilling blast o'er blow that course of thine, and birds of the wild with ravening bills and beaks shall tear thee, ah! Return to righteous course, perchance that same will profit thee, if bent on wilful aims and lewd I fain forswear thee, ah! 
When she had made an end of her writing this, she cast the writ from her hand in wrath, and the old woman picked it up and went with it to Adashia. When he read it to the last, he knew that she had not softened to him, but only redoubled in rage against him, and that he would never win to meet her. So he bethought himself to write her an answer, invoking Allah's help against her. Thereupon he indicted these couplets. O Lord, by the five shakes, I pray deliver me from love, which gars me bear such grief and misery. Thou knowest what I bear for passion's fiery flame, what stress of sickness for that merciless maid I dree. She hath no pity on the pangs to me decreed, how long and weakly white shall last her tyranny. I am distraught for her with passing agonies, and find no friend, O folk, to hear my plaint and plea. How long, when night hath drooped her pinions o'er the world, shall I lament in public as in privacy? For love of you I cannot find forgetfulness. And how forget when patience taketh wings to flee? O thou wild parting bird, say she is safe and sure from shift and change of time and the world's cruelty. Then he folded the scroll and gave it to the old woman, adding a purse of five hundred dinars. And she took it and carried it to the princess, who read it to the end and learnt its purport. Then casting it from her hand, she cried, Tell me, O wicked old woman, the cause of all that hath befallen me, from thee and from thy cunning and thine advocacy of him, so that thou hast made me write letter after letter, and thou ceasest not to carry messages going and coming between us twain, till thou hast brought about a correspondence and a connection. Thou leavest not to say, I will ensure thee against his mischief and cut off from thee his speech, but thou speakest not thus save only to the true intent that I may continue to write thee letters, and thou to fetch and carry between us, evening and morning, till thou ruin my repute. Woe to thee! Ho, eunuchs, seize her! Then Hayat al-Nufus commanded them to beat her, and they lashed her till her whole body flowed with blood, and she fainted away whereupon the king's daughter caused her slave-women to drag her forth by the feet, and cast her without the palace, and bade one of them stand by her head till she recovered, and say to her, The princess hath sworn an oath that thou shalt never return to, and re-enter the palace. The princess hath sworn an oath that thou shalt never return to, and re-enter this palace and she hath commanded to slay thee without mercy, and thou dare return hither. So when she came to herself, the damsel told her what the king's daughter said, and she answered, Hearkening and obedience. Presently the slave girls fetched a basket and a porter, whom they caused to carry her to her own house, and they sent after her a physician, bidding him tend her assiduously, till she recovered. He did what he was told to do, and as soon as she was whole, she mounted and rode to the shop of Ardashia, who was concerned with sore concern for her absence, and was longing for news of her. As soon as he saw her, he sprang up, and coming to meet her, saluted her. Then he noticed that she was weak and ailing. So he questioned her of her case and she told him of all that had befallen her from her nursling. When he heard this, he found it grievous, and smote hand upon hand, saying, By Allah, O my mother, that this hath betided thee, straighteneth my heart. But what, O my mother, is the reason of the princess's hatred to men? Replied the old woman, Thou must know, O my son, that she hath a beautiful garden, than which there is naught goodlier on earth's face, and it chanced that she lay there one night. In the joyance of sleep she dreamt a dream, and t'was this, that she went down into the garden, where she saw a fowler set up his net, 
and strew corn thereabout. After which he withdrew, and sat down afar off, to await what game should fall into it. Ere an hour had passed, the birds flocked to pick up the corn, and a male pigeon fell into the net and struggled in it, whereat all the others took fright and fled from him. His mate was amongst them, but she returned to him after the shortest delay, and coming up to the net, sought out the mesh wherein his foot was entangled, and ceased not to peck at it with her bill, till she severed it, and released her husband, with whom she flew away. All this while the fowler sat dozing, and when he awoke he looked at the net and found it spoilt. So he mended it, and strewed fresh grain, then withdrew to a distance, and sat down to watch it again. The birds soon returned and began to pick up the corn, and among the rest the pair of pigeons. Presently the she-pigeon fell into the net, and struggled to get free, whereupon all the other birds flew away, and her mate, whom she had saved, fled with the rest, and did not return to her. Meantime, sleep had again overcome the fowler, and when he awoke after long slumbering, he saw the she-pigeon caught in the net. So he went up to her, and freeing her feet from the meshes, cut her throat. The princess, startled by the dream, awoke troubled, and said, Thus do men with women, for women have pity on men, and throw away their lives for them, when they are in difficulties. But if the Lord decree against a woman, and she fall into calamity, her male deserteth her, and rescueth her not, and wasted is that which she did with him of kindness. Allah curse her, who putteth her trust in men, for they ill requite the fair offices which women do them. And from that day she conceived an hatred to men. Said the king's son, O oh, my mother, doth she never go out into the highways? And the old woman replied, Nay, O oh, my son, but I will tell thee somewhat wherein, Allah willing, there shall be profit for thee. She hath a garden which is of the goodliest pleasances of the age, and every year, at the time of the opening of the fruits, she goeth thither, and taketh her pleasure therein only one day, nor layeth night but in her pavilion. She entereth the garden by the private wicket of the palace, which leadeth thereto. And thou must know that it wanteth now but a month to the time of her going forth. So take my advice, and hie thee this very day to the keeper of that garden, and make acquaintance with him, and gain his good graces. For he admitteth not one of Allah's creatures into the garth, because of its communication with the princess's palace. I will let thee know two days beforehand of the day fixed for her coming forth, when do thou repair to the garden, as of thy word, and make shift to night there. When the king's daughter cometh, be thou hidden in some place or other. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the seven hundred and twenty-fifth night, she pursued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the old woman charged the king's son, saying, I will let thee know two days beforehand of the king's daughter going down to the garden. Do thou hide thee in some place or other, and, when thou espiest her, come forth and show thyself to her. When she seeth thee, she will fall in love with thee, for thou art fair to look upon, and love covereth all things. So keep thine eyes cool and clear. And be of good cheer, O my son, for needs must I bring about union between thee and her. The young prince kissed her hand, and thanked her, and gave her three pieces of Alexandrian silk, and three of satin of various colours. And with each piece, 
linen for shifts and stuff for trousers, and a kerchief for the turban, and fine white cotton cloth of barback for the linings, so as to make her six complete suits, each handsomer than its sister. Moreover, he gave her a purse containing six hundred gold pieces, and said to her, This is for the tailoring. She took the whole and said to him, O oh, my son, art thou not pleased to acquaint me with thine abiding place? And I also will show thee the way to my lodging. Yes, answered he, and sent a marbleuk with her to note her home and show her his own house. Then he rose, and bidding his slaves shut the shop, went back to the wazir, to whom he related all that had passed between him and the old woman, from first to last. Quoth the minister, O oh my son, should the princess Hyatalnufus come out and look upon thee, and thou find no favour with her, what wilt thou do? Quoth Ardashir, There will be nothing left but to pass from words to deeds and risk my life with her. For I will snatch her up from amongst her attendants, and set her behind me on a swift horse, and make for the wildest of the world. If I escape, I shall have won my wish, and if I perish, I shall be at rest from this hateful life. Rejoined the minister, O oh my son, dost thou think to do this thing and live? How shall we make our escape, seeing that our country is far distant? And how wilt thou deal thus with a king of the kings of the age, who hath under his hand an hundred thousand horse? Nor can we be sure, but that he will dispatch some of his troops to cut off our way. Verily there is no good in this project which no wise man would attempt. Asked Adashia, And how then shall we do, O wazir of good counsel? For unless I win her, I am a dead man without a chance. The minister answered, Wait till tomorrow, when we will visit this garden, and note its condition, and see what betideth us with the caretaker. So when the morning morrowed, they took a thousand dinars in a poke, and repairing to the garden, found it compassed about with high walls, and strong, rich in trees, and rillful knees and goodly fruiteries. And indeed its flowers breathed perfume, and its birds warbled amid the bloom, as if it were a garden of the gardens of paradise. Within the door sat a sheikh, an old man on a stone bench, and they saluted him. When he saw them, and noted the fairness of their favour, he rose to his feet after returning their salute, and said, O oh my lords, perchance thee have a wish, which we may have the honour of satisfying? Replied the wazir, Know, O elder, that we are strangers, and the heat hath overcome us. Our lodging is afar off at the other end of the city. So we desire of thy courtesy that thou take these two dinars and buy us somewhat of provant, and open us meanwhile the door of this flower garden, and seat us in some shaded place, where there is cold water, that we may cool ourselves there, against thy return with the provision when we will eat, and thou with us, and then, rested and refreshed, we shall wend our ways. So saying, he pulled out of his pouch a couple of dinars, and put them into the keeper's hand. Now this caretaker was a man aged three score and ten, who had never in all his life possessed so much money. So when he saw the two dinars in his hand, he was like to fly for joy, and rising forthwith, opened the garden gate to the prince and the wazir, and made them enter and sit down under a wide-spreading, fruit-laden, shade-affording tree, saying, Sit ye here, and go no further into the garden. For it hath a privy door communicating with the palace of the princess Hyatal Nufus. They replied, We will not stir hence. Whereupon he went out to buy what they had ordered, and returned after a while, with a porter bearing on his head a roasted lamb and bread. They ate and drank together, and talked a while till presently 
the wazir, looking about him in all corners right and left, caught sight of a lofty pavilion at the farther end of the garden. But it was old, and the plaster was peeled from its walls, and its buttresses were broken down. So he said to the garden, O Sheikh, is this garden thine own, or dost thou hire it? And he replied, I am neither owner nor tenant of the garden, only its caretaker. Asked the minister, And what is thy wage? Whereupon the old man answered, A dinar a month. And quoth the wazir, Verily they wrong thee, especially an thou have a family. Quoth the elder, By Allah, O my lord, I have eight children, and I... The wazir broke in. There is no majesty, and there is no might save in Allah, the glorious, the great. Thou makest me bear thy grief, my poor fellow. What wouldst thou say of him, who should do thee a good turn on account of this family of thine? Replied the old man, O my lord, whatsoever good thou dost shall be garnered up for thee with God the Most High. Thereupon said the wazir, O Sheikh, thou knowest this garden of thine to be a goodly place, but the pavilion yonder is old and ruinous. Now I mean to repair it, and stucco it anew, and paint it handsomely, so that it will be the finest thing in the garth. And when the owner comes and finds the pavilion restored and beautified, he will not fail to question thee concerning it. Then thou dost say, O oh my lord, at great expense I set it in repair, for that I saw it in ruins, and none could make use of it, nor could any one sit therein. If he says, Whence hadst thou money for this? Reply, I spent of my own money upon the stucco, thereby thinking to whiten my face with thee, and hoping for thy bounties. And needs must he recompense thee fairly, over the extent of thine expenses. Tomorrow I will bring builders and plasterers and painters to repair this pavilion, and will give thee what I promised thee. Then he pulled out of his poke a purse of five hundred dinars, and gave it to the gardener, saying, Take these gold pieces, and expend them upon thy family, and let them pray for me and my son. Thereupon the prince asked the wazir, What is the meaning of this? And he answered, Thou shalt presently see the issue thereof. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the seven hundred and twenty-sixth night, she resumed, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the wazir gave five hundred ducats to the old gardener, saying, Take these gold pieces, and expend them upon thy family, and let them pray for this my son. The old man looked at the gold, and his wits fled, so he fell down at the wazir's feet, kissing them and invoking blessings on him and his son. And when they went away, he said to them, I shall expect you tomorrow, for by Allah Almighty there must be no parting between us, night or day. Next morning the wazir went to the prince's shop and sent for the syndic of the builders. Then he carried him and his men to the garth, where the gardener rejoiced in their sight. He gave them the price of rations, and what was needful to the work, men for the restoration of the pavilion, and they repaired it, and stuccoed it, and decorated it. Then said the minister to the painters, Hark ye, my masters, listen to my words, and apprehend my wish and my aim. Know that I have a garden like this, where I was sleeping one night among the nights, and saw in a dream a fowler set up nets and sprinkle corn thereabout. The birds flocked to pick up the grain, and a cock-bird fell into the net, whereupon the others took fright and flew away, and among the rest his mate. But after a while she returned alone and picked at the mesh that held his feet, till she set him free and they flew away together. 
neither Fowler had fallen asleep, and when he awoke, he found the net empty. So he mended it, and strewing fresh grains sat down afar off, waiting for game to fall into that snare. Presently the birds assembled again to pick up the grains, and among the rest the two pigeons. By and by the hen bird fell into the net, when all the other birds took fright at her, and flew away, and her husband flew with them, and did not return. Whereupon the fowler came up, and taking the quarry, cut her throat. Now when her mate flew away with the others, a bird of raven seized him, and slew him, and ate his flesh, and drank his blood. And I would have you portray me the presentment of this my dream, even as I have related it to you, in the liveliest colours, laying the fair scene in this rare garden, with its walls, and trees, and rills, and dwell especially on the fowler and the falcon. If ye do this, I have set forth to you, and the work please me, I will give thee what shall gladden your hearts over and above your wage. The painters, hearing these words, applied themselves with all diligence to do what he required of them, and wrought it out in masterly style. And when they had made an end of the work, they showed it to the wazir, who, seeing his so-called dream set forth as it was, was pleased, and thanked them and rewarded them munificently. Presently the prince came in, according to his custom, and entered the pavilion, unweeting what the wazir had done. So when he saw the portraiture of the fowler and the birds, and the net, and beheld the male pigeon in the clutches of the hawk which had slain him, and was drinking his blood and eating his flesh, his understanding was confounded, and he returned to the minister and said, O wazir of good counsel, I have seen this day a marvel which, were it graven with needle gravers on the eye-corners, would be a warner to whoso will be warned. Asked the minister, And what is that, O my lord? And the prince answered, Did I not tell thee of the dream the princess had, and how it was the cause of her hatred for men? Yes, replied the wazir. And Ardashir rejoined, By Allah, O minister, I have seen the whole dream portrayed in painting, as I had eyed it with mine own eyes. But I found therein a circumstance which was hidden from the princess, so that she saw it not, and tis upon this that I rely for the winning of my wish. Quoth the wazir, And what is that, O my son? And quoth the prince, I saw that when the male bird flew away, and, leaving his mate entangled in the net, failed to return and save her, a falcon pounced on him, and slaying him, ate his flesh, and drank his blood. Would to heaven the princess had seen the whole of the dream, and beheld the cause of his failure to return and rescue her. Replied the wazir, By Allah, O auspicious king, this is indeed a rare thing and a wonderful. And the king's son ceased not to marvel at the picture, and lament that the king's daughter had not beheld the dream to its end, saying to himself, Would she had seen it to the last, or might see the whole over again, though but in the imbroglio of sleep. Then quoth the wazir to him, Thou saidst to me, Why wilt thou repair the pavilion? And I replied, Thou shalt presently see the issue thereof. And behold, now its issue thou seest. For it was I did this deed, and bade the painters portray the princess's dream thus, and paint the male bird in the pounces of the falcon, which eateth his flesh and drinketh his blood, so that when she cometh to the pavilion, she will behold her dream depicted, and see how the cock-pigeon was slain, and excuse him, and turn from her hate for men. When the prince heard the wazir's words, he kissed his hands and thanked him, saying, Verily, the like of thee is fit to be minister to the most mighty king, and, by Allah, and I win my wish and return to my sire rejoicing, I will assuredly acquaint him with this, that he may redouble in honouring thee, and advance thee in dignity, 
and hearken to thine every word. So the wazir kissed his hand, and they both went to the old gardener, and said, Look at yonder pavilion, and see how fine it is. And he replied, This is all of your happy thought. Then said they, O elder, when the owners of the palace questioned thee concerning the restoration of the pavilion, say thou, "'Twas I did it of my own monies, to the intent that there may betide thee fair favour and good fortune. He said, I hear and I obey. And the prince continued to pay him frequent visits. Such was the case with the prince and the wazir, but as regards her to Nufus, when she ceased to receive the prince's letters and messages, and when the old woman was absent from her, she rejoiced with joy exceeding, and concluded that the young man had returned to his own country. One day there came to her a covered tray from her father. So she uncovered it, and finding therein fine fruits, asked her waiting women, Is the season of these fruits come? Answered they, Yes. Thereupon she cried, would we might make ready to take our pleasure in the flower garden. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section thirty. Section thirty one. Of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7 by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 31 When it was the seven hundred and twenty-seventh night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the princess, after receiving the fruit from her sire, asked, Is the season of these fruits set in? And they answered, Yes. Thereupon she cried, Would we might make ready to take our pleasure in the flower garden? O my lady, they replied, thou sayest well, and by Allah, we also long for the garden. So she inquired, How shall we do, seeing that every year it is none save my nurse who taketh us to walk in the garden, and who pointeth out to us the various trees and plants, and I have beaten her and forbidden her from me? Indeed, I repent me of what was done by me to her. For that, in any case, she is my nurse, and hath over me the right of fosterage. But here there is no majesty, and there is no might save in Anna, the glorious, the great. When her handmaids heard this, they all sprang up, and kissing the ground between her hands, exclaimed, Allah upon thee, O my lady, do thou pardon her, and bid her to the presence. And quoth she, by Allah, I am resolved upon this. But which of you will go to her? For I have prepared her a splendid robe of honour. Hereupon two damsels came forward, by name Bulbul and Siwad Alain, who were comely and graceful, and the principals among the princess's women and her favourites. And they said, We will go to her, O king's daughter. And she said, Do what seemeth good to you. So they went to the house of the nurse, and knocked at the door, and entered. And she, recognising the twain, received them with open arms, and welcomed them. When they had sat a while with her, they said to her, O nurse, the princess pardoneth thee, and desireth to take thee back into favour. She replied, This may never be, though I drink the cup of ruin, Hast thou forgotten how she put me to shame before those who love me, and those who hate me, when my clothes were dyed with my blood, 
and I well nigh died for stress of beating. And after this they dragged me forth by the feet, like a dead dog, and cast me without the door? So by Allah I will never return to her, nor fill my eyes with her sight. Quoth the two girls, Disappoint not our pains in coming to thee, nor send us away unsuccessful. Where is thy courtesy us, wards? Think, but who is it that cometh in to visit thee? Canst thou wish for any higher of standing than we with the king's daughter? She replied, I take refuge with Allah. Well I wot that my station is less than yours. Were it not that the princess's favour exalted me above all her women, so that were I wroth with the greatest of them, she had died in her skin of fright. They rejoined, All is as it was, and naught is in any wise changed. Indeed, tis better than before, for the princess humbleth herself to thee, and seeketh a reconciliation without intermediary. Said the old woman, By Allah, were it not for your presence and intercession with me, I had never returned to her. No, not though she had commanded to slay me. They thanked her for this, and she rose, and dressing herself, accompanied them to the palace. Now when the king's daughter saw her, she sprang to her feet in honour, and the old woman said, Allah, Allah, O king's daughter, say me, whose was the fault, mine or thine? Hayat al Dufus replied, The fault was mine, and tis thine to pardon and forgive. By Allah, O my nurse, thy rank is high with me, and thou hast over me the right of fosterage. But thou knowest that Allah, extolled and exalted be he, hath allotted to his creatures four things, disposition, life, daily bread, and death. Nor is it in man's power to avert that which is decreed. Verily, I was beside myself, and could not recover my senses. But, O oh my nurse, I repent of what deed I did. With this, the crone's anger ceased from her, and she rose and kissed the ground before the princess, who called for a costly robe of honour, and threw it over her, whereat she rejoiced with exceeding joy in the presence of the princess's slaves and women. When all ended thus happily, Hayat al Nufus said to the old woman, O oh my nurse, how go the fruits and growths of our garth? And she replied, O oh my lady, I see excellent fruits in the town, but I will inquire of this matter, and return thee an answer this very day. Then she withdrew, honoured with all honour, and betook herself to Ardashir, who received her with open arms, and embraced her, and rejoiced in her coming, for that he had expected her long and longingly. She told him all that had passed between herself and the princess, and how her mistress was minded to go down to the garden on such a day. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the seven hundred and twenty-eighth night, she continued, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the old woman betook herself to the prince, and told him all that had passed between herself and the princess Hayat al Nufus, and how her mistress was minded to go down into the garden on such a day, and said to him, Hast thou done as I bade thee with the warder of the garden, and hast thou made him taste of thy bounties? He replied, Yes, and the oldster is become my good friend. My way is his way, and he would well I had need of him. Then he told her all that had happened, and of the dream paintings which the wazir had caused to be limbed in the pavilion, especially of the fowler, the net, and the falcon, whereat she joyed with great joy, and said, Allah upon thee, do thou set thy minister midmost thy heart, for this that he hath done pointeth to the keenness of his wit and he hath helped thee to the winning thy wish. So rise forthright, O my son, and go to the hammam bath, and don thy daintiest dress, wherein may be our success. Then fare thou to the gardener, and make shift to pass the night in the garden. 
for though he should give the earth full of gold, none may win to pass into it whilst the king's daughter is therein. When thou hast entered, hide thee where no eye may espy thee, and keep concealed till thou hear me cry, O thou whose boons are hidden, save us from that we fear. Then come forth from thine ambush, and walk among the trees, and show thy beauty and loveliness which put the moons to shame, to the intent that Princess Hyatal Nufus may see thee, and that her heart and soul may be filled with love of thee. So shalt thou attain to thy wish, and thy grief be gone. To hear is to obey, replied the young prince, and gave her a purse of a thousand dinars, which she took, and went away. Thereupon Ardashio fared straight for the bath and washed, after which he arrayed himself in the richest of robes of the apparel of the kings of the Hosros, and girt his middle with a girdle, wherein were conjoined all manner precious stones, and donned a turban inwoven with red gold, and purfled with pearls and gems. His cheeks shone rosy red, and his lips were scarlet, his eyelids like the gazelles wantoned, like a wine-struck white in his gait he swayed, beauty and loveliness garbed him, and his shape shamed the bowing of the bow. Then he put in his pocket a purse containing a thousand dinars, and repairing to the flower-garden, knocked at the door. The gardener opened to him, and rejoicing with great joy, salamed to him in most worshipful fashion. Then observing that his face was overcast, he asked him how he did. The king's son answered, Know, O elder, that I am dear to my father, and he never laid his hand on me till this day, when words arose between us, and he abused me, and smote me on the face, and struck me with his staff, and drave me away. Now I have no friend to turn to, and I fear the perfidy of fortune, for thou knowest that the wrath of parents is no light thing. Wherefore I come to thee, O uncle, seeing that to my father thou art known, and I desire of thy favour that thou suffer me abide in the garden till the end of the day, or pass the night there, till Allah grant good understanding between myself and my sire. When the old man heard these words, he was concerned anent what had occurred, and said, O my lord, dost thou give me leave to go to thy sire, and be the means of reconciliation between thee and him? Replied Ardashir, O uncle, thou must know that my father is of impatient nature and irascible, so an thou proffer him reconciliation in his heat of temper, he will make thee no answer. But when a day or two shall have passed, his heat will soften. Then go thou in to him, and thereupon he will relent. Hearkening and obedience, quoth the gardener, but, O oh my lord, do thou come with me to my house, where thou shalt night with my children and my family, and none shall reproach this to us. Quoth Ardashir, O oh, uncle, I must be alone when I am angry. The old man said, It irketh me that thou shouldst lie solitary in the garden, when I have a house. But Ardashir said, O oh, uncle, I have an aim in this, that the trouble of my mind may be dispelled from me, and I know that in this lies the means of regaining his favour and softening his heart to me. Rejoined the gardener, I will fetch thee a carpet to sleep on, and a coverlet wherewith to cover thee. And the prince said, There is no harm in that, O oh, uncle. So the keeper rose, and opened the garden to him, and brought him the carpet and coverlet, knowing not that the king's daughter was minded to visit the garth. On this wise it fared with the prince, but as regards the nurse, she returned to the princess, and told her that the fruits were kindly ripe on the garden trees, whereupon she said, O oh, my nurse, go down with me to-morrow into the garden, that we may walk about in it, and take our pleasure, inshallah and send meanwhile to the gardener, to let him know what we purpose. So she sent to the gardener to say, The princess will visit the parterre to-morrow, so leave neither water-carriers nor tree-tenders therein, nor let one of Allah's creatures enter the garth. 
when word came to him, he set his waterways and channels in order, and going to Ardashir said to him, O oh my lord, the king's daughter is mistress of this garden, and I have only to crave thy pardon, for the place is thy place, and I live only in thy favours, except that my tongue is under thy feet. I must tell thee that the princess Hayat al Nufus hath a mind to visit it to morrow at the first of the day, and hath bidden me to leave none therein who might look upon her. So I would have thee of thy favour go forth of the garden this day, for the queen will abide only in it till the time of mid afternoon prayer, and after it shall be at thy service for said nights and fortnights, months and years. Adashir asked, O elder, haply we have caused thee some mishap. And the other answered, By Allah, O my lord, naught hath betided me from thee but honour. Rejoined the prince, and it be so, nothing but all good shall befall thee through us, for I will hide in the garden, and none shall espy me till the king's daughter hath gone back to her palace. Said the gardener, O my lord, an she espy the shadow of a man in the garden, or any of Allah's male creatures, she will strike off my head. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the seven hundred and twenty-ninth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the gardener said to the prince, And the king's daughter espy the shadow of a man in her garden, she will strike off my head. The youth replied, Have no fear, I will on no wise let any see me. But doubtless to-day thou lackest of spending money for thy family. Then he put his hand to his purse, and pulled out five hundred ducats, which he gave to him, saying, Take this gold, and lay it out of thy family, that thy heart may be at ease concerning them. When the sheikh looked upon the gold, his life seemed a light thing to him, and he suffered the prince to tarry where he was, charging him straightly not to show himself in the garden. Then he left him loitering about. Meanwhile, when the eunuchs went into the princess at break of day, she bade open the private wicket leading from the palace to the parterres, and donned a royal robe, embroidered with pearls and jewels and gems, over a shift of fine silk, purfled with rubies. Under the whole was that which the tongue refuseth to explain, whereat was confounded the brain, and whose love would embrave the craven strain. On her head she set a crown of red gold, inlaid with pearls and gems. And she tripped in patterns of cloth of gold, embroidered with fresh pearls, and adorned with all manner precious stones. Then she put her hand upon the old woman's shoulder, and commanded to go forth by the privy door. But the nurse looked at the garden, and seeing it full of eunuchs and handmaids walking about, eating the fruits and troubling the streams, and taking their ease of sport and pleasure in the water, said to the princess, O oh, my lady, is this a garden or a madhouse? Quoth the princess, What meaneth thy speech, O nurse? And quoth the old woman, Verily, the garden is full of slave-girls and eunuchs, eating of the fruits, and troubling the streams, and scaring the birds, and hindering us from taking our ease, and sporting and laughing, and what not else. And thou hast no need of them. Wert thou going forth from thy palace into the highway, this would be fitting, as an honour and a ward to thee. But now, O oh my lady, thou goest forth of the wicket into the garden, where none of almighty Allah's creatures may look on thee. Rejoined the princess, by Allah, O nurse mine, thou sayest sooth, but how shall we do? And the old woman said, Bid the eunuchs send them all away, and keep only two of the slave girls, that we may make merry with them. So she dismissed them all, with the exception of two of her handmaids, who were most in favour with her. But when the old woman saw that her heart was light, and that the season was pleasant to her, she said to her, now we can enjoy ourselves aright, so up and let us take our pleasance in the garden. The princess put her hand upon her shoulder, and went out by the private door. 
the two waiting women walked in front, and she followed them, laughing at them, and swaying gracefully to and fro in her ample robes, while the nurse forewent her, showing her the trees, and feeding her with fruits. And so they fared on from place to place, till they came to the pavilion, which, when the king's daughter beheld and saw that it had been restored, she asked the old woman, O oh, my nurse, seest thou yonder pavilion? It hath been repaired, and its walls whitened. She answered, By Allah, O oh, my lady, I heard say that the keeper of the garden had taken stuffs of a company of merchants, and sold them and bought bricks with lime and plaster and stones, and so forth with the price. So I asked him what he had done with all this, and he said, I have repaired the pavilion which lay in ruins, presently adding, and when the merchants sought their due of me, I said to them, Wait till the princess visit the garden and see the repairs, and they satisfy her. Then I will take of her what she is pleased to bestow on me, and pay you what is due. Quoth I, What moved thee to do this thing? And quoth he, I saw the pavilion in ruins, the coins thrown down, and the stucco peeled from the walls, and none had the grace to repair it. So I borrowed the coin on my own account, and restored the place, and I trust in the king's daughter to deal with me as befitteth her dignity. And I said, The princess is all goodness and generosity, and will no doubt requite thee. And he did all this, but in hopes of thy bounty. Replied the princess, By Allah, he hath dealt nobly in rebuilding it, and hath done the deed of generous men. Call me my purse-keeperess. The old woman accordingly fetched the purse-keeperess, whom the princess bade gave the gardener two thousand dinars, whereupon the nurse said to him, bidding him to the presence of the king's daughter. But when the messenger said to him, Obey the queen's order, the gardener felt feeble, and trembling in every joint, said in himself, Doubtless the princess hath seen the young man, and this day will be the most unlucky of days for me. So he went home and told his wife and children what had happened, and gave them his last charges and farewell to them, while they wept for and with him. Then he presented himself before the princess, with a face the colour of turmeric, and ready to fall flat at full length. The old woman remarked his plight, and hastened to forestall him, saying, O Sheikh, kiss the earth in thanksgiving to Almighty Allah, and be constant in prayer to him for the princess. I told her what thou didst in the manner of repairing the ruined pavilion, and she rejoiceth in this, and bestoweth on thee two thousand dinars in requital of thy pains. So take them from the purse-keeperess, and kiss the earth before the king's daughter, and bless her, and wend thy way. Hearing these words, he took the gold, and kissed the ground before Hayat al-Nufus, calling down blessings on her. Then he returned to his house, and his family rejoiced in him, and blessed him who had been the prime cause of this business. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 31《三国演义》Section thirty two of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume seven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume seven, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 32 When it was the seven hundred and thirtieth night, she pursued, It has reached me, O auspicious king, that when the caretaker took the two thousand ducats from the princess, and returned to the house, all his family rejoiced in him, and blessed him who had been the prime cause of this business. Thus it fared with these, but as regards the old woman, she said to the princess, O oh, my lady, this is indeed become a fine place. Never saw I a purer white than its plastering, 
nor properer than its painting. I wonder if he have also repaired it within. Else hath he made the outside white and left the inside black. Come, let us enter and inspect. So they went in, the nurse preceding, and found the interior painted and gilded in the goodliest way. The princess looked right and left till she came to the upper end of the estrade, when she fixed her eyes upon the wall and gazed long and earnestly thereat, whereupon the old woman knew that her glance had lighted upon the presentment of her dream and took the two waiting women away with her that they might not divert her mind. When the king's daughter had made an end of examining the painting, she turned to the old woman, wondering and beating hand on hand, and said to her, O oh, my nurse, come! See a wondrous thing, which were it graven with needle gravers on the eye corners, would be a warner to whoso will be warned. She replied, And what is that, O oh my lady? When the princess rejoined, Go, look at the upper end of the estrade, and tell me what thou seest there. So she went up, and considered the dream drawing, and then she came down wondering, and said, By Allah, O oh my lady! Here is depicted the garden, and the fowler, and his net, and the birds, and all thou sawest in thy dream, and verily nothing but urgent need withheld the male pigeon from returning to free his mate after he had fled her, for I see him in the talons of a bird of raven which hath slaughtered him, and is drinking his blood, and rending his flesh, and eating it, and this, O oh my lady, caused his tarrying to return and rescue her from the net. But, O oh my mistress, the wonder is how thy dream came to be thus depicted. For, wert thou minded to set it forth in painture, thou hadst not availed to portray it. By Allah, this is a marvel which should be recorded in histories. Surely, O oh my lady, the angels appointed to attend upon the sons of Adam knew that the cock-pigeon was wronged of us, because we blamed him for deserting his mate. So they embraced his cause, and made manifest his excuse. And now, for the first time, we see him in the hawk's pounces a dead bird. Quoth the princess, O oh my nurse, verily fate and fortune had cause against this bird, and we did him wrong. Quoth the nurse, O oh my mistress, foes shall meet before Allah the Most High. But, O oh my lady, verily, the truth hath been made manifest, and the male pigeon's excuse certified to us. For had the hawk not seized him and drunk his blood and rent his flesh, he had not held aloof from his mate, but had returned to her, and set her free from the net. But against death there is no recourse, nor, O oh my lady, is there aught in the world more tenderly solicitous than the male for the female, among all creatures which Almighty Allah hath created. And especially tis thus with man, for he starveth himself to feed his wife, strippeth himself to clothe her, angereth his family to please her, and disobeyeth and denieth his parents to endow her. She knoweth his secrets, and concealeth them, and she cannot endure from him a single hour. And he be absent from her one night, her eyes sleep not, nor is there a dearer to her than he. She loveth him more than her parents, and they lie down to sleep in each other's arms, with his hand under her neck, and her hand under his neck. Even as saith the poet, I make my wrist her pillow, and I lay with her in litter, and I said to night be long, while the full moon showed glitter. Ah me, it was a night, Allah never made its like, whose first was sweetest sweet, and whose last bitterest bitter. Then he kisseth her, and she kisseth him, and I have heard of a certain king that, when his wife fell sick and died, he buried himself alive with her, submitting himself to death for the love of her, and the straight companionship which was between them. Moreover, a certain king sickened and died, and when they were about to bury him, his wife said to her people, Let me bury myself alive with him, else will I slay myself, and my blood shall be on your hands. So when they saw that she would not be turned from this thing, they left her, and she cast herself into the grave with her dead husband, of the greatness of her love and tenderness for him. And the old woman ceased not to ply the princess with anecdotes of conjugal love between men and women, till there ceased that which was in her heart of hatred for the sex masculine. And when she felt that she had succeeded in renewing in her the natural inclination of woman to man, she said to her, "'Tis time to go and walk in the garden." So they fared forth from the pavilion and paced among the trees. Presently, 
the prince chanced to turn, and his eyes fell on Hayat al Nufus. And when he saw the symmetry of her shape, and the rosy clearness of her cheeks, and the blackness of her eyes, and her exceeding grace, and her passing loveliness, and her excelling beauty, and her prevailing elegance, and her abounding perfection, his reason was confounded, and he could not take his eyes off her. Passion annihilated his right judgment, and love overpassed all limits in him. His vitals were occupied with her service, and his heart was aflame with fire of rapine, so that he swooned away and fell to the ground. When he came to himself, she had passed from his sight, and was hidden from him among the trees. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the seven hundred and thirty-first night, she resumed, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Prince Ardashir, who lay hid in the garden, saw the princess and her nurse walking among the trees, he swooned away for very love-longing. When he came to himself, Hayat al-Nufus had passed from his sight, and was hidden from him among the trees. So he sighed from his heart-core, and improvised these couplets. Whenas mine eyes behold her loveliness, my heart is torn with love's own ecstasy. I wake o'er throne, cast down on face of earth, nor can the princess my soul torment see. She turned, and ravished this sad love-thralled sprite. Mercy, by Allah, Ruth, nay, sympathy. O Lord, afford me union, deign thou soothe my soul, ere grave niche house this course of me. I'll kiss her ten times ten times, and times ten, for lover's wasted cheek the kisses be. The woman ceased not to lead the princess a pleasuring about the garden, till they reached the place where the prince lay ambushed, when, behold, she said, O thou whose bounties are hidden, vouchsafe us assurance from that we fear. The king's son, hearing the signal, left his lurking place, and surprised by the summons, walked among the trees, swaying to and fro with a proud and graceful gait, and a shape that shamed the branches. His brow was crowned with pearly drops, and his cheeks, red as the afterglow, extolled be Allah the Almighty in that he hath created. When the king's daughter caught sight of him, she gazed a long while on him, and noticed his beauty and grace and loveliness, and his eyes that wantoned like the gazelles, and his shape that outvied the branches of the Marubalan, wherefore her wits were confounded, and her soul captivated, and her heart transfixed with the arrows of his glances. Then she said to the old woman, O oh, my nurse, whence came yonder handsome youth? And the nurse asked, where is he, O oh my lady? There he is, answered Hayat al Nufus, near hand among the trees. The old woman turned right and left, as if she knew not of his presence, and cried, And pray, who can have taught this youth the way into the garden? Quoth Hayat al Nufus, Who shall give us news of the young man? Glory be to him who created men. But say me, dost thou know him, O oh my nurse? Quoth the old woman, O oh my lady, he is the young merchant who wrote to thee by me. The princess, and indeed she was drowned in the sea of her desire, and the fire of her passion and love-longing, broke out, O oh my nurse, how goodly is this youth! Indeed he is fair of favour. Methinks there is not on the face of the earth a goodlier than he. Now when the old woman was assured that the love of him had gotten possession of the princess, she said to her, Did I not tell thee, O oh my lady? that he was a comely youth with a burning favour? Replied Hayat al-Nufus, O my nurse, king's daughters know not the ways of the world, nor the manners of those that be therein. For they company with none, neither give nor take they. O my nurse, how shall I do to bring about a meeting and present myself to him? And what shall I say to him? And what will he say to me? Said the old woman, what device has left me? Indeed, we were confounded in this matter by thy behaviour. And the princess said, O oh my nurse, know thou that if any ever died of passion, I shall do so, 
and behold, I look for nothing but death on the spot by reason of the fire of my love-longing. When the old woman heard her words, and saw the transport of her desire for him, she answered, O my lady, now as for his coming to thee, there is no way therein, and indeed thou art excused from going to him because of thy tender age. But rise with me, and follow me. I will accost him, so shalt thou not be put to shame, and in the twinkling of an eye affection shall ensue between you. The king's daughter cried, Go thou before me, for the decree of Allah may not be rejected. Accordingly they went up to the place where Adashia sat, as he were the full moon at its fullest, and the old woman said to him, See, O youth, who is present before thee, tis the daughter of our king of the age, Hayat al-Nufus. Bethink thee of her rank, and appreciate the honour she doth thee in coming to thee, and rise out of respect to her, and stand before her. The prince sprang to his feet in an instant, and his eyes met her eyes, whereupon they both became as they were drunken without wine. Then the love of him and desire redoubled upon the princess, and she opened her arms, and he his, and they embraced. But love-longing and passion overcame them, and they swooned away and fell to the ground, and lay a long while without sense. The old woman, fearing scandalous exposure, carried them both into the pavilion, and sitting down at the doors, said to the two waiting women, Seize the occasion to take your pleasure in the garden, for the princess sleepeth. So they returned to their diversion. Presently the lovers revived from their swoon, and found themselves in the pavilion, whereat quoth the prince, Allah upon thee, O princess of fair ones, is this vision or sleep illusion? Then the twain embraced, and intoxicated themselves without wine, complaining to each other of the anguish of passion, and the prince improvised these couplets. Sun riseth sheen from her brilliant brow, and her cheek shows the rosiest afterglow. And when both appear to the looker on, the skyline star ne'er for shame will show. And the leaven flash from those smiling lips, morn breaks, and the rays dusk and gloom o'erthrow. And when, with her graceful shape, she sways, droops leafiest band tree for envy low. Me her sight suffices, naught crave I more, lord of men and morn, be her guard from foe. The full moon borrows a part of her charms. The sun would rival, but fails his low. Whence could Sol aspire to that bending grace? Whence should Luna see such wit and such mind gifts know? Who shall blame me for being all love to her? Twixt accord and discord, I doomed to woe. Tis she won my heart with those forms that bend. What shall lover's heart? from such charms defend, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the seven hundred and thirty-second night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the prince had made an end of his verses, the princess strained him to her bosom, and kissed him on the mouth and between the eyes, whereupon his soul returned to him, and he fell to complaining to her, that he had endured for stress of love, and tyranny of longing, and excess of transport and distraction, and all he had suffered for the hardness of her heart. Hearing these words, she kissed his hands and feet, and bared her head, whereupon the gloom gathered, and the full moons dawned therein. Then said she to him, O my beloved, and term of all my wishes, would the day of estrangement had never been, and Allah grant that it may never return between us. And they embraced and wept together, while she recited these couplets. O who shamest the moon and the sunny glow, thou whose slaughtering tyranny lays me low, with the sword of a look thou hast shorn my heart, how escape thy sword glance fatal of blow? Thus eke are thine eyebrows a bow that shot my bosom with shafts of fiercest low. From thy cheek's rich crop cometh paradise, how then shall my heart the rich crop forego? Thy graceful shape is a blooming branch, and shall pluck the fruit who shall bear that bough. Perforce thou drawest me, 
robst my sleep. In thy love I strip me, and shameless show. Allah lend thee the rays of most righteous light. Draw the farthest near, and a tryst bestow. Then have ruth on the vitals thy love hath seared, and the heart that flies to thy side the bow. And when she ended her recitation, passion overcame her, and she was distraught for love, and wept copious tears, rain-like streaming down. This burnt the prince's heart, and he in turn became troubled and distracted for love of her. So he drew nearer to her, and kissed her hands, and wept with sore weeping, and they ceased not from lover approaches, and converse and versifying, until the call to mid-afternoon prayer. Nor was there aught between them other than this. When they bethought them of parting, and she said to him, O light of mine eyes, and core of my heart, the time for severance has come between us, twain. When shall we meet again? By Allah, replied he, and indeed her words shot him as with shafts, to mention of parting I am never fain. Then she went forth of the pavilion, and he turned, and saw her, sighing sighs that would melt the rock, and weeping shower-like tears, whereupon he for love was sunken in the sea of desolation, and improvised these couplets. O oh, my heart's desire, grows my misery, from the stress of love, and what cure for me? By thy face like dawn when it lights the dark, and thy hair whose hue beareth night-tides blee, and thy form like the branch which in grace inclines, to Zephyr's breath blowing fain and free, by the glance of thine eyes like the fawn's soft gaze, when she fused pursuer of high degree, and thy waist down-borne by the weight of hips, these so heavy and that lacking gravity, by the wine of thy lip-dew, the sweetest of drink, fresh water and musk in its purity, O gazelle of the tribe, ease my soul of grief, and grant me thy phantom in sleep to see. Now when she heard his verses in praise of her, she turned back to him, and embracing him, with a heart on fire for the anguish of severance, fire which naught save kisses and embraces might quench, cried, Soothe the byword, saith, patience is for a lover, and not the lack thereof. There is no help for it, but I contrive a means for our reunion. Then she farewelled him, and fared forth, knowing not where she set her feet, for stress of her love. Nor did she stay her steps, till she found herself in her own chamber. When she was gone, passion and love-longing redoubled upon the young prince, and the delight of sleep was forbidden him, and the princess in her turn tasted not food, and her patience failed and she sickened for desire. As soon as dawned the day, she sent for the nurse who came, and found her condition changed, and she cried, Question me not of my case, for all I suffer is due to thy handiwork. Where is the beloved of my heart? O oh, my lady, when did he leave thee? Hath he been absent for thee more than this night? Can I endure absence from him an hour? Come, find some means to bring us together speedily, for my soul is like to flee my body. O oh, my lady, have patience, till I contrive thee some subtle device, whereof none shall beware. By the great God, Except thou bring him to me this very day, I will tell the king that thou hast corrupted me, and he will cut off thy head. I conjure thee by Allah, have patience with me, for this is a dangerous matter. And the nurse humbled herself to her, till she granted her three days' delay, saying, O oh, my nurse, the three days shall be three years to me, and if the fourth day pass and thou bring him not, I will go about to slay thee. So the old woman left her, and returned to her lodging, where she abode till the morning of the fourth day, when she summoned the tire-women of the town, and sought of them fine dyes and rouge for the painting of a virgin girl, and adorning, and they brought her cosmetics of the best. Then she sent for the prince, and opening her chest, brought out a bundle containing a suit of woman's apparel, worth five thousand dinars, and a head-kerchief fringed with all manner gems. Then she said to him, O oh, my son, hast thou a mind to foregather with Hayat al-Nufus? And he replied, Yes. 
so she took a pair of tweezers and pulled out the hairs of his face and penciled his eyes with coal then she stripped him and painted him with henna from his nails to his shoulders and from his insteps to his thighs and tattooed him about the body till he was like red roses upon alabaster slabs after a little she washed him and dried him and bringing out a shift and a pair of petticoat trousers made him put them on then she clad him in the royal suit aforesaid and binding the kerchief about his head veiled him and taught him how to walk saying advance thy left and draw back thy right he did her bidding and forewent her as he were a houri faring abroad from paradise then she said to him fortify thy heart for thou art going to the king's palace where there will without fail be guards and eunuchs at the gate and if thou be startled at them and show doubt or dread they will suspect thee and examine thee and we shall both get into grievous trouble and haply lose our lives wherefore an thou feel thyself unable to this tell me he answered in very sooth this thing hath no terrors for me so be of good cheer and keep thine eyes cool and clear then she went out preceding him till the twain came to the palace gate which was full of eunuchs she turned and looked at him as much as to say art thou troubled or no and finding him all unchanged went on the chief eunuch glanced at the nurse and knew her but seeing a damsel following her whose charms confoundeth the reason he said in his mind as for the old woman she is the nurse but as for the girl who is with her there is none in our land resembleth her in favour or approacheth her in fairness save the princess hayat al nufus who is secluded and never goes out would i knew how she came into the streets and would heaven i wot whether or no twas by leave of the king then he rose to learn somewhat concerning her and well nigh thirty castratos followed him which when the old woman saw her reason fled for fear and she said verily we are allah's and to him we shall return without recourse we are dead folk this time and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section thirty two. Section thirty three of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume seven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 33. When it was the 733rd night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the old nurse saw the head of the eunuchry and his assistants making for her, she was in exceeding fear and cried there is no majesty and there is no might save in allah the glorious the great verily we are gods and unto him we shall return without recourse we be dead folk this time when the head eunuch heard her speak thus fear got hold upon him by reason of that which he knew of the princess's violence and that her father was ruled by her and he said to himself Belike the king hath commanded the nurse to carry his daughter forth, upon some occasion of hers, whereof she would have none know, and if I oppose her she will be wroth with me, and will say, This eunuch fellow stopped me, that he might pry into my affairs. So she will do her best to kill me, and I have no call to meddle in this matter. So saying, he turned back, and with him the thirty assistants who drove the people from the door of the palace whereupon the nurse entered and saluted the eunuchs with her head whilst all the thirty stood to do her honour and returned her salaam she led in the prince and he ceased not following her from door to door and the protector protected him so that they passed all the guards till they came to the seventh door it was that of the great pavilion wherein was the king's throne and it communicated with the chambers of his women and the saloons of the harem as well as with his daughter's pavilion so the old woman halted and said here we are o my son and glory be to him 
who hath brought us thus far in safety. But, O oh my son, we cannot foregather with the princess, except by night, for night enveileth the fearful. He replied, True, but what is to be done? Quoth she, Hide thee in this black hole, showing him behind the door a dark and deep cistern, with a cover thereto. So he entered the cistern, and she went away, and left him there till ended day, when she returned and carried him into the palace, till they came to the door of Hyatt al Nufus's apartment. The old woman knocked, and a little maid came out and said, Who is at the door? Said the nurse, Tis I. Whereupon the maid returned, and craved permission of her lady, who said, Open to her, and let her come in with any who may accompany her. So they entered, and the nurse, casting a glance around, perceived that the princess had made ready the sitting-chamber, and ranged the lamps in row, and lighted candles of wax and chandeliers of gold and silver, and spread the divans and estrades with carpets and cushions. Moreover, she had set on trays of food and fruits and confections, and she had perfumed the place with musk and aloes wood and ambergris. She was seated among the lamps and the tapers, and the light of her face outshone the lustre of them all. When she saw the old woman, she said to her, O oh nurse, where is the beloved of my heart? And the other replied, O oh my lady, I cannot find him, nor have mine eyes espied him. But I have brought thee his own sister, and here she is. Cried the princess, Art thou gin mad? What need have I of his sister? Say me, and a man's head irk him, doth he bind up his hand? The old woman answered, No, by Allah, O my lady, but look on her, and if she pleases thee, let her be with thee. Then she uncovered the prince's face, whereupon Hayat al Nufus knew him, and running to him, pressed him to her bosom, and he pressed her to his breast. Then they both fell down in a swoon, and lay without sense a long while. The old woman sprinkled rose water upon them until they came to themselves, when she kissed them on the mouth more than a thousand times, and improvised these couplets. Sought me this heart, dear love, at gloom of night. I rose in honour till he sat forthright, and said, O aim of mine, O soul desire, in such night visit hast of guards no fright? Replied he, Yes, I feared much, but love robbed me of all my wits, and reft my sprite. We clipped with kisses, and a while clung we, for here twas safe, nor feared we watchman white. Then rose we parting without doubtful deed, and shook out skirts where none a stain could sight. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the seven hundred and thirty-fourth night, she pursued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when her lover visited Hayat al-Nufus in her palace, the twain embraced, and she improvised some happy couplets beseeming the occasion. And when she had ended her extempore lines, she said, Is it indeed true that I see thee in my abode, and that thou art my cupmate and my familiar? Then passion grew on her, and love was grievous to her, so that her reason was well nigh fled for joy, and she improvised these couplets. With all my soul, I'll ransom him who came to me in gloom, of night, whilst I had waited long to see his figure loom, and naught aroused me save his weeping voice of tender tone, and whispered I, Fair fall thy foot, and welcome, and well come. His cheek I kissed a thousand times, and yet a thousand more, then clipped and clung about his breast, enveiled in darkling room, and cried, Now verily I've won the aim of every wish, so praise and prayers to Allah for this grace now best become. Then slept we even as we would the goodliest of nights, till morning came to end our night, and light up earth with bloom. 
as soon as it was day, she made him enter a place in her apartment, unknown to any, and he abode there till nightfall, when she brought him out, and they sat in converse and carouse. Presently he said to her, I wish to return to my own country, and tell my father what hath passed between us, that he may equip his wazir to demand thee in marriage of thy sire. She replied, O oh, my love, I fear, an thou return to thy country and kingdom, thou wilt be distracted from me, and forget the love of me, or that thy father will not further thy wishes in this matter, and I shall die. Me seems the better read were that thou abide with me, and in my hand grasp, I looking on thy face, and thou on mine, till I devise some plan, whereby we may escape together some night, and flee to thy country, for I have cut off my hopes from my own people, and I despair of them. He rejoined, I hear and obey. And they fell again to their carousal and conversing. He tarried with her thus for some time, till, one night, the wine was pleasant to them, and they lay not down, nor did they sleep till break of day. Now it chanced that one of the kings sent her father a present, and among other things a necklace of union jewels, nine and twenty grains, to whose price a king's treasures might not suffice. Quoth Abd al Qadir, This riviere beseemeth none but my daughter Hayat al Nufus. And turning to an eunuch, whose jaw teeth the princess had knocked out for reasons best known to herself, he called to him and said, Carry the necklace to thy lady, and say to her, One of the kings hath sent thy father this as a present, and its price may not be paid with money. Put it on thy neck. The slave took the necklace, saying in himself, Allah Almighty make it the last thing she will put on in this world, for that she deprived me of the benefit of my grinder teeth. And repairing to the princess's apartment, found the door locked and the old woman asleep before the threshold. He shook her, and she awoke in a fright and asked, What dost thou want? To which he answered, The king hath sent me on an errand to his daughter. Quoth the nurse, The key is not here. Go away whilst I fetch it. But quoth he, I cannot go back to the king without having done his commandment. So she went away, as if to fetch the key. But fear overtook her, and she sought safety in flight. Then the eunuch awaited her a while. Then, finding she did not return, he feared that the king would be angry at his delay. So he rattled at the door, and shook it, whereupon the bolt gave way, and the leaf opened. He entered and passed on, till he came to the seventh door, and walking into the princess's chamber, found the place splendidly furnished, and saw candles and flagons there. At this spectacle he marvelled, and going up close to the bed, which was curtained by a hanging of silk, embroidered with a network of jewels, drew back the curtain from before the princess, and saw her sleeping with her arms about the neck of a young man, handsomer than herself whereat he magnified Allah Almighty, who had created such a youth of vile water, and said, How goodly be this fashion for one who hateth men! How came she by this fellow? Methinks twas on his account that she knocked out my back teeth. Then he drew the curtain, and made for the door. But the king's daughter awoke in a fright, and seeing the eunuch, whose name was Kaffa, called to him. He made her no answer. So she came down from the bed on the estrade, and catching hold of his skirt, laid it on her head, and kissed his feet, saying, Veil what Allah veileth. Quoth he, May Allah not veil thee, nor him who would veil thee. Thou didst knock out my grinders, and saidst to me, Let none make mention to me aught of men in their ways. So saying, he disengaged himself from her grasp, and running out, locked the door on them, and set another eunuch to guard it. Then he went in to the king, who said to him, Hast thou given the necklace to Hayat al-Nufus? The eunuch replied, By Allah, thou deservest altogether a better fate. And the king asked, What hath happened? Tell me quickly. Whereto he answered, I will not tell thee, save in private and between our eyes. But the king retorted, saying, 
tell me at once and in public. Cried the eunuch, Then grant me immunity. So the king threw him the kerchief of immunity, and he said, O king, I went into the princess Hayat al Nufus, and found her asleep in a carpeted chamber, and on her bosom was a young man, so I locked the door upon the two and came back to thee. When the king heard these words, he started up, and taking a sword in his hand, cried out to the race of the eunuchs, saying, Take thy lads, and go to the princess's chamber, and bring me her and him who is with her, as they twain lie on the bed, but cover them both up. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the seven hundred and thirty-fifth night, she resumed, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the king commanded the head eunuch to take his lads, and to fetch and set before him Hayat al-Nufus, and him who was with her, the chief and his men entered the princess's apartment, where he found her standing up, dissolved in railing tears, and the prince by her side. So he said to them, Lie down on the bed, as thou wast, and let him do likewise. The king's daughter feared for her lover, and said to him, This is no time for resistance. So they both lay down, and the eunuchs covered them up, and carried the twain into the king's presence. Thereupon Abd al-Qadir pulled off the coverings, and the princess sprang to her feet. He looked at her, and would have smitten her neck, but the prince threw himself on the father's breast, saying, The fault was not hers, but mine only. Kill me before thou killest her. The king made at him to cut him down, but Hayat al-Nufus cast herself on her father and said, Kill me, not him, for he is the son of a great king, lord of all the land in its length and breadth. When the king heard this, he turned to the chief wazir, who was a gathering place of all that is evil, and said to him, What sayst thou of this matter, O minister? Quoth his wazir, What I say is that all who find themselves in such case as this have need of lying, and there is nothing for it but to cut off both their heads, after torturing them with all manner of tortures. Hereupon the king called his sworder of vengeance, who came with his lads, and said to him, Take this gallows bird, and strike off his head, and after do the like with his harlot, and burn their bodies, and consult me not about them a second time. So the headsman put his hand to her back to take her. But the king cried out at him, and cast at him somewhat he hent in hand, which he had well nigh killed him, saying, O dog, how durst thou show ruth to those with whom I am wroth? Put thy hand to her hair, and drag her along by it, so that she may fall on her face. Accordingly, he hailed her by her hair, and the prince in like manner, to the place of blood, where he tore off a piece of his skirt, and therewith bound the prince's eyes, putting the princess last, in the hope that someone would intercede for her. Then having made ready the prince, he swung his sharp sword three times, whilst all the troops wept, and prayed Allah to send them deliverance by some intercessor, and raised his hand to cut off Ardashir's head, when, behold, there arose a cloud of dust that spread and flew till it veiled the view. Now the cause thereof was that when the young prince had delayed beyond measure, the king, his sire, had levied a mighty host, and had marched with it in person to get tidings of his son. Such was his case. But as regards King Abd al Qadir, when he saw this, he said, O whites, what is the meaning of yonder dust that dimmeth sights? The Grand Wazir sprang up, and went out to reconnoitre him, and found behind the cloud men like locusts, of whom no count could be made, nor aught avail of aid filling the hills and plains and valleys. So he returned with the report to the king, who said to him, Go down, and learn for us what may be this host, and the cause of its marching upon our country. Ask also of their commander, and salute him for me, and inquire the reason of his coming. And he come in quest of aught, we will aid him. 
and if he have a blood feud with one of the kings, we will ride with him. Or if he desire a gift, we will hand sell him. For this is indeed a numerous host, and a power uttermost, and we fear for our land from its mischief. So the minister went forth, and walked among the tents and troopers and bodyguards, and ceased not faring on from the first of the day till near sundown, when he came to the warders with gilded swords in tents star-studded. Passing these, he made his way through emirs and wazirs and nabobs and chamberlains to the pavilion of the sultan, and found him a mighty king. When the king's officers saw him, they cried out to him, saying, Kiss ground! Kiss ground! He did so, and would have risen, but they cried out at him a second and a third time. So he kissed the earth again and again, and raised his head, and would have stood up, but fell down at full length for excess of awe. When at last he was set between the hands of the king, he said to him, Allah prolong thy days, and increase thy sovereignty, and exalt thy rank, O thou auspicious king. And furthermore, of a truth, King Abd al-Qadir saluteth thee, and kisseth the earth before thee, and asketh on what weighty business thou art come. And thou seek to avenge thee for blood on any king, he will take horse in thy service. Or, an thou come in quest of aught, wherein it is in his power to help thee, he standeth up at thy service on account thereof. So Ardashir's father replied to the wazir, saying, O messenger, return to thy lord, and tell him that the most mighty king, Saif al-Azam Shah, lord of Shiraz, had a son who hath been long absent from him, and news of him have not come, and all traces of him have been cut off. An he be in this city, he will take him and depart from you. But if aught have befallen him, or any mischief have ensued to him from you, his father will lay waste your land, and make spoil of your goods, and slay your men, and seize your women. Return therefore to thy lord in haste, and tell him this, ere evil befall him. Answered the minister, To hear is to obey, and turned to go away, when the chamberlains cried out to him, saying, Kiss ground! Kiss ground! So he kissed the ground a score of times, and rose not, till his life-breath was in his nostrils. Then he left the king's high court, and returned to the city, full of anxious thought concerning the affair of this king, and the multitude of his troops. And going in to King Abd al-Qadir, pale with fear and trembling in his side-muscles, acquainted him with that had befallen him. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 33Section 34 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 7, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton. Section 34. When it was the 736th night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the wazir returned from the court of the great king, pale with fear, and with side muscles quivering for dread exceeding, and acquainted his lord with what had befallen him. Hereat disquietude and terror for himself and for his people laid hold upon him, and he said to the minister, O wazir, and who is this king's son? Replied the other, Tis even he whom thou badest put to death, but praised be Allah who hastened not his slaughter, else had his father wasted our lands and spoiled our good. Quoth the king, See now thy corrupt judgment, and that thou didst counsel us to slay him? Where is the young man, the son of yonder magnanimous king? And quoth the wazir, O mighty king, thou didst command him be put to death. 
When the king heard this, he was clean distraught, and cried out from his heart's core and in most of head, saying, Woe to you! Fetch me the headsman forthright, lest death fall on him. So they fetched the sworder, and he said, O king of the age, I have spitten off his head even as thou badest me. Cried Abd al-Qadir, O dog, and this be true, I will assuredly send thee after him. The headsman replied, O king, thou didst command me to slay him without consulting thee a second time. Said the king, I was in my wrath, but speak the true, ere thou lose thy life. And said the sworder, O king, he is yet in the chains of life. At this Abd al-Qadir rejoiced, and his heart was set at rest. Then he called for Ardashir, and when he came he stood up to receive him, and kissed his mouth, saying, O my son, I ask pardon of Allah Almighty for the wrong I have done thee, and say thou not aught that may lower my credit with thy sire, the great king. The prince asked, O king of the age, and where is my father? And the other answered, He is come hither on thine account. Thereupon quoth Ardashir, By thy worship I will not stir from before thee till I have cleared my honor and the honor of thy daughter from that which thou laidest to our charge, for she is a pure virgin. Send for the midwives and let them examine her before thee. And they find her maidenhead gone, I give thee leave to shed my blood. And if they find her a clean maid, her innocence of dishonor and mine also will be made manifest. So he summoned the midwives, who examined the princess, and found her a pure virgin, and so told the king, seeking largesse of him. He gave them what they sought, putting off his royal robes to bestow on them, and in like manner he was bountiful to all who were in the harem. And they brought forth the scent cups and perfumed all the lords of estate and grandees, and not one but rejoiced with exceeding joy. Then the king threw his arms about Ardashir's neck and entreated him with all worship and honor, bidding his chief eunuchs bear him to the bath. When he came out, he cast over his shoulders a costly robe and crowned him with a coronet of jewels. He also girt him with a girdle of silk, purfled with red gold and set with pearls and gems, and mounted him on one of his noblest mares with sele and trappings of gold inlaid with pearls and jewels. Then he bade his grandees and captains mount on his service and escort him to his father's presence, and charged him tell his sire that King Abd al-Qadir was at his disposal, hearkening to and obeying him in whatso he should bid or forbid. I will not fail of this, answered Ardashir, and farewelling him, repaired to his father who, at sight of him, was transported for delight and springing up, advanced to meet him and embraced him, whilst joy and gladness spread am among all the host of the great king. Then came the wazirs and chamberlains and captains and guards, and kissed the ground before the prince, and rejoiced in his coming. And it was a great day with them for enjoyment, for the king's son gave leave to those of King Abd al-Qadir's officers, who had accompanied him and others of the townsfolk, to view the ordinance of his father's host, without let or stay so they might know the multitude of the great king's troops and the might of his empire. And all who had seen him selling stuffs in the linen draper's bazaar marveled how his soul could have consented thereto, considering the nobility of his spirit and the loftiness of his dignity. But it was his love and inclination to the king's daughter that to this had constrained him. Meanwhile, news of the multitude of her lover's troops came to Hayat al-Nufis, who was still jailed by her sire's commandment, till they knew what he should order respecting her, whether pardon and release, or death and burning. And she looked down from the terrace roof of the palace, and turning towards the mountains, saw even these covered with armed men. When she beheld all those warriors, and knew that they were the army of Ardashir's father, she feared lest he should be diverted from her by his sire, and forget her, and depart from her, whereupon her father would slay her. So she called a handmaid that was with her in her apartment by way of service, and said to her, 
Go to Ardashir, son of the great king, and fear not. When thou comest into his presence, kiss the ground before him, and tell him what thou art, and say to him, My lady saluteth thee, and would have thee to know that she is a prisoner in her father's palace, awaiting his sentence, whether he be minded to pardon her or put her to death. And she beseecheth thee not to forget her or forsake her, for today thou art all-powerful, and in whatso thou commandest no man dare cross thee. Wherefore, and it seem good to thee to rescue her from her sire and take her with thee, it were of thy bounty, for indeed she endureth all these trials for thy sake. But, and this seem not good to thee, for that thy desire of her is at an end, still speak to thy sire, so haply he may intercede for her with her father, and he depart not, till he have made him set her free, and taken surety from, and made covenant with him, that he will not go about to put her to death, nor work her aught of harm. This is her last word to thee, May Allah not desolate her of thee. And so the peace. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the seven hundred and thirty-seventh night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the bondmaid sent by Hayat al-Nufis made her way to Ardashir, and delivered him her lady's message, which when he heard, he wept with sore weeping, and said to her, Know that Hayat al-Nufis is my mistress, and that I am her slave, and the captive of her love. I have not forgotten what was between us, nor the bitterness of the parting day. So do thou say to her, after thou hast kissed her feet, that I will speak with my father of her, and he shall send his wazir, who sought her aforetime in marriage for me, to demand her hand once more of her sire, for he dare not refuse. So if he send to her to consult her, let her make no opposition, for I will not return to my country without her. Then the handmaid returned to Hayat al-Nufis, and, kissing her hands, delivered to her the message, which when she heard, she wept for very joy, and returned thanks to Almighty Allah. Such was her case. But as regards Ardashir, he was alone with his father that night, and the great king questioned him of his case, whereupon he told him all that had befallen him, first and last. Then quoth the king, What wilt thou have me do for thee, O my son? And thou desire al Qadir's ruined? I will lay waste his lands, and spoil his hordes, and dishonor his house. Replied Ardashir, I do not desire that, O my father, for he hath done nothing to me deserving thereof. But I wish for union with her, wherefore I beseech thee of thy favor to make ready a present for her father, but let it be a magnificent gift, and send it to him by thy minister, the man of just judgment. Quoth the king, I hear and consent. And sending for the treasures he had laid up from time past, brought out all manner precious things, and showed them to his son, who was pleased with them. Then he called his wazir, and bade him bear the present with him to King Abd al-Qadir, and demand his daughter in marriage for Ardashir, saying, Accept the present, and return him a reply. Now from the time of Ardashir's departure, King Abd al-Qadir had been troubled, and ceased not to be heavy at heart, fearing the laying waste of his reign and the spoiling of his realm, when, behold, the wazir came in to him, and saluting him, kissed ground before him. He rose up standing and received him with honor, but the minister made haste to fall at his feet, and kissing them, cried, Pardon, O king of the age! The like of thee should not rise to the like of me, for I am the least of servant slaves. Know, O king, that Prince Ardashir hath acquainted his father with some of the favors and kindnesses thou hast done him. Wherefore he thanketh thee, and sendeth thee in company of thy servant, who standeth before thee, a present, saluting thee, and wishing thee especial blessings and prosperities. 
Abd al-Qadir could not believe what he had heard of the excess of his fear, till the wazir laid the present before him. When he saw it to be such gift as no money could purchase, nor could one of the kings of the earth avail to the like thereof. Wherefore he's belittled in his own eyes, and springing to his feet, praised Almighty Allah, and glorified him, and thanked the prince. Then the ministers said to him, O noble king, give ear to my word, and know that the great king sent to thee, desiring thine alliance, and I to come thee, seeking and craving the hand of thy daughter, the chaste dame and a treasured gem, Hayat al-Nufis, in wedlock for his son Ardashir. Wherefore, if thou consent to this proposal, and accept of him, do thou agree with me for her marriage portion. Abd al-Qadir, hearing these words, replied, I hear and obey. For my part I make no objection, and nothing can be more pleasurable to me. But the girl is of full age and reason, and her affair is in her own hand. So be assured that I will refer it to her, and she shall choose for herself. Then he turned to the chief eunuch, and bade him go and acquaint the princess with this event. So he repaired to the harem, and kissing the princess's hands, acquainted her with the great king's offer, adding, What sayest thou in answer? I hear and obey, replied she. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the seven hundred and thirty-eighth night, she pursued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the chief eunuch of the harem, having informed the princess how she had been demanded in marriage by the great king, and having heard her reply, I hear and obey, returned therewith to the king, and gave him this answer, whereat he rejoiced with exceeding joy, and calling for a costly robe of honor, threw it over the wazir's shoulders. Furthermore, he ordered him ten thousand dinars, and bade him carry the answer to the great king, and crave leave for him to pay him a visit. Hearing and obeying, answered the minister, and returning to his master, delivered him the reply and Abd al-Qadir's message, and repeated all their talk, whereat he rejoiced greatly, and Ardashir was transported for delight, and his breast broadened, and he was a most happy man. King Saif al-Azam also gave King Abd al-Qadir leave to come forth to visit him. So, on the morrow, he took horse and rode to the camp of the great king. He came to meet him, and saluting him, seated him in the place of honor, and gave him welcome. And they two sat whilst Ardashir stood before them. Then arose an orator of the king Abd al-Qadir's court, and pronounced an eloquent discourse, giving the prince joy of the attainment of his desire and of his marriage with the princess, a queen among king's daughters. When he sat down, the great king caused bring a chest full of pearls and gems, together with fifty thousand dinars, and said to King Abd al-Qadir, I am my son's deputy in all that concerneth this matter. So Abd al-Qadir acknowledged receipt of the marriage portion, and amongst the rest fifty thousand dinars for the nuptial festivities after which they fetched the Kazis and the witnesses who wrote out the contract of marriage between the prince and princess, and it was a notable day, wherein all lovers made merry, and all haters and enviers were mortified. They spread the marriage feasts and banquets, and lastly Ardashir went in unto the princess, and found her a jewel which had been hidden, an union pearl unthridden, and a filly that none but he had ridden, so he notified this to his sire. Then King Saif al-Azam asked his son, Hast thou any wish thou wouldst have fulfilled ere we depart? And he answered, Yes, O king, know that I would fain take my reek of the wazir who entreated us an, an evil, wise, and the eunuch who forged a lie against us. 
So the king sent forthright to Abd al-Qadir, demanding of him the minister and the castrado, whereupon he dispatched them both to him and commanded to hang them over the city gate. After this they abode a little while, and then sought of Abd al-Qadir leave for his daughter to equip her for departure. So he equipped her, and mounted her in a tak trawand, a travelling litter of red gold, inlaid with pearls and gems and drawn by noble steeds. She carried with her all her waiting women and eunuchs, as well as the nurse, who had returned after her flight and resumed her office. Then King Saif al-Azam and his son mounted, and Ab al-Qadir mounted also, with all the lords of his land, to take leave of his son-in-law and daughter. And it was a great day to be reckoned of the goodliest of days. After they had gone some distance, the great king conjured Abd al-Qadir to turn back. So he farewelled him and his son, after he had strained him to his breast, and kissed him between the eyes, and thanked him for his grace and favors, and commended his daughter to his care. Then he went in to the princess, and embraced her, and she kissed his hands, and they wept in the standing place of parting. After this he returned to his capital, and Ardashir and his company fared on, till they reached Shiraz, where they celebrated the marriage festivities anew. And they abode in all comfort and solace and joyance of life, till there came to them the destroyer of delights and severer of societies, the depopulator of palaces and the garnerer of graveyards. And men also relate the tale of Julnar the Seaborn, and her son King Badar Basim of Persia. There was once in days of yore, and in ages and times long before, an Ajam land, a king, Sharaman Hait, whose abiding place was Khorasan. He owned a hundred concubines, but by none of them had he been blessed with boon of child, male or female, all the days of his life. One day, among the days, he bethought him of this, and fell lamenting for that the most part of his existence was past, and he had not been vouchsafed a son to inherit the kingdom after him, even as he had inherited from his fathers and forebears. By reason whereof, there betided him sore cark and care, and chagrin exceeding. As he sat thus, one of his mamelukes came in to him and said, O my lord, at the door is a slave girl with her merchant, and fairer than she I hath never seen. Quoth the king, Hither to me with merchant and maid, and both came in to him. Now when Sharaman beheld the girl, he saw that she was like a Rudanian lance, and she was wrapped in a veil of gold purfled silk. The merchant uncovered her face, whereupon the place was illuminated by her beauty, and her seven tresses hung down to her anklets like horses' tails. She had nature-cold eyes, heavy hips and thighs, and waist of slenderous guise. Her sight healed all maladies, and quenched the fire of sighs. For she was even as the poet cries, I love her madly, for she is perfect fair, complete in gravity and gracious way, nor over tall nor over short, the while too full for trousers are those hips that sway. Her shape is midmost twixt oars small and tall, nor long to blame nor little to gainsay. O'er fall her anklets tress as black as night, yet in her face resplends eternal day. The king seeing her marveled at her beauty and loveliness, her symmetry and perfect grace, and said to the merchant, O Sheikh, how much for this maiden? Replied the merchant, O my lord, I bought her for two thousand dinars of the merchant who owned her before myself, since when I have travelled with her three years, and she hath cost me, up to the time of my coming hither, other three thousand gold pieces. But she is a gift from me to thee. The king robed him with a splendid robe of honour, and ordered him ten thousand ducats, whereupon he kissed his hands, thanking him for his bounty and beneficence, 
and went his ways. And then the king committed the damsel to the tirewomen, saying, Amend ye the case of this maiden, and adorn her, and furnish her a bower, and set her therein. And he bade his chamberlains carry her everything she needed, and shut all the doors upon her. Now his capital wherein he dwelt was called the White City, and was seated on the seashore. And so they lodged her in a chamber, whose latticed casements overlooked the main. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 34 Recording by Terry Torres, 